a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Star Wars Knight Errant by John Jackson Miller Read by Decade Bird Publishing Powered by Artificial Intelligence Prologue With each stroke of his pen, the old Celestin discovered the creator of the universe. Lord Damon was relatively young, as humans went. And yet Gub Tango found his liege again and again as he worked through the stack of crumpled flimsoplast cells. Shipping invoices. Engineering schematics. Restaurant receipts. Gub couldn't read the words, but he could sometimes tell what they were about from the pictures. All were dated long before, sometimes centuries before, Damon came to power on Darknell. Yet all, somehow, presaged his lordship's rise. It was an amazing thing, Gub thought, riffling the thin sheets of acrylic, stuck together from age. Documents on such mundane matters, and yet they all were part of creation, Damon's creation. Gubb shook the glow lamp he had been allotted and brought it nearer to the text. Yes, the prophetic symbols were there again, hiding. It was Gubb's job to make them apparent to all. He quietly thanked Damon for that. At sixty, Gubb was lucky to be of any service, especially after losing the use of his legs in a vat collapse during Lord Chabras's reign. That should have been the end of his usefulness. But years earlier, Gubb had worked in a bioweapons factory, injecting spores with poison. It had been a short step from that meticulous work to using a chemical stylus, and such a skill was always handy on Damon's capital world. On taking power, Damon had ordered the Orbesh letters that spelled his name altered to reflect his mark on existence. Two flag-like strokes would be added to the characters not just when they were written in the future, but also everywhere they had previously appeared. And altered wasn't the right word, because, as Damon had put it, the new characters had always existed. Mere organics simply couldn't see them. Making them visible now was an alteration, it was revelation. The change was instantaneous for the vast majority of written words in Damon's domain, all electronically stored. But manual attention was required for signs and labels, as well as for the relatively few physical documents the culture had generated. Thus, Gubb and thousands of crafts beings like him on Darknell and elsewhere had been tasked with revealing the letters that had always been there. It might have been easier simply to destroy the earlier materials, most flimsoplasts dissolve eagerly in water. But Gubb knew that wasn't the point. If, as Damon's Sith adepts said, the universe had been created 25 years before, when Damon was born, all older matter must have been created by him, as well, including this advertisement. If a ragged sheet depicting pictures of shoes held within it the marks of Damon, then it was not an advertisement, but a holy artifact. Destroying it would be sacrilege worthy of the great enemy. Damon's signature was everywhere in the galaxy, even in the sky above. The pages from the past were just another piece of that ubiquity. They had to look the part. Zeroing in on the circular, Gubb found one of the letters he was seeking in the caption for a gray boot. Another Oric. Gubb sighed and rubbed the electrostatic pen against his knee to charge it. He knew the importance of his job, but he's still tired of seeing the pesky vowels. The added flags, his supervisor called them kerns, that created the holy letter Orecta flew to the left of the character, almost always butting up against the adjacent figure. But if Damon didn't intend for the characters to run together, then Gubb must do his best to see that the transformed, revealed characters didn't, either. In matters of creation, neatness counted. And so, the old Celestin sat in his tiny apartment in the Iridium Quarter, his day a slurry of Dorndos and Enthdos that often stretched far into night, as it had tonight. Gubb seldom wondered what happened to the reams of completed flimsoplast he'd returned over the years. He assumed the documents went right back to where they'd been found, although he could tell from the stains and smell that some of them had been in landfills, waiting for expulsion into the nearest star. Who kept track of what needed to be returned where? What kind of a job must that be? Gubb couldn't imagine. It didn't matter, so long as he'd done his part for divine revelation. His work concerns were only in meeting his quota and pleasing a passive-aggressive inspector. 
his real worries he saved for his dwindling food ration, forced to serve three, and for his orphan granddaughter Tan, sleeping in the other room, her future unknown. And increasingly, he worried over the caregiver he'd recently hired for the two of them. Unreasonable, brash, and, unbeknownst to him, at that moment across town working toward the ultimate destruction of Lord Damon, forger of alphabets and creator of the universe. Part 1. The Daemonate. Chapter 1. And sit space, everyone is a slave. It was a funny thing about a bunch whose credo included a line about their chains being broken, Narsk thought. They were always careful to leave plenty of chains intact for everyone else. Still, some people were more enslaved than others. It paid to be special, to be good at something. Life was less unpleasant then. And for the really special? One had one's choice of masters, not that the options were that appealing. Nars Kahane's own specialty had brought him to Dark Mill, seat of power for Daemon, self-declared Sith Lord and would-be godling. Narsk had first used a stealth bodysuit to harvest rhyme bats from caverns on Verdant, and what he was doing now wasn't much different. True, the Bothan couldn't imagine anyone back home clinging upside down to a rope in a high-security tower's ventilation system, but then, not everyone could be special. What was different now was the stealth suit. The Sith warring in the region hadn't focused much on advancing stealth technology over the last few decades, they were only after bigger explosions. That was fine with Narsk. The bodysuit he wore was the top of a Republic line never seen in the Gramani sector. He didn't know how his supplier had acquired a Cirrusept personal concealment system, Mark VI, or even whether the previous five versions were any good. Narsk just knew he'd never gotten so far on an assignment so easily. Almost a shame, given all the preparation he'd put in. He'd arrived in Zakria, Dargmel's administrative capital, weeks earlier to establish his cover identity. Locating the target was simple enough, the lopsided pyramid known colloquially as the Black Fang was visible from most of town. He'd carefully studied traffic patterns around the obsidian edifice and noted the shift changes of the sentries guarding the few openings. Within a month, he'd located every route into and out of the colossal House of Secrets. And then he had walked right in. The Mark VI could do for tradecraft what hyperdrive did for space travel, Narsk thought. Electronic baffles worked into the suit's skin at a molecular level warped and bent electromagnetic waves around the wearer. Sound, light, comms, the Mark VI dodged them all. And Cirrusept had thought of everything. A breath filter matched exhalations to room temperature and humidity. Special goggles permitted Narsk to see out, despite the fact that no light was reaching his eyes. They'd even supplied a similarly cloaked pouch for carry-along items. If Narsk wasn't exactly invisible, he took an attentive eye to spot, especially in the dark. But attentiveness, Narsk had found, was not a gift that Lord Damon, creator of all, had seen fit to bestow on his sentries. As elsewhere, the peculiar lord's adepts had rounded up menacing-looking characters and proceeded to overdress them. There wasn't a bruiser so tough he couldn't be made to look silly when strapped into gilded armor and wrapped in a burgundy skirt. One poor Gamorian, his squat, lumbering green body particularly at odds with his finery, across town had looked ready to cry. So while Narsk had brought his needler and extra rounds on every trip to the research center, he'd never needed them. The Mark VI had gotten him to the door, but the sentries had actually opened it for him, allowing him inside when they entered themselves. When your job's to make sure nothing ever happens, he'd once heard, you begin to see nothing happening even when something's going on. By now, his thirteenth and final trip inside, Narsk believed it. Many of the secrets of the Black Fang, officially, the Daemonate Dynamic Testing Facility, Dark Nil, rested comfortably in the memory of the data pad in his pouch. Lord Odeon would be pleased. That wasn't always a good thing, Narsk knew. Damon's older brother got most of his thrills from death and destruction. The whole sorry war smacked of a psychological study. Damon was the spoiled kid who thought he was the only person in the universe who mattered. Odeon was the jealous sibling, reacting to his loss of uniqueness by trashing the playpen. If Damon thought he created everything, Odeon believed it was his destiny to destroy everything. 
Half of Odian's adepts were part of a death cult, flitting around his evil light hoping to cash out in his service. Raltiri Glomites were less suicidal. Fortunately, Nars didn't have to adopt their ways to take their assignments. Not many of them, anyway. Reaching a juncture in the ventilation system, Narsk felt the whole building wheeze around him. Frigid air chuff passed, cooling the facility for today's big test. The Mark VI responded, matching the surrounding temperature while somehow keeping frost from accumulating on the suit's surface. The Republic designers were good, Narsk thought. Too bad they can't fight. Or won't. Cutting the cable, Narsk settled gently onto the vent cover. The main testing center below was the only important room he hadn't entered, if only because his quarry hadn't been moved here yet. But there it was, its metallic bulk just visible through the icy slats at his feet. Convergence. In Damon's conflict with Odeon, the great capital ships that once dominated Sith battles with the Republic had sat largely out of play. Neither had a clear idea how many great ships his brother had, and while Odeon would have happily taken his chances in a huge engagement, Damon was unwilling to oblige. The result had been a series of strokes and counterstrokes, where the winning factor wasn't the amount of firepower as often as it was the ability to project different kinds of strength quickly. The field of battle changed constantly. The Convergence Tactical Assault Vehicle had chucked thousands of years of military science in favor of Damon's idea of the moment, one ship fits all. Like Narsk's stealth suit, Convergence was intended to do everything. Twice the size of a starfighter, the craft served as a small troop transport, capable of delivering 8 to 10 warriors through hyperspace. It also sported weapon systems allowing it to play the role of fighter or bomber depending on the situation. Damon foresaw a time when millions of the vessels would propel him to his rightful place, ruling the galaxy. Damon's engineers, meanwhile, had foreseen only a never-ending nightmare. And their prediction, spoken only to themselves, had thus far come closest to reality. Peering down into the chamber, Nars could see why. Mounted onto a colossal testing arm was the ugliest contraption he'd ever seen. Convergence was a hundred-ton expression of one man's moods, changeable and conflicting. Damon had demanded that the vessel keep to the tripronged dart aesthetic of his starfighters, but the wings and color scheme were about all that the pregnant monster had in common with those sleek ships. Designers had saddled the forward section with a hulking crew compartment that was still less than comfortable, room for nine passengers, but only if six stood the entire way. The engines, enlarged on two earlier occasions, seemed nonetheless outmatched. A missile battery pointed nowhere in particular. And a massive nacelle ran along the underside, last vestige of an earlier plot to convert the ship into a tracked vehicle for use on land. Narsk imagined they still kept the wheels somewhere in the building, anticipating Damon's frequent changes of mind. Endless engineering for an endless war. Narsk thought it something a child would design. Yet despite it all, there was still something worth stealing. For all their troubles, Damon's designers had leapt upon some worthwhile advances. Some of the composite work on the whole had shown fruit, and the turbolaser energy efficiency was as good as anyone in the sector had seen. Useful facts, especially to his employer. Self-styled though he was, Lord Odeon was a proper mimic when it came to technology. Narsk had been assigned to pick Convergence's secrets clean. With any luck, Odeon's massive floating factory, the Spike, would soon be churning out better weapon systems using the ideas. Narsk had stolen most of the data at his leisure, thanks to Damon's sudden decision to add riot control features to the ship. Now he was back for the last morsel, the energy shield package. Over the past week, Damon's researchers had exposed its shields to sonic waves, electronic emissions, and blazing heat, adjusting the ship's software package as needed. This test, designed to evaluate shield performance in atmospheres, was the one Narsk had been waiting for. The Convergence prototype had been married to a huge rotating arm, a centrifuge designed to simulate performance at sublight speeds. On less secret vehicles, this kind of testing was done in the air, but, Narsk imagined, the researchers probably worried the thing would never fly anyway. He was glad he hadn't been ordered to steal the ship itself. A buzzer sounded. The massive Taurus began to move, sleepily dragging the bulk of Convergence. 
Narsk's attention was below, nearer the hub. The observers monitoring outside wouldn't have a visual on the gargantuan motor or the space around it. Narsk heaved himself over the edge, timing his drop to allow him to land on the gargantuan arm itself. Touching metal for a moment, he lightly tumbled backward off the rotating bar toward the floor below. He immediately went flat, mashing his furry face to the rib decking of the testing chamber. Less than a meter stood between the floor and instant decapitation. Just another day working for the Sith, Narsk thought, adjusting his mask's visor to accommodate for the sudden, worrying darkness. Regaining his bearings, he shimmied toward the motor housing at the room's center. There, in the motionless base, was what he was expecting to find, a live control panel, intended for use only when the centrifuge wasn't in motion. Narsk steadied the display. Telemetry from the test stream to the hub through an insulated cable snaking along the great arm's length to convergence. Seeing information cascade across the small screen, Narsk reached in his pouch for the data pad, packed neatly on top. A simple interface established, he began downloading the results from this and every previous shield test on the prototype. It was as easy as he'd been told. It helped to know the odd Odeonite hiding within Damon's technical ranks. They're all odd, Narsk thought. But never mind. Download complete, he squinted at the display, taking precious extra time to make sure he was seeing what he was supposed to. Deciphering the Damonite alphabet didn't help. What a pain in the... Another buzzer, barely audible, alerted him that the prototype had reached full speed. Soon it would be starting its long deceleration. He had to go. But first he needed to leave his parting gift in exchange for all the information he had stolen. Gingerly reaching into the pouch, Narsk removed the cargo he'd been toting, beradium thermal charges. They'd gotten dearer on Dark Mill recently, forcing Narsk to smuggle in his own, hardly a comfortable experience given the explosive's testiness. Just a few charges attached to the centrifuge's base would be enough to disable part of the testing center and take out the prototype, too, as soon as Narsk activated the remote detonator. It would make for a pretty explosion, he thought, but he'd be too far away to see it. He was already on his way out, slinking into a narrow drain used for runoff from weather-related tests. Too slick and vertical to be a route into the center, it was a remarkably convenient way out. Sliding down in darkness, Narsk smiled. He'd never gotten within 20 meters of convergence, and yet he had everything needed to build his own. As if anyone would want it. When Lord Chagres's holdings were broken up, young Damon had been quick to seize Dark Mill. There was little question why. The aesthetics did more to sell his vision of godhood than an army of statues, although he had that, too. The planet's main sun, Nelcharai, provided residents with a sickly light that led scientists to worry it might throw off its hydrogen core at any time. But it was the two younger, brighter stars slowly circling each other in an outer orbit that were the real attraction. With only just enough mass to support fusion, Nelchar 2 and 3 were too remote to destabilize Dark Nell's orbit or even affect the weather. But they were always visible somewhere on the planet, day or night. The suns watched Dark Nell, literally, residents said. For the azure and golden orbs resembled nothing more than the mismatched eyes of Damon himself. Thus the so-called creator of all forever watched his fearful subjects from the skies, ensuring that no treason could ever fester under his gaze. Unless the planet happened to be facing the other way. Looking up from the roof of the airspeeder factory next door to the testing center, Narsk chortled. Moments before, the eyes had risen above the black fang, in advance of impending dawn, which left half the planet's residents unmolested by any stellar voyeur. Astronomical details didn't matter, of course. People in the Grimani sector had lived under Sith rule for so long, they'd believe anything. Narsk had always assumed that Damon had altered his irises to match the stars, but Odeon had sworn the brat's off-putting eyes were natural. Whatever the truth, it was a good ploy. Filtered through the polluted haze of the capital, the stars made for an arresting spectacle. And if anyone snickered at the time of the year when the star's orbits made their creator appear cross-eyed, well, that was what Damon's correctors were for. Pulling the mask back from his hairy pointed ears, Narsk was thankful the correctors weren't here now. The Mark VI had performed well, 
but even Sirisip couldn't shield him from a large number of people searching with the dark side of the Force. Narsk knew mental rituals for maintaining a low profile, but getting into and out of the testing center had kept him pretty busy. It was good that Damon had pulled most of the correctors back to his headquarters in advance of some new plan against Odian. Narsk didn't wonder much about what it was. The Sanctum Celestial was someone else's assignment. Narsk removed his gloves and placed them with the goggles and mask in his bag, just beside the detonator. He'd wait to trigger the explosives until he was on the freighter taking off. He already had the travel authorization under his cover identity. He raked tan claws through matted facial fur, even with the suit's cooling system, he was soaked. He breathed deeply. Too many trips into dark spaces. It was good to be done with Dark Nell. Making his way toward the side of the roof where his clothes were hidden, Narsk thought about what the completed job would actually mean. Money wasn't significant in many Sith territories. Units of exchange didn't even exist in Odian's realm. Possessions, likewise, were difficult to accumulate in a region where borders were impermanent and safety was fleeting. No, in Sith space, people were measured by their options. By the little degrees of freedom they were allowed to have, and by the mobility they had to have when things fell apart. It wasn't enough to find a reasonably non-murderous despot to nuzzle up against. Sith lords fell as quickly as they rose. The only way to survive was to be valuable to many Sith at once. With this feat, Narst's reputation would grow, a reputation that would keep the Bothan out of chains no matter what came. It was the most that anyone living in Sith space could hope for, he thought. Or want. You have something I want. Came a low female voice from behind. Corrector. Narsk tumbled forward even as he heard the lightsaber hum to life behind him. <laughs> it had to be a corrector. None of Damon's sentries carried lightsabers. But Narsk wasn't bothering to look. He was already over the side of the rooftop, angling toward the ledge that ran the length of the factory. Padded boots ground against dura steel as he found his balance and sprang into a headlong run. His pursuer remained above, dashing quickly along the roof edge. Narsk worried that his speed wouldn't be enough, especially with his legs already aching from exertions in the testing center. He fumbled for the pouch, still pulling against his arm as he ran. He reached and reached again. The needler was, where? The bottom of the bag, blasted. No time to go searching, not with the end of the ledge ahead and footfalls growing nearer above. More factory buildings stretched into the distance, leading farther away from the Black Fang. Narsk leapt a few meters to the cornice of the next building. It would be a much longer jump from the corrector's rooftop, but Narsk wasted no hope on his pursuer giving up. Sure enough, glancing back, he spied a shadowy bipedal form sailing through the air, easily crossing the distance between the structures. Only a Sith with Force skills could have made that leap, Narsk thought. Such were the correctors, elite officers charged with repairing those elements of creation that didn't suit Damon's liking. Narsk didn't want to know what the revision process was like. The new ledge went a short distance before turning. Narsk skidded as he rounded the corner. It was narrower on this side, just half a meter separating the wall from a six-story drop to the alley. The Bothan didn't slow down at all, though every step tested fate. The stealth suit's boots weren't made for this, he knew, but there was no question of recovering his street clothes back on the rooftop. He just needed time to get to a place where he could don the suit's mask and gloves and reboot the stealth system. Narsk shot another look back. His assailant was a female humanoid, close to his height and weight. That wasn't much cause for relief, though. If it came to a physical showdown, he wouldn't last against a Sith adept of any size. And at least against a larger pursuer, he might be able to use his nimbleness to his advantage. But this corrector had matched him leap for leap. At least her lightsaber was out of sight, he'd heard it, but he'd never seen it. She must have doused the thing immediately as soon as the run began, Nars guessed. Puzzling. Why hasn't backup arrived? Where are the klaxons? Narsk had just begun to wonder when salvation appeared to him, shining through the skylight of the smaller building below. It was the answer, if only he could get down there. 
Without thinking twice, he bounded from the corner and tucked his body into a tight ball, stealing himself. The Mark VI wasn't a suit of armor, but as he fell he hoped it might offer some defense against the shiny membrane, seemingly hurtling toward him. Shards of shoddy transparent steel exploded downward as he fell, offering less resistance than he'd expected. The same couldn't be said, though, for the permacrete floor. And any hope Narsk had for a controlled landing ended when he hit the surface, and he proceeded to slide a dozen meters through a puddle of golden goo before finally slamming into a wall. Uncurling, Narsk squinted through the pane and looked around. The place was what he thought it was. Incomplete speeder bike bodies dangled from pulleys on chains, swaying as they worked their way toward a shower of paint. The whole place reeked with the pungent lacquer, wafting in steamy sheets. Narsk saw droids on duty so covered with spray, they could barely move. Evidently, there was a place in the Daemonate too toxic even for his slaves. Narsk struggled to stand. Where was the corrector? Not above him, he saw. She hadn't been dressed like the ones he'd seen in public. Did Damon have some new kind of secret police? Why didn't she follow him down? Do they worry about getting messy? An idle and foolish thought, and one he paid for immediately as he lost his footing in the greasy runoff and planted his chin onto the floor. The junk was in his fur now, more of that blasted guilt Damon liked to see on everything. Rising, Narsk realized it was also covering a good part of the stealth suit. There was no sense activating it, it'd need to be wiped completely clean before it could fool anyone. But he'd had no choice. Craning his neck, he scanned the rafters for the reason he entered. There it was, high in the rafters, a fully assembled speeder bike, glistening and dry, hanging from the end of a chain. Moving more carefully this time, Narsk pushed past a loader droid on his way to a gantry ladder. Looking up again, still no corrector, he made for the top step and waited for the conveyor to bring it past. A short jump, but slipping in the slop atop the ladder, Narsk nearly missed it altogether. Clawing frantically, he finally locked an elbow around the rocking frame and joined his hands, hoisting himself onto the seat. Safely astride the vehicle, Narsk ripped the protective coverings from the control display. Yes, the speeder would operate, but it barely had enough fuel to make the edge of Zakria. That didn't really matter. The corrector would definitely have brought in support by now. Narsk would reach safety in the next few minutes, or not at all. Opening his bag, he found the needler. It was right on top of his other goods, easily reachable. Narsk sighed. Terrific. Switching the hand-built weapons setting to fire acid-filled darts, he drew a bead on the pulley above and fired. Moments later, Bleary-eyed workers departing from the personal transport assembly shop looked up to see a golden blur rocketing through an open fourth-story window. Narsk tucked his body tightly against the speeder's frame. The chain, still attached to the vehicle, whipped behind like a Moskatha's tail, smashing against a nearby building as he turned for the main avenue. No time to worry about that. Narsk allowed the wind to replace the gunk in his lungs. He'd never considered Zakria's air to be fresh before now. Manufacturer's way stretched ahead, leading toward little duros and a thousand places where he could lose himself. The only thing behind him was the black fang, its outline lit by the twin stars above. Seeing no corrector, he turned his attention back to the street ahead. He should have looked up. The woman hurtled down from a skybridge crossing the thoroughfare, far above. Seeing her falling, her arms and hands outstretched, Narsk instinctively mashed the throttle. A sudden thump jerked the speeder from behind, nearly causing him to slip off again. Seizing a single handlebar with both hands, Narsk forced the speeder bike out of its turn and angled back into the open. Narsk looked behind him. He'd momentarily thought she'd landed on the vehicle, but there was no sign of her. Maybe she'd made a grab for the seat and slipped to her doom. About time for it to inconvenience someone else, he thought. Only, the speeder was still shimmying to and fro. Something was impeding his control. Narsk looked around again. And found her, behind and below, clinging to the end of six meters of chain still attached to the speeder. She'd looped the length of it around her arm, and was now riding it like a tether. 
By the blur of streetlights far beneath, Narsk could see her starting to climb toward him. The Sith and their chains. That's enough. Finding his needler, Narsk locked his knees against the speeder frame and released the handlebars. With one hand on the chassis, Narsk reached behind and started firing. Darts lanced through the exhaust trail, just missing his stowaway, who angled her body to avoid them. The projectile's paths terminated out of sight far below on the street. Narsk swore. A needler was the wrong weapon, but he couldn't very well bring a blaster to a spy mission. Scanning the dial, he found a setting he could use. The pulse wave darts would detonate seconds after they cleared the barrel, delivering most of their force in her direction. She was nearly to the back of the speeder now, grasping for a handhold. Narsk reset his weapon, steadied himself, and gaped as his pursuer vanished into the darkness. Puzzled, Narsk squinted for a second, only to go flying himself as the nose of the speeder caromed off a sturdy metal obstacle, another skybridge. The bottom of the speeder smacked the outer guardrail, throwing the entire vehicle end over end. Sky and bridge spun consecutively before Narsk's eyes, before blending together in agonizing darkness. She was human, after all. Narsk awoke to the sight of her as, lit by the burning wreckage of the speeder bike, the woman crossed the white sky bridge toward him. A young adult, dark complexioned, with short cropped black hair, a few odd wisps of it blew in the wind. Clad in a laborer's tawny work shirt and dark canvas pants, she blended with the night, and unlike Narsk, she didn't appear any worse for the landing. She hadn't been trying to climb onto the speeder, he realized as he struggled to get to his knees. She'd seen the bridge up ahead, and had been readying to drop away to safety. Now she strode confidently toward him, looking determined and holding her unlit lightsaber. Forcing himself to stand, Narsk fell on his hairy face. His right leg was sprained, perhaps broken. And the needler was gone. Narsk squirmed in panic as he heard the familiar hum from above. He clawed at the roadbed, desperate to avoid the moment he'd so often delayed. This had always been a danger, the risk that came with being special. All those jobs, and anyone could have ended like this, with a flash of crimson. Green. Green. Narsk's eyes widened. The lightsaber was green. Jedi? Narsk rolled over and looked at the woman's eyes. Hazel. Wide, alert, focused, but on the right side of madness. A Jedi. He couldn't believe his luck. A Jedi? Here? He'd heard a single Jedi had recently been on the loose in Sith space. One who had challenged Odian during the Shiloh affair and who had lately given Damon fits. Narsk had never met any Jedi, but he knew their reputation, and he knew he never could have hoped to have been discovered by anyone better on Dark Mill. You're her, Narsk began. Aren't you? You're Kara Holt. The woman didn't answer. Kneeling, she frisked him. In no position to resist, Narsk scanned her face more closely. Yes, it matched the images he'd seen. He licked his pointed teeth. He knew what to do. I'm on your side, Narsk said. I want to destroy Damon, too. Ignoring him, the woman pawed at the stealth suit. Amazingly to Narsk, and seemingly so to her, the Mark VI had no rips, although it now had grit to go with its golden splotches. Stepping away with Narsk's pouch, she found the data pad inside. Eyes skimming the screen, she spoke. You work for Lord Odeon. Narsk was startled. Her voice was low and rough, not much more than a whisper. Odeon, he responded. What makes you think that? Maybe I'm a revolutionary. There are no revolutionaries on Dark Nell. She said, voice rising as she deactivated the data pad. And if there were, they wouldn't be stealing military secrets. Holding the data pad where Nars could see it, she casually flipped the device into the air and bisected it with a sudden flick of her lightsaber. Nars gulped. All that work. All that work for Odeon. She said, catching his thought. Yes, he said. No sense denying it now, he realized, he might as well hit her with some truth. I was working for Odeon. But I'm not an Odeonite. It's just a job. That's worse. Kara said, looking down. 
You're an enabler. She nearly spat the word, causing Nars to flinch. She yanked his bag from the ground and stepped back. Narsk forced himself to stand, painful as it was. Fine, he said, clearing his throat. You've denied Odian the knowledge. But the important thing is to deny Damon the knowledge and the warship he's building. And we can do that. Look here, I can show you. Narsk stepped toward her and his bag, only to have her raise the lightsaber between them again. I don't work with Sith. She said, I told you, I'm not Sith. He gestured toward the pouch. Look in the bag. You'll see. The human deactivated her weapon and reached inside. Seeing her recognize the detonator control for what it was, Narsk flashed a toothy smile. You see? We have the chance to do something important against Damon. He began to reach for the controller. And all I ask is that I be allowed time to. No. In a single, liquid motion, the woman looked back up manufacturer's way, pointed the detonator, and pressed the button. A flash and a rumble came from the far end of the avenue. Two kilometers away, the opaque skin of the black fang heaved for a split second before erupting outward. Metal shards ripped free from the structure, desperate to escape. Thunder followed fire, more than enough noise and light to wake all Zakria. Nars brought a bruised hand to his long nose in horror. They must have powered up the centrifuge again, he thought. Fully armed and fueled, Convergence would have exploded in an outward spiral. He thought that was a possibility before he planted his explosives, but he had always planned to be aboard a freighter lifting off from Darknell before pressing the button. Not gawking like an idiot on a skybridge with a Jedi. You fool. Narsk yelled. Do you realize what you've done? The woman regarded the blaze with mild satisfaction. Yes. Narsk wilted, forgetting the pain in his leg. He looked to the rooftop plazas at either end of the skybridge. No authorities were here yet, but they soon would be. And still, the Jedi seemed pleased with herself. Idiot, Narsk thought. No wonder the Sith ran the Jedi out of the outer rim. He barked at her. Is that it? Are we done here? No. She said, igniting her lightsaber and waving it in his direction. Strip. The woman neatly slipped the folded Mark VI back into Narsk's bag, although neither suit nor bag was particularly neat anymore, smeared and stinking of paint. You've really made a mess of this thing. She said. Is this stuff permanent? I don't know, Narsk snarled. He didn't care about the suit anymore. The real authorities were out, screaming in their airspeeders toward the cauldron that was the testing center. And here he was, naked, but for his shorts, sitting in a garbage bin in a shadowy section of the plaza. The woman had marched him there, taken the stealth suit, and bound his wrists. It was not where he wanted to be with Sith on the way. How can you do this? You know what they'll do to me if they catch me. Seeing her beginning to close the lid, Nars grew more frantic. You can't do this. You Jedi are supposed to be about fair play and decency. You're supposed to be a Jedi. The woman paused. What? Kara Holt said, suddenly miffed. I'm not locking it. The lid snapped shut above him. Chapter 2 I declare the dawn. With Damon's words, the sun rose. I declare the dawn now, as I did, standing in the waters of darkness long ago. The voice grew louder as it wafted through the streets of Zakria, beckoning to day shift workers leaving for the transit hubs. Their liege had prepared another day for them. Seventy meters tall, the image of Damon looked down upon his works and smiled. Colossal holographic hands opened just as the first rays of Nelchar I crested the city skyline. Product of 64 hollow projectors and easily the single largest non-military consumer of energy on Dark Nell, the sparkling image rendered the giant in surprising detail. Above were the confident, piercing eyes, blue and amber, just like the stars, and the short crop of fair, golden hair. Even the talons molded to the fingertips of his right hand appeared in shimmering relief. The imaging specialists had done their work well. 
Seven marble statues depicting Damon's rise to power and prominence ring the image's base. Huge themselves, yet dwarfs next to the crackling titan above, each stone figure looked down one of Zakria's major avenues, radiating from the central plaza. Damon's rise faced celestial way, gazing the long kilometers toward the palace. Damon at Shiloh triumphantly faced Mining Way, home to many of Darknell's processing plants. Damon's voice seemed to come from all the statues in unison. I have decided the sun will shine for 23 hours today, with nine hours of night to follow. The warmth of summer I give to you, and light from the heavens. Kara Holt was impressed. She thought the display could have been more effective only had several of the city blocks not been burning to the ground as the holograph spoke. Hood pulled over her head, Kara slipped from one doorway to another as she made her way back home. It had been a mistake, allowing the chase with the Bothan to carry so far down manufacturer's way. To get home, she had to pass what was left of the Black Fang. What had been a lopsided pyramid was now a tangle of molten girders, with blazes still raging on many levels. My cosmic eyes will rest upon the people of the Southlands today, but know that I am with you always. Big Damon said. You are the encumbered. You are arms of my creation, extensions of my will. You know your functions. As far as Kara could tell, those functions right now seem to be running around in confusion and screaming at random passers-by. At least, that's what Damon's sentries were doing. Normally stern and forbidding agents of order were dashing back and forth across the plaza, unsure of what to do without divine guidance. Never forget, my will is. No one heard what Damon's will was, because the blazing research center chose that moment to tip completely over in an exhausted faint. By the time those around recovered their feet and their hearing, the loudspeakers throughout Sakria had gone silent. They'd heard it all before. Carrie used to hear the spiel every morning on the way to her job at the munitions plant before she moved to later shifts. On all the worlds of the Daemonate, listeners were assured Daemon controlled everything that happened in his realm. Those listeners might be less sure if they were on the plaza this morning, Kara thought. One of Daemon's thugs was on fire. She recognized him. A terror in her neighborhood for as long as she'd resided there, now the hulking guards staggered about, screaming in pain. Kara froze for a moment, unsure of what to do. Evil minion or no, the creature was suffering. She stepped into the street, only to be knocked aside by the advance of three of his fellow sentries. Remembering her cover identity, Kara began to exhale, relieved that someone else had gone to help him. Nope, they shot him. Seeing the thug fall dead at his would-be rescuer's feet, Kara rolled her eyes and retreated into an alley. Sith space was like this everywhere, a place of sudden violence, almost completely devoid of compassion or remorse. She'd never understand it. But she didn't have to understand it to win her fight. And now she had a stealth suit. A cracked window heaved upward. Lightly, Kara slipped back into her home of the past few weeks. The only things inside were a pair of bedrolls, her duffel, and a stand for the portable glow lamp she had to share with Gub Tango's young granddaughter. From the look of the crumpled blankets in the corner, Tan was already gone for the morning. The room wouldn't have been big enough for a closet back in the Jedi Academy, a place where the students were preparing to live with no possessions. Here on Dark Nell, it had to accommodate too. Setting down the Bothan's pouch, Kara peeked through the open doorway into the main room. The old Celestin was there, asleep in his chair again before a mass of documents. His arms stuck out at a right angle, his worn hand shaking as his fingers clutched an invisible pen. Kara edged into the room long enough to douse the glow lamp and push him back from the table. Flimsoplast cells fluttered to the floor. Kara winced. Every part of Gubb's job was insane. Not just what he had to do, but how much of it he had to do. On other worlds with long rotational periods, societies made some allowances for species that were used to standard length days. Not so for Damon's realm. The Sith Lord saw a day with 32 hours as a chance to get in another work shift. Stealing back into her chambers, Kara hung the ragged sheet that served as a door and reached for the gold-stained bag. 
For all the technology it contained, the Bothan's bodysuit had folded up nicely. The label was just inside the seam. Siracept. Kara hadn't been gone that long from Republic space, but somehow, seeing something as simple as a familiar commercial trade name felt refreshing. And a stalwart firm, at that. As the Sith had advanced farther on the outer rim, other corporations had tried to deal with the new locals, usually to their ultimate regret. The more vital to Republic security a company was, the more the defense ministry usually had to cajole it to relocate. But Cirrusept had repeatedly pulled its operations back from the frontier without being asked. Maybe it was because their whole stealth systems business was about staying low and keeping out of trouble. Whatever the reason, Kara was overjoyed to see the suit now, even in its despoiled condition. Her supplies from the Republic were limited to the clothes she wore and the lightsaber in her knapsack. That was never supposed to have been the case. Jedi Master Vanertrice's venture into Daemon space was supposed to have been a surgical strike, short and well supplied. An inspiring figure, Trees had led volunteers into Sith space several times, taking upon himself missions the larger Jedi Order could no longer perform. The Sith in the outer reaches had grown so robust that the Republic, already weakened by the Kandorian Plague, had largely written off everything beyond an inner security cordon. It had even deactivated the interstellar relays that allowed communications with the outside. Whole swaths of space lay abandoned. The Republic government and the Jedi Order weren't against Teresa's raids. The need for them was obvious. But the woman who headed both bodies, Chancellor Janera, knew well that her fearful people wouldn't tolerate her sending large groups of Jedi Knights on offense when all were needed to protect the home front. Teresa had cleverly found a way around that. Each standard year, Jedi Knights had been serving three months on Lion Order Patrol and nine months at the frontier. But sixteen days were allotted for travel between those assignments, a figure that remained the same even as the boundaries of the Republic contracted. And, as in peacetime, the travel arrangements remained in the hands of individual Jedi Knights. That had given Trees an opening. There were enough Jedi volunteers in transit at any moment that Trees could usually get a team of them to rendezvous at a jumping-off point. That allowed a few days for a quick raid, usually one where no casualties were expected, before the Jedi returned to their designated duties. The results of Teresa's raids generally pleased the Chancellor. The morale boost came cheaply, all ships and munitions involved came from private contributions. It was a much different reaction than Jedi Knight Revan had received, centuries earlier, in his own extracurricular efforts against the Mandalorians. But the circumstances, Kara recalled, were different. The Sith were evil, the Mandalorians just had an attitude problem. The logistics were complicated, but Vanner Trees had someone he could rely on in Kara. Vanner, she had always been on a first-name basis with him, had rescued her from Aquilaris years earlier, just after that planetary paradise fell to forces led by the future Lord Odeon. Vanner, sensing the child Kara's potential as both a Jedi and a motivated opponent of the Sith, became her sponsor and mentor. She had lost her family, but found a cause. Kara always wondered if he'd given her the work because he'd thought it would be therapeutic for her. No matter, it was. At twelve, she coordinated travel assignments for volunteers. At fourteen, she helped him raise donations. In the last three years, she'd taken charge of outfitting each group, making sure everything from blaster power cells to med packs were aboard ship in abundance. In a short time, Kara had learned everything necessary to run a volunteer paramilitary organization, all while working to become a Jedi Knight. It had been a busy adolescence. But she'd never joined any of the raids herself. Vanner had forbidden that while she was still a Padawan. Returning to Sith space was too emotional a mission for her, and Vanner knew it. So for years, she'd lived vicariously through him and his allies, taking some solace in the knowledge that she, in some small way, was helping the people she'd left behind. When Kara became a Jedi Knight the day before her 18th birthday, Vanner had remained reluctant to send her into action. But a dire warning from Sith space had taken that decision from him. Vanner called upon every Jedi available for a vital mission on extremely short notice. Kara was available and, as it proved, essential. Kara had found the addition of fieldwork to her duties enormously satisfying. 
All those forgotten, busy weeks preparing the way for others to strike at the Sith suddenly gained amplified meaning. Now she was the weapon, finally to be used in places she'd fled from when powerless. If anything, she prepared even harder for the mission. With Vanner and the other volunteers at her side, she'd have everything she needed. Today, on Dark Nell, what she needed was them. And they were gone forever. The mission at Shiloh had been a disaster. Everyone had been lost. Everyone. Damon's forces hadn't even been the cause. Vanner's team had become trapped in the madness that was Sith space. The problem with making only occasional forays into the region was they didn't know what they didn't know. Vanner had valued surprise in ensuring that his Jedi Knights got in and out quickly and safely. But he'd forgotten that he could be surprised, too. Only Kara had survived, with none of the weapons, medicine, or supplies she had so carefully gathered. They, and the starship they'd arrived in, had disappeared into a sea of fire. Kara didn't even know how to get home. She'd memorized the hyperspace route they'd taken into Damon's territory, but that terminated at the planet they'd raided, a place now under such heavy guard she could never return to it. She'd been tempted to end her own journey soon afterward. Residents lived in constant despair, and meeting both Damon and Odeon confirmed for her that things could never improve. Death was better than survival for those living underfoot, and, perhaps, for a Jedi alone. Better to go down fighting. It had taken making friends here, including one surprising, selfless individual, to change Kara's trajectory. You're no good to us dead. Vanner had always told her. That applied, too, to the people living under Sith rule. She was no good to them dead, either. Suicide by Sith wasn't the answer. She had to live. In a curious way, Kara's change of heart had been like another Vanner Trees raid. It stabbed into the darkness that had clouded her soul and offered hope. Defeating the Sith wasn't the point, helping the people was. Fighting Sith was certainly one way the Jedi could help the downtrodden, but it wasn't the only way. Yes, the people needed bold, dramatic acts of the Vanner variety, but they also needed more than gestures. They needed things that did immediate good, a tall order for a team of Jedi, much less one acting alone. She'd have to manufacture her own opportunities. That required a plan. Planning, she was good at. Kara was already in Damon's realm, he became the first target. Her feelings against Odeon were stronger, but for that reason she didn't trust them. Anger over her childhood's premature end had already led her astray once. Damon was younger, and while he wasn't as physically powerful as his monstrous sibling, he was, in his own way, just as much of a threat. Damon was a creature utterly without empathy. At the Academy, Kara had studied the notion of solipsism as it related to Sith teachings, none other than Darth Ruin had expounded upon it years before. Sith philosophy promoted the glorification of self and the subjugation of others. The young lord took it to a deranged extreme, declaring that existence was some game constructed by, what? Some version of himself on a higher plane, pitting Damon's mortal body against artificial obstacles it had dreamed up, like physics and evil siblings. Damon's empire depended on the labor of others, but the lives of the others didn't matter to him. The parasite needed to be separated from the host. But first, its spread had to be contained. Kara found a good target in the munitions industry, which allowed Damon both to wage war and to oppress people on multiple worlds at once. It was better than striking at the military directly. Even if she somehow found a way to land a devastating blow, her worry was that Odeon or another opportunistic neighbor might pour across the cosmic border, hurting more innocents still. Better to rot Damon's system from within, leaving the illusion of strength to his peers, but an empty shell inside. By the time the regime collapsed, she hoped, most of the civilians would be out of harm's way. Her weeks since losing her master on Shalo had included strikes against weapons plants on a string of worlds. In some cases, she'd been able to free the slave laborers and their families, but those opportunities had grown less frequent as she'd approached the center of Damon's realm. In the metropolis, there was no wilderness into which freed natives could flee. But Darknell was obviously her ultimate goal. 
By striking Damon's military research efforts here, she could steal factories on a dozen worlds at once. She'd arrived on Darknell as she had on the other worlds, disguised as an itinerant laborer on assignment. She'd blanched at that more than once. Disguise wasn't her forte. Persuasion, mesmerism, misdirection, these were skills for a Jedi who couldn't master a lightsaber or blaster, not for an accomplished fighter like Kara. Vanner had used those ploys only to achieve military surprise, Kara could hardly stomach going through her daily life undercover. But she'd had little choice. Damon might doubt her sentience, but he knew she was part of the great game he'd devised for himself, and his four sensitive correctors would be able to sense her presence. She had to be on her guard at all times. It had been happenstance that she'd spotted the Bothan while scouting the Black Fang herself, nights earlier. The spy was good, but he'd gotten too comfortable, selecting the same nearby rooftop to change into his stealth gear. She'd simply waited for her chance. His sabotage of the building was a terrific bonus, especially as it came at an hour when only Damon's true believers would be inside. She was almost sorry to leave the spy to his fate, but no ally of Odeon could be a friend of hers. Odeon was both brutal and insipid. It was no wonder half his followers were suicidal. Kara scraped at the fabric of the stealth suit. Tiny raised lines crisscrossed its surface, leaving countless pits in between for its spectral baffles. Most of the paint clung to the ribbed fabric, she saw. It would be a problem. With his main military research lab in flames, Damon would be doubly on his guard, enough so to make her next move impossible without artificial help. But the suit wouldn't be much in the invisibility department without a proper cleaning. She flipped the suit inside out. A manufacturer's label, but no care instructions. That would be too easy, she thought. She was hardly in a position to call the manufacturer. Maybe she could ask someone at work, down at the... What are you doing here? Carrie yanked the fabric close to her chest as she recognized her host's voice. Just, just about to do some laundry, she said, folding the suit over quickly and jamming it behind her bedroll. She turned to find Gubb standing in the doorway, curtain clenched in his fist. So much for privacy. What can I do for you? I remembered I had a message for you. Gubb growled. His voice was a gravel road, aggravated by years, with a tiny water ration. But my granddaughter said you weren't here. Droopy eyebrows flared into a weak scowl. You went out. He says that like it's a bad word, Kara thought. Well, maybe here, it is. I was called for the Wraith Watch, she said. It was what they called it down at the munitions plant, the one shift with no daylight, whatever the season. During sharply tilted Darknell's winter solstice, it was the morbid middle third of a 24-hour night. I had to go in. That's a lie. Gubb yanked at the curtain, ripping it free from the door jam. It fell to the Duracrete floor. Kara edged backward, almost as wary of the little creature's wrath as she was of any Sith Lord. They'd had their bad moments since she'd turned up here offering to tutor his granddaughter for room and board. She was desperate not to let this moment get out of hand. Oh, she finally asked. Yes. He said, staring her down before finally kneeling to pick up the sheet. I know that isn't true, young human, because the message was from someone at your work, someone on the Wraith Watch, asking you to come in this morning. You clearly could not have already been there. Kara sighed. Damon allowed his slaves no communications devices, couriers handled everything, even if it meant productivity suffered by messages being delayed. The odds of someone showing up while she was out skulking were long, but evidently not long enough. Kara searched for words. She didn't want to use the force to persuade Gubb, not when they lived together. He'd figure that out eventually, and she was trying to use the force as little as possible so as not to attract the corrector's attention but she couldn't see what else to do. It isn't the first time. Gubb said, folding the sheet over his arm. Tan sleeps in the same room with you. She knows you leave at night. The girl's been covering for you. Master Tango, don't blame. She imagines you have some great romance going. He continued. Why anyone would choose to bring more people into this world is beyond me. 
Kara stood and managed to blush. Okay, that's my way out. I, I'm sorry. It won't happen again. Gubb straightened on his leg braces. Looking at Kara, he exhaled audibly. Well, we're all to suffer, now. You have to leave to work your shifts, and I expect you back here to tutor Tan as you're supposed to, when she gets home from her work. At twelve, Tan only had to work eight hours a day. And think about me. I shall have to make my own breakfast. At that, the Celestin hobbled out, taking her door with him. Kara plopped back down on her bed cushion and rubbed her temples. More insanity. Shaking her head, she looked at her duffel and gulped. The handle of her lightsaber gleamed in the low light. She'd never stuffed it all the way into the bag on entering. She slapped it fully inside, then punched the bag a couple of times for good measure. One more day without sleep. One more day undercover. And probably a lot more days than that before she could do anything substantive against Damon. She might never survive at this rate. You'll know which skills you need when you need them. Vanner had always said. Well, he was right about that. Kara's worry was that she didn't have those skills at all. Or the patience. Chapter 3 You understand why we're doing this, Brigadier Rusher. The factory administrator said. We're loyal Damonites, through to the core. And that's why we want to make sure we serve his lordship in the best way possible. The red-headed human in the entry hall rocked back and forth on shined boots. Of course. Administrator Labun stared out the apartment window at the dense smoke hanging over the city. I've been running the plastil works here on Darknell since the days of Lord Chagra, or those are the memories that have been given to me by Lord Damon. I'm the first Duros to hold such a position. And I've never been a shirker. Damon created the encumber to serve him, and serve him we do. The tall green figure turned and gestured to his furnishings. I may live better than many, but it makes no difference to me whether my son was created for a place on my production line, or on the front lines of battle. I know why we exist. Oh, of course. Brigadier Jero Rusher looked to the wall and smirked. It was a different story in every Sith Lord's territory, but he'd forgotten what a weird customer Damon was, sowing the fantasy that all creation was the figment of his warped imagination. Rusher had scars older than Damon's twenty-five years, but never mind, those were apparently figments of his imagination. Maybe all those city blocks on fire when I landed were hallucinations, too. But we know our child has talent. Labun continued, crossing to the divan and placing his hand on his wife's shoulder. And that means, that must mean, that a position with you is what his lordship intended for our son. It would be a waste of material otherwise. He looked up, tentatively. Don't you agree, General? Oh, yes. Turning to face the couple, Rusher spoke in his best sales voice. That's exactly why you want your son in Rusher's brigade, Master Labun. There's no place better for someone to find his potential. He fingered his lapel, subtly angling the silver pins on his trench coat so that they glinted in the warm light. The Duros had brought out the extra lumens today, he saw. Indoor light was rationed on Dark Nell as everything else, even for the relatively well-off. We really would like our son to be in a place that challenges him. The prim Duros woman said, pressing green fingers to green cheeks. Off-world. Twirling the brassy knob atop his wooden walking stick, Rusher smiled. They'd reached that part. Of course. And you're probably asking whether going with us is safe. He turned to the calf dispenser, meticulously set out before him. Well, I'm not going to lie, he said, pouring himself a drink. We're at war, and in war, people get hurt. But if you have to be on a battlefield, ma'am, there's no better place to be than next to a laser artillery piece. The brigadier elaborated on the quality of his armaments, drawing pictures in the air with a gloved hand. He'd known recruiters who brought formal holographic presentations, but it never seemed necessary to Rusher. When people in Sith space saw a ruddy, 
reasonably young man with all the limbs he was born with in charge of a military outfit, they inferred some level of competence, or luck. And if that failed, he had a bigger gun. Now it was time to use it. What's more, he said, our shipboard fatalities in transit are zero. No one dies on the way to the fight. No one. He raised the cup to his lips and paused deliberately before continuing. It's because there are no Sith aboard. The Labuns gasped. None? No adepts, no adherents, no lieutenants, no grunts. We're specialists, administrator. Independent militia units like ours are the fasteners that hold his lordship's whole military scheme together. Pairs of bulbous red eyes locked on each other before returning to him. We've never heard of such a thing. No Sith? Rusher sipped cloudy liquid from the cup. Surprisingly, there was a taste to it. Look, you operate a factory here on Dark Nell. Of course, you've got your Daemonite authorities looking over your shoulder all the time, to ensure your progress, check quality, and all that. You wouldn't have it any other way, I'm sure. He waved in the general direction of the spaceport. But the Kelligdeed 5000 cannon is an advanced piece of weaponry. It takes skilled squads of merc, of specialists to land them on the battlefield, assemble them, and put them into action. Setting the cup down, he took the walking stick in both hands. One bonding pin out of place, one power coupler misconnected, and you've got 17 tons of scrap just sitting out there. So we're our own judges of quality. If we don't do the work right on our own, we're already dead. Russia wrapped his cane on the floor to punctuate the statement. Oh, my. Russia grinned. He hadn't needed the cane for years, but the public liked it. Same for the early gray in his sideburns and beard. But we do the work right, ma'am. Like I say, we're experts. We don't need babysitting. We're not a regular part of Damon's structure at all. He caught himself. Which, uh, is, of course, how he intends it. Being the creator, and all. The male Duros sank to the couch beside his wife in disbelief. Rusher could see the words passing silently between them, no Sith. Rusher chuckled. Right on target. Again. And our ship? Why, it's a pleasure palace. You saw diligence on her approach over Zakria this morning. There isn't a better vessel in the sector. I'm sure we wouldn't know. But if you say so. I do. Many do. I built her myself, you know. I've got people who never want to leave, which is why openings are so few. Rusher turned to see an oval-shaped human in the doorway. Ah. Uh, this is Dakit, our ship's master. He'll be taking care of your son until he's assigned. Assigned to one of our gun squads, or, perhaps, to my headquarters unit. Headquarters. Hey. The Labuns audibly cooed. Is that possible? I mean, he's a bright boy. Then there's no telling how far he'll go, Rusher said. Staying out of the main room, Dakit merely nodded, oversized ears crested with tufts of white hair. Rusher heard someone approach from the Labuns bedchambers. Ah. Uh, here comes our soldier now, I think. Taller even than his parents, teenage beetle Labun strode confidently into the room, wearing a fresh pair of neatly pressed work dungarees, standard uniform for youth laborers. Nodding to his parents, he offered a mock salute to the visitors and leaned against the calf cart, which promptly gave way under his weight, collapsing along with the gawky kid and several pots of beige water. Administrator Labun looked at his son, mortified, as his wife knelt to help pick up the wreckage. Bound for your headquarters unit. Dakit whispered to Rusher in the doorway. We'll be lucky if he doesn't take out the whole ammo magazine, Rusher replied. Shooing his aide to the outer hall, Rusher gave the Labun some time to compose their child. But, turning back, he saw there wasn't enough time in Darknell's ridiculous day to manage that trick. While his mother dabbed at the stains on his shirt with her handkerchief, Beetle tried to extricate his hand from a tin carafe. The operation took nearly a minute, 
time during which the administrator's face grew longer than it already was. Sorry about that, sir. The squirming boy said. You should see what happens to my setup when the bombs start falling, Rusher said, summoning the smile again. And tell your parents not to worry. Like Garbellian said at Averam, war ain't a talent show. The Labuns didn't bother to confer. I think we're settled on this, Brigadier Rusher. The father said. Our boy will be in good hands. Rusher beamed. Very glad. He slapped a hand on young Beetle's shoulder. Welcome to the team, he said, shaking the boy's still dripping hand vigorously. In the same movement, he edged Beetle aside and looked directly at the administrator. There's just the matter of terms. The elder Labun straightened. I was expecting this. You manage Damon's hydraulic lift factory. Diligence needs some new drives. We need four or five. Six! Came a voice from the hallway. We need six new drives, for our offloading assemblies. Rusher gently but forcibly sat Beetle down on the couch and continued to speak over the teenager's head. Their key to getting Diligence safely off Dark Nell, with your son, of course. Of course. Administrator Labun said, dryly. It will be, difficult. All we produce is for Damon, of course. And that's who we're fighting for. This is how it works, he didn't add. He didn't need to. Five minutes later, Rusher eased out of the Labun's apartment, walking stick at his side. Dackett was in the hall, waiting for him. Rusher tossed him the cane. Nice enough place, he said. Then that has, sir, then that has. Dackett smirked. Damon lets them live like that? Guess he throws a few crumbs to the true believers. And a good thing, for us. Rusher nabbed the data pad from Dackett's waistcoat pocket and located an address. You'll have what you need by nightfall, whenever the blazes that is around here. Rusher began walking down the hall when the ship's master called out. Oh, yeah, there's something else. What is it? Novalo just called from diligence. Dackett said. She's chased down that problem on the port landing assembly. Wasn't the Jimbles after all, we need the hydraulic accumulator on that side changed out before we lift off again. A complete replacement? Rusher scratched his beard. She can't jerry-rig something? Negative. Pricey. Yeah. Tell her it's covered, Rusher said, cocking an eyebrow as he turned back toward the apartment door. Let's see if they've got any other kids. Narsk woke up. That fact alone meant they didn't know who he was. The fact that he still didn't know where he was, though, meant he was in very deep trouble. The Jedi had been true to her word. She hadn't locked the garbage bin. That hadn't made it any easier to get out of, though, with his hands bound behind his back. It had taken painful minutes to force his way out, and even then he'd landed on his bad leg clambering down. His cry had attracted the attention of Damon's sentries, checking out the speeder bike debris on the nearby skybridge. Bound and half-naked, Narsk wasn't likely to escape attention. Damon's thugs had rounded up a number of individuals from the streets of Zakria in the hours following the destruction of his testing center. Narsk had met some when they were hauling him away in the transport. Most were homeless invalids, unable to work, Damon usually didn't bother to liquidate those. As the first day had passed, he'd grown more confident. They'd all gone to the sentry station on administrative wave for questioning, where a corrector had interviewed each of the bystanders. Several vagrants were chucked down the front stairs of the station to the street, excused from further questioning. Narsk had hoped they'd do the same with him. Waiting for his reprieve, he'd finally given in to sleep that evening. A mistake. For later that night, he'd woken not in the seamy cell of the station, but strapped to a stone table wet with sweat in a marble-walled room. He was almost relieved when four of Damon's burgundy-clad correctors entered. It meant he was still on Dark Nell. He'd had a nightmare of being found by Odeon, furious over his failure to rescue the secrets of the late, lamented Convergence. No wonder he'd awakened with drenched fur. 
Correctors buzzed in and out of the room through portals visible to him only as black spots at the edge of his vision. The straps were so tight he couldn't turn his head, and it was what was inside his head that held their interest. Nars couldn't imagine how he could have confused the Jedi with a corrector. The correctors walked around broadcasting their presence through the Force, making sure he knew they had the ability to enter his mind at will. The Jedi, meanwhile, hadn't put any mental pressure on him at all, probably for fear of being spotted by correctors. But she would have seen them coming, Nars thought. No wonder she's been able to hide here. The correctors departed for a moment, allowing him to think more freely about what had happened. How long had the Jedi been shadowing him? She had to be Kara Holt. Had she just happened upon him? Had she told anyone else he was there? Did they have her now? The answers mattered. She could give him away. You. An Arcanian accented voice said, Narsk rolled his bloodshot eyes back to see the purple cowl of one of the correctors who'd interviewed him before. You were found in Manufacturer's District without leave, without clothes. I told you, Narsk said, I was mugged. It's why I don't have my work permit on me. He repeated yet again the details of his cover identity. Machine tool operator. Transferred from Nilash. Trying to arrive at work early. The words seemed to form a structure of their own in his mind, a protective surface covering his true mission, and the truer, more secret mission beneath that one. Narsk saw the Arcanian's white, irisless eyes widen as the corrector leaned over him. Another mental invasion was about to begin. Suddenly the familiar figure leaned back, to be replaced by another, just out of his sight, behind the head of the table. This is the one? As my lord knows. As my lord knows. Narsk lurched against the restraints, nearly cracking his clavicle. Lord Damon. There is something in you. Said the same voice from the sunrises and sunsets. Golden talons molded to human fingertips scraped the side of Narsk's face. There is something in you. It must come out. The correctors had rifled through Narsk's mind in anger. That was an assault he was mentally prepared for. Compartmentalization exercises had helped him to bury what was important, and their eagerness to prove their dominance, the Sith adepts had missed everything important. But Damon seemed indifferent, casually riffling through Narsk's mind with all the interest of a window shopper. I created this mind. Damon seemed to say. The unspoken words echoed in Narsk's flared ears. Damon believed he had created Narsk's mind, just as he might have programmed a droid, and while he might not have immediate access to all the information in the Bothan's head, the Sith Lord felt perfectly within his rights to go looking for it now. An unbidden image appeared in Narsk's mind. Dark hair. Brown skin. Glistening, determined eyes. And green light. The Jedi. Damon released his mental hold on Narsk, who had never once seen his captor. The errant knight is here. Damon said, startled. On Dark Nell. Narsk's whiskers bristled upward. For the first time since the night before, something in the mess had worked to his advantage. They haven't caught her yet. Maybe they won't. Yes, Narsk said, panting, his mouth dry. It was a woman with a lightsaber. His eyes narrowed. I feared to tell you, my lord. Her presence here, I didn't understand it. It frightened me. I tried to run when I saw her. Tried to warn someone, the story flowed seamlessly into his tale of a random attack. His shame, he said, had prevented him from revealing all before. Such a person should never have bested a true Damonite. Damon stepped back from the table. Nars hoped he was considering the story. It was almost too much to hope for to be set free. But if there was anyone he needed to convince, Damon was the one. Narsk's heart fell when another corrector entered from another portal. The spy heard Damon inquire. What is it? As my lord knows. The new corrector said, using what Narsk imagined was a standard form for addressing the theoretically omniscient. A package has just been discovered on a rooftop near the testing center. It was hidden beneath a vent cover. A bundle containing clothes and a travel permit. The hollow imprint matches the prisoner. As my lord knows. 
so he had been near the testing center, kilometers from where he was found? As my lord knows. The shadow of Damon fell on Narsk again. Only this time, the shadow was not cast by light, but by darkness. Narsk struggled. He'd been told he could only protect his secrets from Damon with a wall of will, a defiant insistence that his brain was his, and his alone. You're not sentient. Damon said in his mind. Don't pretend to be. Narsk screamed. They're here for the girl. Kara froze on the steps when she heard her neighbor's voice. Tall, shadowy figures had just entered Gub Tango's apartment at the far end of the long basement hall. She couldn't make out any details about them, but they'd certainly attracted the attention of the other residents still buzzing in the halls. They're here for the girl. Not waiting to inquire, Kara twirled and dashed back up the steps to the streets. None of it made sense. She hadn't felt any malevolent presence while entering the Borat Warren that was Gubb's apartment block. And Damon's correctors weren't exactly keeping a low profile. Far from it. She'd seen them, earlier, in the transport station making examples of the poor wretches they'd rousted from the factories. They'd been doing it for five days, at every shift change so the commuters could see. None of the harassed had anything to do with the destruction of the testing center, but she figured Damon probably knew that. Two of the faulty encumbered had been ripped from her own workplace earlier in the day. One had recently criticized the work schedule, the other, a Snivian grandmother, had accidentally used an offhand expression invoking the spirits of her ancestors. Both were candidates for a public form of correction involving alternating bouts of mental and physical abuse. Spectacle always served Damon when something went wrong. Kara had wanted to leap the platform and do something, there and then, but she'd learned her lesson since Shiloh. Gub and Tan didn't deserve to be endangered over something they knew nothing about. It had been risky even moving in with them. After arriving on Darknell, she'd looked for someone who needed a border, then, their home had seemed the perfect cover. But now, as she ducked outside, it felt like the worst idea ever. She couldn't make this mistake again. Vanner had said it. Keep saying, next time, Kara, and someday there might not be one waiting. Kara doubled back behind the apartment building, an iridium processing plant long since retired. The idea of using an old factory for housing always seemed noxious to her, but she was glad of the place now, with its many ways in and out. The two ankle-level windows of Gubb's place lay ahead, just behind the sad little norets he'd planted to supplement their rations. Kara had never entered this way in daylight before, but there wasn't any choice. Seeing Tan absent, Kara slipped in and examined her duffel. Yes, everything was still there. Fingering her lightsaber, she listened for the voices beyond the recently replaced privacy curtain. Gub was out there, along with someone else, voices excited, but not distressed. Tucking the weapon into the deep pocket inside her work vest, she allowed herself to breathe. Maybe it's not so bad after. Hey! The curtain jerked back, causing Kara to reach abruptly for the bulge in her vest. Wide black eyes peered up at her from waist level. Kara relaxed as she recognized her young charge. You scared me, Tan. I didn't know you were home. The Celestin girl said. But I'm glad you are. Normally a bundle of energy, Tan was nearly bursting today, her yen jowls curled upward in absolute joy. They're here. They're here for me. Kara could only look down in puzzlement as the girl grabbed her by the wrist and yanked her into the main room. Seven eyes suddenly stared back. Old Gub stood before two taller beings in the doorway. A male grin peered at her curiously, his trio of dark eyes curling on leathery stalks. The other, an ishy tib female, gave a squawk of mild surprise, her lidless yellow eyes shining in the low light. Both, Kara noticed, wore blinking cybernetic implants at their temples. Pardon me. Gub grumbled, turning away from the visitors. He glared at Kara. What were you doing in there? I didn't see you come in. Didn't you? Kara changed the subject, hoping you would forget. Who are your guests? She bowed her head toward the visitors. 
The grand seemed pleased, leaf-like ears wiggling above his implants. Ah. You must be the tutor. His face curled into a tiny smile, about the most his narrow snout could manage. Lurlarjum, at your service, and my colleague is Irafa. We're from Industrial Heuristics. Carol looked at the badge proffered by the Gran. Your salespeople? Certainly not. Lurlar said. Beside him, the star-faced Ishi Tib gurgled something like a guffaw. Somehow, the cybernetic devices were allowing them to communicate. Gub, unhappy at the interruption, glared at Kara. They're the reason I took you in, human. They're talent scouts. Gub said. Here to see Tan. Talent scouts. The stresses of the previous minutes evaporating, Kara's eyes narrowed. The twelve-year-old Celestine spent her mornings in one of Damon's scavenge plants, disassembling the technological detritus of decades past for salvage. But even the supervisor at that miserable place had noticed Tan's acuity with electronics, loaning the girl operator's guide data pads found in Republic Rex to peruse. With Gub too busy discovering the creator of the universe in scraps from the trash, he'd hired Kara to teach Tan how to read. Any advance in her skills might mean a softer future. Assembling blasters, perhaps. These visitors, however, had more in mind. Kara looked more closely at the Ishi Tibbs badge, of a kind she'd never seen before. The identification allowed newcomers to move about on dark now, it would be worth getting hold of one, she thought. She'd never heard of industrial heuristics either. Damon dissolved most corporations he captured, but she'd seen a few commercial names operating in his space. This was a new one. Our headquarters is in Lord Bactra's region. Lurlar said, sensing her confusion. Lord Damon has generously provided a dispensation allowing us to recruit in his territory. Not for nothing. Kara thought. You're taking Tan away? We mean to transform Tan. The jade-skinned Ishi Tib squawked something in evident agreement. This morning, Lurlar went on. At her place of work, we evaluated her proficiency on the advice of her superiors. And we have determined to a mathematical certainty her talent, her destiny. That which makes her special. The Grand clasped his bony hands together. Bombsites. Bombsites? Yes. Lord Damon's fighters use precision-guided munitions, but for the most part, the guidance comes from the weapons themselves. To keep the vehicle small and nimble, as few systems are built on board as possible. That much is true, Kara thought, rolling her eyes. She'd ridden in one of Damon's flying death traps soon after her arrival in Sith space. She was surprised he'd bothered with oxygen. The Grand continued. Generally, gravity-assisted bombs are smart enough to find their targets on their own, but in the presence of electronic countermeasures, it can help to have manual guidance. Lurlar gestured to Tan, now blushing so hard her skin had turned a pale brown. Tan will join an off-world team devoted to developing the next generation of optics. For Damon? Kara asked. For whomever he chooses. Lurlar said. She is his to dispose of, of course. The Gran rambled about industrial heuristics' long history in the sector and how the company had proudly supplied a long list of Sith Lords over the years. He seemed thrilled that Damon would be added to the list. Your leader supplies us the raw materials. We finish the product. What product? Why, Tan is the product. Properly educated, that is. He rested his bony hand on Tan's head. Industrial heuristics is, in its own way, another factory. We manufacture intellects. Tan smiled up at the visitors, and then at Kara. The youngling was ecstatic. This is what I've always wanted, Kara. What we've been working toward. Kara had never known of any specific goal Tan was working toward, she just assumed literacy was good in and of itself. But the girl acted as if she'd been reprieved from a death sentence. Maybe she had. At the same time, though, it seemed like another kind of prison to Kara. And so, it seemed, to Gub. Bomb sites. Gub stared at his granddaughter, his eyes weary. 
That's all she'll learn about. Only that? The Ishi Tib trilled an answer, which Lurlar translated. An engineer is a part like any other. He said. Specialized. Devoted to a specific function. Replaceable, should the need arise. Tan would learn her specialty in a setting with other hand-picked students who would form her work group in later life. There isn't any need for her to learn about anything else. The Grand chuckled. You wouldn't try to boil water with a blaster. Kara steamed. It was all so backward. Tan would be doomed to a life little different from Gubbs, putting Damon's imprint on the past. Almost anything in the next generation of optics, she estimated, would have been discovered long ago. Discovered, and lost, in the interminable years of conflict during which countless universities, corporations, and scholars had been lost. They were constantly trying to rediscover knowledge they, themselves, had destroyed. Where would she go? Gubb asked, looking down. Not seeming to understand why it mattered, the Gren explained that his company had education centers throughout Bacter space, as well as some mobile centers. Of course, after recent events here, Tan might well find an opening closer to home. Damon had proclaimed publicly that the Black Fang had been demolished to make way for a new and better research center. Even if the ongoing public inquisition suggested otherwise, Damon might well be in the market for more brain power. It's what his lordship intends. Gubb said. Limping across the room, he took his granddaughter's hands in his. The old man trembled, holding back tears. You will go. Kara shot the scouts a look as the Celestins embraced. As far as they were concerned, Tan didn't have an option. They wanted her. She would go. And right away. The Ishi Tib waved off Gubb's efforts to give his granddaughter anything to take along. The recruits were being taken to a staging area at the spaceport, Lurlart said, transports had already been sent for. Whatever facility she went to would have everything she'd ever need. And it will be all she'll ever have. Kara thought. But as she'd seen every day, life under Sith rule was a constant negotiation. The only way to improve things was on the margins. Take care, she said, hugging a tearful but happy Tan in the doorway. May the force be with you. Let it be with something out here for a change. Gubb lingered, sad and small, in the doorway. Outside, neighbors parted and watched, amazed, as one of their own escaped. She'll remain a slave. Kara whispered behind her landlord's back. But she'll have an easier time of it. Gubb responded. In a year, Tan would be thirteen, and obligated to work three shifts daily if she wanted to be fed at all. There was no guarantee her next assignment wouldn't be more dangerous. She could even wind up drafted. A safer monotony wasn't a bad thing, especially if it was somewhere else. The old man straightened, his leg braces creaking. She'll have an easier time of it. He said again, almost to himself. As will I. Limping back inside, he found Kara's curtain again. A stiff yank brought it down for the second time in a week. The message was clear. You want me to go? Gubb looked up at her, fat eyes communicating the obvious. The child was gone. Kara was no longer necessary. He took the curtain, now a sheet again, and draped it across the chair where he did his work. Kara looked blankly into the darkened room. Evicted from a closet. Come now. The old man said, depositing himself in his seat before the desk. Now you will be able to work a third eight-hour shift and qualify for a room and ration of your own. But, of course, Kara needed her nights. I'm glad I was able to help, Master Tango, she said to his back. I'll be out in the morning. Tonight. He said, charging his pen against his knee. Chapter 4 We're racing against time, here. Step it up. Scratching his muscled neck, Jero Rusher squinted up at the crane. They were losing the sun, the one sun that did anything, anyway. Damon's eyes had set earlier, beyond the smokestacks west of the parade grounds. 
Now the cannoneer was watching major surgery on the vessel that was his livelihood, and facing the prospect that the operation might have to be completed in the dark. Squatting on what once had been a Buellobal field, diligence resembled nothing more than a mammoth, two-clawed crustacean. Two colossal retro-rockets provided the ship with its footing, each engine the center of a cluster of four giant cargo modules. Large X's when viewed from above, the cargo clusters were joined together by the oversized fuselage of the crew section. Or at least, that was how things were supposed to be. At the moment, Rusher's precious warship was in two pieces, while his team levered up 3,000 metric tons of metal to make room for the new hydraulic accumulator unit the Labuns had sent over. But the old one had to be dealt with first. Watch out! A steel cable snapped with an ear-splitting crack, causing the mass of metal bound to the crane to dangle wildly. Seconds later the remaining cable gave out, rocketing around the pulley and flinging outward, bisecting a metal scaffold in the process. The crane's lopsided cargo fell to the ground, burying itself in the turf and just missing Rusher's chief machinist. At least it was the old unit, Rusher thought. He scanned the scrambling crowd. Who set that rig? Rookie. Rusher didn't need to hear any more than that, and he didn't need to look. It had made some sense, initially. The new hydraulic module had bought Beetle Labun a place in the crew, after all, and the Duro's team had assured them that he'd worked with the equipment in his parents' factory. But it was looking less like a bargain for Rusher all the time. The new recruit scurried past in his two small fatigues, offering something between a wave and a shrug. Sorry, Captain. That's Brigadier. Trooper Labun was already out of earshot, slamming the door to the portable refresher set up at the field's edge. The team had learned earlier in the day that stress did something vile to the boy's stomach. This evening was having much the same effect on Rusher, standing in the long shadows cast by his disjointed creation. If the playing field had ever been under the lights, it wasn't anymore. Soon the only illumination would be what they could generate themselves, and, of course, from those fool holographic statues at the four corners of the field. It was a crazy idea, mounting a full-size troop transport ship on top of a couple of cargo haulers. But the daring design of diligence had made Russia something of a legend in Sith artillery circles. Most methods of cannon deployment in the sector involved shipping guns and their operators separately. That was dangerous on several scores. Often, one or the other wouldn't make it to the battlefield. Or worse, the crews would have to traverse contested ground to reach their weapons. Frequently, artillery pieces were simply dropped from space, with no provision for retrieval. That had been good for scroungers like Rusher, but it was hardly efficient. Some pieces were carried aboard ships with their operators, but the guns tended to be small. Weapons could be disassembled, but as Rusher had seen, another problem came in, most ships unloaded down a single ramp, causing traffic jams as workers got parts into position. Rusher had longed to combine the large, automated cargo pods dropped from orbit with a vessel hauling the gunnery crews. No such ship had existed in Sith space, until Rusher, a few years after leaving Beld Yulon's crew, built it himself. Salvaging a Deveronian cruise liner, Rusher and a sleepless work team mounted the massive ship atop a superstructure bridging two cargo pod clusters. Their modules opened outward in four directions, allowing eight crews to offload weapons simultaneously. Down, gun, and done, he'd called it. Few crews were faster than Rusher's brigade. They'd even solved the problem of shipping long guns by mounting the barrels outside the ship, jutting outward from the cargo pods. That didn't do much for the ship's appearance, and there were few city platforms wide enough to accommodate diligence with all the metal prods sticking out. On the other hand, as Rusher had once observed, in Sith space it didn't hurt to appear to be bristling with guns. That the guns were non-functioning parts of cannons yet to be assembled was their little secret. That's better, Rusher said, seeing Prenda Novalo and her engineers hoist the new hydraulic unit into place. He retreated to the sidelines. They were literal this time, but Rusher usually stood there anyway for these kinds of jobs. 
It was easier on the nerves. Dackett, Novallo, he'd been blessed on the maintenance side of things. No one knew better how to run an artillery carrier in all of Sith space than his crew. And they'd kept him free. Free enough, anyway. Rusher looked to the rumbling skies. More warships were arriving. Independents, like him. There were even a couple of corporate transports mixed in that he didn't recognize. He swore. Something was going on. He'd put in a dark knell for refit and recruiting, not to take on a new mission right away. People just didn't show up on a Sith Lord's homeworld unbidden. Not if they wanted to be able to leave. That's Mac Metagazy. Called a voice from behind as a tone battle droid carrier soared overhead through the darkness. Master Dackett pointed to the vessel, lighting on the other side of the field. What's this about? I've seen what you've seen, Rusher said. It was a problem with working for Damon. Normally, the chiefs of mercenary vessels would gather at local cantinas and compare notes. But Damon had dismantled most services that marketed to the public, unwilling to waste entertainments on those who existed to provide him entertainment. He'd wiped out a key source of information, and a lot of good cantinas to boot. Stepping into the light of one of the Hollis statues, Dackett made his report on the refit. Diligence's unusual configuration put extreme stresses on its frame when landing in high-gravity environments, functioning hydraulic systems were vital. We'd like another two weeks to get the whole thing done right. Two weeks. Rusher looked again to the darkening skies, filled with lights from descending vehicles. Well, do what you have to. As long as we don't hear from his craziness, we should be. Lord Damon speaks. Thundered a voice from above. Startled, Rusher and his aide looked to the holographic statue behind them. Three times life-sized, the figure of Damon had ceased its automated posturing and was now addressing them. Specifically, him. Jero Rusher is destined for the Sanctum Celestial tomorrow at noon. Rusher shot a glance to the dark wall of the palace, looming to the northwest. Do you have a mission for? Jero Rusher is destined for the Sanctum Celestial tomorrow at noon. Meet your destiny. At that, the holographic statue was as it had been before, depicting Damon looking thoughtful and complicated. I regret to inform you, the mission has been scrubbed. Dackett said. So much for your two weeks. Rusher looked at Dackett. Think he heard me? I doubt it. But who knows? It would certainly be an excellent way for Damon to impress his omniscience upon his people, Rusher thought. Eavesdrop on everyone electronically, and then use his virtual personage on every street corner to react. It would be right up there with some of the more effective totalitarian states he'd read about. But, like his aide, Rusher doubted it. He'd never met the young lord, but he'd known people who had. Spying on everyone sounded like too much work for someone like Damon. If you didn't think anyone else existed, why bother? Dackett clapped his data pad against his artificial hand. Right, then. I'll tell Novalo she's working through the night. Tell you what, Dackett, Rusher said. I'll finish the welding. You visit his lordship. No, sir. The older man said, his gapped tooth whistling. Every band has a front man. I just play the pretty music. Rusher chuckled. Front man? Maybe. But even for the so-called independents, someone else always called the tune. When she was a child, Kara had visited the chilly polar regions of Aquilaris, about the only place on the planet where the weather wasn't gorgeous constantly. Even that had been beautiful, with white caps cresting one after another in the fjords. She had spied a lone quadractal, an ocean-going avian creature more at home in warmer climes, afloat in the crashing surf. At first, she thought the animal was in trouble. A white cap would wash over it, forcing it underwater. Seconds later, it would resurface, soggy and closer to shore, just in time to be struck by the next icy wave. It didn't seem to be making any attempt to fly away, preferring, it seemed, to ride along and take what fate, or the planet's three moons, had in store for it. 
Having watched Sith slaves from Shiloh to Darknell deal with their lives, Kara began to think that was what was happening here, too. The people who lived in this sector were like the wretched quadractal, being buffeted by one violent wave of Sith conquerors after another. Blow followed upon blow. And yet the people, like the animal, wrote it out. Some in the Republic felt that the people who lived under Sith rule didn't deserve saving because they hadn't acted to free themselves. It was clear to Kara those people had never seen Sith oppression up close or they would have understood how wrong they were. The power imbalance between master and slave was just too great. There was no practical way for those under Daemon's heel to band together and in fact, gathering together had the effect of making them more vulnerable rather than more powerful. No uprising was possible. And yet, kneeling in the darkness of her soon-to-be former room, Kara wondered if she'd just seen resistance in action. Parents in the Daemonate were willing to endure more hardship for themselves if it meant their children might migrate to a position that was marginally better. Decades of oppression had forced on them such a long view of life that even the smallest step was a mighty leap to freedom. Maybe that quadractal was where it was because it had acted, acted to send its chicks south. It just didn't have anything left to save itself. But Kara had escaped once. And she wouldn't stay now. Peeking outside to confirm that Gubb was at his desk, Kara pulled the folded stealth suit from beneath her bedroll. It was pristine. She'd been given a solvent by one of her friends at work. Ostensibly intended to clean a piece of furniture, the fluid had worked marvelously on the Mark VI. It had taken meticulous effort, mostly after Tan had gone to sleep each night. But the suit was necessary. Essential, in fact, for realizing the value of what she'd gained through her other job on Darknell. Kara pulled the drawstring on the duffel bag. Lifting her few personal items from the top, she emptied the sack onto her pillow. Pouches of glistening gel tumbled into a pile. Beradium nitrite. Enough explosive to send the universe's would-be creator on a journey of discovery through the stratosphere. She brought the explosive out of the factory a little at a time, in disposable squeeze food packets. It had been easy enough, she was supposed to bring her own lunch and pack out her trash. In its fluid form, it was less prone to accidental detonation than other explosives, and she probably didn't have enough to pull off what the Bothan had done at the Black Fang. But as a Jedi alone heading up against a Sith Lord, she knew it didn't hurt to have backup. She hadn't known what to do with it all, before the other day. Damon himself had given her the key, in his vain insistence that everyone hear his voice daily. On one other world, she'd heard his message declaring the sunrise. Listening again the last two days, she'd heard it again, the same phrasing as off-world, except for the parts about the day's duration. Surely, he didn't record different ones for every world he held, and she wasn't aware of any communications network in Sith space that equaled the one that the Republic had deactivated on the Outer Rim. Both meant that Damon's voice was being simulated, and simulated locally on each world. Obvious, really, but she'd never thought about the corollary. If Damon vanished tomorrow, the rival Sith Lords whose rampage she feared might not find out about it for a long time. Damon's correctors would want to keep their jobs, which meant they would pretend nothing had changed. But in fact, something would have changed, Kara thought as she refilled the bag and cinched it shut. Life wouldn't improve dramatically, but a daemonate without a daemon would be something that would help many people at once. Kara took a last look around the room and stood to depart. Daemon would vanish tomorrow. And it was about blasted time. There were worse things than death. Narsk's aunt had told him that, raising him alone on Verdant. Near the juncture of three sectors and situated on a major hyperspace lane, the planet was desired by many a petty princeling. Indeed, several had declared themselves Sith Lords immediately upon taking the Green World, as if the title Conqueror of Verdanth meant anything. It usually didn't. Verdanth's masters seldom lived long. But they always survived long enough to do serious damage to the population of the world, a diverse patchwork of transplanted peoples. The Bothan community on Verdanth had suffered less than others, if only because of the species' penchant for intrigues. 
More stubborn races had refused to submit when the Sith first invaded. Their survivors saw each successive wave as something to be resisted with all means. A noble thought. But ownership of Verdant was changing almost annually. Defiance of all invaders earned only extinction. The Bothans, meanwhile, submitted freely to whichever Sith warlord they estimated had the upper hand. Their instincts were so good, observers said, that one could track the balance of power in the system simply by looking at who had the most Bothans in his or her camp. Being on the losing side meant death. But that wasn't the worst part, as his aunt had put it, it meant that you'd guessed wrong. Understanding the relationships between others and accurate reckonings of power and where it lay, these were the things that made one a Bothan. Narsk's aunt once described a tribe of feral Bothans, found untold years after a crash on a deserted planet. They had no spoken language, but they could rank with exactitude the numbers of various kinds of predators in their surroundings. To be a Bothan was to be always on the lookout. Narsk had taken those lessons to heart. While a slave for successive Sith lords on Verdant, he'd managed to find chores that bettered his perceptions. The sloppy job of harvesting rhymebats led to assignments tracking escapees. Those led to missions as a non-military scout and, finally, a saboteur. All the time, he'd kept his eyes on the Sith players and the best traditions of his people. The quandary came when two particularly pugnacious rivals chose to settle the ownership of the planet in a duel that left them both dead. The resulting power vacuum put many Bothans off kilter. There was no reason to expect Verdant would stay free from Sith rule for more than a few weeks at most, and yet the planet-bound Bothans had no real way of gauging the relative strengths of powers yet unseen. The only real way to know which Sith Lord to back was to strike out into space personally and have a look. Nars did. And never returned. He'd found a wondrously complicated political scene. A patchwork of dominions and dependencies ruled by despots with secret connections and histories of betrayal. It could keep an industrious Bothan busy for a lifetime. For Narsk, it had. And now, it was all over, because he wasn't on the lookout. The Jedi was a wild card, but he should have known she was there. He'd been on Darknell a month, assessing the potential hazards. Even if only one person on Darknell knew she was there, he should have been the one. He noted, ironically, that he probably had been the first to know she was there. But that information had come too late to be useful. And now that Damon had, through him, become the second to know, Narsk wondered why he was still alive. He'd remained on the slab for days without food, tasting water when a torture session involved it. Damon knew now that Narsk was an agent for Odeon. Once Narsk realized that Secret was gone, he'd relaxed his defenses, allowing the Sith Lord to see everything in his memories since his arrival on Dark Nil. The assumption of the cover identity, the scouting of the testing center, the many forays inside. That was a tactic he'd been taught, too. Once a secret lost its value as a secret, it could be used to shield other truths. He'd flooded Damon with details that didn't matter anymore. It seemed to have worked. Apparently satisfied, Damon had left him alone. Several times the young Sith had sensed the importance of a female human in Narsk's memories, but from his remarks, Damon had always assumed it was the Jedi. Damon was no better than the sentries, Narsk thought. They only see what they're looking for. Now, though, Narsk saw only imminent death. He had nothing more to give, nothing he would give, anyway. His execution was at hand. For correctors entered the room, releasing him from the table and shifting his limp, half-clothed body to a circular metal frame. His feet and ankles were fastened to its perimeter, splaying his body across its width. The correctors tipped the device on its side, wheeling Narsk down one of the narrow, darkened hallways. With nothing to support his neck, Narsk's head hung backward as the frame rolled. Dizzily, he saw a blur of light ahead. His eyes adjusting, Narsk realized it was a wide indoor area with a skylight above. With a bump, the correctors rolled his circular rack onto a small platform built to lift something in anti-grav suspension. Lofted into the air by an unseen force, Narsk saw the people in attendance and realized that his aunt had been right. He guessed wrong. It was not an execution. And there were things worse than death. He had become a stage prop.
Chapter 5 The young lord shimmered, resplendent in his plumage. Damon's preference for shining attire was well known, but today's coppery cape had something extra going for it. Every time the Sith Lord stepped between his viewers and the skylight above, small prisms in the great folds of the garment refracted the noon sun, throwing brilliant colored light all around the adidum. And here, in this enormous heptagonal shrine within the Sanctum Celestial, everyone was beneath Damon. Seven crystal catwalks led to a suspended platform in the center, directly beneath the skylight. Each of the seven midair entrances sat in the middle of an alabaster column, curling upward toward the ceiling and forming, with the skylight, a replica of Damon's sun and tentacles emblem. The walls between bore ornate relief carvings of Damon throughout history and prehistory. So did the floor, where those waiting attendants alternately looked up at their lord and down at their feet to keep from tripping on the uneven surface. Only Narsk was close to Damon's level, but the Bothan didn't feel very honored. After the correctors had used the anti-grav generator to lift his circular prison several meters in the air, they'd done something to apply some spin. Now Narsk tumbled gyroscopically in the air meters above the others, in the space between two of Damon's catwalks. It had been like this all day, bouts of violent rotation punctuated by occasional slowdowns during which his body was right side up. Narsk supposed it was to keep him from passing out. For the first time since his imprisonment, he was glad he hadn't been fed. The brief respites had given him a chance to survey the hall, though, and those inside. Damon had stalked the catwalks for hours, seemingly brooding on some aspect of creation or another. Occasionally, he retired to the oversized plush mass, more a bed than a throne, resting in the middle of the suspended platform. Narsk thought he sat like a youngling, his legs curled up underneath as he idly kicked the ends of the cape. No, not a child, Narsk thought. An adolescent. Beyond a few aggravated sighs, Damon had said nothing at all. He had, however, vanished twice into one of the exits for a wardrobe change. Narsk figured something must be about to happen. The sighs were becoming more like groans, and each outfit had been more outrageous than the last. There must be company coming, Narsk thought. I can't believe this is what he wears around the house. The audience below had gotten no more attention from Damon than Narsk had. There were correctors there, and a few elite sentries. They stood, waiting silently on their master, as did a wustoid woman Narsk took to be Damon's aide-de-camp. Narsk didn't recognize her, but no spy could ever keep track of Damon's palace lineup. She certainly hadn't been hired for her charm, he saw, every time he revolved to face her. Orange-skinned with bound magenta hair, the spindly thing looked like a black hole was sucking her face from within. All the engineering teams in the sector couldn't construct a smile out of that raw material. Narsk couldn't figure it. Damon seemed to prize beauty in his household. But then he had another thought. It must be this way when you're in love with yourself. I heard that, spy. Narsk's frame whirled around long enough to give him a glimpse of Damon at the edge of the platform, raising his talon-tipped hand. Seconds later all Narsk saw was blue pain, as force lightning racked his shaking body. As the attack subsided, rivulets of energy crackled off the side of the rack. You think you've hurt me, don't you? Don't you? Kate billowing, Damon stalked the edge of his platform. Below, several listeners on the lower floor stumbled, trying to keep up with him. You haven't hurt me at all. He railed. In fact, my little nothing, you haven't changed my course a wit. Narsk found his mouth too dry after the attack to respond, but it was just as well. There was no right answer. No, you and the Jedi woman have given me exactly what I wanted. I just didn't realize it at the time. Damon said, kneeling and eyeing Narsk. I don't always see the plan I started with until later, but I always do. Already dizzy, Narsk shook his head. How did Damon's followers stand such double talk? Uliita. Damon called. Is the connection ready? Beneath, the Wustoid spoke. As my lord knows, the heretic Bactra awaits on the priority channel. The woman, Narsk saw, never faced Damon when addressing him. 
Instead, she craned her neck and directed her bulbous ebony eyes toward the skylight, as if Damon were living in the rafters somewhere. Well, he kind of is, Narsk thought. Ulita glanced at her handheld control pad and looked up again. She spoke cautiously, as if fearful to offend. Bactra likes to be called Lord. As my... What he likes is pointless. Activate it. Activating. Should we remove the prisoner? No. The answer sent a chill shot back down Narsk's back. Whatever was about to happen, it didn't matter if he knew about it. He was still dead. The rafters of a Sith Lord's entry hallway were not the place to be pawing at one's armpits. And yet, Kara couldn't stop herself. It was good that getting inside the Sanctum Celestial was so easy because she'd had to fight a small war just to get into the stealth suit. The skin-tight garment was functioning properly, it had gotten her past 8th century posts so far. But there wasn't anything comfortable about it. The planners at Cirrusept had thought of a lot of things, but making one size fit all species and genders wasn't among them. The Bothan had been slightly shorter, and while Kara wasn't overly endowed, she had to take extreme measures to get the fasteners closed. If she had to die somewhere, she'd already be mummified. On the other hand, there was too much room in the mask where the Bothan's hairy snout had been. She'd folded part of the fabric inside and pinned it in order to cinch the mask closed, leaving a bizarre chevron-shaped beak above the mouthpiece. She was positively thrilled no one could see her. Now, as Kara crept from alcove to alcove, every step reminded her why Jedi didn't wear bodysuits. Her regular clothes, stuffed in the tote bag just beneath the explosives, were loose-fitting and comfortable. Kara doubted she'd have wanted the suit even if it were in her size, but she also knew she never would have gotten far without it. She'd broken into Sith strongholds before, but keeping Damon and his correctors from noticing her through the Force took extra concentration. The suit was her edge. She just wanted her edge to stop digging into her midsection. Kara had only ever seen Damon's stronghold from a distance, its obsidian walls tracing long lines around Zakria's centermost point. Tall pylons flanked a gateway on each of the seven sides, Kara had simply picked the nearest. She'd wondered once why Damon didn't have some towering, vertical roost from which to survey his surroundings, as he had on Shalow. A co-worker at the plant had explained that since Damon had created Dark Now, he had no need to look down on it. Kara had barely stifled her laughter then. So he's got a wall. If we don't exist, why does he need it? She'd imagined the walls enclosed some kind of open space, perhaps a courtyard or a lake, with a smaller castle somewhere within. Instead, she'd found that the great gateway was actually a door. The walls weren't a divider, but the outsides of the largest building she'd ever encountered. The structure was recent, raised in the few years since Damon's ascension to power. Kara was flabbergasted. So much of Zakria was old, dating back to previous Sith Lords and before. What had Damon put his building resources into? The biggest shrine to arrogance ever, easily surpassing for scale and gaudiness any of the industrialists' mansions she'd visited when raising money for Vanner. Those people's homes were temples to their own achievement, but only in a figurative sense. Damon's actually came with bar reliefs of himself creating the universe. And yet, changing her route to avoid yet another hall of mirrors, no telling what those would do to the stealth suit, Kara found the place strangely empty. It was a temple without worshippers. Enormous ballrooms and dining halls had clearly never seen a dancer or a diner. If Damon wanted ostentation, he seemed not to understand what it was for. It pained her to see it all now, to think of the people whose lives were wasted in erecting the place. Kara had forgiven the lip service given in public to Damon's creatorhood, but she'd never understood why so many people she'd met also did so in private. Gub, for one. He was more than twice the Sith Lord's age. She wondered if there was a specific day on which everyone on Darknell stopped rolling their eyes when they spoke of Damon's myth. It must have been some long time earlier. It always confused her. If no one else but Damon existed, as his thinking went, why would he go to the trouble to indoctrinate anyone? Why would he care? She'd only met Damon once, but she knew enough from their short exchange to guess. 
Damon could see into the minds of others using the Force, but he didn't take that for proof that they were independent beings. He assumed that any contrary thoughts in their heads were part of the galactic puzzle he'd created for himself to correct. It was just one more thing to fix, another victory condition to satisfy. He wanted the droids around him to know they were droids, organic or otherwise. And if that meant spending five years building an atrium that took five minutes to traverse, so be it. Even if the builders were the only others who would ever see inside. Interesting as Damon's home was as a psychological study, it was ruination for Kara's plans. Feeling for the beradium nitrite in the pouch, she looked around in exasperation. Even if she could find Damon, she'd need a shuttle of the stuff to bring this place down. Hearing activity atop a stone staircase, Kara slipped over the banister and dropped into a crawl space. They weren't sentries, this time, but soldiers. About a dozen figures of various species, all in different forms of military dress, followed a protocol droid down the steps into an atrium. Certainly not Damon's usual high-fashion troopers. Kara gawked, unseen, at the ragtag bunch. What would possess any band of mercenaries to work for a schizophrenic monomaniac? It didn't matter. Inside the mask, she smiled. Take me to your leader. Nice to see you through something other than a rangefinder, Rusher said, jabbing the tongue with a gloved hand. Eating pretty well over on the Javarno loop, I see. Olive and Ovoid, Mac Metagazi smirked. Haven't had to face you in a while, Russ Russ, Rusher. He said, massive belly wobbling as he extended a long, thin arm to the brigadier. Kept the replacement costs duh duh, down. Having spent their working lives trying to kill one another, not all the militia leaders in the subsector got along. But Mac was easy to like. Because he was a droid runner, casualties were never personal for him. And perhaps to avoid the characteristic tone and nervous stutter, he always kept his remarks short, offending few. Not so for some of the others in the party, Rusher saw. Like Karsong the Tagorian, who insisted on being called that, as if anyone could miss a two and a half meter mound of hairy anger. The feral looking mercenary insisted on pushing his way to the front of the group, nearly bowling over their electronic guide in the process. What's the hurry, Tog? Rusher asked again. The Sith Lord's house was endless, the meat could be kilometers away. Karsong snarled, whiskers flaring on either side of his angular muzzle. Waste your own time, human, not mine. Leader of a brigade of shock troops, Karsong complained again about being called to a briefing in person. Foolishness. Then why are you here? Got to be other Sith lords who can keep your muzzle full of chow. Several mercenaries edged back from Russia, in case the Blackford giant snapped. But Karsong kept walking. My business. Emerald eyes glared back at Russia. I sure know why you're here, rock thrower. Damon won't fight bad brother Odian one-on-one. -on -one. He's looking for somebody even more gutless to make him look good. Well, he has you there. Mac said, giant lip curling. Rusher didn't push it. He already knew why most of them were there. Several of the Indies had lately come from the service of the other side. The brigadier had been smarter than they were in that regard. It was Odian avoidance that had sent Rusher into business for himself, years earlier. Beld Yulon had been everything a mentor should be. A fine artilleryman, he'd also cultivated an interest in military history among his recruits. Young Rusher had learned not just about the engagements, but the reasons why they were fought, and how, in many cases, the decisions of a single person could have led to different outcomes. Rusher would have stayed aboard perspicacity forever, had Yulon not lost his children to the plague on Faustin 9. The general's mourning became depression, culminating with a religious conversion, he'd become an Odeonite, a member of the Dread Lord's death-seeking cult. Rusher had begun to suspect and the general started throwing caution to the wind, committing squads to ever more dangerous assignments. The forces, lurch ratio, or percentage of warriors left stranded, had gone skyward, with hundreds of troops abandoned to their fates. Finally, when Yulon announced that the brigade would be taking a job from Lord Odeon, Rusher had seen enough. 
At least Damon believed in a tomorrow, if only so he could have a chance to take credit for its arrival. If even steely operators like Carsong were coming to that realization, things must be getting bad indeed on the other side. Hold here. The droid said, pausing in a chandelier-filled room. Gilded double doors sat beneath a marbled arch in the eastern wall. His lordship is in conference with his other creations, but your time will come. Sad tongue eyes rolled toward Rusher. Goo 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 to know. Max said. Yeah, I feel blessed. The mercs had stopped short of the grand entryway, jabbering and drooling at the riches of the anteroom. Statues, paintings, chandeliers, surely more wealth than they had ever seen, Kara figured. Still, they'd brought her to the right place. She'd been cautious not to dip into the force for anything, but she couldn't miss the evil taint that lay ahead. It could only be Damon and his closest aides. But there was no easy frontal assault, not with the crowd of warriors and sentries lingering there. Slipping past the rearmost member of the party, a fortyish red-bearded human in a trench coat, not entirely oafish-looking, Kara made for a narrow spiral staircase at the left side of the room. Upstairs, the steps finished in a candlelit hallway, leading toward a bright opening. Hearing voices, Kara edged toward it, cautiously. There he was, at the end of a long, crystalline catwalk, little Damon himself, announcer for the morning rush hour. It looked like his rumpus room on Shiloh, only grander, and suspended above the ground by pathways that formed a seven-pointed star. It was, by far, the strangest room she'd seen in the building. And what was he wearing? Kara knelt in the doorway and breathed lightly. Her respiration didn't make the slightest difference inside the Mark VI, but it didn't matter. She'd found the center of the madness, right where she left it, with Damon. And for a change, Damon's taste in architecture would serve her. If she could walk to the central platform, Kara thought, her homemade bomb might have more than its explosive impact. It might well turn the crystal catwalk and platform into a million splinters. The shape of the room and ceiling might well focus the impact, giving her a running chance to escape. That was worth the risk. Reflexively, she looked to see who else was present. The aides she expected, of course, all slavering below. And just to the right of her catwalk something else floated, the Bothan spy, strapped to a rotating wheel. She'd expected to find him here, although she was surprised to see that he still seemed to be in one piece. For a while, anyway. Tough week to be you. There was something else, just on the far side of Damon's perch, that had his full attention. With a start, she recognized the hologram, another Sith Lord. The Cormian, Lord Bactra, towered in the life-sized image, his shriveled white head craning on his long, narrow neck. She'd studied him, back in the Republic. What did Damon have going on with someone like Bactra? Whatever it was, it wouldn't be going on for long. Stealing herself, Kara stood and took a step onto the catwalk. It is refreshing to see the Lord Damon again. The flickering Cormian said. Especially after the troubles you've described. The image of Lord Bactra brought his azure fingers the meter and a half up to his lofty chin and smiled. The skinny titan kept his second pair of arms within the folds of his rich cloak. For one of the sector's smarter Sith Lords, Narsk thought, Bactra was doing a good job of playing dumb. So far, in this conversation, he professed to know nothing about the destruction of the testing center on Dark Nil. That surely wasn't so. The mess at the Black Fang could have been seen from orbit, Narsk guessed, and even Sith who weren't open enemies kept an eye on one another's affairs. I assume the figure I see there is the perpetrator? The saboteur is here. Damon directed the hovering holocom to take a shot of Narsk in his spinning prison. Do you recognize him? Bothan. No, I don't. Bactra said, lipless mouth never changing its shape. But their kind tends to meddle in things that are above them. Narsk swallowed, or tried to. The only things above him at the moment were his feet. And middling, he knew, was something Ayano's Bactra worked at doing without ever seeming to take a side. He'd stayed out of the conflict between Odian and Damon, both of whose territories bordered his own. In fact, 
Narsk knew, the ancient Cormian had gone out of his way to avoid destructive battles with most of his neighbors, preferring, instead, to accumulate more intangible holdings, corporations. Several of the interstellar firms that had continued to operate in the sector under Sith rule were headquartered in Bactra's space. Quietly, Bactra's influence among his neighbors had grown. A less thoughtful strategist might have become a supplier to one side or another, but Bactra understood that clumsy partisanship would have earned him enmity. A Sith expected an arms dealer to sell secretly to all sides, so Bactra did it openly and equally. And when contested worlds fell and their manufacturing interests fled, Bactra's space just happened to be there as a convenient haven. Chaos served Bactra. As it was serving him now. I gather that the sabotage creates a weakness in your technical capacity, Lord Damon. Purely temporary. Damon lay back on the plush bed, staring at the skylight. Of course. But it is a problem in the near term. Bactra said. Consider what you could do if you held the solution as I do. Industrial heuristics? The one. Narsk knew that Damon had recently begun allowing Bactra's firm to recruit in his territory in exchange for some of the fruits of research his people produced. Now Bactra offered Damon something more immediate. From what your aides told mine, you're prepared to consider a further expansion of our franchise. I don't see a better way. Damon said. There are reports my brother is considering building a second factory complex, even larger than the spike. He sat up, his cape a crumpled mass. An axiom is the answer. I require one delivered. The rotation slowing, Nars considered what he just heard. He recognized the name. Arxiums were an industrial heuristic invention, giant mobile universities dedicated to the war-making sciences. Students sometimes spent their entire working lives aboard a single Arxium, churning out new military designs. The clever aspect was the mobile part. By making Arxium spaceworthy, the company had made it possible for the valuable facilities to move, should conditions warrant. But what Damon was suggesting was new. Industrial heuristics turned students into researchers in a lot of places, but all were in Bactra's realm. Damon was asking for the outright purchase of a working Arxium shipped directly into his space. No information sharing, this time, Damon's people would be building weapons directly for him. Not bad, Narsk thought. The Black Fang had taken years to build and seconds to destroy. Damon had just figured out how to replace it in days. What price must that come at? Bactra was ready with the answer. I require passage across your territory to strike at Vela's Pavo. Temporary, we do not intend to hold the world. Six weeks should suffice. Damon stared. Vela's Pavo was unoccupied by any Sith Lord, Narsk knew. The Sith Lord looked to his Wustoid aide down below. Why does he want this? Gadolinium. Ulida replied, temporarily muting the conversation. As my lord knows, Bactra controls three of the four largest superconductor interests in the sector. The fourth sources most of its gadolinium from Vela's Pavo. By striking at the mining operations, Ulida explained, Bactra expected to take out a competitor. As my lord knows. Damon sneered. Bactra hasn't changed. Play for third, hope to win. My lord knows. Damon stood from the bed and approached the holographic image. You have your passage. He said. But I would want to unite the recruits your firm has already found here with the facility as quickly as possible, that they may begin work. Is there a suitable frontier world for the rendezvous? Bactra paused, referring to something off to the side. We have a number of facilities that could reach your territory quickly. There is one near Turgaminion. Alpharesis. Gazari. Gazari. That sounds well. Narsk's prison suddenly sped up again. This time, when the rack turned him upside down, it stayed there, whirling him faster and faster. Fighting against passing out, Narsk looked for a fixed point to focus on. 
All he could find was one of the seven darkened doorways leading from the adidum, a blot behind the crystal railing of the catwalk. The faster his prison rotated, the faster the doorway flickered, until the vision of it persisted. The doorway, and something just inside. An outline. A figure. Nars blinked, sure he was hallucinating. He'd only seen something like it once before, and the black fang whenever he looked at his own hands. The Jedi. Jedi? Damon looked back from the hologram with a start. He scanned the faces of his followers below. Which one of you? Damon's voice trailed off. Never mind. Turning the Bothan upright again, the rack slowed. Narsk swallowed, taking care to shield his thoughts. The Jedi had the stealth suit. And she'd come here, of all places. The Jedi had come here for some reason, and what was more important, only he knew about it. The young lord had known for several days that Narsk had used a stealth suit to enter the testing center, and that the Jedi had taken it. The fact that she was here meant that even with that knowledge, Damon had no proof against it. For the first time since his capture, Narsk managed the tiniest smile. What might a word of warning mean now, coming from a condemned prisoner? I might get out of this yet. Chapter 6 Kara was glad for the stealth suit for one thing, no one could hear her swearing. Certain now of her invisibility, she stood gawking in the doorway. The place was impossible. There was no way she could reach Damon's loft-like platform at the center of the great room to deposit the explosives. Even if she could stay hidden within the force from him and the correctors below, Damon's silly cape was throwing all kinds of light everywhere. She had no idea what the effect would be on the Mark VI. That left affixing the explosive packets to something physical and tossing them inside. But she wasn't sure she could get clear if she just tossed them over the side of the catwalk and ducked back outside. She wanted to stop Damon, but she wasn't going to throw her life away. And Bactra's appearance had thrown her. Kara wanted to end Damon's oppression. But, she realized, while standing in the doorway, there was another reason she'd come to Sith space. She wanted to understand. What was it that made brother fight brother here, destroying the lives of countless innocents underfoot? What was the role of the other would-be Sith Lords? Could they stop this madness between Damon and Odeon, or were they just making it worse? Kara cocked her head. The mask had provisions so she could see and hear what was going on outside, but she needed a straight shot at the speakers. Damon kept moving, and the hologram was on the far side of the platform. That's the side she needed to be on. She ran back down the hallway she'd entered through. There were six other entrances to Damon's room at this level. There had to be some route to one of the doors at the other side. But where? Blast. Facing the doorway again, Narsk squinted. He couldn't see the Jedi anymore, but that didn't mean anything. That he'd seen her at all was an accident, a trick of the light, generated by the freak combination of his motion and the crystal walkway between them. Behind him, the conversation with Bactra was ending in a deal. Damon mentioned his plans to travel aboard his flagship to Gazari to meet the Mobile Research Center. Hearing Damon end the call, Narsk steeled himself to raise his voice. One way or another, this might be made to serve his. Suddenly Narsk plummeted. The middle frame he was bound to bounce once on a cushion of anti-grav force and struck the floor. Two Gamorrean sentries stepped to either side, guiding the prison, wheel-like, toward an exit. Get him out of here. He could hear Damon say from behind. Tumbling, Narsk watched helplessly as a crowd of others filtered into the adidum, past him. Strange faces, alien species he rarely saw in the Damonate. Wait, he croaked, his dry throat too raw for his voice to carry far. Wait. Rusher didn't think long about the torture device being wheeled past him, or the poor soul strapped to it. Other Sith Lords like to do things for show, and Damon certainly seemed to fit the breed. Rusher looked mildly back at the chattering Bothan as the door closed behind him. Rough day to be you, pal. More interesting was what lay ahead. The Sith Lord stood suspended on his crystal platform, gesticulating before a huge planet hanging in the air before him. It was a holographic image, 
five meters wide. Motioning, Damon wheeled the cloudy gray world around, reaching in occasionally to touch the image with his talon-tipped fingers. At every brush, a light burst from the surface of the pseudo-planet. Cauldron of creation, Rusher thought, looking around the heptagonal temple. Everything he'd heard about Damon was true. The Specialist Battalions Damon addressed the company of generals without looking at them. You will depart Darknell at sunset, each jumping to different destinations. In four days, you will reassemble here, on Gazari. Damon spun the virtual globe again and gave it a shove. The holographic world danced through the air before drifting to the marble floor, just ahead of Rusher and company. The lights shining through the clouds were each marked with unit names in Damon's alphabet. You will deploy your forces at the locations being shown to you now. Memorize them. Karsong the Tagorian peered at the hologram. This is where we're setting up. Where's the enemy? Odeon will arrive thereafter. Damon said offhandedly. I have arranged for it. The Nosaurian, another gunnery leader, emitted a series of warbling squawks. Rusher didn't know the language, but he figured the question. How do we know he won't bomb us from orbit before he lands? Reacting to a nod from Damon, the Wustoid woman stepped beside the floating image. Lord Damon created Gazari to be a volcanic world, shrouded in a cloud of metallic ash. Your emplacements will be quite invisible when the great enemy arrives. Beneath the haze, Gazari's pockmarked surface was ridden with lofty ridges overlooking wide rills, providing excellent spots to set up for an ambush. Sounds like a lovely place, Rusher thought. He and the others only had a minute to study their assigned locations before the image vanished. Ambush. That's about what I expected. Karsong turned on a massive clawed foot and began walking toward the exit. Damon looked down, clearly puzzled. What? The Tagorian turned back and stuck out his armored chest. It's what I expected from you. Like on Shalot. Odeon's people are still talking about that one. Rusher noticed others stepping back from the Tagorian. It seemed a good idea. But Damon reacted mildly. You expect fairness, do you? I expect a straight-up fight, but I heard you don't do those. Looks like they're right. He reached for the gilded doorknob. A spray of multicolored light flashed against the door in front of Karsong. Turning his head, he saw Damon's lustrous cape thrown in the air, catching the sunlight from above. Its owner, Freed, hurtled downward toward the floor. Karsong pivoted, reaching for a blade hidden in his belt, only to see a flash of crimson ahead of him. Before he hit the ground, Damon quartered the massive alien with two great strokes of his lightsaber. For several moments, Damon looked down in seeming fascination at the disgusting remains at his feet. Finally, he looked up. Where's my cape? Damon's attendants sprang to his side, delivering the requested garment as he deactivated his lightsaber. What was he? Karsang. Uliida said. He led shock troopers, as my lord knows. Specialist Unit 207, in our accounting. His transport, the Darush, is at the north end of the old parade grounds. Send correctors there and induct the lot. Rusher winced. Karsong's warriors had just become part of Damon's slave army. I'm telling you, there's a Jedi here. I have to talk to Lord Damon. The sentries didn't speak. The burly Gamorreans simply continued to wheel the imprisoned Narsk down a hallway, ignoring his every plea. Narsk wondered for a moment if this was why he got into the Black Fang so easily. Does Damon only hire the deaf? More likely, he thought as he heard their guttural grunts, they simply didn't understand basic. He tested the theory with a remark about Gamorrean females. A further stream of insults confirmed it. There was literally no talking to them. Leaving the main thoroughfare, the guards rolled Narsk's prison down a side hallway. Darkness lay ahead. For a time, Narsk felt only the bumps of the tiles as his prison rumbled onward. Back to the dungeon, he assumed. Then he was alone. Narsk blinked. 
The Gamorians had parked his will against the wall and wandered off. The Bothan craned his neck forward and behind, straining to see anything down the hallway. Nothing. Four five minutes. Just leaving me? Fine. If this was a new kind of torture, it was working. Nars granted. Days with no food and only enough water to keep him talking. Days of mental invasions from the monomaniac and his minions. And today, spinning on display like a child's toy. All of it came pouring, foully, out of the Bothan's mouth. Until an unseen hand clasped his muzzle shut. A foreign thought touched his mind. Shut up. Startled, Narsk felt the wheel turning again. Propelled seemingly by nothing at all, the frame rolled down the darkened hall and through an open doorway into a deserted service passage. The door closed behind, leaving him in a small, dim maintenance area. An unused scullery for one of the countless dining rooms he'd been wheeled past, he expected. The wheel stopping gently against the wall, Narsk smiled. You've come to return my property, I hope. That depends. Kara said, removing her mask. On what you tell me. And how quickly you tell it. The remains of the Tagorian oozed untouched on the temple floor. Damon donned his cape, unconcerned, the generals parted to let him pass. You will deploy to Gazari in four days. He resumed. More vessels will arrive. Remain in your positions. You will not disturb them. With a wave of his hand, more holograms appeared, depicting several ships. Rusher studied them. There were four personnel transports, each labeled with the corporate logo of industrial heuristics and a much larger structure. A floating cluster of connected towers, the city in miniature also bore the climbing arrow logo that symbolized the manufacturer of intellects. He'd heard of the firm, back when working in Bactra's territory. A few on his crew had even learned their trades there. An axiom, he spoke aloud. Some kind of war college, isn't it? And our personnel to be trained within it. They will arrive first, before the facility. And then? Damon said confidently. Odeon will arrive. Rusher flinched. Why? He will come to destroy the facility Bactra sends. Or he will try. He will certainly know of it. Damon didn't say how. And he will know we are sending our bright young prospects there to meet it. Industrial Heuristics has been recruiting openly on Darknell for days, and my brother is known to have spies here. Damon said, waving off-handedly toward the entrance. You met one as you entered. You're using the training center as bait, Rusher said, looking down at his walking stick. The knob atop it glinted as he twirled it in place. And, the students. Yes. Damon returned to the center of the room. He will not attack when the facilities are in Bactra's hands. He'll wait until the delivery is made, so the loss will impact me and not Bactra. It was a standard move for Odeon, Damon said but as ever, he was the better gamesman. He must see the recruits waiting on the ground to seal the illusion. What do we do if he doesn't take the bay bay, bait? Max stammered. He will. I have arranged for it. Damon gestured, and a shining staircase descended from the crystal platform at the center of the room. Setting foot upon it, he was interrupted by a statement from behind, I'm not sure I like this. Damon stopped climbing. What? I said I'm not sure I like this, Rusher said, grasping the walking stick more tightly. Spying Max's wild expression, he shrugged. No, I don't know what I'm doing, either. You're taking younglings on the battlefield, and you're expecting them to be taken out. And I'm expecting you to do as you're told. Damon crooked his head slightly in irritation. Who are you? Brigadier Jero Rusher. I carry eight battalions running medium artillery, laser, and missile. I've worked jobs for you for years, he said. But I'm an independent operator. Damon's response dropped below freezing. As you've just seen, there is no such thing. Rusher swallowed. 
He could feel the Sith Lord supplicants glaring at him, and it didn't help that the other generals were edging out of the way. Some colleagues. We're not part of your army, Lord Damon. That can be corrected. Damon said. To one side, the violet-clad correctors took a step forward. He waved them off. This moment was his. I created you, Brigadier. The young Sith said, raising his metal-tipped hand. You will function as I desire. Yanked by an unseen power, Russia rose several meters into the air. The walking stick clattered to the marble beneath as Rusher's gloved hands clutched at his neck, just above his collar. There was nothing there, but he could feel the presence of Damon's hand. Even the false fingertips, clawing at the back of his neck. Shaking, Rusher coughed and kicked, and tried to speak. I'm, just doing, what you created me to do. The pressure subsided slightly. Still suspended in midair, Rusher watched Damon step toward him. Mismatched eyes looked up. What? Rusher's mind racing, his mouth moved to match. Having autonomous forces was your idea. We were created for the purpose. Your purpose. Damon lowered his hand, and his victim dropped violently to the floor. Blonde eyebrows tilted in amusement. Tell me the purpose. Damon said, smirking. Ignoring the shooting pain in his shin from the rough landing, Rusher fought to get to his knees. We look different. You can't send your regular forces ahead to Gazari without him sensing a trap. Any ship can be disguised. And the truth is, Rusher said, shifting gears, you'd rather rent than own. What in blazes are you talking about? I'm saying you've got more important things to think about, Rusher said getting to his feet. There are too many details to running an artillery brigade. Details I have designed. And that's the problem, Rusher said, searching for his retail smile. You worked so many complexities into this universe, Lord Damon, that it's hard for us lesser beings to cope. Not all organics are up to it. He slapped his chest. You created us specialists to manage these systems, and our own affairs, for greater efficiency. We're like anything else you created to work your will, he said, just a little different. Rusher watched the Sith Lord, burning eyes still set on him. They really did look like the double stars outside. The brigadier stepped over to retrieve his cane. And you know what's really amazing, he asked. It all works. The variety you've designed into the universe is really something. Genius, really. He looked back at Damon. As my lord knows. Damon stood stone silent amid the generals and correctors. At last, he spoke. You have your assignments. Prepayments of ordnance and fuel are already being delivered to your ships. He turned back toward the stairs. Leave me. The sentries opened the doors outward. The generals didn't waste any time stepping over the Tagorian's remains. Where'd you go? Kara lifted her mask and faced the Bothan, still bound to the round frame. He seemed perturbed by her disappearance, as annoyed as she'd been at his unwillingness to talk earlier. He only agreed to trade information for his freedom and only after he was freed. I'm not in the business of helping Jedi, he'd said. I'm not in the business of freeing Sith spies. She'd thought. Hearing approaching voices, she'd headed back into the hallway just in time to see Damon's procession depart the heptagonal temple, heading in the opposite direction. If Damon was at the front, she hadn't been able to see him. But where else would he be? Where is he going? I can answer that. The spy replied. And you know how. Kara groaned. Seeing no alternative, she came to a decision. Hold on. Wait. Wolp. Kara started the wheel moving again, careful not to upset anything as she rolled it through the storage area. The kitchen outside looked as though it had never produced a meal, and yet the larder was fully stocked with fresh food and shining cooking implements. While everyone outside works three shifts for a ration. She thought. Is this really necessary? Cut me down from this thing. 
Just let me do this. There's a way out of here, but you're in no shape for sneaking around, she said. Now, about Damon? The Bothan fumed. He's going to Gazari. He said, finally. Aboard Eridaminos. Gazari? Kara's brow furrowed. She thought back on the intelligence reports she'd seen in the Republic. The world sat in a wedge of Daemon space between Bactra's territory and Odeon's. Does this have to do with what's going on with Bactra? Yes. He said. And that is? Only once we're outside. Kara slid up to a window and looked out. There was the flagship Aerodaminos parked on a rooftop within the compound. The boarding ramps were down on the vessel and she saw the massive rear engines outgassing. It was a ship preparing to travel. Kara opened her pouch. The explosives were there, beneath her clothes and lightsaber. Yes, she thought, it might be easier to do away with Damon aboard a ship. As inviting a target as the temple had been, she'd still have the problem of escaping from what was, in effect, corrector central. How much easier would it be to decapitate the regime from the comfort of a life pod on the way to someplace else? It'd be nice to do something easy. For a change. Sealing the pouch, she returned to the Bothan's torture wheel. He saw her coming. I'll tell you the rest, but you have to take me with you. Wherever you're going. The spy's voice stirred with emotion as it had back on the plaza nights earlier. I owe Damon now, Kara. You must take me. Nope. What? Kara kicked open a door and grabbed the side of the wheel. I don't work with Sith. And I don't work with people who work with Sith. This again? I don't. I told you, there's only one way to get you out of here, she said, releasing the great wheel and walking toward a corrugated metal door. With a heave, she forced it open, revealing a long stone trough leading downward. Down, and out of Damon's compound, terminating in the mountainous refuse pile that abutted the south wall. No. Seeing the long chute below, the spy writhed. Don't. If it's any consolation, she said, I don't think those bonds of yours will survive the landing. I don't know why, but it looks like the guards loosened them. She positioned the circular rack on the open ledge. His eyes burned with anger. You'll regret this, Jedi. I'm not what you think I am. So long. She gave the wheel a shove. Only Mac had bothered to wait for Rusher. Using the cane for real, this time, Rusher stepped past the sentries at the gate and looked up at the black wall behind him. Damon's favorite sons had just set, he saw. Diligence's crew wouldn't have much time to get packed up to move. Master Dackett wasn't going to like this at all. There wasn't any thought of not taking the assignment. Not if Rusher ever wanted to set foot in Damon's space again. And one never knew. If Damon's gambit proved successful, it might all be Damon's space before too long. Mac looked up at the human and smirked. Really, Rusher? You'd rather rent than own? It's what came to me, Rusher said, stretching his bruised leg. Just a little sprain, he'd walk it off. It's not my line. Admiral Veltra said it about irregular units, back in the ancient times, Rusher said. A little history comes in handy. I thought you'd convert it for a MOMO moment. Don't worry, Mac. I'm not about to start wearing gold armor and chanting. Suddenly the two heard a blood-curdling scream from off to the right. Scanning the ramparts, Rusher saw nothing as the cry trailed off into silence. He cinched up his trench coat. Crazy place. And that Damon's the craziest of all. Mac said, covering his mouth. Not much to like about this biz biz, business. Oh, I don't know, Rusher said, straightening his collar. We get to face Odeon. His death cultists want to be blown up. Makes for a short workday. Aerodaminos was Damon's flagship in the classic naval sense. Kara had seen larger, more powerful vessels in the Yen Lord's fleet, Era was more a cross between a battleship and a pleasure yacht. But Era bore Lord Damon, and that unlucky fact gave it its distinction. 
It had been surprisingly simple for her to reach the ship before Damon's entourage. Giving up on navigating the labyrinthine palace, Kara had found her way to the rooftop. It had been an easy traverse from there in the stealth suit. By the time the first train of bearers arrived with Damon's luggage, she was already safely on board, hiding in a service area beneath a deck grating. The service tunnel was a close fit, but she found several passages branching from it to other areas of the ship. She'd been relieved to find one leading to an unused galley, as it meant she could take her time and pick her moment. And in the tunnel, she wouldn't need the stealth suit every minute of the day. She hoped Damon wasn't bringing many adepts sensitive to feelings of hate, because she was coming to absolutely loathe the accursed suit. Settling in near a grating, Kara turned up the suit's audio sensors. She could just make out Damon and the Wustinade passing somewhere in the company of his sentries. As my lord knows, the Bothan spy is missing. She said. The Gamorians left him as instructed. He was not there when they returned. Your lord knows. Damon said to his aide. I knew he'd find a way once we left him alone. An intrepid little beast. Quite entertaining. Beneath the floor, Kara pursed her lips. She thought the Gamorians had loosened the Bothan's bonds before they'd left him alone. It didn't make much sense. Hearing the engines of the vessel throttle up, Kara strained to catch Damon's final comment before he went out of earshot. All proceeds according to my design. Kara looked at the explosives sitting inside her bag and smiled. Just wait, Dark Lord. Let's see you design your way out of this. Chapter 7 The tortured ground pointed up, turrets of Sarasian iron pointed out, and down. Standing in the spotter's nest atop Diligence's hull, Russia regarded the sight with pride, wondering if this was how gardeners felt. Of course, he planted death, rather than life. But in Sith space, that seemed to fit. Hours earlier, it had been a rusty ridge, untouched by organics. Now cannon barrels lined the eastern edge of the Bowl Valley, the weapons planted just inside the stalagmite line by his busy crews. Taking macro binoculars from one of his aides, Rusher looked along the ridgeline. There were the Nosorians' long brocade cannons, just going into the north. Lower down, Mac was positioning his droids as best he could, given the many crevasses in the landform. Rusher had seldom deployed in such challenging terrain. The, the valley was actually an ancient crater several kilometers across, their ridge was part of the eastern wall, broken several times by tectonic action and meteor strikes. The curious stone shards rising from the ridge had made finding an elevated place to land diligence difficult. Rusher guessed they came from acid rain, generated by the same volcanoes whose smoke gave Gazari its low ceiling. Weather seemed to come in only two kinds here, rain, or ashfall. Watching black and moats flutter by, he was thankful they'd gotten here during the latter. Rain that could give a crater teeth was something he didn't want to be out in. Below, he saw what the combination of the two had wrought. The floor of the crater was a tarry slick, a featureless sheen stretching to the corresponding ridge far away. Damon had perched his vessel on the northern crater wall, even now, his elite troops were setting up temporary structures down in the valley. Or trying to. The surface slurry looked ankle-deep. Rusher could see the Damonites struggling in the terrain. But the idea was pretty clever, Rusher thought. By raising decoy tents and depots there, Damon stood a chance of convincing anyone landing that the terrain was manageable. Lost moments in the valley would give his irregulars the advantage. The planet looked as if it had been created specifically with an ambush in mind. Of course, Damon would say he'd done exactly that, Rusher thought, rubbing his neck. He turned his attention back to his own forces. Rusher treated deployments like a science, but visually they had the artistic appeal of a dance. They'd parked diligence in a clearing behind stone spires a couple of meters high, just tall enough to screen their cargo operations. Landing on flat ground to permit easier unloading, they'd activated the precious hydraulic lifts to tilt the nose of the crew compartment downward, providing Rusher's rooftop command center a better angle on the valley. Now, before any enemies were even in the system, 
the real operation was underway. With the ramps on diligence's two cargo cluster feet pedaled outward, all eight battalions hit the ground simultaneously. Squads of rifle-toting troopers emerged first, setting a perimeter. Scouts followed on their speeder bikes, examining terrain and checking for mines. Then the majors, Russia always fancied the old Republic ranks, emerged with their headquarters units, conferring electronically about deployment zones with their spotter counterparts on diligence's roof. The big machines came last, wheeling out the bases of the larger pieces and bringing down the long barrels from their stowage spaces outside the ship's hull. There were no assembly workers in Rusher's brigade. No gunners, either, for that matter. As specialists went, Rusher was a committed generalist. Every laborer who built the weapons was also rated to operate them, and anyone who wanted the fun of firing one had to build the emplacement beforehand and tear it down after the party ended. Artillery pieces were complicated enough that an intimate understanding of them was necessary at every step, from assembly to use to retrieval. It was something he'd learned from old Yulon, back in better days. If a turbo laser blast took out half your people, you didn't want to lose the only ones who knew how to shoot back. Or how to lift off in a hurry. Still, there was the occasional irreplaceable component. Rusher saw his, perched down on the cargo support and screaming inaudibly at teams on the ground. Master Ryland Dackett was the reason things looked choreographed rather than chaotic. He'd spent his life helping Sith shoot Sith. Enough, Rusher imagined, to qualify as an honorary Jedi. He was getting results, as usual. Everything was moving nicely. Engineer Novalo was out giving diligences clubbed feet a once-over. Tunbadon, the creepy Sanyasin running Saranife battalion, was scaring the blazes out of his team, no wonder they were always the first to finish deploying. This could be done in record time, despite the terrain. A light on the northern crater wall caught Rusher's attention. He redirected the macro binoculars to see Damon emerging from Era Daminos. Gone was the spectral cape from days before. Today's Damon was downright demure, decked out in a royal blue flak jacket and leather leggings that tucked into knee-high boots. Dressed for a fight, Rusher thought. Or maybe the weather's just too rotten for the draperies. Scanning away from Damon's departing entourage, Rusher thought for a moment he spied movement beneath one of the flagship's cargo ramps. Something seemed to stir there in the falling ash, almost like a frosted phantom. Zeroing in, he looked again. Nothing. Rusher wrapped the macro binoculars twice against the railing. Get these checked, he said, passing them to an aide. If there's one thing I'll need today, it's eyes that work. It had been the most frustrating journey Kara had endured since arriving in Sith space. Hearing Damon board his starship while on Dark Nell, she'd assumed she'd be able to find him later just by looking for the biggest room. Not so. Era Daminos lacked any lavish pleasure dome like the one in his Sakrian compound. She'd heard a rumor on the work line that Damon didn't care for spaceflight. She couldn't imagine him having a weak stomach, maybe the so-called creator of the cosmos simply felt inadequate actually seeing it up close. That was as good an explanation as any for the fact that there was no hint of Damon in any of the major cabins with views to the outside. He didn't seem the sort to cocoon himself in a meditation chamber, but after the third day and night, she'd actually begun searching rooms that small. Again, no luck. Maybe he stores himself in deep freeze to stay all shiny. She'd thought. Worse, while the service tunnels were both deserted and extensive, the one place they didn't seem to go was toward the reactors. Then again, that might have been for the best. Era was well fixed for kitchens, but it came up short in the life pod department. Evidently, Damon's life was the only one that mattered. There was no easy way to blow up the ship and escape. So she'd waited. The beryllium nitrite packs were swiftly becoming the most traveled explosives in the history of guerrilla warfare. By the fourth day, when Era had grown to a landing, Kara was afraid Damon wasn't on the ship at all. It had been a relief, on finally reaching a cargo ramp, to see Damon's seven-tentacled sun standard hanging outside. 
Several hundred meters across Ghazari's surface, another stood before a canvas dome erected in a forest of jagged pillars. Kara had seen several of Damon's aides milling about, and, finally, the Popinjay himself. The headquarters dome was well within the power of her explosives to destroy. Looking toward the eastern ridge of the crater, she'd seen several more ships parked in the highlands. Lots of options for escape. Things were finally breaking her way. Or so it had seemed. Now, on the ground, Kara realized the destination was more aggravating than the flight. The Mark VI, which had kept her alive throughout her exploration of Damon's Darknell Castle, was almost entirely useless here. The fine particles of volcanic dust drifting through the air found something to love about the suit. Or maybe about Kara. For whatever reason, the ash only clung to her while the suit was activated. It made the stealth suit nothing of the kind. After five minutes walking around on Ghazari, she'd look like a short talls, covered with white dust instead of fur, and with a clipped mask instead of a weird proboscis. I don't care if they see me. Kara thought, ducking beneath the cargo ramp. I'm not going to die wearing this thing. Crouching in the shadows after her impromptu wardrobe change, Kara thanked the Force for her freedom. It was good to be back in her old brown and black outfit again, augmented with her gun belt and lightsaber. And something new, the bandolier she'd fashioned aboard ship for carrying the explosive packets. One wire running to a receiver triggered the whole thing. Folding the stealth suit into the now-empty pouch, Kara strapped the pack around her shoulders and stood. Her bones ached from days in cramped compartments. Her hair, once fine, was a dirty clump. She'd had to wear the Mark VI just to get to the refresher stations aboard ship. Food had been whatever she could abscond with. It had to end. She bolted from beneath the ramp into the open. Time to join the fight. How are we doing, Dackett? Rusher said, amused. It hardly seemed necessary to ask. We can't get Kelly 2-5 out of the hold. The ship's master said, stubbing out a smoldering cigar. Some idiot loaded it wrong back on Winder. Dackett slapped his data pad, jowls shaking as he did. He'd just climbed the six ladder flights to the rooftop without complaint, stopping only to relight. The man was a marvel. Rusher was almost afraid to ask how old Dackett was. He knew the ship's top non-com went all the way back to the days before Lord Mandragal, but... Born during artillery barrage, and conceived there, too. Was Dackett's only line on the score. A pulse cannon was just a giant puzzle to him, he'd helped assemble his first ion cannon when he was seven, alongside his father and stepmother. Rusher didn't know how many battles lay between then and his own first meeting with Dackett, but the brigadier never would have gone into business for himself without him. They'd started with a single gun crew and, Bitsy, a long-barreled heavy laser cannon salvaged from some old derelict. They could barely get her into the hold of their transport back then. Now they ran a crew of nearly 3,000, and according to Dackett's report, nearly everyone was in position, having constructed dozens of guns less than 15 minutes after pads down. Still a few problems with the bulk loaders we salvaged. Dackett said. But, you know, the poor Hydro's running like a dream. Your Duro's boys folks came through. You're welcome, Rusher said. Yeah, well, Novala didn't get everything on our list, now, did she? Rusher smiled. Is it my fault the kid was an only child? I'm wishing his parents had taken a vow of chastity. Dackett gestured toward the starboard side. Rusher pointed the new pair of macro binoculars. There, beyond one of the cargo ramps, sat Beetle Labun in a tracked power loader vehicle, hopelessly mired in the brackish mud. I didn't think there was any of that guck up here on the ridge. He found it. The teenager poked tentatively at controls, one after another, to no avail. Rusher snorted. The recruit had been a total disaster. Most crew slots they traded for equipment had netted them something. Few lived long in Sith space with no skills whatsoever. Beetle's talent must have been stealth, Rusher thought. His virtues had, thus far, escaped all notice. Good day, sir! Beetle yelled, standing in his driver's seat and saluting the ship. 
Right, Rusher nodded, flashing the kid half a grin before turning to Dackett. Please tell me you've already got that pod unloaded. Dackett shrugged. Breathe, Brig. All that's left on that side is the Kallig deed we can't get out of the hold anyway. I wouldn't put the kid on anything that mattered. The master ambled back toward the hatch leading down. Oh, and we should be fully deployed in about a minute. Will you marry me, Master Dackett? Three wives is enough, sir. Dackett said. But if one of them dies, I'll let you know. Era Dominoes brought more people than Kara had imagined. Hundreds of troopers crisscrossed the edge of the valley and erected defensive positions. She'd had a lot of ground to cover unseen, but the rock spires had offered inviting shadows. Gazari didn't seem to have day and night so much as it had blankets of gray clouds alternating with waves of firelit black smoke. Slipping from pillar to pillar, Kara grinned. She loved hunting at night. The winding path to the command dome was working out to be closer to half a kilometer, but at least she was. Hey! Kara looked up to see the glistening black eyes of a Nautilin trooper. One of Damon's soldiers, the green-skinned bruiser held a blaster rifle loosely in one hand and a container of spice tightly in the other. Without thinking, Kara grabbed the surprised trooper's head tentacles with either hand and yanked, pulling his head into her launching knee. The drug and weapon both flying from the brute's hands, Kara drove her shoulder into his armored midsection, toppling him. Staying atop his crashing form, Kara jammed a tentacle into his gaping mouth, stifling his cry. The Nautilin's right hand slapped violently in the gravel, searching. Kara found her weapon first. She ignited her lightsaber and deactivated it again within the same second. <laughs> Kara looked in all directions as life drained from the guard. No one had heard, and she hadn't had to resort to use of the force. Breathing, she returned her gaze to the body in the dirt. The guard hadn't been trying to recover his rifle, but the little container of spice. Dragging the body into a crevice between broken stone pillars, Kara lifted the warrior's rifle and resumed her circuitous trek to the dome. There were sentries out front, but none behind, where the canvas structure abutted the rocky spires. Light inside casting outsized shadows on the fabric, Kara could tell that two people were within. Patting the explosives on her bandolier anxiously, Kara bit her lip. This wasn't close enough. And she had to know who was in the mega tent. She'd seen Damon enter the dome earlier, but that was before her wardrobe change. Creeping behind the structure, she saw an opportunity. While the workers had cleared some of the ground for Damon's command tent, the surface was still uneven enough that light slipped from gaps underneath. Edging toward the dome, Kara took the sentry's rifle and slipped the muzzle beneath the canvas. You're breathing. I didn't tell you to. Hearing the Sith Lord's voice, Kara froze. I am sorry, my lord. The respondent's voice was scratchy and female. Kara lifted the fabric as much as she dared. It was the Wustoid woman she'd seen earlier in Damon's palace. Wearing a silken white dress, she sat atop a silver trunk, staring mindlessly into the bright glow lamp at the center of the room. His back to Kara, Damon stood behind the woman. He was now in a black sleeveless tunic, and his biceps shone with sweat. Kara could never let herself forget that, for one seemingly sedentary, he was an energetic and dangerous fighter. Damon's focus was entirely on his aid, his hands digging into her purple hair. Time to try it again, Ulita. Kara rocked back, nauseated. The last thing she wanted to see was pre-battle action in a Sith warlord's boudoir. But what she heard from the Wustoid regained her attention. Flesh is an atrocity. Ulita chanted. Flesh is a prison. Damon said, digging into her purple scalp. He didn't appear to be wearing the talons. I exist beyond. Form is a prison to keep me from achieving all my mind imagines. But I can transcend the rules I have created with the dark side of the Force. My Force. We are the encumbered. She chanted. You are without the light. Damon intoned. You have form, but not spirit. You are a husk. He brought his hands around, raking urgently at her temples. 
I knew that the first time I saw into another mind. But if I am to transcend, I must expand my reach. I am nothing. There is no Oleida. Only an agency of Daemon. You are nothing, and you are Daemon. I will see with your eyes. Breathe with your lungs. No. Kara recoiled. If this was seduction, it was the worst date she'd ever seen. But she continued to look. The woman was shaking, now, under the Sith Lord's concentration. Kara could feel the waves of force streaming off them. The aide's heart was nearly as black as Damon's. And yet she was letting down all her defenses, burying her will to serve as a conduit for his power. Bulida's right hand, clasped in her lap, trembled and lifted into the air before the light. Very good. My will raises your hand. Damon said. My hand? As my lord knows. Bulida said. I did not will you to speak. The woman went immediately silent. From behind, Damon gripped her skull harder, growing frustrated. No, it isn't true. This isn't real. I'm not the one raising your hand. Bulida paused before speaking. You have told me to, Lord. I am doing it. You do not exist in this. My will should activate your motion directly. Damon said, releasing his hold on her. And look. He grabbed the Wustin's wrist. A pulse. Your heart is beating. Offended, he glared at her. And you're breathing. I'm not willing this. I should be in control. I am sorry, Lord Damon. Bulida said. These things are autonomous. There is no autonomy. Not unless I say so. The Wustoid aide burst into tears, hiding her face. Kara caught a flash of the woman's emotions, still unshielded. True shame. Kara shifted her weight on the rocks. The moment was horrific and yet spellbinding. The woman didn't appear to have suffered physically, but she seemed to shrink as Damon glared at her. It's always the same, he said, simmering. I can animate still objects. I can persuade you to act. But I can't act through you. Damon shoved his sobbing aid violently off the trunk and opened it. I know this can work. I know it. He said, rifling through the chest. The woman spoke, weakly. The holocrons tell of Karnas Muir, an ancient Sith Lord who could enthrall entire populations, making them an extension of his will. He was even developing a method to move his own consciousness from one organic form into another. Damon towered over the woman, crumpled on the floor. It's so obvious. He raved. Why else would I have planted such information in the past if it weren't the key to my escape from this, this prison? Through victory, my chains are broken. The Force shall free me. Damon said, completing the Sith Code. Get up. There's time before the ambush. We'll try again. That does it. Carrie yanked back the rifle and skittered away from the canvas. Furious, she lifted the bandolier over her head. I don't care who finds me. I'm blowing this freak sky high. Command, Recon Knife 2. Rusher tapped his helmet comlink. Go, Knife 2. Aerial contact arriving, 270 Mark. Mark, Recon. Rusher looked above the grumbling volcanoes beyond the far crater wall. There was movement in the clouds. Stay cool, Brigade. This is only party guest one. They'd arrived suddenly, their screaming thrusters reaching Kara's ears the moment she'd knelt over the explosives. Damon's ambush comment and the presence of the armed welcoming party had led her to expect Odian's forces, although why they'd willingly come to such a place was beyond her. But the vessels soaring over the western crater wall looked nothing like warships. Kara slipped the bandolier over her shoulder and crept away from the dome, climbing toward a protected perch higher on the ridge. 
Looking down, she saw four transports hovering over the center of the valley, their retro rockets sending circular ripples across the pudding that served for ground. She'd seen Damon's personnel transports before, on Shiloh. These looked more like commercial vehicles. And the markings weren't Damon's at all. Instead of his symbol, the tail fins of each transport bore insignias she couldn't quite make out. Vertical lines, or perhaps arrows. Where have I seen those before? Kara blinked through the ash. To her left, flashes came from the eastern crater ridge. Macro binoculars, and plenty of them, were trained on the new arrivals. What I wouldn't give for a pair now. Rusher spotted the new contact just as his crew did. They could hardly miss it. The skies wrenched with something new, something much larger, descending into the valley. He shook the ash from his hair. It was helmet time for the brigadier, too. Damon may not have created the universe, Rusher thought, but he certainly ran things to the minute. That's guest two, crew. We're on the timer. What in blazes is that? Kara spoke aloud for the first time since her encounter with the Bothan, days earlier. There was obviously something the spy hadn't told her. At first glance, she thought it was nine different vehicles, descending through the clouds in perfect formation. She'd soon realized it was all one vessel, with nine building-like assemblies the size of city blocks connected into a grid by colossal crossbars. And city was the right term, for as the vessel continued to fall, she realized how vertical the thing actually was, with towers rising from the base structure. Kara rubbed her eyes in disbelief. It was one of the largest vessels she'd seen in Sith space, comparable in size to Damon's mobile munitions factories. Kara gawked as the vehicle, if that was what it was, hovered above the crater floor. Nine mighty engines pummeled the surface, exposing the rock beneath the goo. Finding a spot northeast of the crater center, the complex eased downward, sinking heavily into the remaining muck. Silence. The Jedi shot one look down the hill to Damon's forces near the temporary buildings, followed by another glance at the eastern wall. None of Damon's people seemed to be reacting, anywhere. The first movement came, in fact, from the four transports. Parked a kilometer to the west of the monstrous new arrival, the ships all put down their landing ramps, at the same moment. Kara watched as figures began streaming out of the transports. Straining to see, she finally gave up and crept downward to a closer vantage point. At least so far, Damon's forces on the ground were facing the center of the bowl, paying no mind to the hills. Squinting from her new location, Kara saw hundreds of beings assembling in rows outside the transports. But the ranks weren't orderly, and the figures weren't in military dress. Members of dozens of air-breathing species milled about, kicking and playing in the mud. Younglings. There were hundreds of them. Youths and teenagers, with some young adults mixed in, all enslaved dungarees. All looking excitedly at the sky, the far-off volcanoes, and the giant new city that had followed them into the crater. Each of its nine towers terminated just beneath the low overhanging clouds, each sporting the same three-arrow logo, now clearly visible to Kara. No, she said, standing and nearly giving herself away. Oh, no! She remembered where she'd seen the logo, on the Ishi Tibbs badge, days before, on Dark Nell. And scanning the crowd, she felt a familiar presence. Focusing, she saw exactly what she feared, an animated Celestin girl, obviously excited about her first visit to another planet. Of all places and times, Tan Tango was here. Facility down! Brigadier! So that's an Arxium, Rusher thought. Big. He opened his helmet comlink. That's the last of our party, Rushies. Look alive. This was happening quickly. A voice on another band had just told him what he needed to hear. Damon called, people. Our crashers are at the edge of the system. Rusher had guessed right. Damon had hidden a surveillance probe in the nebula surrounding Gazari's parent star. The cosmic display made for a pretty sight and a fine place to watch for sudden arrivals. The rest of Damon's force, both his ground regulars and his attack fleet, were set to leap in from hyperspace as soon as they got word of Odeon's arrival. 
It was up to Damon's escort and the specialists on the crater rim to keep Bad Brother occupied until then. Weapons live, Brigade. Confirm. Coin Star, live! Sarah Knife, live! Dammit Oil, live! One by one, all eight battalions, all named for the exotic ancient weapons etched on their helmets, checked in. Rusher had found the names in his studies, names connecting his troopers with the past. It was a tough thing, nearly dying for a different Sith Lord every year. It helped to have a connection to something. Snapping the visor down on his helmet, Rusher pointed toward a technician looking back at him from a hemispheric window in Diligence's hull. Responding to the gesture, the tech threw a switch, and the entire vessel hummed as the ship's energy shield came alive. Diligence made too nice a target, sitting there amid the emplacements. The invisible shield wouldn't stop a projectile, but it might dissipate some of the other fire directed their way. Rusher expected plenty. His flak jacket had been on, beneath his overcoat, since touchdown. Guns hot, he called. Rusher out. Looking down again at the four transports, with their passengers gathering outside, he reactivated the comlink. And if anyone targets within a click of those kids, I'll strap them to Bitsy and pull the trigger myself. No. No. She recognized the visitor's garments, now. These were all factory workers, slaves from Darknell and other planets, recruited by industrial heuristics. Adolescents, like Tan. Led by droid minders, the group made its way slowly through the sludge toward the giant facility. There's still time before the ambush. Damon had set it in the dome, and she could see Damon's forces readying lower down the north crater wall. There were more forces in the highlands to the east. Who knew how many blasters, how much artillery might be trained on the innocents? And why? She thought before there was no reason for Odeon's forces to come here, not into what was so obviously a trap. There wasn't anything here worth fighting over. At least not until the monster city ship showed up. No. Kara bolted down the hillside, uncaring. This was wrong, all wrong. In minutes Damon had turned Gazari from a useless rock into a vital strategic target. And the target was her friend, tromping around down there in the ashen mud with her companions and laughing. Damon had baited a trap for Odeon on Shiloh by using the explosive beradium mines as the lure. This time, the bait was live. The fastest way down the cliffside led away from Damon's dome. It wasn't important now. Kara launched down a rocky incline toward the crater floor, attracting the attention of two Sith soldiers at the perimeter. The armored warriors barely had time to look in her direction before she cut them down with a flash of brilliant green. Kara stood revealed. Jedi? Came a stunned voice from higher on the ridge. Jedi! Kara bolted into the valley, boots slapping against the ochre mud as she made for the temporary buildings. She hadn't heard blaster fire yet, but she would. The transports were a good way off, but she still had the first warrior's rifle. Maybe she could drive the crowds back onto the transports. Lurching into the clear, Kara tripped over her feet and slammed into the tarry surface. She looked up, stunned. Nothing had interfered with her progress, the ground was featureless in all directions. She listened again for blaster fire and instead felt a stinging pain near her heart. Ignoring the throbbing, Kara tried to crawl across the blackened field. For a moment, she thought exhaustion from the past few weeks' exertions had finally overtaken her. But hearing the rumbling above, she knew better. Or worse. Kara opened her mind to the Force. Discretion didn't matter, Damon's forces, including any correctors present, already knew she was here. And if they were here now, they were probably feeling the same crushing pressure she was. Something was approaching. A psychic black hole, drawing in all that existed and destroying everything it encountered. It was a feeling she'd first felt on Aquilaris, the day she lost her family, and again on Shalo, the day she lost Master Treese and the other Jedi, her second family. It was why Damon's forces weren't shooting at her now. They'd gotten the word. 
they'd sensed his presence, just as she had. Vanertrice's killer was here. Lord Odeon had arrived. Chapter 8 It's a trap, Lord Odeon. Of course it's a trap, boomed the stentorian voice from above. The little snot doesn't operate any other way. Narsk looked up at Odeon and marveled. Damon's older sibling truly was his antithesis, both philosophically and aesthetically. Where would-be creator Damon surrounded himself with light, destroyer Odeon sat at the center of a sphere of darkness, lit only by holograms depicting the ships outside. Sword of Eldis had one of the stranger bridge designs Narsk had ever seen. A great uncomfortable throne of Mandalorian iron sat on a pedestal suspended meters above the ship's crew, themselves arranged in concentric circles beneath their lord. Some facing inward, to serve him, the rest facing outward, scanning the space outside. Sword had come crashing out of hyperspace, hurtling into the Ghazari system at a speed that unnerved Narsk. It was just another day in Odeon's service. His flagship named to honor an ancient Sith warlord, Odeon styled himself the Barbarian King. Heavy battle armor hid a bulkier form, exposing only his hairless, burn-scarred head. Narsk thought it unlikely that true barbarian kings wore their armor all the time, but Odeon seemed unbound by convention. Or much else. Of course, Bothan, if it is a trap, we could send you down first. Odeon glared down, ruby light from his left cybernetic eye pulsating in the blackness. It ought to take you just a few minutes to bollocks things up entirely. Narsk froze in his seat, searching for meaning in his employer's scowl. Seconds later, Odeon quaked with laughter, the sound amplified by his surgically implanted mouthpiece. Narsk bristled. The worst was the silence from the rest of the crew, unwilling or simply too afraid to join in their master's laughter. Sword's bridge had all the warmth of a polar ice cap. Even before Dark Nil, working for Odeon had been a barefoot dance on the long edge of a vibrasword. But Narsk had to return, even without the convergence data he'd been sent to steal. Damon had left Narsk alive for one reason, to arrange the upcoming battle. A battle that Odeon desired more than a thousand data pads packed with secret schematics. Narsk was now certain Damon had wanted him to deliver Odeon the news of the deal for Bactra's Arxium. He'd had plenty of time to think back on it hiding in the cargo ship leaving the Damonate. Damon had kept Narsk in his presence long enough to hear everything that transpired with Bactra. Even the rotation of his gyroscopic prison, he'd realized, had been programmed to slow down whenever anything important was said. And the Jedi woman was right. The Gamorrean sentries had loosened his bonds before abandoning him in the darkened hallway. If she hadn't come along, he would have escaped himself. As Damon expected. It also explained, he knew now, why it had been such a simple matter to emerge from the Dark Nell junkyard and find off-world transit heading in the right direction. The freighter he'd chosen had hopped to a neutral planet, one that just happened to see regular visitors from the Odeon 8. In two standard days, Narsk had found himself back before Odeon. Narsk's homecoming was harsh but brief compared with the punishment he had endured at Damon's hands. Narsk had destroyed the Black Fang, after all, if he hadn't pushed the button, he'd planted the charges. And while he hadn't mentioned the Jedi's role in that, or his escape, he had described her presence on Dark Nil, something that interested Odeon immensely. Odeon had kept him alive throughout the battle preparations, just to hear more about the dark-haired Jedi running amok in Damon's territory. As ridiculous as Damon seemed at times, he definitely thought things through. He had given Narsk the kind of information that negated all of his previous failures for Odeon, thus ensuring Narsk would deliver it. And he had engineered a situation that was obviously a trap, and yet irresistible to his older sibling. Damon had avoided direct confrontations ever since the loss of Shalot. Odeon would take any chance for a fight, regardless of the danger. Scan for Damon's forces. Odeon said his sword decelerated, its ungainly, chunky form reaching the edge of the planetary nebula. Damon's forces are not in the system. Screeched a voice from the grave, or somewhere near to it. Jelcho, one of Odeon's given navigators, showed his fright mask face. It turned Narsk's stomach. No, boy boy's here. 
Odian said, sniffing. He's on Gazari, like the bumbler said. The main body of Damon's space forces had made a public show of being elsewhere during the last couple of days. Damon, likewise, hadn't covered his tracks about coming to this frontier world with a light escort. Someone else is in the nebula. Odian barked. Tighten the scan. Jelcho turned his empty eye sockets back toward the monitor. Narsk was glad. He hated the given. An entire species with holes in their heads, and yet they made up the bridge crew. Diversity meant nothing in Odian's service. He liked his spies Bothan, his engineers Verpine, and his navigators Given, a curious species capable of calculating hyperspace jumps in their withered heads. The holographic visuals surrounding Odian refreshed. He gestured to a small flotilla, loitering beyond Gazari's sun. Who's that? Jelcho had the answer. Lord Bactra's fleet. Moving? Jelcho paused as another given whispered into his ear hole. If our scans on entering the system are correct, they have just delivered the Arxium to Gazari's surface. They appear to be departing. They're not being very quick about it. Odian growled. He waved a massive gauntlet hand, activating an unseen system. Who's that over there? He called into the darkness. Identify yourself. Cold moments passed before the holographic image of Lord Bactra materialized in the space before him. It is Bactra, Lord Odian. My greetings to you. The flickering Cormian shifted, uneasily. We are literally just passing through. That's a lie. I know what you were delivering to the brat. And it is delivered. Bactra promptly responded. What happens to the Arxium now is no concern of mine. His enormous neck dipped, bringing his icy smile into focus. Of course, if you should like to employ industrial heuristic services yourself, I am sure something can be. Odian cut off the transmission. Wretched little traitor. Despite the years of uneasy peace between them, his distaste for the Cormian's ways was well known. Another given bleated. I have firing solutions on the Bactronites, Lord Odian. Forget it. Pleasure first. Narsk watched through the bridge window as they passed Bactra's ships, still dallying before their scheduled engagement on Velas Pavo. Maybe they simply wanted to watch a good fight. While none of Bactra's affair, the result would certainly alter the balance of power in the region. Bactra would be interested in that. Knowing Damon as Narsk did, it could always be something else. He wondered, had Damon secretly gotten Bactra to renounce his neutrality, adding to the ambush? If so, the Cormian hadn't brought enough forces for it. Bactra's dozen ships might suffice to escort an Arxium or destroy some Gadolinium mines, but Odian had brought a quarter of his home fleet, even now forming an orbital perimeter around Gazari. And the Master of Destruction had brought something else, just now exiting hyperspace behind them. It's here. Odian said, rising with a clank. Thunderers to their transports. Jelcho, you're with me. Pausing on the opaque catwalk leading out of his personal planetarium, Odian shot a wicked look down at Narsk. You, too, bumbler. Narsk jolted upright in his seat. Why me? I might need you to blow up something else of Damon's. Black teeth showed through curling lips. Or if the Jedi wench is here, maybe you can let her destroy it for you, again. Kara got to her knees, just in time. Blaster fire from Damon's ridgeline encampment raked the pasty soil, spraying ash all around her. She could see Damon's forces scrambling toward their heavy artillery, and while she now knew that the firepower wasn't intended for her, at least a few sentries were still after her. Finding her feet, Kara made a dash for the cover of a temporary building. Glimpsing through a window, Kara saw what she expected, nothing at all. It was all a lure. The little outpost on the crater. The students. And now the towering industrial heuristics facility just arrived. All of it was designed to attract Odian to Gazari so the forces on the crater walls could put him into a crossfire. Could Odian really be so stupid, so desperate for battle as to walk into such a place? Yes. 
she thought. That was definitely his presence she sensed entering orbit, and the rumbling of the clouds above meant more than rain. She looked urgently to the west. Clusters of students still marched across the Ebon Valley toward the facility, seemingly heedless of anything that had transpired between her and Damon's sentries. Time was running out. Kara bolted into the open. Command, Recon Ripper 2. Additional contact. I see it, Rip 2. Rusher said, doing his best to track the lone female figure on the poison plane. The brown-clad woman was making a headlong run for the protean mass of transport passengers, a kilometer away, and Damon's thugs on the ridge were taking potshots at her. I don't know who she is, or what she's trying to prove. But she's not our problem. Not on the surface, Brigadier! Additional contact in the air, sky high! Reflexively, Rusher lifted the macro binoculars to look up, before realizing he didn't need them to see what was descending. It was the last thing he expected to see here. And the one thing he never wanted to see. Death Spiral. Everywhere on the crater floor, beings looked up in awe. That included Kara, halfway to the groups of children, watching the shadow pierce the haze above. The form falling through the clouds was a featureless truncated cone, several hundred meters in height. Breaking rockets allowed the monstrous obsidian shape to settle on the surface just southwest of the crater center, equidistant from the transports and the big facility that had arrived before it. Within a second of planting itself in the similarly colored surface, the towering cone shuddered. With a clatter drawing shrieks of surprise and horror from the mob of students, the device shed its outer casings, ejecting mammoth metal panels to the ground. For it was a device that remained. Kara recognized it immediately from the history holos. A death spiral. Developed by Lord Chagra years earlier, it had been conceived as a siege tower in reverse. From its base to its tapering top were more than a dozen concentric rings of blaster turrets and missile launchers, all able to rotate independently. Dropped in the middle of a location under siege, a death spiral, named for the rotating levels giving the illusion that the cone was screwing itself into the ground, was designed to fire in all directions at once. The late Chagra had built several of the devilish devices on a smaller scale, Vanner had barely survived to tell of his encounter with one. Those towers had been controlled remotely. But Odeon's version was so large, Kara saw that there were actual crews on each level, operating the guns. The huge base, too, served as its own transport and armory, wide doors lower down opening to release scores of airspeeders, speeder bikes, and three-legged armored transports. Above, Odeon's troop transports descended. Kara shuddered. It had been exactly like this on Shiloh, Odeon, invading from the sky with a contraption of death. There was no mistaking it. This was nothing of Damon's. Odeon's symbol, imprinted on the transports, said it all. Seven chevrons in a circle, pointed outward, on a black field. Arrows reaching outward, but being swallowed from behind by an ever-expanding void. With an ear-piercing groan, the spiral's turrets began to move and fire. The void was expanding. Quick fire, quick fire. Rusher gripped the railing as brilliant streaks erupted along the ridge on either side of him. In just a few minutes, the once deserted crater floor had become a busy place. It was about to become a hot one, too. Laser fire from Rusher's unit pounded the murderous pillar, towering to the southwest. Seconds later, the Nosaurian's crew opened up from farther along the ridge. Rusher smirked. The Rushies were first on target again. Some target. Yulon had spoken of death spirals, but Rusher had never seen one. And no one had ever seen one like this. The tower must have kept the fabricators on the spike busy for months. As the flashes dissipated, Rusher could see the spiral's rings continuing to move, firing at Damon's forces to the north. That wasn't good. Sergeant Wenela. Target damage assessment. Rusher barely heard the spotter's voice over the din of another round of outgoing energy. Damage zero, command. Zero? 
Energy shield went live the second the target landed. Rusher swore. They'd had a clear shot while the beast was descending, but Damon's signal had ordered them to hold their fire. The young lord was waiting for Odeon to make his appearance. Now that he had, somewhere out there in that swarm of transports disgorging his crack thunder guard troops, it was too late. Rusher's most potent weapons were out of play. Ripper and Satskar. Projectile only, on the tower. The two battalions had the largest number of proton mortar launchers. No shot from the north. Called a voice back. Ripper battalion was on the upper flank, partially screened from the death spiral by the buildings of the Arxium. Aim high and lob bum over. Rusher rolled his eyes skyward. To clear the Arxium, they'd be firing into the clouds. Looks like rain. Energy weapons crews, target Bad Brothers vehicles and personnel. Rolling barrage, don't let them cross. Odeon's forces were moving, now, fanning out. The flyers would be the first across, reaching the Arxium, the transports, and the students if Damon's ground troops didn't get there first. The students. Rusher urgently scanned the field. The adolescents had broken from the semi-orderly companies the minder droids had organized, and were stampeding as a crazed mass back toward the transports. The death spiral hadn't begun firing in their direction yet, but he didn't put it past Odeon. And Rusher's employer had put them in this position. And you went along, to save your neck, Rusher thought. Stars helped them. To the south, the rings of the death spiral lined up, their guns unleashing their deadly potential. Give me that blasted fire on the tower, now. Narsk folded his furry ears over and mashed his hands down upon them. Odeon's crew hadn't bothered to supply him with a helmet, but this close to the death spiral, the Bothan found himself wishing for earplugs. That's the way. Yelled Lord Odeon, standing in the open drop gate of the hovering transport. Looking gleefully at the spitting tower, he pulled his cybernetically attached comlink closer to his lips. Do it. Again. Another shrill, piercing scream from above, and to the north, Narsk saw another of the industrial heuristics transports explode. Shrapnel showered the ashen mulch for hundreds of meters around, just short of the mob of teenagers. With a third volley destroying another transport, the trapped students turned again in panic, flowing like mercury back toward the Arxium. Field trips over, kids, Narsk thought. Sorry. Clinging inside the doorway, Narsk watched as Odeon gave a booming battle cry and bounded to the surface. Other similarly armored members of the Thunder Guard followed, leaving only himself, Jelcho, and the command crew aboard. Look over there. Narsk turned to see flashes of artillery fire coming from hidden positions on the crater wall, far to the east. They weren't Damon's regulars, those were all coming down into the fray from the northern ridge. He thought back to the mercenaries he'd passed on the way out. Part of Damon's preparations, no doubt. Watching several thunderers blown to pieces ahead of Odeon, Narsk spoke his mind. This is ridiculous. He knew what was down here. Why didn't he just bombard the crater from orbit? Lord Odeon wanted to be sure of the Petulant One's presence before dispatching him to the void. Jelcho said. The Given joined him at the edge of the transport's tailgate, his bony knuckles clasped together excitedly. There was almost color in his freakish face, Narsk saw. Almost. Narsk found the Given noxious and obnoxious. First among Odeon's death cultists, they seemed to have nothing in their skinless heads beyond a desire to finish decomposing, once and for all. My people would prefer that our lord slew us, of course. Jelcho nattered. But we will happily accept reaching the void through the agency of Death's brother. Nars glared. How about Death's furry pal? What? Nothing. Narsk wished for something to hit Jelcho in the face with, if only to improve his appearance. But Odeon had made Jelcho his babysitter for the duration, the wraith was the closest excuse Odeon had to an aide-de-camp. Odeon had the simplest power structure of any Sith Lord he'd met. There were no ranks whatsoever, and none of Daemon's regimentation either. Unlike Daemon, Odeon knew others existed, and feared them. 
he kept potential rivals from rising by making sure everyone reported to him. In practice, the result was chaos. Odian's empire devoured worlds like a space slug, using neither finesse nor, often, good sense. The competent were neutralized or paralyzed. And those closest to Odian were the ones who cared least for their own survival, because so few survived around him very long. That worked well enough for Narsk, as an outsider. It allowed him to treat Odian's underlings any way he wished. None had any power over him, except to nausea. Jell Cho. One of the pilots called from the back. Sort of the Eldies just called. Damon's fleet just arrived from hyperspace. They're engaging our forces now. So that's the ploy, Narsk thought. Get Odian here, and don't let him leave. The edges of Jelcho's mouth curled, lending a macabre aspect to his anatomically permanent frown. He embraced the Bothan. This truly is the day. He trilled. And you, Bothan spy, made this all possible. Narsk shrank from the insipid touch. Would it be all right if I had a blaster? I promise I won't go anywhere. The death spiral spat again, demolishing the last industrial heuristics transport. Kara slid in the muck, stopping just in time to avoid being struck by flaming debris. It had been wrong to come this way. She'd hoped to hurt at least some of the students aboard one of the transports, but Odian's hateful machine hadn't left them anything. The youthful gaggle had dispersed now, running pell-mell across the northern surface of the crater. At least Damon's warriors hadn't charged the field yet, or they'd be caught in the middle. Right now, Damon was letting others do his fighting. Several cadres of battle droids rushed the valley from the east, engaging Odian's thunderers, and then there was that artillery. Running again, Kara thanked the force for whomever Damon had on that eastern ridge. Intentionally or not, their shells were screening the fleeing refugees from Odian's charge. But it couldn't last for long. Looking south, she saw that the death spiral had the eastern emplacements zeroed in. She wouldn't have enough time to intercept the crowd unless... Blaster fire suddenly raked the ground ahead of her. Kara leapt to the side, tumbling in the greasy soil. The flanking edge of Odian's first wave of swoop bike riders soared past, with three of the armored warriors breaking off to circle her. Parrying blaster shots with her lightsaber, Kara closed with the nearest rider and pounced. Slashing the front control rods from the vehicle, Kara twirled underneath, watching rider and vehicle plummet downward into an explosive crash. She spun and spun again as the remaining riders closed with her, trying to get a bead on her while moving. The first rider, a Rodian, lost balance when a deflected blaster bolt knocked him from his seat, the second lost her helmeted head to Kara's lightsaber. Ignoring the departing wave of flyers, Kara approached the fallen Rodian. Armored as one of Odian's thunderers, he gurgled in agony as Kara stepped over his body to reach his stalled bike. Yeah, that's bad, Kara said, riding the handlebars. Trust me, you died for a reason. Kelly's inoperable, command. Blast. Lights were going off the board one after another. Now Rusher's best battalion was without its strongest weapons. Pull out the Gwaiths, Tunbadon, and join in on the tower. The leader of Serenife wouldn't take that well, he knew, the Gwaith brothers' concussion missile launchers were some of the slowest loading pieces in the arsenal, with a fire-slash-disable rating in the planetary core. You could paint a peace mural on them between shots. But he also knew Major Tunbadon would already be on the job. Between blasts, word had come from the bridge that Damon's fleet had arrived and was engaging Odian's forces in orbit. It couldn't have mattered less to diligence, doing its best to stay horizontal with all the impacts. We're dialed in! Someone yelled over the comlink. Rusher couldn't make out the call signal. Repeat. Whose battalion was that? Which battalion? Seeing the flares of energy lancing from the death spiral, Russia realized the answer. All of them. The signal was unmistakable. Even in the din of battle, Narsk had felt and heard it, a gentle buzz, in the back of his head. It had been delivered by a tiny implant at the base of his skull, hidden so well that Damon's scans had never found it. Narsk knew instantly what the signal meant. 
His true master was calling. He had to respond. Narsk searched the ready room of the transport. The implant was simply an alert device. He had to make the contact. Any communications device would work so long as it could reach space. Finding a spare portable comset out of sight of the crew, Narsk sat down and activated it. <laughs> Static. He scowled. It was the Death Spiral's energy shield, most likely. Since receiving the news about Damon's fleet, the nervous transport pilot had parked closer to the tower's base for protection. Narsk figured the untested device was interfering with subspace transmissions inside its protected radius. His implant had gotten its signal, but, as he knew, it was from a technology beyond even the capacities of Odeon's builders to foul up. Narsk stood, feeling the pain of the past week's ordeal. There was no choice. He have to go out. Slipping the comp set into a backpack, he made for the exit. At least the nasty given didn't seem to be. Where are you going? Narsk sighed. He couldn't even run onto a battlefield without permission. Stealing his stomach, Narsk looked directly at the given's face. I. I've decided you're right, Jelcho. He pointed outside, where Odeon and his thunderers were dashing between mortar strikes to eviscerate mercenary infantry coming down from the eastern hills. Seeing all this, I just have to get out and take part. With that I could. Narsk stared. Well, why not? Wincing inside, he took the navigator by the chitinous arm. I cannot. Jelcho said. Lord Odeon wanted me here. If the operation should fail, his transport will need a navigator. Failure? What are you talking about? Narsk stepped down onto the crater's surface and waved toward the carnage. Odeon's changing the map of this place. This is the big showdown. And you're telling me you don't want to be in on it? Tentatively, like a wistful bride, Jelcho set a boot gently on the battleground. Another foot followed. The given rasped, a full breath coming from deep inside his bony carcass. There is so much void. No need to waste any, freak. Grabbing a pair of blasters from the transport, Narsk returned to Jelcho and spun him by the shoulder. There, a short distance away, sat open airspeeder bays at the bottom of the groaning death spiral. There's your speeder. Here's your gun. He slapped the blaster into the given's hands. Claim some void. Narsk took his new blaster and began walking around the death spiral to the south. It'd be quieter and safer there, with the tower between him and Damon's forces. He had no desire for a reunion. Feeling someone looking at him, Narsk turned. The given stood limply, gaping. Now what? Narsk could barely be heard over the sound of the tower's rotating, blasting rings. A strange thing, Bothan spy. The given yelled. Jelcho's triangular eye holes seemed to sag a little. When you spoke earlier of Odeon bombing the crater, you said he instead of we. Isn't Odeon's glory your own? Shut up and go shoot something. Before I shoot you. He felt like adding. Rusher looked around. There was suddenly plenty of room atop the hull. Each battalion kept three dedicated spotters on the command platform, but with Sarah Knife, Flechette, and Satskar all out of action, their minders had gone down to manage recovery ops. Not that those who remained were able to do much. The ridge hadn't turned out to be such a good place to set up, after all. Every impact on the hillside rattled upward through diligence, nearly knocking the spotter's helmet sideways. And smoke on the range was so thick now they couldn't see their own teams. Rusher checked the command board on the railing. The display showed five good lights, two north and three south. His battalions were still giving their all, the fires of perdition soaring from the ridge down into the valley. But Odeon's forces in the death spiral had them dialed in. In a blinding flash, a part of the ridge to the north vanished, sending debris skyward. Rusher's command crew shielded themselves as the shock pummeled diligence, followed by a shower of rocks. No energy shield was going to do much against an avalanche from the air. I've lost Rantok Battalion! Ignoring the fall of pebbles, the lead Rantok spotter bounded from his elevated chair and followed his aide toward the ladder. 
Russia grabbed the third spotter, a young human, by the arm. Stay here. You're on evac watch now. Port side. The pink-faced spotter, all of 16, nodded. Rusher headed for the other side. The mission now would be mapping optimum routes back to diligence. It didn't do any good for a team to head back to its designated cargo ramp for boarding if there was an impact crater in the way. Hanging across the railing, Rusher scanned the haze below. He wouldn't be able to check the paths from every ramp, the cameras on diligence's belly hadn't worked in years but he could get direct visuals on the others. A roiling pit had opened near the foot of Starboard 3. That was out. But at least Starboard 2 looked nominal. Rusher lowered the macro binoculars and squinted. Beetle Laboon, helmet askew and shaking nervously, was driving away from the ramp aboard his tracked cargo crawler. Haphazardly fastened to a chain behind was the long barrel of Kelligdeed 25, the laser cannon infamously loaded up wrong on Winder. The Duro's recruit had somehow gotten the recalcitrant cannon out of the hold and was dragging it behind, its mass leaving a gouge in the volcanic dirt. Kid! Kid! Rusher could barely hear his own yells. But the newbie didn't seem to be in his right mind, from the look of him. The boy was ducking as low as he could while still seeing over the hauler's hood. Green knuckles had gone pale on the steering yoke. Rusher pounded his fist against his helmet. He didn't need this now. Across the valley, the death spiral winked, and the whole of diligence moved, actually lifting a few meters off the surface before slamming back to the ground. Wrapping his arm around the railing, Rusher looked back. The young spotter had gone over the side, as well as two of the remaining officers who weren't strapped into chairs. Rusher scrambled to the forward railing and looked down. It had been a glancing blow, leveling a zone just to the south of the ship's perch. But he could tell from the redundant command board that the ship's energy shield was gone. And what else? Rusher activated his helmet comlink. Dack it. What have we got? There was no response from down below. He called again, only to hear a voice he wasn't familiar with from down on the ridge. Master Dackett's down! Rusher swallowed hard. Looking back at the decimated spotter crew, he made for the ladder. Rusher's brigade was breaking. Riding the speeder bike like a bantha rancher, Kara shepherded the younglings forward. The transports ablaze, she had to get them to the far side of the giant industrial heuristics facility. Turbo laser fire was lancing out in several directions from Odeon's cone of death, including over the students' heads. Those barges targeted Damon's positions on the northern ridge, more blasts raked the grounds to the east, cutting down a charging cadre of war droids. Most of its fire, though, was directed at the nearest target, the corporate pseudo-city at the crater's center. One of the nine towers had already imploded and fallen, kicking up a mass of debris that helped screen her crowd's movements. Kara had led a charge of Jedi back on Shiloh. This was nothing like it. There were hundreds of students, perhaps more than a thousand, all streaming chaotically across the shuddering, sloppy ground. She kept her lightsaber aloft and pointed, serving as a visual beacon driving the refugees onward. But no refuge was to be had. A few dozen students, seeing the rising towers of the facility, ran toward imagined shelter, only to veer back in panic as another tower on the southern side collapsed. And still, Odeon's troops bolted ahead, ripping into Damon's forces, which now charged senselessly from the northern ridge toward the death spiral. Kara laced back and forth through the rushing crowd, working to keep stragglers from being cut off. Some aliens couldn't run at all, she saw, and many, like Tan, could go only as fast as their little legs could take them. Angling the larger exodus toward the quieter ground halfway between Damon's northern and eastern positions, she gunned the swoop on a wide sweep, circling the laggards. Blaster fire arced behind her neck. Kara swerved. One of Damon's Vaudran troopers, legless and bleeding in the muck, lay on his chest firing at Kara with his rifle. Kara squeezed the throttle, only to have the bolts follow her, glancing off the back of the bike. They're attacking you, idiot. Why are you attacking me? Seeing the children charge before her, Kara slammed the swoop into reverse. 
blaster bolts flying past her, she flipped backward off the swoop and thudded on top of Vaudran's armored back. As the warrior tried to roll over and raise his rifle, Kara screamed in anger and stabbed downward. Withdrawing the blade, Kara gnashed her teeth and stepped off the body. Deactivating her lightsaber, she shot a glance back to the ridge. She'd hoped Damon was getting a part of it, but the command dome was still there, almost taunting her. They'd probably have an energy field over the encampment now. Her next thought was of the explosives she'd slaved to accumulate and haul halfway across the Daemonate to the back door of the Creator of Chaos. Explosives already behind any energy screen protecting Daemon. Kara's eyes narrowed. Do it. A voice said. End it. Standing beside where the swoop had come to rest in the gray mud, Kara pictured herself back at the dome, just an hour earlier, lifting the bandolier over her shoulder. She should have finished him then. You can finish it. From here. End it. Reaching in her backpack, Kara found the detonator. Confirming from the display that she was in range, she focused her eyes back on the dome. In one instant all her exasperation, all her anger welled up. She saw the dome as she wanted to see it, destroyed, with the oppressor gone and her troubles ended. She saw what she'd seen down Manufacturer's Way when she destroyed the Black Fang using the same remote control. In that moment, she saw an ending. What she did not see, or even notice, in that moment, was her bandolier of explosives, still draped across her chest, where they'd been since she'd mindlessly put them on, back on the ridge an hour earlier. Chapter 9 Kara Kara Her thumb poised over the red button on the detonator, Kara looked down. Amid the slower refugees, one small figure had stopped. Tantango looked up at Kara, black eyes just as tearful as they'd been the day they'd parted on Dark Nell. Kara, what are you doing? What are you doing here? The Jedi lowered the detonator control. She'd asked herself the same question so many times in the last few weeks. Now she asked it of herself again, and almost involuntarily patted the bandolier wrapped around her body. What are you doing? Gah! With a start, Kara pitched the detonator away, pulling her hands back to her chest. For a second, amid all the sounds of warfare, she listened for herself breathing. What was I thinking? Tan patted over and picked up the control. You lost your thingy. She squeaked. Are you, are you a Jedi? Kara sighed and hugged her former student and took the detonator back. Yeah, she said, I think so. Still grasping the quivering tan, Kara looked back toward the death spiral. She knew what had just happened. Odian used his peculiar force abilities to drive others toward acts of self-destruction. Either in his name, as his charging warriors were now demonstrating, or not. Damon's forces on the ridge had broken ranks, goaded into a suicidal charge, just as she had been. It was probably the same psychic message. Tan cried. Our school, our axiom. They're destroying it. Why are they doing that? She looked toward the sea of students beginning to coalesce in a nook where the northeastern crater wall bowed inward. Why are they trying to kill us, Kara? What did we do? Nothing, Kara said, I are rising again. She looked back at Odian's vile tower, now reducing the buildings at the center of the axiom, so that's what the thing was, to molten slag. It's what I'm going to do that they've got to worry about. Releasing Tan, Kara turned to see another of Odian's speeder bike riders charging her, mounted blasters firing. Standing her ground, Kara simply raised her hands in the air. And shoved downward, slamming an invisible weight to the ground. The Odianite speeder bike went out from under him, crashing into the crater floor a meter from her feet. Kara strode toward the dazed rider and delivered a resounding crack to his jaw. A given. Kara had seen given during her ill-advised foray to the spike, weeks earlier, but she had no idea Odian was using them for cannon fodder. The creature wasn't even armored beyond his natural exoskeleton. Hide behind my bike, Tan, Kara said, putting the given's grounded vehicle into hover mode. She pulled the unconscious rider from the ground by his spindly arms. 
It'll only be a minute, I promise. Concussion missiles screaming overhead, Rusher forced himself to focus on the debris-strewn path. There was more incoming than outgoing, he figured, by a three-to-one margin. Whenever that happened for any stretch of time, the battle was over, even for a gunner with a full crew. And his wasn't. It had come apart so quickly. There were others here, all the specialists from that day in Damon's temple, minus the unlucky Tagorian. And yet they seemed to be suffering even worse. He still saw some weak fire coming from the Nosorian's position up the line, but he couldn't see Metagazi's droids at all. His people back on diligence had told him Dakit had left with a recovery team to try to bring back anything from Tunbadun's battalion, from guns to the Sanyasin himself. Always worried about the lurch ratio, Rusher thought. Leave no one behind. Dakit must not have known that Saranife Battalion's entire chunk of ridge was already destroyed. Communications had gone to blazes, along with discipline. That usually happened around the same time. Rusher looked to a rise in the ridge, just ahead. The formation wasn't there before, much of what lay beyond had given way, and the rest of it was smoking. Stabbing at the ground with his walking stick, he propelled himself forward, fearing what he'd see on the other side of the divide. Sir! Sir! Rusher gaped as he crested the hill. There was the death and destruction he'd expected, worse than he'd seen in his career. Hillside and weaponry had changed places, leaving the odd metal spar, an organic limb, jabbing up from the sizzling rubble. But his eyes fixed on the one thing moving. Beetle Labun's cargo crawler trundled through the smoke, puttering between impact craters. In place of the gun barrel from earlier, the Duro's recruit had chained a makeshift stretcher to the back. I have Master Dackett, sir. I can see that. Forgetting the pain in his leg, Rusher dashed around the crawler to the litter. Dackett was there, bloody clothing shredded. Beetle called from ahead. I saw him when I went over the hill with the gun, sir. Rusher knelt beside the stretcher. Looking behind, he saw a long trail gouged in the gravel and snaking out of sight. He doubted repulsor lifts could handle this terrain. Kind of a bumpy ride, Ryland. Dackett grabbed Rusher's collar with a bruised right hand. Shoot me, Brig, before he kills me! Rusher looked at Dackett's other arm. It was down near his feet, set at the end of the litter. I brought it back myself! <coughs> Dackett coughed. Never leave anything behind! Another turbolaser blast struck the ridge, lower down. Tossing his cane aside, Rusher clambered back to the cargo crawler. He opened a bin inside the vehicle's door and pulled out a medpock. Oh, that's where it was. Beetle said, still frozen at the control yoke. That's where it was, Rusher said, scrambling back. Rusher found a spot in the folds of Dackett's neck and injected a painkiller. Dazed, the veteran babbled, apologizing for leaving the ship. Getting too old. I guess, taking chances I shouldn't. Rusher looked around. Everyone on the team, it seemed, was acting with abandon today. The Duro's boy included. Something felt wrong about Gazari. They had to get away. Give me a hand, kid. Ripping his fingers from the control yoke, the Duro's bounded from his seat and stumbled to the surface. Together with Rusher, he helped lift the hefty victim into the crawler's passenger seat. Don't forget the arm. Dackett ordered woozily. Yes, sir. I mean, no, sir. The Duros said. With Beetle perched awkwardly on the hood, Rusher settled into the driver's seat and reached for the control yoke. Imprints of the recruit's fingers were there, worn deep into the plastoid. Rusher shook his head. He'd had driven Dackett through half a kilometer of the most pockmarked terrain on the ridge, under fire. Kid, what possessed you to come all the way down here to get him? The Duros looked down, embarrassed. He was the only person I knew, sir. Rusher laughed, despite himself, but only for a moment. Crowning the hill, he saw his worst fears realized. Before leaving diligence, 
he'd called a general retreat, using the battalions nearest the ship on either side to screen the movements of the forces coming from farther away. But the blazing wreckage strewn ahead was all that was left of the screeners and the screened. Outfit status. One battalion aboard. Crackled the reply over the comlink. Two still out in stragglers, north and south. Rusher couldn't hear the rest. From far away on the crater floor, the death spiral fired again and again, banks of turrets on different levels targeting all along the crater wall. They didn't have diligence in their sights yet, Rusher doubted they could see it, with all the dust and ash in the air. But they were doing a great job of picking off any of his forces trying to return to it. The only possible haven for the remains of the brigade might as well have been light years away. And what's my top speed? Four kilometers an hour? Rusher stood up in his seat and scowled. There was no way through. No way for anyone. So much for working for the creator of the universe, he snarled, sitting down and slamming the vehicle into gear. No miracles here. Crouching behind the frame of a crashed airspeeder, Narsk looked at the comm unit. And looked again. Such timing. This would be the strangest thing ever to happen in the history of organized warfare, or even war between Sith Lords. But the message he had received from space was clear, as was his mission. He had a signal to send to the combatants on Bizarri. Odeon and Damon. He would have the passcode. They would have to accept his word. But looking at the death spiral hurling energy at the dwindling forces on the crater wall, Narsk wondered if any present would hear his message. Searching, he found a pair of macro binoculars near the corpse of the speeder's Odeonite pilot. Even if the death spiral weren't throwing off interference, were Odeon and Damon even listening? Scanning across the field, he found them. They weren't hard to miss. Damon stood atop a hover platform on the northern ridge of the crater, lightsaber lit. His own forces were gathered beneath, a mix of soldiers and the accursed correctors, wielding their own weapons. Less than a kilometer away, Odeon's thunderers crashed toward them, having broken the ambush. The man himself rode above them, carried atop a flying skiff. Force lightning flashed in the destroyer's hands as he approached his long-desired confrontation. No, they definitely won't listen, Narsk thought. And probably no one in the space battle raging above would hear his call, either. He turned his macro binoculars to the east, where the expensive Arxium had been reduced almost entirely to slag. It wouldn't be long now before the death spiral found the mass of refugees, scattering to the east. Narsk blinked. No mistake, a green lightsaber. The Jedi. She was astride a swoop bike carrying some youngling, directing traffic. Insane. Black hair came and went from his view as she alternated her gaze between them and the death spiral. But she wasn't looking at its towering heights, now firing fruitlessly at Damon's shielded platform. Rather, she stared at something closer to its base. Narsk shifted his view to the left, across an endless stretch of body-strewn muck. The Odeonites had cleared the entire area surrounding the conical weapons platform, an area now being traversed by a single speeder bike. Coming from the Jedi's position, the grayish flyer was traveling beneath the energy shield on a direct course back to the Death Spiral speeder bays. Narsk tightened his focus. Jelcho. The unconscious given was slumped over the handlebars of the speeder bike, hurtling at full speed, its accelerator jammed. Moving his scope, Narsk saw that Jelcho was attached to the vehicle by something dark. A bandolier, lined with small, silvery pouches. Just before the helpless rider reached the tower, Narsk scanned back across the crater to see a vision from the past, Kara Holt, squeezing something. His detonator. Narsk dived behind the tipped body of the airspeeder. This'll be bad. The base of the death spiral disappeared with a blinding flash, sundering the massive structure. A shattering crack emanated from the epicenter, shaking the floor of the crater and throwing Odeon's rearmost echelons into the air. To the north, the blast wave knocked both Sith Lords from their aerial perches, depositing them violently upon their respective coteries below. The quake drove all others in the crater to the ground, even the students herded near the northeastern wall. 
Kara looked back in fear. She'd gotten them well enough away from the blast zone, but the ring tower was wrenching itself into bits as it collapsed, throwing shrapnel in all directions. Then, seeing the debris fall short of the mob, Kara sat back on the bike and smiled gently. Damon's plant had produced the beradium nitrite for use against Odeon. She just used it as it was intended, but in a way the so-called creator had never imagined. What in blazes was that? Even Dackett, in his pharmaceutical haze, felt the tremor rattling through the cargo crawler's frame. Our miracle, Rusher said, mouth dry. The turrets that had been firing on the ridge were now spiraling for real, far over the crater's edge. Not waiting for the echoes to die, he pulled the helmet mic to his lips. That's our cue. All units, recall and board. Reactivating the cargo crawler, Rusher looked back at the pillar of fire and marveled. Where had Damon pulled that trick from? Many more moments like this, and he'd become a believer himself. Narsk slid out from beneath the body of the airspeeder. The shock wave had lifted the car and thrown it into the southern wall of the crater, picking Narsk up in transit. The Bothan found himself upside down in the front seat, the crumpled dashboard having taken most of the impact. Staggering to his feet, he swore. Everything hurt again, but he'd picked the right time to take his call. The death spiral had collapsed into its own metallic funeral pyre, a miniature volcano added to Gazari's compliment. Jelcho had found his void, thanks to the Jedi. If only the pleasure had been mine, Narsk thought, stumbling painfully away. From orbit. He found the comm unit not far from the wreck. Its casing was cracked, but it otherwise appeared functional. Narsk activated it. He could make his call. And maybe now, the Sith Lords might even be listening. Kara stood on her bike, her lightsaber pointed straight ahead as she flew over the student body. She yelled to one side and the other in every language she could remember, on the back of the seat, Little Ten did the same. To the east. To the hills. The Sith Lords behind had momentarily ceased their battle to regroup, but they would eventually recover and the victor would have the students. Refuge now could only exist in one place, Kara realized. Something had to have brought all those war droids and cannons to the battle. Kara, there's a path. Kara thanked the Force for the Celestin's sharp vision. The bombardment had collapsed the ridge in places, but some of the graded pathways the battle droids had paved to reach the crater floor remained. She couldn't tell what lay above in the smoke, but it had to be better than staying here. Everyone! Climb! The ship's master was safely aboard. Rusher had seen the Duros recruit and dack it up the ramp before returning to the surface. Coinscar and Zaboka battalions had already returned, amazingly, with most of their equipment. But Team Ripper was still out there, returning from the northernmost position through the mess Beetle had wandered into. The death spiral was gone, but Odian's forces were not. Rusher would wait as long as he could but not a second longer. He looked down. Gazari had been a disaster right up there with Sirocco. He'd always wanted a piece of military history. Now he had it, if anyone on the world survived to tell about it. Three thousand soldiers had awakened under his command that morning. If a thousand remained, he would be relieved. No, not relieved. Nothing would heal this wound. He'd been lucky, so far. All these years, and never the big wipeout, until today. So many were gone. Tun Badon, and his Serenifes. The Sat Scars. The Demitoils. And now Dackett was fighting for his life. There wasn't any coming back from this for a rusher, not for a gunner with only half a. Through the swirling dust, rusher saw the long barrels of the Kelligdids above the northern fold of the ridge. The Rippers had made it. Rusher trotted forward, stepping around debris as the machines came across the rise on their repulsor lifts. Elated, Rusher patted the backs of the bewildered, battered troopers running beside. Load up, folks. Pick any cargo ramp. We've got eight of them, no. He stopped. Standing at the crest of the crumbling formation, Rusher looked down upon a multitude. Students from the industrial heuristics transports swarmed up the hill, 
inundating his beleaguered forces. Russia rocked back, raising his cane in a futile attempt to bar the way. Now wait. Younglings and adolescents from practically every species in the Daemonate flooded past, pouring over the hill toward diligence and its eight ramps, no waiting. Amazed, Rusher looked toward one of his armored gunners, doing her best to keep moving. Zeller. Did you bring these people? Negative, Brigadier. They came with her. Rusher looked back to the horizon. Pulling up the rear was a brown-clad human woman on a speeder bike, chivying the refugees along. Young, but older than most of the students, and holding a lightsaber. Zeller lifted her sidearm and gestured toward the ship's ramps. You want us to turn them back? Rusher's sentries stood at the ramps, holding their rifles and looking urgently toward him for guidance. The students were almost to the ship. Rusher removed his helmet and rubbed his eyes. I think we're outnumbered. He didn't honestly expect his people to turn back a bunch of kids fleeing a war zone. But the woman on the speeder bike was another story. The stragglers all ahead of her, she deactivated her lightsaber. Right, Rusher said. Throwing the headgear to the ground, he began to march over the hill toward her, flanked by Zeller and three of her crewmates. The running refugees simply parted, flowing around him. Rusher ignored them, too. Hold on right there. Who are you? What are you trying to prove? And you are. The woman's voice was husky, matching her dark features. Jero Rusher. Brigadier Rusher. He pointed down the hill. That's my ship. Aha. Uh -huh. Kara Holt. She said, stepping off the bike. She pointed in the same direction. That's our ship. Like blazes it is, Rusher said, what's this about? What do you mean, what's it about? Kara said, lifting the young Celestin off the bike. I should think it's obvious. She jabbed a thumb over her right shoulder toward the crater floor. The fireworks were beginning again, with Damon's and Odeon's personal forces engaging directly. You're here. We're here. We're leaving. We're a military vehicle on assignment, Rusher said, trying to block her path. Not anymore. She replied, bowling past him. Rusher's troopers to either side started to move, but he bolted first, following the young woman. I don't think you understand, girl. We may not have room for, how many have you got here? I didn't have time for a head count. Neither did I, Rusher shot a glance at diligence. The crowd had reached the ramps, streaming up all of them, past the cannons waiting outside to be loaded. The woman stopped, staring at the main body of the ship perched above the twin cargo landers. That looks to me like a space liner. It was. Good. She said, adjusting her backpack. It is again. Rusher grabbed at her jacket. The leather was worn and dingy, caked, as she was, with the ashfall. Intense hazel eyes glared back at him. Not the perverse golden irises of Sith lords, but just as bright. No Sith on my ship. Do I look Sith to you? You look crazy. That's enough. Kara yanked free from the brigadier's hold. You see a lot of Sith carrying green lightsabers? Depends on who they kill. Rusher knew plenty of Sith who had collected them, back when Jedi had still been active out here. Fingering her unlit weapon, the woman stopped and studied Rusher's face. You work for Damon. I've seen you before, in his palace. Rusher stared. I can't imagine how. No, you probably can't. She said. Watching the lines of students moving up the ramps into diligence, she gestured for the Celestin girl to step to her side. These people are from Damon's territory. He brought them here. I know. Well, now you can take them out of here. She said. Before they get killed. I sympathize. But we're only here to provide fire support against Odeon, Rusher said, straightening. Would Damon really send someone to test him in the middle of a war? He wasn't going to get caught. 
He doesn't bring us here to evac civilians. You don't look like you're providing fire support. You look like you're leaving. The woman gestured beyond the throng, where the remaining soldiers of Ripper Battalion were breaking down its artillery pieces. Turning back, she approached Rusher. Boot to boot with him, she looked urgently into his eyes. Look, take them out anyway. You already know, if he approves, Damon will tell you it was his intention all along. Rusher blinked. She's met Damon all right. The woman was barely half his age, maybe a little older. What was she doing out here? She wasn't one of Damon's people, not dressed this way. And worried about the kids? Can she actually be a Jedi? Kara stepped away to where the Celestin was helping the smallest refugees toward the cargo ramp. Seemingly satisfied with their movement, she looked back to Rusher. Look, if you don't want me aboard, I'll stay. She shot a glance toward the ascending crowd. Just get them away from here. A screeching sound from high above preempted Rusher's response. Through roiling clouds and now beginning to spill their polluted rain, those outside diligence saw ever-darkening shadows. Several shadows. Rusher's shoulders sagged. Now what? This place is busier than a spaceport. You're not wrong. Kara said, pointing up. Two huge warships pierced the clouds, descending toward opposite ends of the crater. Rusher recognized one as part of Damon's attack force the other sported an Odeonite symbol. Separated by mere kilometers, the two vessels hovered over the crater. Facing each other, and waiting. That, doesn't look like air support. No. Kara said, biting her lip. Something has changed. Not changed enough. Looking fruitlessly for his helmet, Rusher reached into his pocket for his spare comlink. Novalo, are we in shape to move? His foul-mouthed engineer responded with several epithets regarding the new guests in the access ways. I'll take that as a yes. Light her up. He turned to Zeller. Push everyone into the barracks and tell them to hunker down. Rusher turned back to see Kara kneeling next to the Celestin. Don't worry, Tan. This man will take you out of here. She grasped the girl's tiny hands. I'll find a way out of here too. Yeah, kid. Don't worry. She will, Rusher said. Tossing his cane up the ramp, he scooped up Tan and addressed his remaining ground crew. Forget the equipment. Get these stragglers on. Kara lingered outside, watching the general and his tearful, writhing cargo disappear up the ramp. Taking a deep breath, she turned back to look at the new arrivals setting down in the crater. What are you gawking at? Rusher stood on the ramp. I said you'd find a way. You might be suicidal like an Odeonite, but you sure don't work for Damon. He pointed. Come on. Carry someone. Narsk looked at the descending Sith vessels and smiled. He had made his call, as ordered, and they'd heard his message all right. Now events had been set in motion, the Battle of Ghazari would end far differently than either Odeon or Damon had imagined. After the past couple of weeks, it was nice to be the puppeteer for a change. Making his way to one of Odeon's transports, he cast his eye across the rainy battlefield. So many lives. So much material. The corpses and wreckage would just be another layer in the ooze soon. He was overjoyed to be leaving. It would be a simple matter to get back to Sword of Eldis. But that would end his sojourn here. He'd studied the schematics of Odeon's flagship while aboard, earlier. Once back aboard it, a one-person, hyperspace-capable fighter would be within easy reach. And then, to his real master's side. Chapter 10 Something's wrong. There were actually quite a lot of things wrong, from Kara's standpoint on the Bridge of Diligence. For a warship, the command deck looked ridiculous. She'd been joking outside about the main fuselage resembling a commercial liner. Now, inside, she could see that was exactly what it was. 
Posh bridge chairs bore the emblems of a cruise line from the Republic colonies. Judging from them, Diligence's crew compartment had evidently begun life as Vichari Telk out of Dev Aaron. How had it wound up out here, toting artillery for Sith? But that wasn't the problem that had caused her to open her mouth for the first time since reaching orbit. Standing on plush carpet long since beaten into submission by combat boots, Kara studied the conflagration raging outside the viewport. Odeon's hulking capital ships vied with Daemon's smaller destroyers and snubfighter fleets for control of Ghazari, from the number of flaming derelicts, the battle had been raging for some time. And judging from the near hits diligence had experienced during the ascent, it was clear neither side was yet willing to yield a cubic meter of space to the transit of the other. So why had the two big cruisers, the ones that had arrived while diligence was loading, been allowed to descend earlier, unmolested? During liftoff, she'd gone to one of the lower viewports hoping to see the results of Damon's duel with Odeon, postponed by her destruction of the Death Spiral. Instead, she'd seen the lone Odeonite and Damonite cruisers settling closer to the surface, with no one taking a shot at either. And she'd seen none of the telltale signs of the final, fraternal showdown. Kara walked down the soft steps to the railed-off command pit. The place was ludicrous. No tactical setup here, the bridge was designed so tourists could walk around the perimeter of the deck and look out to space, or down to observe the captain and his crew doing their work, like figures in a museum display. She found Rusher there, leaning over a crewmate and looking generally dumbfounded. Captain, something's wrong. Yes, it is. Rusher said. I'm a brigadier. Without asking her pardon, Rusher pushed past Kara to another command station. The zoo's closed. Visit when we're not being pursued. Pursued? The design of the ship made it impossible to see aft from the bridge, and Kara hadn't noticed anything resembling a tactical map. You mean, by Odeon? I mean, by everyone. Rusher said, looking up at her. Lit by the screens below, he looked older than she'd remembered. Odeon's people think we're with Damon. Which we were, only Damon wasn't expecting us to pull out, so the ships he's brought in don't know what we are. He said. He flipped sweat from his short mop of auburn hair. There isn't exactly anyone running traffic control right now. They just took out Remorseless. His Mon Cal navigator reported. See? The general winced. It's not just us. That was an infantry carrier. All the ear eggs coming off the ridge are getting it. Kara walked back up the steps to the huge observation window on the starboard side. The battle was dazzling, almost too much for the human mind to process. Vichari Telk's tourists had never seen a sight like this from here. With diligence weaving, it was difficult to find a steady point of reference. Except for one. Wait, she said. Squinting, Kara saw a small flotilla of ships hanging in the nebula near Gazari Sunday. Who's that over there? Lord Bactra's people. Rusher said, looking back over the displays. They delivered the Arxium. The, uh, former Arxium. And Odeon's ignoring them? Rusher turned to face her. I don't give history lessons, you know. Behind, someone on his crew muffled a chuckle. Rusher looked back and sneered. Not right now, anyway. Kara ruminated. What she saw squared with what she knew from Republic intel, Bactra dealt with both brothers. Whatever deal he and Damon had, he'd be unlikely to get involved in the fight, and they would likewise steer clear of him. That was it. Make for over there, Kara said, pointing to Bactra's forces. Maybe we can hide among the neutrals. Maybe they'll adopt us and take us home. Rusher said, rolling his eyes. He threw up his hands. Do it. He instructed his helmswoman. Diligence quaked, lurching to the right so quickly that Kara had to steady herself against the window. Listening to the metallic groan as the shipyard, she looked down at the colossal cross-shaped cargo lander that served as the ship's right foot and wondered whether it would stay attached. Any shipwright in the Republic would call this slapdash. The navigator spoke. We're made, Brigadier! Rusher looked up to see blue laser fire zinging past the port window. 
A second later orange fire arced past the viewport on Kara's side. Who's got us? The Mon Cal looked up. They both have, sir. Several of Odeon's and Damon's ships had broken off to follow them toward the nebula. Rear turret. Damage in the shelling, sir. Rusher shrugged and walked up the steps. Won't be long now. He said, looking down. Bactra's ships were up ahead, tantalizingly close, but they'd never get there at this rate. Diligence didn't have the speed or shields to survive an engagement. This is crazy. Confronting Rusher, Kara waved toward the window behind her. Another ray lit the space outside. You can fight. This ship's bristling with weapons. This ship's weapons are on pallets in the hold, lady. Rusher said, glaring. Grabbing her arm, he turned her abruptly to face outside. Those gun barrels out there are just cargo, and half of them are gone. Kara's face fell as she looked where he was pointing. Our aft gun's out. That leaves us with a couple of fixed rock crumblers that fire forward. He said. A barrage echoed through the ship, causing Rusher to reach for a vertical support. They've got us. We slow for a second to turn around. Kara looked blankly down at the control pit. There had to be something she could do, but her mind, usually crackling with ideas, failed to produce. Looking back, she saw the brigadier. Arms crossed, Rusher leaned against the column and stared out the window at the rest of his ship. The laser blasts were coming closer now, mirroring off the shine on the window. Thanks. For, for getting us this far, she said. He didn't look back. Sorry we couldn't get your kids clear. Kara started to step toward the window. They're not exactly my kids. The view outside the window abruptly changed, laser fire and nebulosities becoming black steel and screaming red lights. Diligence rocked violently, knocking both Kara and Rusher backward from the bulkhead. They hit us. No. Rusher said, scrambling to his feet, looking up at his ceiling. They bumped us. Kara joined him back at the viewport. Odeon's dark gunships soared by on the right, barely clearing Diligence's body. To the left, Damon's tripronged pursuit fighters jetted past. Firing away, firing ahead. They're not targeting us, Kara said. They're shooting at Bactra ships. Rusher's jaw dropped. Ahead, in the nebula, two of Bactra's crescent-shaped cruisers had just erupted into flames. What in the? Incoming message. The comm operator announced from behind. Hologram! Suddenly the holographic image of Damon was beside them, fluorescent in the darkness. All irregular units, attend to me. This operation has entered a new phase. Rusher shook his head. What just happened? His bridge was silent. The message had been as terse as the one on the parade grounds, days before. Damon had commanded diligence, and, Rusher presumed, any other mercenaries surviving Ghazari, to follow on a particular hyperspace route. Rusher saw the warrior woman perched at the farthest point forward on the command deck, kneeling as she studied the nebula ahead. There wasn't much left to see, save debris. Damon and Odeon's forces had together torn into Bactra's surprised flotilla, laying half of it to waste in less than a minute. Bactra's largest vessel and the other survivors had leapt abruptly for hyperspace, followed by several of the warring until a minute ago brothers' capital ships. And leaving just now were the two large cruisers, one Odeon's and one Damon's, that had landed untouched on Ghazari shortly before. He mentioned coordinates. Right here, Brig. The comm operator read what they had been sent. You're not gonna believe this. Rusher was nearly struck dumb. This, this is in Bactra's space. Jutrend. It's his capital, isn't it? Kara's voice came from up ahead. She was still rocking gently on her knee, looking out into the nebula to a point far beyond the burning wrecks. It's Bactra's capital. I don't know, Rusher said. Maybe not for long. 
Rusher tried to put the pieces together. He had to think that Odian would have sent the same message to his own forces. Why else would they have attacked Bactra at the same time? But that only raised another question, why would Daemon and Odian have done anything at the same time, besides try to kill each other? His visitor looked back, every bit as confounded as he was. I've been away for a while. She said. Is there any precedent for Daemon and Odian collaborating? None. You just saw it, Rusher said. If I hadn't seen it, I wouldn't have believed it. Kara stood. There's nothing here I can't believe. Her voice was lower than he'd heard it before. Rusher looked back to the Mon Calamari. Anyone targeting us? No, Brigadier. Damon still has forces lifting off from Gazari, but all Odian's people appear to have followed him. To Bactra's homeworld. Rusher looked up to see Beetle Laboon in the doorway, holding a data pad. The kid looked as if he had gotten lost at least once heading for the bridge. That's all right, Rusher thought. We're all a little lost right now. I have your head counts, Brigadier. Rusher climbed the steps from the command pit to take the data pad. Master Dackett? The medics had to strap him to the table, sir, to keep him from coming up here when the shooting started. Exhaling, Rusher took the data pad. His relief over the news lasted until he saw the numbers. 1717. Kara looked back. That's your crew? No, Rusher said. That's yours. Rusher's crew looked back at him. How could so many refugees have fit on diligence? Their commander had the answer. Our survivors are 560. He ticked off the numbers. Some percentage each of Ripper, Coinscar, and Zaboka battalions, plus those whose assignments had kept them aboard diligence on Gazari. He dropped the data pad to the carpet and stood in silence for a moment. Then he turned. Damon gave us an order. Load coordinates for Jutrand. On the other side of the bridge, Kara nearly leapt out of her boots. What? We were hired to fight a battle for Damon, Rusher said, gravely. He says it's not over. It is now. Kara stomped down the steps into the command pit, walking behind the seated bridge crew. What are you going to do, throw rocks at Bactra? I mean, you just said it. Half your crew is dead, or? She stopped herself and looked incredulously up at the brigadier. No, no. She said, leaning over the navigator's chair. Belay that order. Just. Belay? Rusher stormed to the railing. Listen, lady, you're lucky to be here right now. I'm of a mind to dump you and your kids back on that ridge and go, while we still can. He looked at the ships outside. At least no one was shooting any longer, but that didn't mean they were safe. Whatever our condition, we're professionals. We've got a commitment. Damon could still be in the system with us, for all we. No. Odian and Damon followed Bactra on those cruisers that came to pick them up. Kara looked up at him. I don't sense them anymore. You use the force? Rusher stared at her. The lightsaber's not just for fun. I'm a Jedi. Rusher rolled his eyes. This was surreal. Some kind of knight errant, running around in Sith space alone, is that it? Saving student bodies here and there. No, this is new. Kara said earnestly. Usually I save whole planets. Rusher looked at her for a moment, expecting her expression to change. It didn't. I was right the first time, he thought. She's crazy. Throwing up his hands, Rusher turned to walk off the bridge. Okay, we're done. Plot us a way out of here. To where? The navigator and Kara asked in unison. Rusher shrugged. Just somewhere. They needed repairs. Reinforcements. Time to regroup. But they wouldn't be welcome in Damon space after skipping out on the Jutran leg. They could try to argue they were too crippled to make the trip, but Rusher didn't put much stock in the odds of sympathy from Damon. 
and most of all, they had to rid themselves of their passengers. One in particular. I'm going to go check on Master Dackett and the others. Rusher paused in the doorway and looked back. And for your information, five-sixths of my crew is dead or missing. Get it right. The door closed behind him. Bacter is finished, Narsk said, relaxing on the sand. The desert breeze was warm on his fur. Quality midpacks were doing wonders for him, too. Odian's idea of medical care was amputating sore limbs and grafting blasters in their places. It had taken mere days for the joint surprise attack to break the back of Bacter's regime. Narsk had left near the outset, as planned, fleeing to an outpost near Jutran to observe and recuperate. Now he was making his final report. Odian and Damon are fighting over the remains, but that's to be expected. A female voice expressed satisfaction. The errand is complete, then. A bequest will be arranged. Narsk bowed his head. Certainly. This audience was almost certainly done. Two sentences were the most he'd ever received by hologram. As he began to rise, another question came. What, about the Jedi? Startled, Narsk straightened himself before the comm unit's cam. Kara Holt? She was on Gazari, he said, targeting Odian. I don't know if she escaped. The words hung in the air for a moment. Narsk wondered whether he was supposed to have said something more or something different. She did escape. The response came, at last. I know exactly where she is. Narsk didn't know how, but he knew not to ask. He swallowed hard, his throat only just now restored by the drinks of the Oasis Resort. He could feel his brief respite coming to an end. What is your bidding? Keep an eye on her. She could mean more to my plans than you know. The hologram began to fade into the rays of the double sunset. And as for you, prepare for travel. I know another who needs the services of a specialist. Part 2. The Diarchy Chapter 11 Saj Kalishan liked to look at the Grand City, but he couldn't remember why. He vaguely recalled first seeing the view from the loft on his arrival, years earlier. It was then that he had found the Metropolis Grand, and it was that appraisal that he continued to rely upon, now that his facility for description was leaving him. Today, when the regent looked down, he saw only the geometry of life here, little beings in little hexagonal buildings, rising from the pale cerulean sea that surrounded his mesa. The ocean, too, he seemed to remember liking, but he couldn't be sure. It was just an impression, and Kalishan could no longer determine whether it was his thought or somebody else's. The Kravaki lingered at the window ringing the penthouse, letting the sun warm his tentacles. Even through the dark screen, it always helped his circulation. For a moment, he thought he almost had feeling back in all his limbs. But the feeling was fleeting. Kalishan's glowing black eyes narrowed in irritation. Other Kravaki, twice his age, had more range of movement than he had. Some days he couldn't even wiggle the feelers beneath his shell-like snout. There was nothing fair about it. The regent had not been living hard. He was not well-traveled. But he was, by vocation, the elder, and the job had made him old. The robed figure writhed in anger. His upper limbs still worked, hidden in the folds of the beige fabric. The Kravaki he had known, the ones so much more robust at his age, what were they, anyway? Nothings. They were out there now, within the polygonal communes on the horizon, carrying out his instructions. None of them had risen to anything like his position, even those touched, as he was, with the Force. He'd heard their tales, back when tales were being told, of famous Kravaki following the other side of the Force, as Jedi Knights and other fools. What had that brought them? Nothing, compared to what the Dark Side had made available to him, then, as a youthful adept under Lord Chagra, and now. It was so obvious, what the Dark Side offered. Great, powerful rewards, like. Well, he couldn't remember right now. 
but he was sure there were some, and those selfless shellheads back home would never share the benefits. It always felt good to think of the other Kravaki. Comparing his lot with theirs, Kalishan knew who he was. Powerful, and real, and independent. Regent. The Kravaki tore from the window, robes billowing. Cramped tentacles tingled to life, suddenly animated by more than his spirit. Scaling the diamond-shaped dais, he faced the shadows without seeing. He was in the presence, and it was wrong to look too closely. Regent Aspect will feed us. A scratchy female voice commanded. I will feed you. As if on air, Collision glided from the great room and into the hallway, to pass on the command. The meals would be had. He would find the beings on the next level that understood the food dispensers, and if they weren't capable of fulfilling the request, he would operate them himself. And he could, too. Tentacles that didn't work for him, minutes before, were suddenly nimble now. Collision didn't question it, there was nothing to question. He knew his role. To the presence, he was the appendage. Brigadier Rusher's asleep. Beetle Laboon said. I was trying to tell him about the housing situation for the refugees, and he dozed off again. Again? Kara stared at the young Duros, fidgeting outside the door to the barracks. He does this often? I am new here, myself, ma'am. Beetle said, apologetically. But he seems to be interested in what he's interested in. That sounded like a more gentle description than she would have given. Kara shook her head. Wait until Master Dackett gets done in prosthetics, she said. Maybe he can make something happen. Kara watched the recruit amble back to the turbo lift and turned to the bustling dormitory. After having spent a few days aboard, she changed her view of Rusher's ship. It wasn't the luxury liner she'd been led to expect by the bridge, that was more an observation lounge where crew and cosmos alike were on display. It appeared that Deveronians, or at least, the bunch that had built the crew compartment had a fairly stratified social system. Some of the accommodations were fine, if not fancy, individual rooms with views. But most riders traveled in large barracks located not so much below decks as between walls, in the innermost sections of the ship. Passengers were shelved in long rows of berths stacked three high. There was barely enough room to walk between them, much less run, as many insisted on doing, despite her repeated warnings. And it wasn't like there was any place for them to go. Beyond their bunks, there was only an adjoining common activity area that doubled as a mess. When they weren't eating, they were trying to destroy it. The students weren't exactly younglings, but they were without sit supervision for the first time in their lives, locked in a confined space, with nervous energy to spare. Even the young adults seemed to be devolving to the lowest maturity level in the room. Their activities were in real danger of doing lasting damage to the bolted-down furniture, if not the body of the ship. Kara was glad they'd forgotten the way to where the artillery was stored. And there were three more roomfuls on other decks, each demanding Kara's attention. Even at that, there hadn't been enough space. While Rusher's ship had once carried more than 3,000 warriors, the majority worked shifts and shared accommodations. Kara had been forced to put several on the floor in the hallway outside, generally the older students she'd deputized as chaperones. Most of them were happy enough for the chance to get out of the big rooms and actually experience silence again. It had been an exhausting period. She'd encountered problems she'd never imagined dealing with before, situations taxing all the logistical skills she'd developed under Van Artrice's tutelage. Because another feature of Deveronian society meant that almost all its travelers were male, the refresher facilities on the deck were communal, offering none of the privacy that several of the species under her care required, herself included. She'd started running lines to the refresher on each deck. But even that had been a struggle to set up. She'd soon found that industrial heuristics had brought recruits from several of Damon's worlds, not just Dark Nell, to Gazari. While the recruiters she'd met had spoken basic, well, one of them had, several of the species on board didn't know a word. How did you tell a Wookiee to wait his turn to relieve himself? There was more. They all breathed oxygen, but the living quarters were always too hot or cold for someone, usually too hot, as the trip dragged on. 
some of the species couldn't be billeted near each other for olfactory reasons or otherwise. And putting always amorous pubescent zeltrons on a cruise ship with anyone had been a total mistake. These were things industrial heuristics had already thought out, she was told, the Arxium was designed as a multi-species facility. More than once, Kara found herself wishing one would miraculously appear. Little help had come from the brigade members. People had assisted her on occasion under orders, but for the most part, few, beyond young Beetle, volunteered. Most stayed to their own decks. Kara had wondered aloud about that before Novalo, the middle-aged human engineer. Kara found the woman otherwise unburdened with the hardship of a personality, but nonetheless asked whether the crew members were always so hostile to civilians. Sometimes. Novalo had answered. But that's not it. Your brats are sleeping in their dead friends' bunks. Rusher had been little kinder, for the few minutes she'd actually seen him in the past week. She'd only caught him a couple of times in the days since Gazari, always when he was on the way to someplace else. Everything involving the refugees he delegated, particularly to the spacey but well-meaning Duros. It was probably the most she could expect from someone who worked for the Sith. He was the wrong person to look to for assistance, much less compassion. In stark contrast had been the old-timer named Dackett, who claimed to have a lifetime of experience in quartering integrated crews. Like the guns in the hold, the man seemed made of Sarasian iron. When Kara had first seen him, he was in medbay, loudly refusing to allow the medics to reattach his arm until worse off gunners had been treated. It had been too late to save the limb by the time they'd gotten to him, but he was more concerned about making ship and crew whole again. He'd never been officially restored to his duties as far as she knew, but the droids had given up sedating him after the fourth futile day of trying to keep him confined. The man reminded her a bit of a friend she'd made on Shalot, totally living for the people. It was good to have any help at all. Dackett was more familiar with the species living in the Grimani sector and in several cases had sent over gunners who could serve as interpreters. More important, he'd made the food situation their one bright spot. Rusher's brigade ate better than anyone she'd met in the Daemonate, and even with the large number of refugees, they still numbered less than the ship's regular complement. Most of the students' dietetic needs had been addressed by what was in the larder, the gunners were a diverse bunch. But watching the teenagers, Kara saw that many either gorged themselves, hoarded food in their berths, or both. The hardships of years of slavery weren't going away on a single starship ride. The saddest thing was how many, amid all the tumult, sat in silence, shell-shocked by recent events. How could she explain everything that had happened to them, in any language? And when she did speak to them, all wanted to know one thing, what would happen to them now? Kara wondered, too. There were so many of them. She thought seriously more than once about taking them all back where they'd come from. But there were all sorts of problems with that. Even if she could get Rusher to agree, a prospect she put little stock in, they hadn't all hailed from the same place. And even if they did return to Damon's territory, his forces simply weren't going to welcome their arrival. She envisioned going to one planet only to see the students forcibly redistributed again, perhaps as pawns in yet another deadly scheme. And that was unacceptable. Damon Specter, she'd realized, was the unifying thread in the stories of the few refugees she'd gotten to know. Like Eger, the diminutive Ortolan, whose toddler sister had died from the poisons in Damon's water. Eger's parents had delayed reporting her death for a year in order to accumulate enough rations to buy a positive recommendation from his factory shift leader. Or Yuru, the Snivian teenager, whose four older siblings had died in Damon's slave armies. His lookalike father had attended work disguised as him the day industrial heuristics came to administer its tests. The most heartbreaking case was Luria, a human girl, ten years old at most. Her family had the misfortune to live on one of the frontier worlds passed back and forth between Daemon and Odeon. After successive invasions, only Luria's teenage sister remained from her family until the day that her sister, too, did not return home. For a week, the child lived in panic, knowing nothing until corporate scouts arrived, seemingly convinced that Luria was a budding expert in repulsor lift design. 
Now she sat all day in her bunk, folding and refolding the ragged blue headband that was the last connection to her sister. Kara had no answers for the girl, but her own question had been answered. Gubb had been the first to suggest it, days earlier. He might have wanted to keep his granddaughter around, but it was more important to him that she be transported to a better place, with a better life. Kara had thought to make Darknell a better place for everyone by doing away with Damon. If she'd failed at that, at least she could make sure that Luria's sister and all the other guardians had not made their sacrifices in vain. She'd gotten Tan and the others out of the Daemonate. Now she had to make sure they wound up in a safe place. If such a thing existed in Sith space. Don't move, Kara. I've got you in my sights. Kara looked over to the short ashen blur behind the mess counter. If you want to be silent, Tan, you'd better turn the sound baffles on. Stepping over, she gave the amorphous shape a kindly swat. And you've still got some growing to do, if you want to hunt Sith. Blast! Tan Tango pulled off the mask of the stealth suit, causing the system to deactivate. The Celestin was a comical sight, binding the outfit in a dozen different ways just to get it to fit. The Bothan's mask was a better match for her bulbous facial features, but the rest of it was so scrunched that the baffles couldn't do their jobs. I thought I had you that time. The suit had made Tan, now Kara's bunkmate again, the life of what had once been the Satsgar barracks. Kara certainly had no interest in using the thing ever again, though she had wondered a few times if by turning it inside out, she might shut out the noise of the deck. And Tan now clung to anything having to do with Kara. Some of it was the situation, she knew, but not all of it. Just as a nanny and part-time tutor, Kara already had been Tan's hero on Dark Now. Learning that the bedtime stories her human big sister had told her back then were true, and that Kara was one of the Jedi Knights she'd described? That was heaven. Watching Tan strike a sequence of action poses in the comically large suit, Kara rolled her eyes. Her comet had picked up a tail. Aren't you sleepy yet? Dark Nell time, Kara. Kara yawned. That excuse won't last forever. She looked over at the open door at the back of the galley. Were you just wearing that thing outside? Tan giggled. Just trying it out again. Again. Find out anything juicy? Well, if you're trying to pin down the elusive captain, you'll find him two decks up in the solarium. Tan smirked. I followed that skinny Duros. Good girl. Five Jedi points for you. Rusher emptied another square glass. Lum Ale wasn't his favorite, but he wasn't going to waste the good stuff. Not this week. The solarium always seemed to have a silly name to him. The space liner part of diligence went from stars to stars. No one was going to get a tan watching hyperspace blur by. But they'd left the little room intact, partially because it gave Rusher a place to unwind and study his history holos. Neither facts nor fermentation were working for him today. Rusher had been in constant motion since the first hyperspace jump, one of a series needed to escape Damon's territory. Inventory and casualties, casualties and inventory. There'd been not a minute to think about where they were going, or what he might do then. He'd made sure of it. The crew expected, no, needed, to see the same Jero Rusher they always had. Upbeat. Joking. Ready with a quotation or an alternate history in a millisecond. And he had given them that. On the bridge, in the ward room, and, most of all, in Med Bay. He'd learned that from his mentor Yulon, before the bad times. Units take losses. Leaders take charge. But he didn't know how to take this one. As they'd figured it, Diligence now had but two working battalions. One laser battalion, Ripper, fully outfitted and staffed with the merger of personnel from Coinscar, and one missile battalion in Zaboka. He hadn't led so few in more than a decade. For cargo ramps on each side seemed superfluous. Ripper and Zaboka each had a side of the ship to themselves. Running too small a crew in Sith space was perilous, even beyond the hazards of the battlefield. As he'd just seen with Damon, 
Sith lords absorbed independent operations into their slave armies all the time. Size meant effectiveness, which meant independence. And security, security they wouldn't have now. Historical knowledge, like power, was fragmented in Sith space. But try as he might, he couldn't remember any cases where enslaved units lasted long enough to be remembered, much less faded by later generations. Love of history had, in fact, led to Russia's independence in the first place. He'd had the relative good fortune to be born into the systems of Lord Mandragal. A real throwback, Mandragal had known more about the Sith of old than most of his rivals, and had used that knowledge to develop the scheme that had, thus far, kept Sith talons off diligence. He'd found it, of all places, in the recordings of Elcho Kresh, whose father, Ludo, had figured in the Great Hyperspace War millennia before. Ludo had made his son sit out that disastrous conflict in a hidden location. But though frail of frame, Elcho was not one to take the Sith Empire's failure idly. Elcho spent years developing a counterattack plan, making the most of the small forces available to him. The concept, as Mandragal had learned from one of tentacle-faced Elcho's holocrons, was simple, and quite applicable to his modern world. When most Sith lords raised their armies solely from their enslaved populations, Kresh family rival Naga Sado had fared better by absorbing outside cultures with different skills. Elcho, exiled outside the Stygian caldera, saw an even wider variety of forces that similarly might be brought to bear against the Republic. Pirate bands, mercenary militias, species holding a grudge, any number of potential allies existed. Through them, a small number of Sith believers could project great force. It wasn't necessary to have Sith officers aboard every ship, Elcho reasoned, so long as bargains were constructed properly. Offering promises of operational autonomy and a share of the spoils, Elcho built an impressive force from spare parts. But his counterstroke against the Republic was never delivered. For while Elcho's father had tried to shield his son from harm at every turn, even fashioning a protective amulet for him, no magic could save the young Sith from his own foolishness. Drinking deeply at revels on the eve of invasion, Elcho had suffered a ruptured stomach, killing him within hours. His invasion force, strung together only with his own agreements, soon dissipated. But his ideas lived on, in a holocron discovered by Lord Mandragal in his youth. With neighbors on all sides declaring themselves Sith lords, the friendless Mandragal found he didn't have the blaster fodder to throw at his opponents. When droids failed to protect his interstellar borders, he consulted the recordings and followed the long-dead leader's dictates to the letter. There was something slightly romantic about the notion, Rusher thought, nearly three millennia after his death, Elcho's grand plan finally got its trial. Indeed, Mandragal made significant inroads against his opponents, flexing muscles that didn't really belong to him. More than three-quarters of Mandragal's combat forces were independent operations, fleeing from the threat of enslavement by other Sith lords. Most were more than willing to fight in Mandragal's name in exchange for continued autonomy and access to the resources and recruits they needed. But in the end, Mandragal, as mortal as Elcho, surrendered to human foible. Twenty years earlier, Damon and Odian's mother, a wretched monster by the name of Zelian, seduced the aging Mandragal and slew him in the night. Rivals pounced, only to discover that Mandragal's great army was mostly ephemeral. But the model had been created, or recreated, for Beld Yulon, and many who came after. And for Russia, although maybe not for much longer. Human foible. He turned the glass in his hand. How many mistakes on Ghazari had been his? He'd known death spirals existed, if not on the scale that they saw. Should he have developed some tactic, just in case? How many of those who remained would suffer for his failure? The door slid open, behind. Master Dackett, he said, not looking back. How's the arm? Skinnier. And it smells like something that came out of a Kalor slug. No wife number four this season, then. About time you gave the rest of us a chance. Rusher filled another glass and proffered it. Anesthetic? I won't take your pity. Dackett said. 
but I will take your drink. Settling his mass into the second chair, he reached instinctively for the glassy cube, only to see that it was the robotic hand that he had raised. He glared at it. Down, you. Seemingly reluctantly, the cybernetic limb withdrew. Rusher chuckled. You too are going to have some negotiating to do. Yeah, well, we're not alone. Dackett seized the drink with his flesh hand and downed it. You're going to have to do something about all of this. You've got a handle on the rest of it, but we don't have the bunks for all these refugees. Then put him on the floor. I can't walk the halls amidships now without putting my boot into some someone's gullet. The master responded. And we've got food now, but we're gonna run out of some stores pretty soon. He slammed the empty glass on the table. And some of the people, Brig. I got Skrillings eating the trash, down there. Maybe we can ration that, Rusher said, knocking another swig back. This isn't entirely new, you know. We have picked up riders before. Dackett grew more animated. Yes, but those were military. Infantry. Shock marines. People from other militias. And they usually gave us something for the ride. The refugees had nothing to give them at all. Rusher looked at the shadows on the floor. If they were trying Dackett's patience after just a couple of days, Rusher was glad not to have gone near them. Well, you know the score, Ryland. We haven't found a place to dump them off yet. Blast it, Brig! You're not even looking! Dackett stood abruptly. I don't get it! That buffoon kid! Labun? I know what I said! We were going to lose him on the first sender that had a hyperspace buoy. Rusher looked up. The kid saved your life, Dak. Not before he ran over my foot with the cargo crawler. Rusher set his glass down and stared blankly at the bottle. Maybe I don't want an empty ship just yet. Dackett sat back down. Now we're getting somewhere. He looked directly at his commander. Look, I see it, too. My whole staff bought it on that ridge. But I can tell you now, there's nobody in this crowd you can make into a gunner any better than you can that Duro's kid. He placed the lid on the bottle. The quicker we clear the decks, the quicker we can get some new people. Some new battalions. Rusher glared. Shooting what? Sharp insults? Whatever we give them. Dackett said. Until we win enough fights to get more guns. But there's no room for anyone new, until you make it. He rose again, leaving a giant crease in the chair. I'm not gonna tell you how you need to feel, Brig, but I'm gonna tell you how you need to act. You can't let them just see you going through the motions. You've got to do something. Pull the trigger. All right, Rusher said, smirking. How should we do it, then? Airlock or poison? Maybe poison. Dackett said, opening the door. He's ready to see you, ma'am. Kara Holt stood in the doorway. It's about blasted time. Chapter 12 Kara had been trained as a Jedi Knight. She excelled in tracking. She'd been living in Sith space for weeks with only her recollections of star maps to tell her where she was. And yet, somehow, Brigadier Rusher had ditched her again. She'd followed Tan's directions to the Solarium only to meet Master Dackett, who offered to go in first and smooth the way. Finally inside, she'd prepared to launch into her list of demands for the refugees when Rusher stood and excused himself to the refresher in the next room. Looking at the empty bottles, Kara understood why, and seeing his cane still propped beside the chair, she thought nothing of the interruption. Until Rusher never returned. After banging on the door, she'd finally opened it, to find no facilities whatsoever. It was a service access way leading to a ladder. It was Era Damino's all over again, substituting only an eccentric Sith lackey for the eccentric Sith Lord. What was it with these men hiding on their spaceships? Now, fully three hours later, Kara had him pinpointed again, decks away, in the wardroom, in the middle of spinning a tale about some old battle for his underlings. She wondered if he had a secret twin. Combat Rusher had been headstrong, but somber, that was the version she'd seen in the Solarium. 
This was the mess table variety, Joker and Huckster. Storming in, Kara was determined to get some answers out of one of those personalities. Stop, she yelled, shaking his walking stick at him. Move again, and you'll need this cane for real. Rusher looked at her, and then to the expectant faces around him. He let out a hearty laugh, which they joined in. Duty calls. He said, rising. Catching a few of the grimier gunners leering at her, she was suddenly glad they hadn't gone anywhere near her refugees. This rusher was hardly running a Republic Navy vessel. But then, what could she expect from a sit stooge? Some answers. Where are you running off to this time? An emergency on the bridge? She followed him into the anteroom. Another brewery to bankroll? I had been drinking, young lady. Rusher said, reclaiming his cane. I needed a walk to clear my head before attending to your very important problems. Thank you for patronizing me. It's my pleasure. He said, turning down the long hall toward the bridge. So, Jedi, we don't get your kind around here. You're out here on official business. Not quite. Kara explained Vanertrice's mission to the Daemonate and how she'd gotten stranded. You've heard of Treese, I'm sure. No. Should I have? Kara chewed her lip. She'd have thought that all Treese's efforts would have made more of an impact. Intellectually, she knew that Sith space took in many sectors and untold numbers of systems, and that there was nothing like mass communications here. But Rusher seemed to know things, or, at least, he pretended to. It was disappointing. But Rusher seemed to grow more interested as she spoke. He clearly understood the workings of the Republic, even if he'd never been there. If you're not officially sanctioned by the Jedi Order, he said, or by the Chancellor, then how did you get a ride out here? He recounted what he knew of the Republic Navy's sometimes tentative relationship with the Jedi. He'd met a couple of former commanders, cut off here decades earlier in Sith space. They wouldn't ferry a rogue Jedi to a cantina without someone's stamp of approval. You don't break into Sith space flying commercial. We paid the way ourselves. Oh. So you guys are like Jellic going into Cable, or Revan, before, what was it? Garlist? No, Cathar. He snapped his fingers. I get my massacred cat people mixed up. Are you like this all the time? I don't know, I'm not really around myself all the time. Kara began to walk away. I'll come back when you've sobered up. Rusher grabbed her wrist and chuckled. No, I'm fine. He said, releasing her. We don't get much news from the Republic here. He patted the bulkhead warmly. What's this thing's name, again? Diligence. It's named for one of the inexpugnable class Republic ships from the Mandalorian Wars. He said. Admiral Morvis's ship. You know, Dallin Morvis was very much misunderstood. People assume that because you're born to wealth, you don't know what you're doing. Walking again, Rusher nattered on about the exploits of Morvis's crew, and then more about his ship. Kara tuned him out. Soldered together out of spare parts, diligence would never have been permitted in any Republic battle fleet. And yet Rusher was so proud of it. The man was a total mystery. He seemed to want to emulate the military leaders of old, and yet he had so little to work with. And the ship's name. That just seemed sort of sad, like a garbage scout driver naming his ship for one of the great exploration vessels. And I've always said, if Exer Kun had artillery at Taprua, your Jedi Chancellor would be sporting yellow eyes today. Can we get to the subject? Kara stood in front of him, arms akimbo. We have to deal with the refugee problem. Yes, you're right. Rusher said, nodding. When can we get rid of them? What? He pushed past her down the hallway. You said we had a refugee problem. I agreed. I never really intended for you all to stay aboard this long. He looked up. There was just more to take care of first. Kara steamed. I'll say. 
and I've been taking care of it. She stalked down the hall after him. And get rid of them. That's just great. She shook her hands as she walked. I'm not sure what I should have expected from someone who works for Sith Lords. Who else am I supposed to work for? The Republic? Rusher laughed. I don't know if you've noticed, but they closed all their branch offices. Pausing, he looked back at her for a moment, studying her. Kara flinched under his gaze. What? Just remembering what that kind of energy was like. He turned and began walking again. I've counted six hyperspace jumps. Are you telling me we haven't found a single suitable port since then? Depends on what you mean by suitable. Rusher said, climbing the ramp toward the double doors leading to the bridge. And whether I care about your definition. Suitable for me means a place where Damon won't shoot at me on sight for fleeing. Kara gawked. We're still not out of the Daemonate? We couldn't very well cross into Odeon's territory, or Bactra's. Not without knowing what in blazes is going on. He slapped the button to activate the doors. It's required some detours. Kara watched the general half limping down the steps into the command pit. His leg really was giving him pain, she saw, but he kept forgetting to put the cane in the correct hand. Huckster. Rusher stood behind the signals officer. We've been trying to scan for any news at all, to see what the score is. We don't know. Maybe it is safe for us. He looked up at Kara, who shook her head. Damon wanted the kids for his military-industrial brain trust, she said. He'd find them. And if there's the slightest chance Damon and Odeon have united, this is no place for them, or you. She was glad he seemed to readily agree. It doesn't make any sense. He said. I mean, really, you have no idea how much blood has been shed between these two. I have an inkling. That was an understatement, she thought. Damon and Odeon have been at each other's throats, well, since Chagra died. Chagra. Kara knew the name from the intel reports and Vanner stories. The Chagra hegemony had been a relatively stable period in Grimani sector politics during which the Sith made inroads against the Republic. The invasion of her Aquilarian home had come during the hegemony. Luckily for civilization, it hadn't lasted long. Eight years earlier, Chagras's death, under reportedly mysterious circumstances, had touched off a new round of internecine and fighting. Not just within his own realm, but seemingly everywhere in Sith space. Rusher confirmed that Odeon and Damon's war had broken out then, the creator of all things still in his late teens. But he had no idea what they were fighting over, or what had caused it all. Rusher knew of Chagra, he'd fought both for and against him in his younger days, but he'd never met him, and had no idea what had killed him. What kills any of them? He related the ends of Elcho and Mandragal. I don't know where longevity comes from with these people, but it isn't lifestyle. Kara knelt and rested her head against the railing, stray ebon strands falling on either side. None of it made any sense. Why would Odeon and Damon team up, even briefly? She sensed an unseen hand at work. But she always sensed that, among the Sith. Exasperated, she moaned audibly. Can't we just go to the Republic? Who said anything about going to the Republic? Rusher looked at the navigator. Ishal, do you know how to go to the Republic? The Mon Calamari shrugged. I sure don't. The brigadier said. Hey, how'd you get here? There was a lane to Damon's transport center near Shiloh, Kara said, rubbing her forehead against the cool railing. A headache was beginning. I don't think it's an option. I'll buy that. In the weeks since Odeon and Damon tangled over Shiloh, traffic from the Damonate military hub had doubled. I might amble by there with a ship full of Jedi, but not just one. Next time, bring some friends. Kara opened her eyes and glared through the railing. What did I say? Nothing, she said. She stood, knee joints cracking. Look, can you just get us closer to the Republic? What are you looking for, convenient connecting flights? 
I don't think you understand. The hyperspace lane options out here are pretty limited. Rusher called up a holographic display and pointed to the glowing lines. Avoiding Damon's and Odeon's space, they'd have to make another six jumps to get appreciably closer to the frontier with the Republic, and a couple of times they'd have to double back. And you've got different Sith waiting in between each of those jumps. They're not going to wave as we go past. Kara scowled. It was the chief difficulty she'd experienced since her arrival here. In the Republic, one could count on ready access to databases, including most of the known commercial hyperspace lanes. The military kept some private, and some corporations tried to keep newly discovered lanes secret when it benefited their trade. But in Sith space, everything was different. In shutting down its subspace communications relays here, the Republic had created a breakwater of ignorance between Sith space and the inner systems. No longer able to draw upon the collected knowledge of Republic spacers, Sith starship drivers were reduced to using the information they already had stored, plus whatever was in libraries and data centers in their territory. Repeated fragmentation of Sith power had greatly degraded what was available in the latter, as Odeon had just done against Daemon, statelets often targeted each other's knowledge centers for destruction. Aboard one of Damon's fighters in the Shalow episode before Dark Nell, she had access to exactly one hyperspace route, the intended route Damon had planned for that vessel to take. Maps meant options. Possible escape. Cartography was power, and, increasingly, Sith Lords were hoarding it. Rusher clapped his hands loudly. Okay, I've got it here. Belura. Kara looked up at the display. Belura isn't closer to the Republic. It's farther away, she said. Farther away is not better. Sometimes it is, out here. Rusher touched a control, causing grid lines to appear in the air, delineating the latest territories known to the diligence crew. Belura belongs to the kids. What kids? I don't know. Rusher said, waving his hand through the display to move stars around. I've never been back this far. But they say there's a Sith principality that's run by children. Children? The idea sounded like a bad Republic holodrama. Kara imagined playground kingdoms run by angry young Sith with tousled hair. You don't mean that. Well, I don't know much about it. I always imagined it was some kind of regency deal, with the power behind the creche and all of that. Kara stared at the pseudo-stars and breathed deeply. If there was someone running the realm for them, she couldn't imagine the situation lasting very long, not where Sith were concerned. How recent is what you know about the place? Heard from someone who went near there once. They've been in power for five years, at least. He said. Sounds odd to me, too. None of these Sith underlings is very patient. I would think old uncle would have done them in by now, or old aunt, or the palace pastry chef. Seeing Rusher smile, Kara gave in. If he was pleased with his solution, moving him might take another week. I don't see we have any choice, she said. I guess, whatever happens, they can't be as hateful as the adults. There were other kids at that Jedi school, weren't there? Rusher asked. You have met some before. He glanced back toward the exit. I mean, before this week. Ignoring him, Kara started toward the exit. There would be a lot to do, presuming the place was remotely satisfactory. Which she wasn't at all sure it would be. None of them sets foot off this ship until I check the place out, mercenary. Sounding amused at the label, Rusher called after her. This is Sith space, Jedi. We're not going to find our way out and we're not going to find the paradise you're looking for. Scaling the steps from the command pit, he found her in the doorway, glaring back at him. He shrugged and raised his hands. You're just going to have to settle for the best we can find, and the best is the least worst. Kara stared back at him, icily. Rusher turned to his crew and smiled, again the jolly drunkard. You know, I'm glad I got that out. I nearly said least beast. No, she said. That would have fit. Regent Aspect The girl called. It wasn't a command, this time. 
Kalishin woke from his daze and looked toward the pile of orange pillows at the center of the room. It was happening again. The boy atop the plush mountain was shaking, droplets of sweat streaming from his pale forehead. The fever had returned. Quillen was seeing the future. The future, or something so far outside his frame of reference that it tested his understanding. Black eyes searched the room, as the human searched for, what? Words. Fourteen years old, and Quillen had never spoken once in Collision's presence. Kneeling beside him, his sister, Dramica, fought to follow the boy's trembling movements. Making small, frantic motions with her hands before her frail sibling's face, she fought to capture his attention. Collision stepped as close as he dared. Only the care droids were allowed to physically approach the twins, and he was only supposed to address them from his dais. Standing anywhere closer disoriented Quillen too much. The teenager's perceptions were too strong. Everything that made Saj Kalishan an individual was already shining through the force, blinding the boy. Additional visual stimuli only overwhelmed him. It was the reason, he now remembered, for his robe, colored to match the walls. Her brother calmed, Dramica spoke for him, as she always did. Regent Aspect she said, tracing in the air with her fingers. Regent will sense the approach of new aspects. She said, voice wavering. I will sense the approach of new aspects, Kalishan droned. The Kravaki closed his eyes and tried to focus his mind. Aspects. It was how Quillen and Dramica referred to all agencies outside themselves, organic or electronic. Twins, separated in body, but conjoined through the force, one being, that no power in science or Sith alchemy could separate. They had been just five years old when he met them, very young, as humans went, and they had never, in Kalishan's memory, set foot outside their loft. And yet, Kalishan had realized on meeting them that they represented that which he most desired, power. True power, beyond the imaginings of any of the neighboring Sith pretenders. Power that would one day rule the galaxy. Dramica clenched her long blonde hair in her fists. Regent will find the aspects, and include them. Kalishan repeated the command. His audience over, he stepped back outside the sibling's lair. The nanny droid passed, ready again to help Dramica in her hours of grooming. He had his own job to do. Include. There had been a time, long ago, when he hadn't understood that instruction. He hadn't really belonged, then. His ego had still stood in the way of enlightenment. He was still thinking of other Kravaki, and what his outfit looked like, and how he might be the one Sith to put down the Republic once and for all. All trivia. Such information was useless to his masters. It need not exist. And soon, none of their rivals would exist, either. Gliding down the spiral ramp to a lower floor, the regent spied the creature that would help make it happen. The giant brain floated, asleep, in its cloud. Collision stared at it. Adrift in its cylinder of deadly cyanogen gas, the grotesque alien form paid him no mind. The Salegian was old. It had been the first one that Collision had captured and brought to the loft, years earlier. Already two centuries old by then, the monstrosity had been no match for its abductors. The alien still bore signs of being brought to heel, Several of its hanging dendrites were no more than stumps, severed by the torturers. Kalishan hated Salegians. One of his few lingering memories was of being mocked as a child, Saj Salegian, the other Kravaki had called him, jealous of his piercing intelligence. During his Sith education, he had finally encountered real Salegians at one of their colonies on Tramanos. If he hadn't already disliked them, he would have started then. The creatures flew about in their self-propelled gas envelopes, trying to participate in the world's commerce as if they weren't colossal floating brains. By never acknowledging their own ugliness, they seemed to expect others to ignore it, as well, an uncomfortable burden for their counterparts, to say the least. And while the Salegians had inborn telepathic skills, enabling them to surmount all language barriers, they seemed to have little interest in using their special abilities for influence and power. Ludicrous. What was an advantage if one didn't press it? 
Kalishan had harbored no compunctions about using what they wouldn't. Within days of being appointed guardian of the twins, he'd arranged to have this first specimen, never known by any name other than, one, brought in. The results had been so positive that he had worked to lure entire Salesian communities to Balura. Thousands of the creatures had settled in the capital city of Hestabil. But while one was old, it had proven itself unmatched at its job. It was time for it to prove itself again. Kalishan raised his hand before the cylinder. You will contact the defensive stations, he said, hammering at one through the force. For a moment, the mass of grey and crimson sat, unresponsive, in the foggy soup. But then the Salegian's chilly response echoed through the regent's mind, I will contact the defensive stations. You will report the appearance of any strangers immediately. I will report the appearance of any strangers immediately. Collision shivered as he watched the tendrils beneath the creature beginning to stir. Violet blood pulsated through thin membranes on the creature's pate. The being was coming to life, contacting the other minds in the facility. Its telepathy had a limited range, less than a kilometer, but that would reach all the intended parties on the island. And more. The regent stared at the transparisteel container. Years earlier, he would have flinched, moving quickly to avoid seeing the repulsive thing in action. Now he couldn't remember what it was he had once found so nauseating. He watched idly for a minute, until, moving, he caught a reflection of someone he didn't recognize in the glass. He looked about for several seconds before realizing the image reflected was his own. Facial tendrils drooping, he trudged back upstairs to his assigned place near the twins. Chapter 13 Rusher had said she wouldn't find paradise. The brigadier had clearly never been to Balura. The capital city, Hestabil, was constructed on a waterfall. No, it had been constructed as a waterfall, or more precisely, a river delta carved into a steep diagonal slope. Kara had seen the remarkable formation on their approach from orbit. Belura's largest landform was a high plateau, separated from the sea by towering escarpments all around everywhere but near the southern bay, where the drop-off to the ocean had been sculpted into terraces. A grid of canals cut in a hexagonal pattern broke each terrace up into hundreds of six-sided city blocks, with water cascading pleasantly down from one level to the next through dams. Raindrops from the tropical forests at the continent's center, high above, thus completed their long journey into a rippling blue sound, lapping at the edge of the geometrical shore. Kara turned toward the pinkish sun and inhaled deeply. Fresh ocean air filled her lungs, reminding her of her aquilarian home, years earlier. Avian creatures drifted lazily across the sea. There were no ships in the harbor, that seemed strange, but quite a few landing pads, like theirs, constructed on platforms above the gentle surf and connected to the city, behind, by bridges. At this distance, she couldn't see much detail to the terrace city, Dakit had been called away before she could ask for a pair of macro binoculars. Even as obviously engineered as the metropolis was, though, the shape seemed in harmony with the surroundings. Low, featureless structures squatted on the hexagonal steps running up the embankment, with bridges running across the canals. Nowhere to be seen were the smokestacks of Darknell or the mining pits of Shiloh. The Sith didn't build this, she thought. This was a Republic world. She put it on her mental list of places to visit when they finally took it back. The only thing marring the beauty of the scene was the Mesa. A flattened mountain the same height as the mainland plateau perched in the middle of the bay, several kilometers from the shore. Kara imagined it to be some granite remnant of erosion, or perhaps a chunk separated from the continent by whatever seismic event created the bay. There was something constructed atop it, she saw, almost a squash dome overhanging the mesa on all sides and making the formation resemble a giant below mushroom. Occasional airspeeders buzzed back and forth from the mesa to the city. And there was something else, in the bay, buoys the size of starfighters, bobbing in concentric rings radiating from the mesa to the mainland. Odd. And odder still, no one had come to meet them. Jedi, I think you made out better than you could have hoped. Kara turned to see Rusher at the bottom of one of the starboard ramps. Once it had become clear that no welcoming party was on the platform, she'd hit the surface first, followed by Novalo and her crews checking hull integrity. 
but Rusher had taken his time to emerge. It's quiet, Kara said. Nobody stopped us, anyway. Rusher said. Strange-looking fighters in orbit hadn't even moved when they exited hyperspace. Nobody had even hailed them until they were on final approach, when a guttural voice came on the comm system directing diligence to one of the platforms ringing the bay. And we know we're not in Daemon space. He said. The brigadier knelt and pointed to the tiled surface of the landing platform. Diligence was parked upon a colossal letter auric formed by chalk-colored hexagons. No little flags. The alphabet's normal here. I don't know, Kara said. Maybe Damon's revelation workers haven't gotten around to stonework yet. But she likewise doubted that this was Damon's territory. All those orderly rows of city blocks and no holographic statues that she could see. Or real ones, for that matter. And it definitely wasn't Odeon's territory. There was still a city to see even if she'd only seen a small number of figures moving about. Rusher stretched, lifting his walking stick high into the air. Well, it looks good to me. He said, turning to face the cargo ramp. He cupped his hand to his cheek and yelled. Deploy. At once, the other seven cargo ramps clanked open. Metal plating rumbled as the first batch of refugees came thundering down the ramp behind Rusher. Kara leapt toward the foot of the ramp, nearly knocking the brigadier over. Wait! Wait! She looked up. Dackett was leading the exodus, with Beetle Laboon nearly lost in the stream of bodies. The tromping continued over her voice until she ignited her lightsaber. And yelled, Nobody move! The puzzled crowd stopped in its tracks, although more students continued to descend the other ramps. Kara shot an irritated look at Dackett. So that's where you got called away to. The master shrugged, nodding toward his superior's back. Lightsaber shining, Kara pointed it toward the brigadier's chest. I told you, I needed to check the place out first. I thought that's what you were doing, down here. Rusher said, looking down with annoyance at the glowing tip. Were you just checking out the sea air? Kara deactivated the lightsaber and stepped closer to him. I need to do a proper recon, Brigadier, she yelled. Do you even know what that is? The man stared down at her, coolly. They'd played this game over the past couple of days on the way here, but he'd always chosen the battlefield. She could tell, bickering with the little Jedi girl was something that won him points with his soldiers. But he'd always had the upper hand, or been able to pretend whatever he was giving in about wasn't important. She wasn't going to let him get away with that now, even if she had to break him right here, in front of his top officers and all the refugees. I think. Rusher said, speaking slowly. That there's shelter up in that city. Room for a lot more people than my ship has. And nobody shot at us for being here. He counted on his fingers, ticking off the benefits of Belura. Shelter. Security. Sustenance. I win. Goodbye. He began to move, but Kara blocked him. We don't know anything about the Sith that run this place. Why aren't they here yet? Maybe they've gone swimming. Rusher said. It's a nice day for it. Look, I've told you. On a data pad, this place has everything you need. These things are all theory to you. Do I look like a theorist? Rusher smirked. Kara saw he was playing to his crew again. She wasn't going to allow it. I think you don't care. You haven't even come up to see the refugees the whole time we've been aboard. She gestured toward the crowd of students listening on the ramp. Is that why you're in artillery? So you never have to see who you're attacking? Rusher exploded. Now, you wait a minute. Abruptly grabbing her shoulders, he turned her behind one of the ramp hoists out of sight of most of the crowd. Startled by his sudden movement, Kara looked up at him. You think this isn't real to me? The brigadier spoke quickly in Kara's face, trying to keep his voice down. 
I may not see who I'm shooting, little Jedi, but I always see who gets shot. I've got kids your Celestin's age and younger that I've had to carry away from deployments in vials. Yanking a surprised beetle from the line of escorts, he folded the kid's ear back to reveal an embedded chip. I've got comm frequency tags on all my people so I know who's where, and when. He said. I don't leave anyone behind unless going after them is going to get more of my people killed than it saves. But when that's the case, like on Ghazari, I go. He straightened and looked back at the ramp. Carrying your people is going to get my people killed. Kara simmered. This was yet another side to Rusher, but it was clear he was serious this time. Serious, she could deal with. One hour, she said. Rusher looked toward the bridge to the city and stepped back toward the cargo ramp. Ripping the comlink headset from Beetle, he pitched it to Kara. One hour. Kara bolted across the tarmac toward the corrugated pathway. Rusher turned, gesturing to his troops to reboard the refugees. He was almost in their midst when he was interrupted by the Jedi, standing at the edge of the bridge and looking back. Oh, and Brigadier? Jedi don't leave anyone behind either, she said. It's a good trait. She turned and ran toward the city. The time was now. Collision paced the perimeter of the circular penthouse, as excited as he had been in years. He could even feel the tips of his tentacles, without the animating power of Dromica's commands. After eight years of plotting, eight years of banal arrangements made in the name of his dual masters, all was coming to fruition. And it all had to do with the new arrivals, down below. The regent returned to the northern window to study the strange-looking warship again. One had reported its arrival from hyperspace first, passing on word from the orbital sentries. Now it was clearly visible on its landing platform, separated from the mesa and the loft, atop it, by a few kilometers of seawater. According to plan, the starship's occupants had been allowed to debark without interference. Certainly, they would want to do so. Belura was pleasing to the organic eye, even if Collision could no longer remember why. In the design he had implemented for his young charges, Belura was the planetary equivalent of a Windorian Gorsk plant, a pretty flower with a paralyzing sting. Population, manufacturing output, military strength, all these things had grown steadily in the diarchy in the past eight years because when people came to visit, they stayed, whether they intended to or not. And very soon, thanks to his efforts, Quillen and Dramica would export Belura's brand of welcome to the other worlds within their space, and beyond. Planets controlled by the twins today would hew even more tightly to their commands, clearing the way for the diarchy to expand. And now, at last, Collision knew what direction they would expand in. The diarchy had several Sith neighbors, ranging from the watchful Arcadianate to the pretenders of the Shagrasi remnant. But no border was wider than the one the twins shared with the accursed Lord Daemon. Like their other neighbors, Daemon had been reluctant to either ally with or declare war on their diarchy. Collision had spoken with him several times, always by hologram. The narcissistic Lord of Presumption had never seemed to understand his younger rivals, and what Daemon didn't understand, he dismissed. That was well, the Kravaki thought, Quillen and Dramica lacked the forces for an all-out confrontation. But now Damon had made a critical error. A strategic move against Lord Bactra, in concert with his brother, Odian. Collision knew very well why they had done it, he had received the message on the special channel, too. But while the diarchy was too remote to share in the dismemberment of the Bactran territories, it did front a tantalizing number of systems in the Daemonate's rear. A rear now unguarded. Damon would expand into Bactra's space only to lose his own. The Sari warship below had been the harbinger. Word of Damon's move against Bactra had filtered in, but the appearance of the vessel, Diligence, the commander had called it, served as confirmation. When asked, the mercenary had even transmitted his reasons for visiting Belura, delivering student refugees from the Battle of Ghazari. Kalishan knew that Damon would never have allowed the escape of any portion of his workforce, so long as he had ships in the area to stop it. It was all the confirmation they needed. Quillen had already sensed it, of course, and when Dramica gave the command, 
it had taken collision mere moments to put the plan into action. The battleships, under construction for years, were ready in their secret docks. Within a day, maybe within hours, all would be underway. For the first time in months, Collision felt truly alive. Not as an individual, but as a part of things. Big things, as foreseen by his masters. It didn't matter that the mechanics of the plan were his. The Sith Code had it wrong. Through victory, my chains are broken. The chains were the victory. By binding the weak, the chains were the victors. In the midst of his elation, a stray thought entered the regent's mind, passed on by the Salegian, downstairs. Someone is approaching Hestabil from the warship. And the students are reboarding. Collision stopped. That didn't make sense. Diligence's captain had indicated readiness to offload his passengers. What could cause him to change his mind? Nothing. Unless they weren't what he said they were. Unless they were part of some kind of daemonite trick. Collision lurched backward. He wasn't the only one who'd heard the one's thought. Tentacles flailing within his robe, the regent flurried, against his will, back onto the diamond dais before the twins. Dramica faced him, green eyes glistening. He knew her command before she gave it. But he obeyed, nonetheless. As always. Was it the salt? Or the wind? Kara didn't know what it was about seaside settlements, but they never seemed to look as nice up close as they did from the ocean, or from above. The buildings of Hestabil were mostly white and beige, many sandstone constructs drawing from what she guessed were local materials. But for some reason every place she'd passed looked dingy. Uncared for. Even the newer buildings had a light sheen of dirt on walls facing the harbor. Large reflecting pools built into several of the terrace levels had a coat of algae almost thick enough to walk across. The seams between the small tiles that made up the pathways were caked with mildew. There wasn't a lot of spray coming from the cataracts, but it looked like whatever hit the streets was never wiped away. Every walkway she found was slick, regardless of its proximity to water, and the bridges connecting the polygonal city blocks stank from their accumulated grime. This wasn't a place for running. Fortunately, she didn't seem to have a need to run, at least, not so far. Hestabil reminded her of some sleepier ports in the Republic, people of various species drifted about, ambling from one uninspired stone igloo to another. Duros. Kamasi. Ithorians. Celestans. None of them paid her the least bit of attention. Kara looked down. No, she hadn't gone out wearing the stealth suit, but she certainly felt invisible. Making sure her lightsaber was out of view in her vest pocket, she selected a wandering Ithorian to approach. Surely, she could engage her in a conversation about something. If nothing else, there was the gorgeous weather to talk about, and maybe Kara might learn something about the state of things on Belura. Excuse me, she said, stepping up to match the brown giant's lumbering gait. Hey! I'm talking to you. The Athorian barely looked down at all, continuing to walk toward one of the hexagonal silos that dotted the cityscape. No good, Kara thought. Language problem. She didn't know Athorian. But someone had to know basic. Spotting an elderly Duro's couple passing, she tried again. They actually stopped, but only to look at her with mute indifference. Kara turned in disgust, scanning the crowd. The people looked as shabby as the buildings, old clothes, barely fitting in many cases. And all with the same vacant expression. I'm in a droid factory. Kara's hour was nearly up when she chased down a female Celestin on one of the lower levels. Sullust was in a nearby sector, and she knew they understood basic there. If not, she understood a little Sullustese from her time with the Tangos. But again, she received the same sad stare. Kara searched the Celestin's bulging eyes. It was as if she wanted to respond, but couldn't remember the words. Remember our deal. Kara's comlink crackled. It was Rusher's voice, right on schedule. Stepping into an alcove, she spoke quickly, explaining what she'd seen. This doesn't look right to me, she said. Somehow, 
I knew it wouldn't. The voice responded. Well, you'd better hurry and find out whatever it is you're after. We just heard from Deep Voice again on the comm set. The Balurans saw the refugees on the platform, and they're sending people to help with our situation. Our situation? Kara goggled. How do they know about that? You told them? Hey, it's their planet. All the guy said was that they'd send someone by to direct the kids to a center. A center for what? For assigning living quarters. Those are the exact words. Rusher said. You've got to admit, it sounds innocent enough. Kara frowned. She agreed with the brigadier. As relocation practices went in sit space, it was downright mild. Before she could say anything else, Russia reported that his sentries had spotted someone's approach. Be careful, she said. The word is diligent. Russia responded. Oh, and be on the lookout, you've picked up a tail. Rusher out. Kara tapped the headset. Hello? What? A tail? What does he mean by that? Exasperating jerk, she grumbled aloud. He says the same thing about you. Came a voice from behind. Kara spun, angry at being caught unaware. There was nothing but the sidewalk and canal there until she looked down. Tan Tango, she growled. You followed me? Before the young Celestin could answer, Kara heard another familiar voice coming from the stone staircase leading down. There you are. Beetle Laboon said, sweat streaming from his emerald skull as he topped the stairs and saw Tan. The Duro soldier fell to his knees, hyperventilating. So many stairs. Tan looked at the Duros, and then up at Kara. Don't you know some kind of Jedi healing trick to help him? Help him how? By making him run laps every day? Kara put her arm around the recruit's chest and helped him toward the canal. Beetle surprised her by abruptly plunging his head into the burbling water. Kara exchanged glances with Tan until Beetle emerged, gasping. Thank you. What are the two of you doing here? Tan explains that she was in one of the groups that had come down the ramps from Diligence, but when the order came to re-embark, she had seen Kara running toward the city. She bolted, Master Holt. Beetle said, fingering the water from his ears. Brigadier sent me after her. Kara clutched at her hair, sure it would fall out at any minute. She could see where the refugees ranked in Rusher's mind, if Trooper Laboon was the rescue team. It's so drab here. Tan said, wandering and looking up at the city. It's the same three buildings, over and over again. Darknell wasn't exactly a colorful place, Kara said. But she knew what the girl meant. Here on Balura, all the bright colors belonged to nature. Architecture, fashion, everything suffered from a dearth of energy, imagination, newness. Stepping to an outer wall long enough to confirm that Diligence wasn't powering up its engines yet, Kara turned back toward another crowd headed for one of the hexagonal silos. This one was large, the size of a full Hestabil block, and, from the sounds inside, evidently some kind of factory. She could see smoke now, rising from a chimney above. Beetle and Tan in tow, Kara pulled an elderly Duros from the line. As before, neither he nor anyone else responded to her action. Nor did he respond to her simplest questions. Holding the man's shoulders, she looked to Beetle. Can you speak to him, Beetle? Show him we're friendly. Ask him his name. The lanky Duro saluted and joined Kara in front of the old man's face. Sir, what's your name? Kara glared at him. I mean, in Duris. Beetle shrugged. I don't speak Duris. Great. Sitting on the canal ledge and splashing with her stubby feet, Tan chimed in. Maybe there's something in the water. I don't think so, Kara said, looking into the dull, wilted eyes of the old man. And language isn't the issue. She could sense it. The Duros understood the words. It wasn't that he wouldn't respond, he couldn't. He seems numb. Wait. Kara turned back toward the man and raised her fingers. 
She hated doing this, but if her hunch was right. You don't want to go into the building, she intoned. The Duro's elder froze. I don't. I don't. His arms began to shudder. Go into the building. Kara held his shoulders and studied his eyes. There was something there. An emotion. Confusion? No. Panic. Abruptly, Kara released the Duros, who bolted ahead as if shot from one of Rusher's cannons. The green figure disappeared into the doorway, as he had always intended to. Or as someone else had always intended for him to. It's a force user, Kara said. Damon had his correctors and his propagandist historians, but this was different. Here, the Sith were directly imposing their will on the people, all of the people. But how? Force persuasion was a one-on-one -on -one technique. To mystify a populace on such a scale required, what? She had no idea. Kara scrunched her nose, deflated. This wasn't a safe place for her charges at all. She'd been hoping that, outside the influence of Damon and Odeon, conditions might be better. If anything, they were worse. Is every place out here insane? Abruptly, Kara stepped to the canal wall and lifted Tand by her shoulders. Beetle, tell Rusher we're coming back. You've got my comlink. He said, picking his ear again. Reminded, Kara reached to activate her headset when suddenly a booming alien voice echoed in her ears. Diarchy fleet workers, you will commence loading operations now. Kara looked around, surprised. The voice wasn't coming from the comlink, but from another mind. Tenders, you will deliver the designated Salegians to their assigned vessels. At once the lazy pace of Hestabil picked up around her. Citizens who had been taking their time to reach their destinations suddenly began moving quickly, thundering toward the hexagonal buildings. Other residents poured onto the slippery streets from the white domes, housing, Kara imagined, to join the march. It was Belura's version of Darknell's morning commute, all directed by a mysterious source, the same voice Kara had just heard. Salegians, the voice had said. Kara had met a Salegian years before on Coruscant, hard to look at, but easygoing, part of a seemingly happy race of interstellar travelers. A natural phenomenon, their thought broadcasts sounded quite different from thought projections through the Force, and that was unmistakably what she and the locals had heard. It made sense as a form of public address, with listeners able to comprehend regardless of their lingual differences. Hearing another announcement, Kara looked around. No Salegians were visible, and they certainly would have been noticeable, but that didn't mean anything. As she turned to face the direction where the sensation was strongest, her eyes locked on one of the large silos. From there, a Salegian could contact much of the city at once. That had to be it. Looking around, Kara felt like kicking herself. City blocks radiated from silos all across Hestabil. Those reflected the Salegian's range, she imagined. There had to be more than one. But the quick compliance of the people seemed odd, and nothing explained the tremors she now felt in the Force. Apart from the famous Jedi Master Oru, millennia before, the Force had touched relatively few Salegians. Using the creatures for mass communication was novel, but signified no inherent danger. Pushing her way up crowded steps to get a better view, Kara called out behind, Beetle. Stay with Tan. Suddenly the crowd began churning faster. Fighting against the wave, Kara struggled to keep her balance and to see what was driving them. It wasn't the Salegian's words. Humanoid figures in skin-tight red suits descended across the cliffside city aboard silver multi-person airspeeders. Leaving their speeders hovering over the canals, a few of the Scarlet Riders leapt high into the air. Traversing several meters in an uncanny instant, the determined newcomers landed safely on the sidewalks and charged the crowd. There's our Sith, Kara thought. So much for paradise. Tan. Tan. Kara looked back. The girl had gotten lost in the crowd, and the Duros was gone, too. The Scarlet Riders, men and women of various species, were still on the move, hurrying stragglers along toward their work. They hadn't harmed anyone yet, but Kara noticed baton-shaped weapons slung over their left arms. 
she swore. Blast it, beetle, I told you to stay with her. Forcing her way through the stampede, Kara leapt atop the canal's retaining wall and looked down at the crowd. There was the Athorian from earlier, surprisingly nearby, and faced a stern face with one of the riders. Despite the height difference, it was easy to tell who was in charge. The Athorian seemed mystified. Feeling a twinge in the force, Kara realized why. Straining, she heard them. You will comply with your orders immediately. The rider said. I will comply with my orders immediately. The Athorian droned in basic, before barreling forward. Seeing the same exchange going on all along the thoroughfare, Kara realized the truth. The Salegians only gave, or passed along, the commands. The Scarlet Riders enforced them, using force persuasion. It made sense, now. The people of Balura were indeed numb, worn down by constant mental manipulations by force users. Alert, Kara scanned the crowd for her companions. Suddenly she saw Beetle Laboon in the crowd, confronted by two riders. And there, behind them, was Tan, being held by a third. They weren't trying to escape, and Kara knew why. There was only one thing to do. Hey Sith! Kara yelled, leaping atop a stone platform and igniting her lightsaber. A dozen faces in the mob turned toward her. Yeah, that's right. I don't want to go to work. Come and get me. Chapter 14 For the first time since Gazari, Kara's lightsaber tore into Sith flesh. That battle had been chaotic, multiple combatants heading after different targets. Here, even amid the workers scrambling to safety, there was a simple direction to events. Kara, trying to chase Tan and Beetle's captors, and more Scarlet Riders than she could count trying to stop her. Kara bounded against a sandstone wall and leapt back into the fray, lancing toward her assailants. Their batons were alive with energy now, blades matching the color of their suits. But the weapons were only half the length of her lightsaber, the minimum required for hurting workers. It forced her to abandon all the fancy lightsaber disciplines with names she could never remember anyway and fight freeform. That was the way she liked it. A female rider jabbed at her and received a roundhouse kick followed by a death blow. A hulking male rider leapt toward her from behind, stabbing downward, Kara twirled and sliced backward, separating his sword arm from his body. Withdrawing her lightsaber from her fourth attacker, Kara turned back only to walk into a maelstrom. You will stop, you will stop, you will stop. For advancing Sith, speaking in unison, pounded at her through the force. Dizzied by the mental onslaught, Kara felt her knees buckle. Rolling away on the sweaty sidewalk, she opened her eyes to see them advancing. Advancing, and speaking, their words pummeling her. Wincing, Kara looked behind them and saw one of their airspeeders hovering, unoccupied, over the scene. Reaching through the force, she grabbed at it and pushed. The vehicle complied, slamming violently down onto the canal retaining wall behind her surprised attackers. Their psychic attack momentarily broken, Kara pushed again, causing them to lose their footing on the slick surface. Regaining her feet, she bounded toward them. And past them, leaping over the speeder's debris to the top of the retaining wall. She broke into a run toward the sea, relieved that the mental pressure had abetted. Force persuasion was a discipline almost every Force user learned, even if she loathed using it. But she'd never felt such power behind it before, excepting perhaps Odian's coaxing call to self-destruction. The only thing that was keeping her alive was that, at least as far as she could tell, the Scarlet Riders had learned mesmerism to the exclusion of other, more physical skills. She could take them in a direct duel, but now was not the time. She spied her real goal, ahead. Tan and Beetle's captors had loaded them aboard one of the airspeeders, the first in a row of three readying to head across the bay. She'd have only one chance to catch them. Speeding up as she approached the trailing airspeeder, Kara remembered her headset and punched a button. Rusher, this is Kara. Whatever you do, don't let the rest of the refugees off the ship. Tell me something I don't know. Rusher thought, pocketing his comlink as he dashed across the once lush carpet of the ready room. 
one didn't go very far in Sith space without seeing a suspicious mind trick now and again. From what he could tell, the characters in red that had ridden up had worked more than a few of them. The brigadier had been getting ready to kick back in the solarium when he saw them through the skylight, the first flyers coming across from the mesa in the bay. By the time Rusher reached the top of Starboard 3, he'd seen Novalo and her fix-it team standing, hypnotized, in the middle of the metal bridge. In between them and Diligence, riders representing Balura's government stalked across the platform, rounding up everyone they could find. Rusher cursed himself. He'd advised the sentries not to challenge any arrivals too strongly, figuring that the locals were coming to escort the refugees away. Either that, or the Jedi or Trooper Labun would be back with the Celestin kid. But the Sith who ran the planet evidently weren't going to settle for just his passengers. It wasn't the first time a Sith Lord had reneged on Rusher's independence, not everyone respected the way forces from Mandragal's former empire did things, and even if they did, they were Sith. Cheating was in their nature. But as far as he knew, the faceless masters of Balura didn't even know who or what Rusher's brigade was. It was just a crew to enslave, a warship to be grabbed. A warship where most of the weapons are on the inside, Rusher thought, running onto the bridge. At least the deck watch had the presence of mind to close the ramps before anyone boarded. But the options from here were limited. This was going to be a close one, if they got out of it. Hail from below, Captain! Rusher stepped down into the command pit to see the view from the cam beneath port ramp 1. A gaggle of red suits was there, including one toothy monster of a Trandoshan who looked none too comfortable, strapped into his light jumpsuit. Looking up at the cam, the Trandoshan waved a meaty green hand and hissed. You will open this vessel and report for assignment. It doesn't work over the comm, pal. Rusher snorted. These weren't Sith Lords, or even the higher quality Sith Adepts he'd seen. They were specialists, like him, trained at one thing. And it wasn't going well for them. The rider repeated his command. Talking louder doesn't help. Rusher sat down at the Bezalisk's comm station. Now can we talk about you returning my crew, or... The diarchy has spoken. Open this vessel. If you say so, Rusher said, pointing to his helm's being. Drop anchor. With a metallic crack, port ramp 1 dropped open, smashing the Trandoshan and two of his cronies flat. The ramp lifted back shut less than a second later. Good hydraulics, baby. Rusher said, patting Diligence's command console and smiling. A brief respite. His reverie halted when the Mon Calamari navigator spoke up, pointing to another monitor. Master Dackett's down there. What? Other side, sir. Rusher looked at the view from the underbelly. Dackett and several more of the sentries stood, motionless, before another Red Rider. Blast. Rusher sat back in the chair, flustered. The fat man was going to get him killed one day. Probably saw the shore and went out looking for the women. As Rusher stared, the Trandoshan walked into the scene, rubbing the fresh dent in his rubbery skull. You will submit, mercenary. He ignited a short crimson lightsaber. Open up or we'll cut you out. The Trandoshan shot a look at his stupefied hostages. Or maybe we'll cut something else. Rusher stood, tapping vainly on the comm link. This is your department, Jedi. Where are you? Diligence could use a rearguard action, Jedi style. Kara Holt, come in. Nothing. Blast and blast. Rusher said, tossing the comm link to the floor and stomping up the steps to the big window. Their lurch ratio was shot to blazes, anyway. We're on our own. He looked down at the helm's being. Can you lift off without cooking them? Sir, you're going to leave Master Dackett. He'll find a way back, Rusher said, looking back outside. We've still got his old arm. Kara had gone cliff diving a few times as a child on Aquilaris. But never as an adult, never as a Jedi, and never from a ledge that stood not over water, but over a city. 
Running atop the retaining wall, she saw the permacrete ledge run out just ahead, where it guided the water down a hundred meters to the next level of Hestabil. She sped up. Boy, this had better work. Leaping, Kara stretched her arms wide, reaching for the rearmost airspeeder as it pulled away. If she was shocked that she tried it, she was even more surprised when she overshot it, crashing down upon the suddenly idling vehicle's hood. Rolling over, she saw the crimson-clad driver struggling with the control yoke. Feeling the impact, the Rodian looked up at her, puzzled. Engine problems? Kara asked, putting her boot through the windscreen and into the driver's snout. Scrambling across the shattered remnants, she leapt atop the bewildered Rodian. Crowded from the driver's seat, the Sith lackey struggled to find his baton. With an inviting target in the creature's green proboscis, Kara grabbed him by the scarlet collar and punched repeatedly. Hanging halfway outside the speeder, the pummeled Sith turned his glassy eyes on her and focused. You will release me. Okay, Kara said, pulling her hands back into the airspeeder. The stunned Rodian plummeted out of sight. Kicking out the remains of the windscreen, no transparer steel factory here, she saw, Kara settled into the driver's seat. Up ahead, the airspeeder bearing Beetle and Ten rocketed away, climbing above the edge of Hestabil and out over the harbor. It was making a direct line for the mesa at the center of the bay, she set her speeder on a course to follow. Confirming that she wasn't being pursued, Kara looked down and to the left. Something was going on with diligence, but from her elevation it wasn't clear what. More people were out on the tarmac and bridge, and she could see some airspeeders and red outfits. But at least she didn't see any shooting. Kara couldn't imagine that Russia would endanger his own people on the dock by putting up a struggle, but, then, she never knew with him. If the red suits down there were as powerful as the ones she had faced, they might have already shown him a thing or two about fast talking. Kara faced a decision. The refugees would certainly be in jeopardy. But just as clearly, everyone who lived on Belura was in danger, danger of losing their sanity, as they had already lost their independence. This scheme was something Damon could have dreamed up. The workers weren't simply enslaved here, the rulers of, what had the Salegian called it, the diarchy were actually turning the people into automatons, one command at a time. Darknell had been a place where art and other forms of leisure had been discouraged as unnecessary. Belura had taken Damon's notion a step farther. The place was colorless not because the people weren't allowed to decorate their lives, in fact, they probably weren't even aware of what things looked like. Or much else, for that matter. Not under that kind of psychic duress. Strong-willed beings could resist force persuasion, but here there was simply too much of it going on. Wills were being broken before anyone realized they were under attack. Kara remembered thinking the harbor mesa and the building overhanging it resembled a below mushroom. Now that first impression seemed prophetic. One of her early assignments as a Padawan had been shutting down a ring of core world smugglers shuttling shipments of the fungi to Coruscant for processing. Mere busywork for a new recruit, neither the Jedi nor the Republic had much time for spice interdiction, and between war and plague, the population had plenty to forget. But on that assignment, she'd gotten to see people in the grip of narcotics, still functioning, but no longer the masters of their own lives. That's who the people of Hestabil had reminded her of. And whoever, or whatever, was on that vertical island was controlling them in the same way. The Balurans were still independent beings, but with no will to resist when the call came. And increasingly, no identities of their own. And there was more going on, she noticed now. Accelerating, Kara looked down at the buoys leading from the mesa across the bay to the city, behind her. They appeared to be evenly spaced, just like the silos in the city. More Salegians, she murmured, passing over one and getting a closer look. There, visible through the transparent roof of the buoy, bobbed a Salegian in its protective cylinder. Kara's mind raced. The Salegians on the mainland weren't simply public address announcers. These poor creatures were all links in a telepathic communication system, a chain that reached, unbroken, all the way across the water to the mesa and its retreat, high above. She'd heard of ancient signaling methods that used line-of-sight signals instead of electronics. Whoever was running this place had put the entire bay on his telepathic grid. 
there wasn't a need for a comm link anywhere. Except in her case. Reminded, Kara activated her headset and prepared to call in her destination. The mesa and its metallic cap loomed before her. Another sanctum, Kara groaned, shaking her head. I just hope they don't use Damon's architect. They're putting holes in us, Brigadier! Rusher's nostrils flared. This was worse than Minox. The second diligence hit the thrusters and began to hover, several of the Red Raiders from outside had leapt onto the ship. Now monitors showed the Trandoshan and several of his buddies clinging atop the massive retro rockets, jabbing at anything they could find with their short red lightsabers. Give him a spin, Helm. The tentacle-faced kill complied, her light green fingers a blur across the console. Around them, diligence lurched and spun, forcing Rusher to grab onto chair backs for balance. Outside, the scenery of Balura blew past, and on the monitor, so did several of the Sith climbers. Still a couple left, sir! Cut thrusters. Rusher yelled. Diligence slammed violently to the platform, just in time for Rusher to yell another command, thrusters on. The tentacle-faced helmswoman got the picture, making Diligence hop like a Zeltran veil dancer. Bracing himself, Rusher watched the underside monitors. This time, even the muscle-bound Trandoshan lost hold. Rusher signaled a return to midair. Good work, Zoosh. Next time someone tells me they've been to Corellia, I'll believe them. I'd sis say it's a good thing we got the hydraulics fixed. The kill hissed. And that Novalo isn't here to break my neck for that stunt. Reminded, Rusher walked up the steps to the viewport. Where are our people? Diligence swung over the bay, turned aft, and tilted. Looking down at the platform, Rusher spotted Dackett and Novalo standing with thirty or so crew members, back toward the far edge of the raised dock. However strong the Sith lackey's power of suggestion was, it wasn't enough to keep victims standing around when all blazes were breaking loose. Rusher saw that the Trandoshan and the few other goons who hadn't been thrown into the water were out of commission, lying in the huge cracked imprints diligence had pounded into the tiled surface. But others were coming across the bridge from the city. Boy, it'll feel good to shoot something. Make it an island. With a jolt that rocked the bridge, the turbolasers mounted left and right of the crew compartment blasted downward at the metal bridge. Rated for nothing more than clearing asteroids, they were more than sufficient to send the structure, and quite a few of the baton-toting thugs, into the bay. Brigadier! The air suspeeder sis! Rusher saw it, and felt it, before Zush finished hissing the words. A flash of grey filled the viewport before him, sending a tremor through the bridge that knocked him to the carpet. Several of the airspeeders that had brought the trouble to the landing platform were still out there. If he'd forgotten about them, they were reminding him now, slamming against the upper decks and trying to rupture the windows. He'd never be able to bring the ship's weapons to bear against them. Too bad they didn't. Wait, Rusher thought. Weapons, we've got. From his position on the carpet, he turned to face the crew in the command pit. Spin us again, and hit him with the long cannons. The Kellys. Zusha's dark eyes blinked. Sis sir, those are in the hold. The carriages and generators are. The barrels are attached to the hull. Rusher stood, gloves flush with the window. Three airspeeders buzzed past, trying to find a safe means to approach the spinning ship, spinning in place. Spying a red rider making a run, Rusher yelled. Hard to starboard. <laughs> Diligence yawed violently, its protruding Sarasian iron cannon barrels cleaving the air like a massive rotor. The stern metal tore through the first of the shoddily built airspeeders as if it wasn't there. While the second speeder avoided that fate, its pilot didn't, flung nearly over the horizon by the spinning muzzle. Well, that's a new one. Rusher watched the third airspeeder hurtle into the bay, struck by a glancing blow. What would he name this tactic? It wasn't something they could try against a larger ship or a fixed obstacle without snapping off their attachments. The Rusher just this once maneuver, maybe. 
Visual on Master Dacket, sir. What's he doing? Beating the Trandoshan to death with his new arm. Rusher smiled. Put us alongside the platform and drop starboard ramp 3. Just like a regular evac. Well, nothing at all like one. But it'll do. Diligence dropped into position. Rusher looked for his cane. His sprain from Damon's palace had healed, but he might need it for defense when Prenda Novalo boarded. Mesmerized no longer, Diligence's hull doctor would have just seen him using her precious ship like a battering ram. But as he watched his crew board on the monitor, he realized that inevitable confrontation would be the least of his troubles. They'd won a few minutes respite from the Sith, but the refugees were still aboard, and their nursemaid hadn't returned. Rusher found his comm link, on the floor. Holt. Come in. Jedi. The light on it blinked. She'd sent a message, during the chaos. But before he could play it back, a call came from the helm's being. Brigadier, we've got new contacts from the north. A lot, and they're big. Rusher gritted his teeth. Now what? Bigger than the airspeeders? Bigger than us! Rusher dashed to the viewport facing Hestabil and gaped. Steam was rising from the giant stone pools built into several of the terrace levels. Steam, and something else, something they wouldn't be able to overcome with a couple of rock chasers and a few stunts. His eyes widened. Little Jedi, wherever you are, I think we've made them mad. A Jedi. Collision marveled as he shambled away from one. A Jedi Knight was less than ten minutes away from the loft. There was no need to consult any electronic scanner, nor even any reason to look out the window. The network he'd developed had brought the news instantaneously to him and his young masters. Part of the inspiration had come from watching Jornizi spiders, accidentally and unwisely imported from Kyllorin to his homeworld. Even when he blinded the creatures, they could sense the approach of others, feeling vibrations in their webs. The arrayed Salegians created their own web, constantly broadcasting status reports back and forth to one another. The same individuals who provided them the reports were charged with forcing them to send them, the red-clad unifiers. Quillen and Dramica hadn't understood the need for the Sith adepts to wear uniforms, they never expected to see them, anyway. In the body of diarchical power, the unifiers acted both as regulating agents, ensuring that orders were followed, and as antibodies, killing or co-opting pathogens. The biological metaphor was collisions, too, straight from his writings about how the pinnacle of Sith power might be achieved. The glorification of self. The subjugation of others. Clearly these ancient precepts pointed to only one solution. For just one Sith being to rule a system of life forms the size of the galaxy, those others would have to be part of the self. Constituent parts of a larger whole, self-regulating, acting on the direction of the mind. There wasn't any other way. Governments, despotic or republican, were too inefficient. As long as any other will had force, a leader could not force his will on all. It had required bringing the twins into his scheme, but he'd done it. Damon and his correctors were pikers compared with what they had achieved. To a degree, Belura operated as a single living being, and, as he could hear from the rumbling outside, the hatchling was about to leave the nest. But that was also the problem. He remembered it now, as he entered the turbo lift and headed to the penthouse. Quillen and Dramica had been necessary. No Sith he'd met, lord or adept, had the boy's natural talent for far-seeing, and likely no force user, anywhere, was the girl's equal when it came to giving strong hypnotic commands. But the regent had assumed his will would remain intact. He would serve as the ego, working as the conscious mediator between the outside world and the siblings in their cocoon. To them, the world beneath their comfortable floor was a theoretical place. A realm they would imagine and influence, but never enter. That role would be reserved for collision. Only it had gone wrong. Emerging onto the top floor, he remembered it all. The excitement had restored some of his faculties, some of the independent spirit he once had. It wasn't possible to mediate between someone of Dramica's power and the rest of society without losing one's own identity. 
he wasn't strong enough. He doubted anyone was. And yet, there wasn't anything to be done about it. He stole a glance toward the twins as he walked toward his place by the window. Sandy-haired Quillen sat and stared, mouth unwiped, wearing his nightclothes at midday, as he did every day. Dramica lay on her back, braiding and unbraiding her hair as she pawed at a pillow with her bare toes. Collision quickly looked away. There was no defeating power such as theirs. Hearing more thunder across the bay, Collision realized the rest of the galaxy would soon learn the same. The battleships were ready and rising from their construction hangars, secreted beneath Hestabil's just-drained reflecting pools. Mammoth, two-pronged affairs of precious imported Durasteel, the fourteen vessels had been constructed quietly over five years in preparation for this day. And each, critically, included an important passenger, a Salegian. The same training centers on Balura that had turned raw Sith adepts into masters of persuasion had worked their ways on the few Salegians they'd found who were receptive to the Force. None of them would ever rival the hated Master Oru for power. But ensconced at the heart of a battleship, each would ensure that orders from Balura were followed exactly. Unlike their cousins in the harbor and up in the city silos, they wouldn't simply pass commands along. They'd ensure they were followed, forcing their will on crew and escorting fighter pilots, alike. Some had taken convincing. The Salegians were an accursedly independent lot. But, as here on Balura, there would be unifiers present to ensure their participation. And if that failed, the threat of harm to their fellows in captivity had always worked. There weren't many of them, but they would be enough. They would be the first wave, claiming Daemon's rearward systems. Collision hoped they might even be able to win space engagements and land battles without a shot fired. Any Daemonite that approached within half a kilometer of the ship brains would be vulnerable to their attack. The twins would command them, and thus command all. Nothing would be able to stop them. Regent Aspect will protect us. Dramica said. Collision turned, puzzled. The girl was sitting up now, looking at him plaintively as she calmed Quillen. The boy was in a fetal position again, as he often was when confronted with something new. I will protect you, the regent said, belatedly. Dramica's uncharacteristically tentative question hadn't had her usual strength of psyche behind it. But the next one did. You will tell us how to destroy a Jedi. The girl said, green eyes flaring with orange fire. You will tell us, now. Mindlessly, he repeated her demands and then found he had nothing to say. He had faced plenty of Jedi Knights while learning the Sith ways. But none had come to Balura and its neighboring systems in the eight years since its founding. The Grimani sector had been too far gone by then, Balura too far into the Sith interior. While he'd heard rumors of Jedi stabs into Sith space, they'd always attacked elsewhere. But he knew he had faced them once. He just knew. Chidna's eyelids flipping closed, the Kravaki sank his head in shame. I. I don't know how, Lord Dramica. I don't remember. You will destroy the Jedi. I will defeat the Jedi, Kalishan said, whirling with renewed vigor back toward the turbolift. The words he had spoken were Dramica's, but also his. He had created the perfect Sith command structure. As horrible as it was to lose his place in it, that paled before letting a Jedi take it down, in its moment of triumph. Better to lose to another Sith than a Jedi. He might forget the rest, but no Sith could forget that. Chapter 15 The trick with invading hidden fortresses, Kara thought, was picking a strategy and sticking with it all the way. She hadn't dealt with enough to declare herself an expert, but given her recent experiences, it seemed a truism. You could sneak in, evading detection at all costs and shying away from all encounters, or you could just barge in, leaving nothing standing, including the doors. Hopping back and forth between the approaches simply clouded the issue. Once you had a trail of bodies behind you, it really was past time to consider a subtle approach. Looking back at the trail of bodies behind her in the hallway, Kara decided she wouldn't worry about who had seen her or whether they might be sending for reinforcements. 
Skittering off in search of a path of less resistance would just take longer and, ultimately, endanger more people. Besides, this way was more satisfying. All those days on Dark Nell wanting to strike back, strike something, she'd imagined a day like this. She'd been careful not to desire it too much, that way led to the dark side. But in all her sneaking around, she'd wondered if she would ever get to confront Sith oppressors directly. It was true these weren't Damon's people, the lack of statues on every city corner said that. But she'd seen enough of the Baluran brand of Sith oppression in two hours to make the diarchy, whatever that was, her target of choice. Bring them on. More were coming, for sure. Since arriving in the airspeeder bay gouged into the side of the granite tower, Kara hadn't heard any sirens or seen a single surveillance droid or cam. But the Salegians in the facility hadn't stopped chattering in her mind, alerting more Scarlet Riders, now Scarlet Runners, to her movements. The baton wielders had tried to block her entry from the start and had kept her from seeing where Tan and Beetle's captors had taken them. They'd tried to keep her from entering the main tunnel leading into the strata, and they'd waged a massive effort to keep her out of the one turbo lift she'd found. The minions, if that's what they were, were getting stronger now. More capable. She had guessed that would have been the case, but not a lot else on Belura had gone as she'd expected. Seeing that, Kara had begun using their ferocity and numbers as a guide. The Salegian's mental ululations were coming from so many different directions inside the facility that she couldn't use their strength as her homing beacon. But the most recent wave of attackers had one thing in mind, preventing her from ascending higher within the mountain complex. As with real below mushrooms, the active ingredient had to be up in the crown. Just like the perverse to imitate nature, Kara thought, pushing out the corpse that was keeping the lift door from closing. Looking at the controls, she saw only two higher levels. Directing the car to the topmost, Kara calmed herself and entered a defensive stance, lightsaber at the ready. The door opened to reveal more red-suited protectors, also in defensive stance, their lightsabers ignited. In unison, they raised their free hands and screamed through the force. You will leave, you will leave, you will leave. Okay, Kara said, punching the control and closing the door. She hadn't intended to switch to taking the path of least resistance halfway through, but there wasn't any sense being doctrinaire about it, especially not when they were giving her such a headache. Spying a handhold above the doorway, Kara sent the car to a lower floor and extinguished her lightsaber. Leaping for the slot above the door, she dangled by one hand and raised her weapon. There was no access hatch in the ceiling centimeters above her head, but there would be in a few moments. Scurrying up the service ladder inside the shaft moments later, Kara could still feel the psychic pressure from the defenders through the lift door. But their tactics confused her more than anything. Their defense had seemed one-dimensional, too, at most. Mesmerize and fight fight and mesmerize. The Mesa garrison was more powerful at suggestion and more formidable at fighting, but other tasks seemed to be beyond them. Scaling past the floor she'd fled, she heard people throwing themselves violently against the door. Who can't open a stuck turbo lift? Finding a ventilation tunnel leading up and away from the shaft, so much for avoiding them, she remembered the Rodian back on the airspeeder. He seemed to have no inkling at all how to restart his stalled-up vehicle. And the pattern of defense, too, seemed strange. She'd heard the Salegian's psychic calls, directing her opponents to defend hallways she was only considering entering. Were they using the Force to predict her movements? Or was it someone else? Someone's controlling all this, Kara thought, spying light at the end of a side shaft. She found the metal roots of the mesa top structure now, driven into the rocky base, ventilation ducts brought in air from outside. Shimmying the long meters toward the illuminated grating, she looked up to find what she'd expected, a short stretch of shaft above, providing entry to the squash dome. But it was what she accidentally saw between the sunlit slats that gave her pause. Outside, across the bay, great battleships were on the rise, rumbling from housings within the terrace city. Suddenly she realized what the workers had been preparing. But for what purpose? Slicing a larger aperture with her lightsaber, Kara squinted at the harbor, trying to find diligence and its platform. 
Her eyes crossed the shoreline twice before she spotted the dock, apparently cut off from the mainland, and empty. Fumbling for the headset around her neck, Kara found the mouthpiece. Rusher. You'd better have a good explanation for this. Looking down at the sea, Rusher thought it didn't seem nearly as peaceful as it had when they'd landed. Perhaps it was because the water below was now dotted with people who'd been trying to enslave him, and more airspeeders were rallying from the coast, trying to reach the weaving spacecraft. The battleships weren't paying them any mind, at least, not so far. The first three had made for orbit almost immediately, they certainly had someplace to go in a hurry. The presence of several others lingering in the stratosphere was the only reason he hadn't flown higher. Evading the airspeeders had taken them barely half a kilometer from the rearmost behemoth. Seeing it, Rusher felt a faint twinge at the back of his skull. A slight spark, associated with a feeling. A feeling that he should order diligence down. Rusher shook his head. A strange thought, but his hunches were like that sometimes. Standing at the viewport, he looked down at the ocean again. How would heading back down now protect them? It didn't make any. You will set your vessel down. Rusher's cane fell to the floor. Are you feeling something? He asked. Yes, sir. Master Dackett stood in the open double doorway to the bridge. It's just like what those little Cretans were doing down on the platform. It's stronger near the battleships, Rusher said, staring out the window. He looked to Zush, at the helm. Let's, be somewhere else. He scraped at his hair, flicking sweat to the carpet. His eyes followed the droplets down. Going back to the surface had seemed like such a good idea, for a moment. Landing, and debarking, and giving his ship over to the red-clad Sith flunkies, just as they'd asked. Rusher looked up. The ship hadn't moved. Looking back down at his helmswoman, he noticed the kill's hand shaking over the controls. He stepped down into the command pit and placed his gloved hand over hers. It's okay, Zush. I felt it, too. Together, they pressed the switch to move diligence clear. Very sorry, sister. That's enough of this, Rusher said, rescaling the steps. Get us out over the ocean and head for space. Refugees or not, Belura wasn't a place to stick around. This happened so often in Sith space, he thought. Things were so fluid, and many of the warlords so secretive, that one never really knew what to expect from system to system. But they'd find another world quickly enough. Maybe in the Shagrasi remnant, that wasn't very far away. Any place would be better than this. We still got a missing man, Brigadier. Dackett said, standing at the railing. Labun? Rusher looked incredulously at the ship's master. We were talking about dropping him off on top of the nearest hyperspace buoy. He'd half hoped the kid would wind up staying on Balura with the refugees, it was why he'd sent him in search of the Celestin, instead of someone more competent. Blazes, Dak, you were talking about it. I know. But that was before we knew what kind of jump they were pulling here. And that matters how? It doesn't. Dackett said, scratching his fleshy neck with his artificial hand. He sighed. But he pulled me out of that hole on Dazari. It's the least I can do. He slapped the back of his hand against the viewport. Nobody pulled me out of a hole. People have just been getting me into them. Rusher looked down at the heaving ocean, livening up as the diligence flew farther from the mainland. Reminded, Rusher looked to his comm link again. The light was flashing, another message had come in while they'd been enraptured by the battleship. Hang on. Message from her craziness. Putting it to his ear, he listened. From beside the command pit, Dackett watched as his commander stood. Anything? She's swearing at me. And cutting out. He chucked the comm link to the floor and looked to the basilisk at the comm station. Morex, do you have any more? No, sir. The verdant giant said, tapping his massive headset. But they know some new words in the Republic. Rusher turned back to the window. The airspeeders that had been flying alongside, looking for an opportunity, were long gone. 
No one had challenged their flight across the open ocean. He looked back to see his helmswoman looking at him. I have a clear path to orbit, Brigadier. Zush trilled. And nothing between this hemisphere and the nearest hyperspace lane. Rusher folded his arms, made a command decision, and kicked the wall repeatedly with his good leg. Pull up the comtag records, he said, looking down at the basilisk. Labun. Rank, major disaster. With any luck, the Jedi would be where he was. He looked over to see Dackett, smiling gently. And you quit grinning, or I'll have your other arm. Just indigestion, sir. Rusher. Would the man ever check his comlink? She wished he'd told her what channel's diligence monitored. At least that Bessilus com operator seemed to know what he was doing. But it probably wasn't Rusher's fault, she thought, running through the darkened hallway. Between climbing upward through a granite tower and the mountaintop building she'd entered, she hadn't been able to get a signal outside since the air vent. And given how they communicate in this Minox nest, it's hardly a surprise, she thought. More of the red-suited acrobats had assaulted her more urgently than before. Whoever was directing them seemed to have changed strategies mid-course. Instead of predicting where Kara might go and trying to intercept her, the defenders had begun setting up roadblocks in the facility. Armed warriors lurked behind hastily constructed barricades in some hallways, in others, like the one she was in now, there were just the physical barriers. Dusty desks and computer equipment stood in heaps, haphazardly piled in front of the doorway. It's like a child barring the door to his room, Kara said aloud, picking her way past. She didn't know quite where the comparison had come from, Rusher had spoken of children running Belura, but she'd seen no sign of any on the whole planet. Just more of the Scarlet Warriors. She needed answers, answers she hoped to find in the dim light of the round room, up ahead. The place was huge. The spare desks and consoles had come from here, she realized, it had clearly once been a command center of some kind. All that remained in operation were seven large video monitors hanging from the ceiling in a circular pattern and silently cycling through maps of Hestabil. But instead of facing outward, the screens had been turned to face the transparent steel cylinder at the room's center. And its monstrous occupant, floating in a pale yellow cloud and emitting a steady psychic hum. Kara had never imagined Selegions could grow so large. Even if it were mobile, it never could have fit through any of the doorways here. She didn't know what Selegions ate or how, if they even did at all. But this creature appeared to have gorged, now a flabby mass of drab dotted with bloody boil-like knots. And unlike the animated figure she had met on Coruscant, this one had root-like tentacles that dangled, damaged, and limp. She stepped toward the container carefully, remembering that the gas inside was as deadly to her as air was to the Selegion. The creature remained motionless and unresponsive. Kara crinkled her nose. It didn't make sense. This being was clearly the nerve center, it was impossible to avoid such references when looking at a giant disembodied brain. The telepathic messages back and forth to the city began and ended here in a cacophony she had to struggle to ignore. And yet the Selegion seemed nothing like a Sith overlord, an evil answer to ancient Master Oru. In fact, it looked dead. A specimen in a vial. Touching the side of the cylinder, Kara was surprised by a somber voice in her head, different in volume and tone from the others. What is your message? Message? What is your message? I don't know what you mean, she said, aloud again. She didn't remember whether Selegions had normal hearing or were strictly telepathic, but the creature seemed to stir when she spoke. And the background buzz of outgoing telepathic communications had ceased. It's listening. Those people out there, they're following your instructions. You're the one enslaving people. Kara looked around, warily, expecting the Selegion to call for its enforcers. But the creature simply sat, frozen in the gas. The buzz of background communications resumed, continuing between the Selegion and what? And the battleships, Kara said, remembering the sight from outside. You're running them, too. With Selegions aboard, is that right? She glowered at her reflection in the container. You send the messages. 
you're spreading this madness. For another long moment, there was no response. Karen knelt beside the cylinder's base. There, at the bottom, were flashing controls. She couldn't rupture the tank, but she could deactivate its circulation system. Within minutes, enough waste gas would build up inside to quiet the creature's commands to its minions once and for all. I'm sorry, Kara said, reaching for a switch. But you're Sith. She looked up, one last time, for any reaction. Again, nothing. And then a whimper. It sounded like nothing she'd ever heard before, a thin, sonorous moan no louder than a whisper. But it felt like an ancient sadness had passed by, barely caressing her mind as it went. The thought, if that's what it was, wasn't directed at her. It was directed at the universe. Like a whimper. Kara looked up at the beast towering in the haze, behind the transparent steel. The facility was rife with emanations from the dark side of the Force. But none, she now realized, was coming from this legion. Abruptly, she yanked her hand away from the switch. She'd been too quick, so busy listening to the telepathic noise that she hadn't been minding the force. The Salegian wasn't using it at all, for good or ill. Tentatively, Kara placed her hand on the cool surface of the container and reached out through the force. The second she touched the Salegian's mammoth mind, emotions overwhelmed her. Fear. Anger. Joy. Hatred. Love. All of them at once, confused and intermingling. Breaking contact, she realized the feelings were all hers, brought forward in self-defense against a mind that had become a null. A non-entity. The Salegian's mind was alive and percolating with the messages it was conveying, but all that activity, she realized, was autonomous. The creature's judgment centers had been bypassed, if they functioned at all. Independent reason had no place in its waking mind. It spoke, but it didn't know the words anymore. Taking a breath, Kara renewed her contact with the strange mind. This time, she focused her approach, trying to find her way through the wreckage of the Salegian's psyche. Most conscious beings whose minds she had touched had a spark, a fire that drove them. Here only an ember remained, and what she felt chilled her. The creature seemed bereft. Its whole life was a timeless agony. An independent mind, reduced to a conduit and controlled by others. Others. Kara reached for a visual image, but found only a single, shadowy figure, all scaly forearms and facial shell platings. A Kravaki? That's who's controlling you. Controlling? Who? Surprised to hear a response, Kara looked around the base to find an identification plate. One? That's your name? The Salegian stirred, emitting a gentler version of the same sound. Kara perceived that the creature had had another name, at one time, but that time had long since passed. She pressed for more detail on the Kravaki, and on the others. But the wretched being had no understanding of space and time anymore. It understood there to be a greater power ruling the Kravaki, but it could be on the next floor, or in the next galaxy. Hearing a thump on the other side of the room, Kara quickly looked away. Seeing nothing, she looked down at the container's base. One, do you want me to free you? Free? Who? Kara huddled up close to the plating. There wasn't time for an existential debate. Look, I need your help. I know what you're doing, all of it. One was responsible for Balura and for coordinating the defense of the Mesa. Her talking to it had probably bought the quiet moments she'd had. She hadn't sensed any commands relating to the fleet, from touching one's mind, she'd understood that another Salegian, elsewhere in the building, was relaying commands to the ships through Sithcom system operators. They wouldn't be able to link far-flung Salegians telepathically without intermediaries. But the quivering mass before her could make a difference for everyone. Do you know where my friends are? Can you tell the people chasing me to leave me alone? Tentacles shifted. It wasn't understanding. They'll listen to you, one, Kara said. That's how they decide to do anything. Just tell them to. She stopped. 
The warm colors on the Selegion's frontal lobes began to dim. She was losing it again. Realizing what she had to do, Kara bit her lip and stood. Lifting the two fingers of her right hand before her, she spoke in a monotone, you will command the sentries to return to their barracks. Life returned to the Selegion. I will command the sentries to return to their barracks. And then it did. You will command one sentry to deliver the Duros and the Celestin prisoners to the airspeeder bay. She could get them out from there, she figured, hearing it comply, she continued. You will order the people of Hestabil to their homes, she said. You will stop sending messages for others. One paused for a moment, seemingly puzzled, before finally repeating the commands. For a moment, Kara thought she felt another of the whimpers again. She smiled. She might have broken the Sith hold on Belura only temporarily, they did have more Selegions, but one would no longer be a part of it, provided she could protect it from its masters. I'll get you out of here, somehow, she said, patting the side of the container and looking around. The tank was bolted to the floor, and the doors weren't wide enough. But at least Rusher had a team of engineers, presuming she could find them. Walking toward the entrance, she reached to pull her headset back into place, only to hear the beep of an incoming call. She activated the comm link. Where have you been, Rusher? I hate to break this to you, but we're going to have another guest. I am not Rusher. A scratchy voice said. Kara stopped running. She didn't have time for guessing games. Look, I don't care who you are, as long as you're with diligence. The speaker didn't let her finish. We met on Dark Nil, twice. The first time, you stole something from me. Kara stared into the dim light. She'd barely been able to get a signal before. But this voice was pure and clear. And familiar. The Bothan? You do remember. I, I'm surprised to hear from you. Kara didn't even know his name. Are you here? I wouldn't be talking to you at all. Came the curt response. But I have my instructions. And here are yours. He continued. Divide and conquer. Wait. What? She looked around the darkened control room. The only thing here was the Selegion in its tank. Where are you? I am here. Jedi, responded a much different voice from behind her. Seeing red light reflected in the container, Kara felt fire lash her back. Rolling forward, she looked back to see six of the lightsaber batons, all in the tentacles of a single attacker. The Kravaki. I will destroy the Jedi. Dramica's command rang in the regent's cavernous ears. It helped to remember it. Every syllable stirred his body to action, restored his lost youth and vigor. The teenager's commands had always had that effect, but never so much as now, now, when he had just set his emerald eyes on his first living Jedi in years. I will destroy the Jedi. I will destroy the Jedi. The Kravaki's tentacles whirled into motion, making deadly rotors of the weapons they held. He had discarded his robe in the turbo lift, and on seeing the human woman dawdling, had pounced. He'd only torn into the back of the dark-haired invader's jacket when she dived forward, tumbling out of the way. She was a Jedi. She had to be, to move like that. And Quillen, upstairs, had already sensed that she was, and told Dramica, who had ordered the regent aspect. I will destroy the Jedi, he said, whirling ahead into the command center. The woman leapt an overturned chair, left from the days when the Selegion wasn't handling communications. There was the creature, up ahead, in its tube. Collision remembered that he hated it, this time. He would have to put it back to its tasks once he had dealt with the interfering Jedi Knight. I will destroy the Jedi. Shut up. The Jedi raised her hand and sent one of the chairs tumbling through the air toward him. A strange skill, Collision thought as he cut the furnishing to pieces in a blur of lightsabers. He vaguely recalled once knowing how to levitate things but it had been more than a decade since he had exercised the power. But combat, his body remembered. Andromaca's command had unlocked talents he'd never had. 
Kravaki were formidable fighters. But even the greatest Kravaki Jedi, Vodo Sayask Bass, had only used his two uppermost limbs to hold his battle staff. Now tentacles that could not lift a cup for collision that morning were wielding lightsabers of their own. The Jedi stood, meters from him, her own weapon ignited. An emerald lance in the darkness. She looked at him, warily. The Kravaki, I take it. Kalishan didn't deign to respond as he zigzagged through the maze of furnishings on the shortest route to the woman. The Jedi Knight backed off, leaping from desk to appended desk. She seemed to want to parlay, to find something out about him and the operation. Kalishan charged ahead. He had his orders. And now he had his chance. Seeing the Jedi duck in front of the Salegian's gas chamber, the regent twirled one of his lightsabers and hurled it at her. The woman started to move, just as he'd expected, only to halt, knocking the thrown weapon to the floor with her own. Charging, Kalishan threw another, aiming at a spot over her head. No! The woman yelled, leaping to knock the smallish lightsaber away before it struck the tube. What are you doing? You'll smash the chamber. I will destroy the Jedi. Kalishan yelled. And you, too, you idiot. She jabbed a thumb against the transparisteel. Kalishan froze for a moment, watching the giant brain bobbing in the toxic gas. He looked down at the four remaining lightsabers curled in his tentacles. Yes, rupturing the tank would have killed them both. And yes, he didn't care. He was destroying the Jedi. The regent slithered back a meter, shifting the weapons to different limbs. This wasn't supposed to be the Sith way, not the one that he remembered learning about. Sith weren't self-destructive. He'd thought he was part of something larger, earlier, something worth surrendering his identity to. But Dramica's implanted command had urged him to his own demise, in order to protect her and her brother. Not this way, he thought. He gestured invitingly for the Jedi to engage him, well away from the Salegian's chamber. Now you're thinking. The Jedi said, leaping a table and entering a defensive stance. Kalishan lurched forward, tentacles whipping the lightsabers back and forth in a weaving motion. The Jedi lunged powerfully downward, glancing off the upper sabers before yanking her weapon back upward, singeing his facial tendrils. The regent advanced again, only to find her leaping nimbly to his right, forcing him to turn to follow. The more he turned, the farther she moved. The regent snarled. Moving in a circle kept him from bringing more than two of his weapons to bear at any one time. The Kravaki turned back the other direction suddenly, hoping to catch the Jedi off guard. But instead, she moved inward, grabbing one of his weaponless limbs with her spare hand and yanking. Knocked off balance, Collision fell. And found himself looking up at one of his tentacles, dead and unmoving in the Jedi's gloved hand. She'd severed it on the way down. No pain, Kalishan noticed. It was one of the limbs from his middle carapace, that morning, he hadn't been able to feel a thing in it, either. Only Dramica's power of suggestion had restored its movement. Now the thing was dead again. And so would he be, if he didn't move. Kalishan skittered backward as the Jedi advanced. The woman was too strong. He had the skills to destroy her, deep in the recesses of his memories. But he needed direction, just as his withered limbs had needed life. There was only one place to get both. Jedi, he said, moving back toward the lift he'd descended in. So you can say something other than. Kalishan ignored her. You came looking for children, Jedi. I heard the Salegian pass your command to the sentries. He stepped inside the lift. If you care to see children, follow me. The doors closed behind him. Belura would, again, be a trap. Chapter 16 You're not going to believe this, Brigadier! Waiting on the cargo deck, Rusher stared blankly as the image came up on the monitor. Defying all sense, they'd crossed over kilometers of ocean back to the mesa where the Diarchy airspeeders had come from. And there, below, was Beetle Laboon, 
sitting in the middle of an airspeeder and waving to the sky like a castaway outside a life pod. Rusher looked over to Dackett, standing by at the drop gate. Now if we only had audio, we could hear your savior yelling like an idiot. Dackett rolled his eyes. Are we clear to open or not? Oh, by all means, Rusher said, patting the master's shoulder and stepping to the other side of the cargo door. But remember, if you want to keep him, he's your responsibility. Ignoring his elder aide's response, something about brigadier generals and their mothers, Rusher flipped the switch to lower the ramp. The Duro stood, alone, in an airspeeder floating just outside the speeder bay. No one contested his presence, in fact, nothing had impeded their own approach. From their level, they could see the Celestin girl sitting on the ledge of the landing port, kicking her legs. Why didn't you pick up the girl? Rusher yelled down to the bobbing airspeeder. Beetle gestured meekly toward the vehicle's steering yoke. I started the speeder before she got in. He said. I only know forward and stop. Directing his bridge crew to bring diligence down closer to the sea, Rusher started to concoct a response. But the ship's master got his attention first. Great sons! Brigadier! Look! Bodies littered the garage behind the nonchalant Celestin. At least a dozen of the scarlet-clad sentries, like those who had hassled them at the dock, all chopped down at various points in the huge room. Here and there, wrecked airspeeders still burned, remnants of a colossal melee. Dackett looked down at Beetle, struggling to climb the line they had dropped to him. Do you think he fought all those people to get her out? I haven't got the slightest idea. Rusher looked at Dackett, and in unison, they both pulled on the rope, hauling up the wayward duros. Where's your headset, recruit? Rusher asked, watching him clamber onto the ramp. You see what comes of going out without your comm link. Begging the brigadier's pardon, brigadier. Beetle said. But if the brigadier recalls, the brigadier gave it to the Jedi. Rusher pursed his lips. Oh. He looked back into the airspeeder bay, and the corpses strewn across the floor. You did this? Kara Holt came after us. The Celestin yelled from her perch. Rusher stepped aside so two of his troopers could leap down into the floating airspeeder. Look, what's your name? Tan. Tan, we're going to back this speeder up to you so you can get on. My ship can't land here, and we can't get any closer. The airspeeder bay was meters below, and cargo ramps would never reach it without the stowed cannon barrels jabbing the cliff wall. Hop in when they get to you. No. No? She's here inside the mesa, somewhere. You have to go in after her. Rusher looked at Dackett. I'm going to die, he mouthed. I'm sorry, kid, Rusher said, looking down and attempting to appear kindly. We just don't know where she is. This is a huge place, and we don't know how much time we have to go searching for. <laughs> Suddenly scrap metal struck diligence from above, ricocheting off the starboard cargo assembly and raining down past Rusher. He was almost afraid to ask. What was that? Droids, sir. Dackett pointed to more of the stuff, coming down. Arms. Legs. The odd torso. All were part of a larger shower of transparisteel shards, falling from the cantilevered facility atop the mesa. She's up there, Brigadier. Tan squealed, standing on the ledge and jumping up and down. She pointed to the building, hundreds of meters above. Rusher straightened. I stand corrected. Just stop jumping, before you fall in. He glowered at Dackett. Or before I jump in. Another locker opened, and another droid launched forward, hurtling toward Kara. As she had with the last five, she used the force to hurl the bulbous thing through the shattered window. This was getting old. Kara had followed the Kravaki upstairs in a service turbo lift. She wasn't about to follow in the same car. It didn't seem likely that the Kravaki would kill her with a booby-trapped lift, but she wasn't willing to put it past him. Stepping out of the lift had confirmed her location. 
The room was vast, easily the full diameter of the squash dome she'd seen from outside, spacious living quarters perched high above the bay. They always nest on the top floor, she thought. You could usually tell a Sith Lord by the real estate. An opaque dome rising nearly to the ceiling sat in the room's center, well away from her. The curved window went all the way around the penthouse, its path interrupted every twenty meters by small rooms jutting inward. Some held nothing but multicolored storage bins neatly shut and stored away. Others held banks of lockers, and as soon as she passed, she learned what was in them. Nanny droids. Big, chubby spheres on spheres, tumbling around on their repulsor lift bases. She'd seen their like before, in the Republic, the BD series had cared for generations of aristocratic young, teasing and tending with metal tendrils not unlike the Kravakis. And like the Kravaki, they had thrown themselves at her in a most untender fashion. As each locker burst open, its metallic occupants sailed into the room, encircling the colossal upside-down bowl at its center in a whirlwind of protection. The droids were unarmed, but at a hundred kilograms each, the hurtling mamas were weapons themselves. With every step Kara took into the room, another droid broke from the swarm, throwing itself at her. She beheaded the first three with her lightsaber, and while she kept it handy still, she had long since lost patience with this game. Now, when one lunged, she simply waved her free hand, angling the writhing projectile through the windows. If the living occupants of the room were here, they wouldn't be able to miss the noise. With the last droid tumbling down into the bay outside, Kara surveyed the room. Still no Kravaki, just the strange onyx hemisphere, a dozen meters across, sitting silently. The room around it had a playroom feel, but it seemed long since out of use. Brightly colored furnishings peeked out from beneath drab sheets. All the toys were tucked away. It reminded Kara of the spare room in a neighbor's house in Aquilaris, years before. A child had lived there, but childhood joy did not. Instead, she only felt the angry presence of the dark side. She'd felt it elsewhere in the facility, but here in the loft, that was a good name for it, she thought, it permeated everything. And it was more than anger, she realized, it was furor. Furor over being trapped over the loss of something never known. Whoever lived here had sat on that resentment, letting it grow into a thick hate that made her heart sink with every step. And at its center, the black dome. Lightsaber at the ready, Kara circled it. Was it a prison? Or a lid? She heard rustling from within. Wrecking the place hadn't drawn anyone out. Would anything? Then she noticed a slightly raised platform in the shape of a diamond, just steps away from the dome. The carpet leading to it was worn, whoever stood there only ever approached from the outside, facing the dome. Gritting her teeth, she did the same. As soon as both her feet were on the dais, Kara saw the half-orb ahead shudder. Recirculated air whooshed from its base as a gap opened between it and the floor. It was a lid, rotating on a horizontal axis and sinking back into the floor behind. A raised round stage sat within, but this was no amphitheater. Light from the shattered windows fell across a mass of orange cushions, piled high in the largest bed fort she'd ever seen. Near the center sat two teenage humans. A boy rocked with his hands around his knees, glancing furtively at Kara and then looking quickly away. For someone just a few years younger than she was, Kara thought he dressed younger still, sitting in bedclothes in the middle of the day. But his dark eyes looked old, set back in his bald head above heavy bags. He, at least, seemed to notice her. The blonde girl beside him sat endlessly brushing her hair, paying Kara no mind whatsoever. Kara wondered for a moment whether the well-fed pair were indeed the Kravaki's prisoners, until she realized that they were the focus of the dark side energy she'd felt. She looked up at the lid, tilted backward. A meditation chamber, the largest she'd ever seen. The boy looked again at Kara, eyes searching for familiarity. Just as Kara started to speak, the girl noticed her, too, dropping her brush and speaking to the air. Regent will address the Jedi aspect. A strange statement from a stranger source. The girl dressed in the oversized nightshirt was well on her way to womanhood, and yet she had the wide eyes of a youngling. You are in the presence of the diarchy. 
came a voice from behind the round lid. The Kravaki emerged from behind the half dome, bearing his foreshortened lightsabers. His stump of a tentacle hung, limp and unbandaged. This is Lord Quillen. He said, gesturing to the boy. And his sister, Lord Dramica. Kara remained on the dais, looking warily at the pair. And I call you? The Kravaki seemed to stall, fumbling for words. Looking back at the human couple, he finally answered. I am regent here. The scheming regent. Kara thought, remembering Rusher's joke. But it wasn't clear who was in charge here. You've taken my friends, she said. I've ordered them freed. Quillen simply bobbed back and forth and looked away while his sister looked angrily at Kara. Dramica seemed eager to blurt something, but, glancing back at her brother, she said nothing. The lords do not understand what you speak of. The regent said. They do not interact with the universe as you and I. Looking to the siblings and receiving no rejection, the Kravaki explained. Twin children of a powerful Sith Lord, Quillen and Dramica had never perceived reality as others did. Quillen lived entirely inside his expansive mind, sensing other organics as phantasms moving in his personal dream world. No one could contact him, save Dramica, connected to him on a level no Sith scholar or physician understood. But she, too, had a unique situation. Since learning to speak, Dramica's only form of communication had been force persuasion. And her talent for it was immense, acting on levels beyond the vocal. Even in infancy, before she knew the word for hunger, Dramica had possessed her human caretakers to get whatever she and her brother needed. Now we use droids for their immediate needs when I am not present. The regent said. Dramica's power had been so great that she burned out less prepared minds. They had Damon's problem, Kara realized, only worse. Much worse. Damon had come into his Force powers and his Sith philosophy at a later age, after he'd already been socialized to some degree. He may not have believed that others were sentient beings with free will, and he certainly perceived the environment around him through a strange prism. The universe was the playing field of some game on an astral plane. But Damon at least interacted with that environment, he understood it, and accepted it as a given. The twins only acted through their environment, making other beings extensions of their own will. It was exactly, she realized with horror, what Damon had been trying to accomplish back in the camp with the Wustoid aid. I have been asked to explain this so you will cease your activities and submit to inclusion. The regent said. Inclusion? Kara stepped down from the dais and walked, wary of coming too close to the now watchful twins. Like you included the Salegians? Did they ask to be part of this? They were useful. They needed to be first. First of how many? Kara waved toward the window and Hestabil, across the harbor. You've already got a planet in Thrall. How long are you going to let this go? They're Sith, she realized, answering her own question. But could you be born Sith? She faced the Kravaki again and pointed to the siblings. Listen, Regent, how is it they came to be the center of all of this? Why isn't someone trying to help them? I am trying to help them. I have orchestrated all this. I have built it for us all. We will realize our destiny as one. To the side, Quillen glowered at the Kravaki. His sister followed suit. The Regent seemed to shrink under their gaze. Kara noticed. I don't think they feel your role is as central as you do, she said. You're just another Sith flunky, just another tool. The regent shuddered with rage. You will join us, join them, or be destroyed. No. Expecting an attack from the Kravaki, Kara was startled to see movement from another quarter. The boy knelt atop the pillows and shakily raised his hand. The child had never exercised, she thought, if he had even left the room at all. But with his feeble motion, his sister stood and raised her hand. You will kneel. Dramica said, facing Kara. Kara stumbled. She'd fended off attempts to mesmerize her all day, but this was on another scale entirely. 
The younger girl's words stabbed into her brain, raking at her free will. Kara's brow furrowed, her mental shields going up too late. You will kneel! Dramica boomed, clenching her fists. Kara locked her knees together, fighting against the weight pushing down on her. It was more than simple suggestion. Dramica appeared to have mindlessly worked other forms of force manipulation into her commands, acting out upon the physical world to force Kara's muscles and bones to comply. Still, the Jedi fought. I will. You will kneel. Kara's knees went out from under her. Hitting the floor with a painful thud, her hand struck the ground palm first. Her weapon, extinguishing itself, clattered away. Eyes tearing up, Kara tried to crawl toward her lightsaber, just meters ahead of her. But immense pressure continued to bear down on her. The only way to keep from having the life crushed out of her was to kneel. Regent Aspect Dramica said, much quieter. From the side, the Kravaki glided toward Kara, his quartet of mini lightsabers raised. Sweat pouring, Kara looked up and tried to speak. Tried to move. Tried to do anything against the executioner now looming above her. Tentacles curled, bringing the four glowing instruments of death centimeters from her neck on all sides. Feeling their burning presence, Kara had a fleeting thought of all the close calls she'd escaped, through sheer cussed stubbornness. No. At the last moment, Collision had realized he wasn't the one bringing the lightsabers to bear. Let me do it. The regent looked back to see Dramica standing there, at the edge of the pillows, her hands raised, willing him ahead. You will destroy the Jedi! The girl yelled. She jabbed with clenched fingers, trying to make Collision move. You will destroy the Jedi! Collision shuddered, the lightsabers pausing a hair's breadth from the Jedi's neck. Yes, I will destroy the Jedi. Not you. Me. He fought the force animating his tentacles. Release me. The girls simply glared. Incensed, the Kravaki fought back, directing at his young master the psychic power he'd so often utilized in her name. You will release me. Seeing the Kravaki hesitate, Kara fell flat to the floor and reached through the force. Her lightsaber clattered between the regent's legs and into her hand. Before a single second expired. <laughs> Kara ignited it and rolled to the right, depriving the regent of one of the tentacles that gave him footing. The Kravaki screamed, doubling over and dropping his weapons. <laughs> Momentarily freed from Dramica's control, Kara regained her feet and started running. The girl shifted, beginning to react. Kara couldn't allow that. Reaching forward, she swept with her left hand, scooping up the droid debris in her path and blindly launching it toward the siblings' roost. Dashing in a circle around them, she wasn't going to be able to strike them with anything. But she wasn't trying to spread destruction, just distraction. To enforce the twins' wills, Dramica had to get her attention, or at least concentrate. Kara wasn't letting that happen. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw the teenagers reacting to the sudden shower of scrap. Quillen clasped his hands together and let loose a mournful howl while his sister stumbled around on the cushions, trying to keep her body in front of him as Kara turned. The Jedi widened her circle, dousing her lightsaber and snapping it to her belt in a single, smooth move. She needed both hands as she ran ever wider circles around the pair. It felt to her almost like a game in a gymnasium as she yanked storage containers from the open closets, hurling their contents into the penthouse. Toys. Food. Clothing. It all came out, rocketing to her left as she dashed. Through the miasma of junk she could see the boy standing now, balancing on shaky legs and wailing while his sister yelled something inaudible at the floored Kravaki. The regent wasn't going anywhere, Kara saw, but now Dramica was on the move. Kara saw the girl clamber off the pile of pillows and onto the floor, into the stream of the hurled objects. As canisters and utensils clattered past, Dramica raised her hands and mimicked Kara's hand motions. Kara skidded to a stop. Grabbing one of the nanny droid's tubby abdomens from the floor with her hands, Kara heaved, 
bowling it toward Dramica. Struck by the bouncing ball, the girl fell. <coughs> Quillen screamed, and as he did, Dramica leapt from the ground, reinvigorated. Kara started running again, this time sweeping with the force to rip window shards from the floor. She had to keep shifting strategies, keep them on the defensive. The twins' only understanding of combat, physically or through the force, came secondhand, through their minions. They couldn't be accustomed to this kind of thing. But she was quickly running out of things to throw. Changing tactics again, Kara bolted across the diameter of the room, leaping onto and over the pile of cushions. Quillen lurched away, waving for Dramica to return. The girl moved faster this time, traversing the platform quickly. Kara looked back, trying to find the turbo lift she'd entered through. That was a mistake. Dramica, running up behind her, reached out through the force. Turning to run again, Kara stumbled across an empty drawer from one of the cabinets she'd hurled. Falling before a shattered window, she reached instinctively for her lightsaber. But looking up, she saw the Sith girl, meters away and approaching with her hands raised. Dramica began to speak. <coughs> and screamed, instead. Behind her, Quillen had seen something she hadn't. Dramica's head snapped to the right, looking out the window and into the muzzle of a Kaladid 5000 cannon racing toward her. The girl dropped as thousands of kilograms of Cerasian iron stabbed through the window, driven by the movement of the warship outside. Rolling away, Kara looked back in surprise. Diligence! The warship lurched away from the building, withdrawing the colossal makeshift battering ram and taking part of the window frame with it. Looking to see Dramica reviving, Kara regained her feet and started running. Reminded, she reached for the con link and yelled, Is that you, mercenary? Silly question. The response came. Kara couldn't argue. To her left, she saw the Kravaki trying to rise on his remaining tentacles. Only one of his lightsabers was lit, but looking back, she saw Dramica holding one of the others. Kara winced. She should have put the regent down before this, she thought. And did the girl know how to use the lightsaber? She didn't relish another confrontation. Bounding across the room, Kara looked back to see that Diligence was no longer hovering outside the window. Boots skidding on the rug, she heard the reason. We can't get a ramp to you like this. Rusher's voice crackled. Kara saw the ship bob outside the window and drop again. We're going to slip under where the building juts out. You'll have to jump. When don't I? Kara wondered. She looked back. The regent had foundered, unable to make his remaining limbs obey. But Dramica continued to advance, green eyes now an empty red, matching the weapon burning in her hand. Behind and to her right, Kara saw Quillen meekly backing toward the window, hands raised to mimic Dramica's motions. Or was it the other way around? Divide and conquer, the Bothan had said. Kara looked at Quillen's eyes, as alive now as his sisters were vacant. Dramica's not the puppeteer. She's just another puppet for Quillen. Stop! Dramica yelled, raising her free hand. Facing her, Kara shuddered under the psychic command. And bolted, dashing straight between Dramica and the regent, heading straight for Quillen. The boy looked at her in wordless panic, his hand raised, just like his sister's. Charging, Kara saw Dramica wilt, no longer animated by her connection to her brother's mind. <coughs> Quillen yelled. Tucking her head beneath his armpit, Kara wrapped her hands around the boy and shoved toward the window where she'd seen Diligence last. With a mighty heave over the crunchy bottom of the pane, she carried Quillen over the side. Tackle becoming a tumble, Kara saw the lower levels of the loft whisking by, and the luxury cruiser Sunduck turned spotter's nest of the warship rising up to meet her. Tucking her left leg under the terrified teenager, Kara slammed violently into the hull. White heat shot from her ankle to her eyes in an instant. Dazed, Kara rolled, Quillen still partially on top of her. Diligence rolled, too, the harbor air currents pitching the vessel's nose upward. Kara and the boy slid backward, toward the decktop railing and the bay, hundreds of meters below. 
Kara clawed, desperately seeking a handhold. A metallic hand grabbed her instead. We've got her! Master Dackett yelled. Move us out. Kara heard. Dragged along with Quillen by Dackett and two other troopers, she spotted Rusher standing, partially visible, in the hatchway. No, she yelled, pushing futilely against her bearers. Tan and Beetle are still down there. We've got them. Rusher called, making a hole for his crew members to pass her into the hatchway. He regarded Quillen, feebly pushing at the air. You didn't think we had enough kids along? Kara fought to rest away from those relaying her down the ladder. So Tan and Beetle had made it out. But they weren't the only ones in jeopardy. The Salegians were back there, still living a life of unimaginable agony out in the buoys. And what of everyone else on Belura? In the whole diarchy? We can't leave, she said, wincing as the crew set her down on the deck. You don't understand. I can't leave. Not a chance, Holt. Rusher said, gesturing for the hatch above to be closed and speaking into his comlink. Orbital velocity, now. You can't make me go with you. The cargo I'm carrying is yours. Rusher said, descending the ladder toward her. Until it's delivered, you go where we go. Feeling the sudden impulse driving the vessel forward, Kara lay back against the deck, defeated. Rusher stepped past the medic tending to her and headed down the hallway. Kara glared. Leaving people behind again. This isn't going to help your lurch ratio. Chapter 17 He's just a kid. Rusher wrapped the head of his walking stick against the railing to the command pit. And you're telling me he's Sith? A Sith Lord. Kara corrected. Oh, well, that makes sense, the brigadier said. We didn't have a Sith Lord in the collection. Glad you brought him on board. He glared at the Jedi, sitting on the plush carpet of the bridge and nursing her wrenched thigh. Her attention was where his was, on the boy huddled in the nook, far forward. Rusher had posted armed guards to either side of the teenager, but it hardly seemed necessary. The kid was a mess. Since arriving with Kara on the bridge, he'd alternated between fevered looks through the viewscreen at Belura, below, and howling fits with his head tucked between his knees. A Sith Lord in his pajamas, Rusher thought. I've seen it all now. He's never been in space before. Quillen's never been out of his room before. Kara said, edging closer, and then back. She seemed to alternate, too, between sympathy and wariness. Rusher understood from her that, minutes earlier, the boy had been trying to kill her. But, Lord Quillen didn't look powerful. If anything, he seemed, mentally challenged. Kara looked around at the cosmos filling Quillen's sight on all sides. It's this blasted observation lounge of a bridge. Can't you polarize the viewports, or something? Not under attack, I can't, Rusher said, eyes sweeping the space from port to starboard. The diarchy battleships he'd seen leaving Hestabil were all out there, part of a serious space force that included cruisers and snub fighters. He even spotted some troop transports in the mix, all clustered near the battleships. The diarchy meant business for someone. But not them, at least not so far. Despite his words, diligence wasn't under attack. Since they'd reached orbit, the diarchy fleet had simply sat there, in between them and any hyperspace jump points. Leaving the Baluran system for anywhere required negotiating this field of predators, poised to strike. And unlike Ghazari, Rusher didn't figure the ships would suddenly leave on another appointment. You say this kid's their boss, he said, gesturing toward Quillen. Is that why they're not attacking? I don't know. Kara said. All her efforts to reach the boy had failed. I think they're waiting for orders. From him? From anybody. The Jedi stood, looking out at the sea of motionless spacecraft. Rusher waved to the Besilisk in the command pit, ordering a complete scan of all channels coming from Belura. If any word came up, 
he wanted to know it first. Look, Holt, if this kid's the boss, can't he tell them to knock off? Kara looked at the teenager, peeking at her with reddened eyes as he quaked. I don't think he can tell anyone anything. She said. Not without his sister. Rusher waved his arms. Well, let's get her on the comm then. No! The brigadier rocked back on his heels, surprised by the urgency of her response. I mean... Kara said in a more composed tone. No, I don't think it works that way. She speaks for him, but he only speaks to her through the force. I thought you people could fire your jibber-jabber a long way. It's not easy, if you've never done it before. Kara said. And Quillen's never had to do it before. Rusher's head swam. Agitated, he raked the head of his cane against the metal railing, causing a clackety-clack that set the Sith boy moaning again. Yeah, that's right, Rusher said. I feel like crying, too. He stomped toward the Jedi. I don't want either of you here. Flinching at the pressure on her leg, Kara tried to stand. You've made that clear. There's never been a Sith aboard diligence for a reason, Rusher said, eyebrows flaring. It keeps me and my crew safe, and them away from the heavy artillery. He waved at the fuzz of stars beyond one of the Diarchy's fleets. Don't they teach you your own history out in the Republic? Maybe you've heard of a little thing called Teletoa's Maxim. It goes. Never let Malik aboard. She finished. You're blasted right. Generations of military professionals knew the tale of the Republic Admiral who'd let a Sith in Jedi's clothing come along for the ride. He'd spent the rest of his career trying to undo the damage. We'll take their jobs. We'll take their fuel. But we won't take a Sith across the street. Not if I. Morex called from within the pit. We got fire! Bring a deer! At us? Rusher dashed back to the railing, distracted from his anger. The comm officer responded by pointing to the monitors. Lights shone on Belura's surface, where Hestabil and its continent were now slipping into nighttime. But it wasn't artificial illumination. Fire. Kara limped away from the teenager toward the port window. Studying the surface of the world slipping past, she pointed to locations all along the Terminator into night. Rusher joined her, bearing a pair of electrobinoculars. Plumes were rising from several levels of the capital city. Riots? People are waking up, I'd imagine. Kara said. And waking up angry. There had been a constant stream of commands coming from the Mesa to all of the twins' minions on Balura, she explained. Now that Quillen's sister had no commands to relay, order was collapsing. Rusher rubbed his forehead. And the first thing they do is set their place on fire? That doesn't make any sense at all. How should I know? Kara asked. People have been telling them to work, sleep, and eat for years. This is the first time they've had any options. She paused. Granted, it's an odd way to spend your first night off. Don't ask me, Rusher said. I blow stuff up for a living. He looked back over his shoulder at the warships outside. If this is our chance, maybe we'd better slip past now, before they realize how fun it is. Yeah. Kara said. I think you're... Incoming transmission! Brig! Just as Damon had appeared to them days before, now another Sith materialized in the dim light. A dar-looking Kravaki, Rusher saw, tentacles draped in a cape. Who's this? The Regent. Kara said. I don't know his name. Forward, the boy squealed, mystified by the strange image. <coughs> My name is Saj Salijan. The figure in the image responded. The Kravaki coughed and looked down. I mean, Saj Kalishan. He paused, his posture straightening. I know that now. Rusher looked at the image, puzzled. So he knows his name. What's the big deal? I think it is. A big deal. Kara said. Quiet. 
She hobbled over to address the hologram. What do you want? Kilometers below, Kalishan stood downstairs in the control room of the loft. Beside the sleeping Salijan in his tube, the Kravaki looked up at the seven video monitors, showing images from across the bay in Hestabil. It was one of the few surviving parts of the surveillance system the floating brains had not replaced, and now it gave him his only detailed view of what was going on. As commanded, the workers at the secret underground shipyards had started work on more battleships the instant their recently constructed fleet was safely away. Unfortunately, the knowledge of metal casting procedures lay not with the workers on the scene, but with a small group of experts on one of the lower floors of the Mesa complex. Normally, the Salegians carried their instructions to scarlet-clad unifiers in facilities all across Belura, allowing them to run many operations at once. But when the hub Salegian stopped routing messages, the factories were caught without know-how at a critical moment. At six Hestabil sites, molds filled uncontrolled with molten dura steel, overtopping and setting off chains of explosions. He could see that something similar had happened to three of their munitions factories as well. Heavy lids drooped as Kalishan watched the chaos spread. Belura had been a model of Sith centralization, a non-electronic system centered on a single lord's will. Now the former regent saw it all ending. A body could survive without a thinking mind only while the organs knew their function. Without one, the network was damaged. Without the will of the twins, it could never be repaired. I said, why are you calling us? Hearing the Jedi's voice, Kalishan shambled back to the holographic setup as best he could on his remaining tentacles. I am simply calling to learn whether the boy Quillen yet lives. Why? The dark-haired Jedi in the crisp image appeared to grow more reserved. Are you looking to parlay? No, it's too late for that, the Kravaki said, briefly explaining the mounting industrial disasters spreading across Belura. He redirected the cam toward a monitor showing Dramica, who had collapsed into a faint after her brother's disappearance through the window. She cannot tell a physical presence from one she observes through the Force. She cannot see him, so she does not search for him, he said, looking at her motionless body. She was the only one who could reach him, and for it, she became as much his slave as I did. Kalishan refocused the cam on himself and snorted. Kill him, if it pleases you, he said, lifting a singed stump that once held a lightsaber. It might please me. The comment caught the Jedi speechless. Another explosion came from across the bay, this one so loud it was audible through the control room's windowless walls. That would be one of the power stations, Kalishan said. The woman crossed her arms, her brow furrowed. You can't just send instructions over a comm link, like anyone else? Our minions have none. A secondary communication system provides a potential avenue for dissenters, he said. And before you ask, the other Salegians have rebelled, just as one here has. I cannot use them. I wasn't going to ask. She said. But I would ask that you free them. That, Jedi, is the last thing I would do, he said. But I can do no more, anyway. I will leave that to the others, when they arrive. He glanced back at another monitor. And it seems, now, they have. Others? What are you? Before Kara could finish her question, the skies around Diligence's bridge came alive with motion. One after another, colossal white vessels leapt in from hyperspace, surrounding the planet and orbiting fleet. Long and majestic, the crystalline warships, like snowflakes on a skewer, Kara thought, swiftly opened fire on the Diarchy's battleships. Kara stumbled toward the command pit, where Rusher and his crew were only beginning to react. So were the battleships, she saw out the starboard viewport. They didn't need guidance from Belura to be jolted into defensive action, but they moved sluggishly compared with the cruisers and similarly shaped fighters. Get us out of here, she said. Which way? Any way. Diligence tossed, banking away from Belura on a vector through the combat. Watching, Kara saw the precision with which the newcomers were striking. Two flaming battleships were out of commission, but salvageable. The arrivals were taking care not to destroy their prey. 
I've never seen them before. Rusher said, stepping up to the window beside her. I thought you lived around here. I live on this ship. He said, fumbling nervously with his cane. I work all over. But nobody knows how many Sith Lords there are, if these are even Sith. Kara scowled. Someone else would sure be nice, for a change. But out here, nested within competing Sith statelets, it couldn't be anyone else. Grabbing onto Rusher's arm as diligence weaved, she'd nearly forgotten her injury in the excitement, Kara foundered emotionally. This was her worst nightmare from Dark Nell, realized. It was exactly what she was afraid would happen in the Daemonate, had she caused a collapse from within that was visible from without. She looked over her shoulder to Belura. There wasn't any time to get any of those people free. The whole diarchy was collapsing, and, somehow, the twins' rivals had seen it. But how, so quickly? With a start, Kara realized the diarchy bordered Daemon's territory. Were these ships his? What could Daemon do, she wondered, if he knew the power the twins held? His greatest desire was to subjugate absolutely, to render other organics literal extensions of his will. But the twins had accomplished something he hadn't. For whatever reason, Damon still counted his own ego, his own individuality, too important. He wanted to subsume others, yet at the same time he enjoyed dominating them too much to truly allow a merger of will and matter. But Quillen and Dramica didn't understand the concept of other. As near as Kara could tell, from infancy they treated the Force as another of their senses, and they had no clear understanding of where they stopped and others began. For all his bluster, Damon had come to his Force powers too late. He had already known who he was by then. What could Damon do if he captured the twins now? Could he co-opt them? Learn from them? Kara looked back to the tactical display. They weren't anywhere near escaping the battle zone yet, and there was another vessel, still larger, up ahead. The flagship, hanging back and observing everything. And at the moment, blocking their path. Behind, she saw the hologram, still there. Collision, can't you do something? The former regent shook his head, sadly. This is not my house. He paused, then looked up. The dowager will decide our fate. The image disappeared. Tractor beams got us! Bring a deer! Rusher looked at Kara, mouthing the words unbelievingly. The dowager? That's her, Narsk said, standing in the doorway of the flagship. That's Kara Holt. The Bothan looked at the hologram and smiled, toothily. No more running, little Jedi. And it had been easy, just like the rest of this job. Narsk had arrived on Balura just a day earlier, traveling aboard a special stealth fighter contributed by his latest employer. Quickly locating the video surveillance system left over from early in the twins' reign, he'd installed a secret transmitter and left for higher ground atop the cataracts to monitor it. He'd been surprised, but not alarmed, to see the Jedi and her warship appear that morning. But it had worked out well. The artillery carrier's communications were even easier to crack from his position. From them, he learned that Kara was indeed at the center of the chaos being robbed below. When he'd seen her chasing across the bay to the mesa, he directed his client to be at the ready. And when he'd ascertained that she was in the sanctum, he pulled the trigger, cutting in and giving her the information she needed. He didn't even wait to learn the result, heading back to space and a rendezvous with the arriving flagship. Easy. The Jedi had not disappointed. Very good, Narsk Kahane. Take a seat. Narsk settled back in a high-covered chair and watched his own breath as he exhaled. She kept it so cold here. Through the shimmering frost particles, he focused on his employer. She was the best-looking of all the Sith Lords he'd worked for, he thought. Damon tried to look like the center of attention. This woman earned it. Human and just a few years older than Kara, the woman struck a noble warrior's pose in white furs and armor. Her skin was clear, freckled with frost. Golden eyes, narrow and fiercely intelligent, looked back at him. He wasn't human, but if he were. Thanks for the good work, Agent. She said, stepping past him onto the upper deck of the bridge. And for the thought. 
She looked down and addressed the hologram. So you're the Jedi. You have the advantage. Yes, I do. She said. My name is Arcadia Calamandra. I'm a Sith Lord, and I'm here to help. Part 3 The Arcadianate Chapter 18 Hyperspace had become a haven for Kara, her only one, since arriving in Sith space. Suffering might hold sway on either side, but the weird region between stars was something even the Sith could not ruin. In the past, when she had traveled between worlds under duress, Kara had always chosen to make the journey. Diligence, instead, had been compelled to follow the crystalline flagship and part of its fleet into the hyperspace lane under threat of disintegration. She wanted to object, but Russia wasn't about to deviate from the course he'd been provided. The day in the diarchy had simply been too much. The fight had gone out of everyone, herself, included. They hadn't been boarded. But before jumping, they'd been ordered to provide information about how many warriors and refugees were aboard Diligence. Kara disliked admitting there were hundreds of students on board, but she was more worried the invaders might destroy their worship outright. The woman in the hologram somehow seemed to already know their situation anyway. The new Sith Lord was a puzzle, serious and direct. Kara had spent part of the hours in hyperspace parsing Arcadia's few words. Russia seemed to know nothing of her and her realm. What had the woman's calm officer called it? The Arcadianate. Another would be warlord with an eponymous empire. Just what the galaxy needed. But while Russia had not recognized the emblem on her flagship, seven interlocking chevrons, one for each color in the visible spectrum, he had recognized the vessel's name. New Crucible related to Yeldes, a peculiar ancient Sith Lord who was the favorite of a number of philosophical descendants, including, of all people, Odeon. The Crucible of Yeldes had been a novel military institution created by him to transform peaceful subject peoples into talented warriors. Several Sith Lords in more recent times had tried to put their own spin on it. Kara's heart had sunk on hearing Rusher's explanation. From one slave pit to another. Early in the journey, Rusher had gone to his quarters for sleep, or perhaps back to his solarium for fortification. Kara didn't know. Fearful of leaving Quillen alone, Diligence had no formal brig, she tried to rest on the plush floor nearby, where she could keep an eye on him. She'd found it impossible to sleep for more than an hour at a time, given the bustle of the command pit. But at least one person had remained quiet, Quillen had calmed down with every light year Diligence put between itself and Belura. Kara gave partial credit for that to Tan. Visiting the bridge to see her former roommate, the Celestin had spied the distraught Quillen, curled up at the front of the room before his yawning guards. Before Kara could object, Tan had plopped down on the carpet near the boy, assuming he was just another refugee. In a sense, of course, he was. And as Tan sat chattering away about the sights and sounds of hyperspace around them, Quillen had stopped quaking and started watching her instead. Kara had initially feared that the boy was trying to find another potential puppet, but she perceived nothing of that in the Force. Rather, the young girl simply seemed to be a calming influence for the troubled teen. Tan was close to Dromica's age, Kara realized, and just as childlike, in her own bubbly way. From studying in the shadows of the Tango's apartment one week, to serving as playmate to a Sith Lord the next, it made as much sense as anything else. The rest of the trip had been an exhausted slide. Momentum had carried Kara far from that first trip to Shalo all the way to Belura. But as Diligence and its escorts emerged from hyperspace into a bluish pocket of newborn stars, she was filled with dread. She hadn't been in control of her destination during the flight to Ghazari, but at least she'd had a plan for after her arrival. Seeing the white world laced with pink striations looming ahead, she knew nothing but the planet's name and that had come from their captors. Synod. Reading what passed for star charts aboard his ship, Rusher had said it rhymed, roughly, with lie dead. She thought that was a strange choice of expressions until they got closer. It fit. Synod was a frigid lump. 
Near to but little warmed by its adolescent star, the globe spun quickly, weak sunlight racing across its surface of water and carbon dioxide ice. But while that surface had seemed smooth and featureless from orbit, on approach, Kara had seen mammoth slabs tilted diagonally, remnants of tectonic fractures. Elsewhere, bright smears marred the surface, evidence of ancient cryovolcanism. Sinead might be lying dead now, but it hadn't always been a quiet place. Diligence had been directed to land near an icy outcropping just across a wide basin from what appeared to be a small cluster of greenhouses. Several other starships sat on the ice nearby. New Crucible didn't follow them down, instead expelling a shuttle to the A-frame building across the frosty plain. That had been their cue. Now Kara and Rusher stood, as commanded, on the surface of Sinead, both wearing the spacesuits the brigadier had produced from the hold. A whisper of oxygen clung to Sinead's surface, but given the temperature, removing the environment suits would have been the first step in a slow suicide. Weary from her broken sleep, Kara looked across the terrain for any clues. The basin was one big parking lot. Tracked vehicles had been out on the ice, running between the ships and the hothouses, if that's what they were. Warmth and Sinead didn't seem to go together. But neither did the pair at the foot of Diligence's ramp. Kara had simply thought it before, now she knew it for certain. Rusher was no ally. She glared at him, holding that silly cane of his, even out here. His spacesuit was clunky and copper-colored, just like hers, and both would have been considered antiques in the Republic. The man shifted back and forth on the ice, Kara thought he was trying to find which footing would make him look the most statuesque. No wonder he was working for Damon. He looked up at Sinet's tiny star, visibly traversing the sky. Join Rusher's brigade and see the galaxy. He said over the comm link. Another joke. Kara took a step forward, keeping her back to him. I'm not talking to you, she said. And yet, you are. We didn't have to follow these people, Kara said. We could have dropped out of hyperspace before getting here. You know that's not true. Rusher said, poking his walking stick against the pink ice at his feet. We had no idea who else was in the lane. We could have collided. Or worse. Kara exploded. Worse? We've just gone from one Sith Lord to another. Again. She turned to find Rusher chipping at the ground and trying not to chuckle. Tan and her friends hate to go to sleep anymore. Another day and they could wake up, God. Rage outpacing her mouth, Kara shook her fists theatrically. They might be running Odeon's death mills. Or back where they started, shining statues for Damon. Rusher shook as he laughed. I like this whole not talking to me part. He said. Look, kid, Jedi, we were never going to find a place that wasn't run by Sith. Let's just be patient and check this one out. I'd like to check it out. I can't, Kara said, opening her fists and looking at her hands. New Crucible had ordered Kara and Rusher to wait outside, unarmed. Using the hated stealth suit wasn't an option, either. The Mark VI had a remarkable operating range, but Sinead's temperature was well outside it. Kara looked back toward the west and squinted. Just a few minutes earlier, it had been noon in this high latitude, now Sinead's sun was dropping behind the settlement. The two conical tractor beam generators they'd spied from orbit cast the longest shadows, reminding her that, whatever else might happen, diligence wasn't going far without permission. Its external weapons were simply too weak. Squinting against the icy glare, she made out movement. The brigadier had seen it, too. Stepping forward, Rusher flipped the cane into a surprised Kara's hands and raised his macro binoculars. Kara looked at the stick and smoldered. I'd like to crack that faceplate with. Wow. Rusher said, lowering the unit. You have to get a load of this. Curiosity trumping annoyance, Kara reached out and yanked at the macro binoculars still looped around Rusher's armored neck. Pulling the brigadier down, she angled the glasses toward the approaching blur. Lord Arcadia Calamandra rode across the ice sheet toward them, looking every bit like one of the Winter Warrior Princesses Kara had seen in her story Holos as a child. 
Above the furs and armor from before, Arcadia now wore a silvery cape that caught the frigid air as her mount loped across the tundra. The great three-limbed reptile bounded along on clenched fists, its forked tail snaking back and forth behind it. And amazingly, Arcadia's face and forearms were exposed to Cyanid's cruel climate. Even the creature she rode had a heated air supply, Carasaw. Arcadia's sole nod to the elements was the addition of the cape and a museum relic of a headdress. Pulling at the reins with one hand, Arcadia seemed to be enjoying just a brisk day out. Kara released the macro binoculars abruptly, causing Rusher to nearly pitch over. The woman was halfway to them, now. Kara tried to wipe the fog from her faceplate, to no avail. What was it the Kravaki said? A dowager. What's a dowager? A widow. Rusher said. An old woman who owns her late husband's property, like an estate. She doesn't look like a widow to me. Maybe. I sure don't think I'd survive a shore leave with her. Rusher said, rubbing his gloved hands together. But it wouldn't be a bad way to go. Please, Kara said. Try to grow up. Before them, the ice lizard slid to a stop, splaying its palms wide to get a purchase against the ice. Towering above them, Arcadia yanked at the reins. As the Sith Lord twisted atop the creature, Kara spied a meter-long, ornamented staff, bound to Arcadia's back. Sorry about the circumstances. Arcadia said, her words precipitating into snow. Our landing bays aren't yet large enough to accommodate vessels, like yours. She leaned over and patted the chuffing creature's snout. And I can only get the barrelics out for a ride in the summer. This is summer? Kara stared at the newcomer. The woman was twenty-five, maybe thirty at most, and healthy. And for the first time among the Sith Lords she'd met here, Kara saw face paint, light silvery streaks beneath her eyes, setting off her frost-speckled cheeks and completing the whole Warrior Queen look. It was quite a get-up. Arcadia seemed equally bemused. She looked down at Kara and smirked. I said no weapons, Jedi. What? Kara looked down to see Rusher's cane, still in her left hand. Oh, she said, lifting it in both hands. Fine. Abruptly, she brought the cane down over her space-suited knee, snapping it in two. She pitched the halves to Rusher, who glared at her and tossed them to the ice. Arcadia noticed him. Kara Holt of the Republic, I spoke to earlier. But who are you, sir? Jero Rusher, of Rusher's Brigade. He saluted. That's my ship you forced down. Diligence. Diligence. Arcadia repeated. Like Admiral Morvis's vessel? The same. Rusher said, visibly impressed. The Sith woman spoke matter-of-factly. His exploits in the first battle of Amanoth were a fraud, you know. Rusher's smile froze. You must know something I don't, then. Probably. With thigh-high boots, the woman kicked the reptile into motion. As it loped in a studious circle around the pair, Kara watched Rusher. The man was dumbstruck, for a change. Arcadia had punctured one of his historical heroes and sounded authoritative in the process. I'm going to have to study up so I can do that, Kara thought. You wanted us here, ma'am. Rusher said. What can I do for you? It's what I can do for you. Arcadia said, bringing the barrelics to a stop. It's as I said. I'm here to help. You were leaving Ballura when we found you. I understand you have refugees aboard. Kara studied the woman as she dismounted. The Jedi only came up to Arcadia's chin. The refugees weren't from that conflict, Kara said. We're just passing through. I know. Arcadia said, raking ice from the nodding Barrelix's eyes. You told us that. And I am aware of what happened in the Daemonate. To the Arxium, they were bound for. She said. Rusher looked at Kara, puzzled. They hadn't mentioned where their passengers had come from in their transmissions. Arcadia continued, not looking at them. I am willing to help your students, and to provide for your ship's needs, Brigadier. 
but I need something first. Abruptly, she turned toward them. You do have a refugee from Balura. She said, piercing eyes focused on Kara. What I really need right now, is to see Quillen. Kara stiffened. I'm sorry? Don't toy with me, Kara Holt. Arcadia said, looking down. I know you have Lord Quillen of Balura aboard your ship. I am prepared to render aid, but only if the boy is produced first. Rusher started to move toward the ramp, but Kara grabbed his arm. Hold it, she said. Eyeing Arcadia, she waved her hand. Look, whatever the boy once was, he isn't now. I saw what your people did to the Diarchy ships. I know he was a rival. But he's not a threat to you now. She wondered what she was doing, speaking for a Sith, but the pathetic creature under guard didn't seem to be that. Not anymore. You don't have to kill him. Arcadia looked down at Kara, her face betraying no emotions. After an icy moment, she burst into laughter. <laughs> kill him? Of course, I'm not going to kill him. She said, smiling broadly. I'm his sister. Still under construction, Arcadia's citadel had been built inside a series of connected ice calderas. With the collapsed underground reservoir's contents having long since boiled off to space, Arcadia's builders had simply erected a thatch of ice pillars above, topped with a layer of transparent steel. The result had been a massive airtight compartment inside the ice, far larger than it appeared on the surface and roomy enough for an entire city. A creature hiding under a shell, Kara thought. And Kalamandretta, as Arcadia called it, was as alive as the surface was dead. Emerging from the cab of the trundle car, the tracked ground transport Arcadia had sent to diligence, Kara surveyed the great atrium. Hundreds of workers thundered past, crisscrossing artificial flooring stacked with orderly piles of supplies. With Arcadia's starships forced to park outside, Patriot Hall served as a massive depot. Several ramps led gradually downward from the main floor to large galleries hewn into the glacier. Only stars shone through the transparent ceiling, night had fallen for the second time in four hours. Synod was the complete opposite of Darknell and its endless days and nights. But the place was bright, nonetheless, thanks to long tubes embedded in the ice walls. Effervescent blue liquid coursed through them, giving off a warm light. Our lifeblood. Arcadia said, turning over the barrelix to a wary green-skinned handler. Cynedian algae. The seas under the ice sheets were full of the stuff, she explained, drawing energy from thermal vents. Whole sections of Kalamandretta were devoted to cultivating and processing the algae, which provided both fuel and food for the settlement. We use every molecule of it. Nothing is wasted. Kara observed her own breath. It still doesn't keep it very warm here. Some guest you are. Rusher said, stepping out of the trundle car. Don't criticize someone living in an ice house for not turning on the heat. At least he had that overcoat of his, Kara saw. He hadn't bothered to find anything more for Kara to wear, nor had he spoken to her on the ride over. She figured he was still stinging over the cane incident. But at least she hadn't done that in front of his crew. What was he upset about? Her eyes darted to the foot traffic, now flowing around their parked vehicle. After the dismal streets of Darknell and the robotic misery of Balura, Synod had plenty of energy to it. The citizens in Patriot Hall looked up and around as they walked, not down at the floor. And most of their clothing was brand new, uniforms of varying colors and styles. Those clearly didn't all come from the algae. We have something for you. Rusher said, slapping the side of the trundle car. Trooper Labun emerged from inside, pushing Quillen down the ramp in a brown hover chair. His hands fastened to the handles of the antiquated model, Quillen appeared nearly catatonic. Stepping to the foot of the ramp, Arcadia looked down at the teenager. No trace of emotion crossed her face, and Quillen didn't respond either, not even when Arcadia knelt beside him, cape flowing on the chilly floor. Kara studied the two together. Beyond the high foreheads, she couldn't see much resemblance, nor a lot of big sisterly warmth coming from Arcadia. But at least it was a peaceful meeting. 
Arcadia had assured her earlier that not all Sith siblings were like Damon and Odeon. Still hiding in there, little Quillen? Arcadia said, searching his eyes. Suddenly, the boy moved in his chair. Arcadia appeared startled for a moment before noticing that Tan had scampered up behind her. Ah. Uh, hello, girl. Arcadia said. She looked up at Kara. Why is she here? I didn't want to bring her, Kara said, grabbing at Tan's shoulder and pulling her back. She's one of the students, I mean, the refugees. But we need to calm Quillen down to move him, and she seems to help. Arcadia nodded to the girl and stood, directing Beetle toward an ice portal where her aides waited to take care of Quillen. Why did you bring Beetle? Kara whispered to Rusher. We're trying to be as unthreatening as possible, remember? The worst thing Labun might do is run over her foot with the chair. It's a hover chair. Rusher rolled his eyes. Believe me, he'd find a way. At least he was talking again, Kara thought. Returning from seeing her brother off, Arcadia addressed the military man. You became part of history yesterday, Brigadier. I hope you appreciate that. He does, Kara intervened. But what do you mean exactly? The diarchy has fallen. After eight years, Quillen Andromica's realm has become part of the Arcadianate. By replacing the commanders on the Diarchy's ships of the line with Selegions, Arcadia said, Quillen could have made them an organic extension of his planet-bound command. But there had always been a fatal flaw. The bobbing brains aboard the cruisers had to get their orders, somehow, and that had required technology. While Arcadia said she could imagine trained Force users transcending space with their telepathy, the method seemed impractical to her. Such feats were difficult and rare, not something to be relied upon. An error of youth and inexperience. She called it. Quillen always would have been dependent on a physical linkage, somewhere. And that linkage could be attacked. Arcadia explained that she had just dispatched an agent to Belura seeking to compromise that connection when Kara suddenly appeared, disrupting Quillen's communications at the source. It was then that we thought to help you. She said. And you did your work well. You triggered our invasion. Help me? Kara felt the pain in her leg coming back. What do you mean? Divide and conquer. Came a familiar voice from behind the trundle car. Around the transport strode the Bothan, wearing a brown parka matching his fur. Kara gawked. She hadn't seen the spy since Damon's castle on Darknell but it had definitely been the Bothan's voice back on Balura. You. I take it you know each other. Rusher said, eyeing the new arrival with puzzlement. Yes, I know him. This is, this is, Kara stopped, stymied. She'd never learned his name. Narsk. The Bothan said, looking up at the brigadier. Rusher scratched frost from his beard and smiled. I got it. You're the guy from Damon's torture wheel. Well, thanks for the help. Narsk said, little regarding the general as he stepped past. Here is your final report, Lord Arcadia. Arcadia took the data pad from the spy and read. Narsk described the contents as she did so. Even now, her forces were landing on Balura, taking control of the whole regime. Kara grabbed at his sleeve. I thought you worked for Odeon. I'm an independent contractor. Narsk said coolly. Much like your friend here who doesn't help people. Arcadia is the highest bidder. He paused. Of the moment. This is why I like you, Narsk. Arcadia said, not looking away from the data pad. I always know where I stand with you. Reading, a faint smile crossed her face. This is good. Your forces have taken Hestabil without a shot fired, my lady. Narsk said. Arcadia's advance guard had installed itself in the loft and was sending forces across the planet to free the Selegians from their prisons. The Diarchy's network would be dismantled and all its citizens, floating brains included, would become contributing members of the Arcadianate. Kara looked in the direction Quillen had been taken. 
What will happen to Dramica? She will remain in her mountaintop home, supervised and tended to. Arcadia said. Far away from her brother. They should never see each other again, given their curious connection. I don't know what kind of life it will be for Dramica, but I expect it'll be superior to what she had. She paused. I'll visit her later, to check in. And collision? Dead. Arcadia said, slapping the data pad on Narsk's chest. The Bothan nodded and took the device. The regent was executed just before I received the call. They said he met his end quietly. Kara stepped back. The figure she'd fought had acted as one possessed, but in the hologram, the Kravaki had seemed almost tragic. Why did he have to die? Quillen was the mind. Arcadia said. But Kalishan was the mastermind. He built the system. Maintained it. He made possible all that my brother wrought. Another enabler, Kara thought, looking over at Narsk and Rusher. I'm surrounded by them. Every Sith sees a different path to rule of the galaxy. Arcadia said. But once a strategy has been shown to fail, the strategist must pay the price. Kara looked back at the Bothan. And when exactly did you stop working for Odeon and start working for her? Arcadia regarded Narsk civilly. Agent Kahane is someone I've worked with before. She said. He contacted her just after the Battle of Ghazari morphed into a war on Lord Bactra, claiming that he'd had enough of Odeon and Daemon for a while. One can hardly blame him, really. I dispatched him to Balura. And the rest. She added, smirking gently at Rusher. Is history. You thought you could get me to do your dirty work, Kara said acidly. You did. Narsk said with a sneer. Actually, once he told me you were there, we didn't know what you might do. Arcadia said. But you've tended to be a destabilizing factor, wherever you've gone. We expected an opportunity might arise this time. Narsk bowed to Arcadia. Is there any other service I can perform? Arcadia studied Kara for several seconds. Perhaps. Stick around, Narsk. I'm sure there's something you can do. The Bothan looked back at Kara. There is something. She has property of mine back on her ship, I suspect. The stealth suit, Kara thought. Oh, that. I gave it to a little girl. Good luck getting it back. Suddenly reminded, she looked up, startled. Tan. Where'd she go? Rusher pointed down one of the huge blue-lit hallways. She went with Beetle and the boy. Here we go again, Kara snarled. Does anybody ever make it back to your ship? Hey, you brought her. You lost her. A hand touched Kara's shoulder, chilling her. Don't worry. Arcadia said. She's no doubt excited. There is a lot for her to see in our city, and for you, too. Me? Shrinking from Arcadia's reach, Kara looked around. She'd been expecting guards to show up to cart her away to wherever they kept captured Jedi, presuming they had such a place. But everyone she'd seen had seemed like a civilian. This isn't a concentration camp, Kara. It's civilization. An enlightened community, which will welcome your refugees. Kara's jaw set. No guards? Well, you won't be left alone. The glistening Sith Lord said. But all members of the Arcadianate have some kind of combat training. And all of them will act to protect it, if you try to disturb it. Before Kara could respond, Arcadia clapped. A Trilek aide in Mauve stepped forward. Take Brigadier Rusher to requisitioning. I'm sure his crew and passengers have some immediate needs. As Rusher nodded genteelly and saluted, Kara glared at him. Still looking for a job. And call for seas. Arcadia yelled, heading off in a different direction. There's much that we want from the Jedi, but there is much she should learn first. Seeing Rusher depart with the Trilek, Kara looked back across the atrium to Arcadia. 
An aide had taken her headdress, revealing hair as light as Kara's was dark. Another aide stood nearby, waiting on her every word. Kara's head swam. This was like no welcome a Jedi had ever received from a Sith Lord. And none of the dozens of people around seemed to take the least note of it. No one but the Bothan, who leaned against the trundle car, eyes shifting back and forth between the two of them. Chapter 19 Arcadia had wanted Kara to walk in the shoes of her citizens. Touring Kalamandretta, Kara figured she could have fit her entire body comfortably inside a single one of her guide's boots. And yet the Herglet moved through the thoroughfares of the ice-hewn city with amazing speed, forcing Kara to march double-time just to keep up with her. One of the larger members of a once-aquatic species, Seas was a lumbering grey behemoth measuring two-plus meters in all directions. Clad in her bright yellow vestments, the guide could have been seen from orbit, Kara thought. There will be Selegians joining the Arcadianate. Seas said, riding down to a lower level. It'll be nice to have someone the same size around. Kara nodded. She noticed the steam rising from the blowhole atop the frost-covered Herglick's head. Aren't you cold here? she asked. Seas let out a thunderous laugh. <laughs> a body that stays in motion doesn't notice. She said, launching into a discussion of her life as they emerged from yet another factory. Seas had been in the Arcadianate just six years, but had found time to familiarize herself with all operations on Synad, as well as several other of her leader's worlds. And I still had time to have four children, can you believe it? Indeed, Seas seemed to know everything about every place they entered. The alga processing plants, without which there would be no life on Synad. The reclamation facilities, finding metals vital to Arcadia's cause one milligram at a time from the waters deep underground. Even the education centers, where the youth of Synod were turned into productive and committed citizens. Seas had found her first assignment as a teacher there, just after Arcadia had conquered her homeworld. But if her guide harbored any ill will about that, Kara had seen no indication of it. In fact, she'd been able to get little specific about Arcadia out of the Herglick, save some platitudes about the Sith Lord's keen mind. Early in the tour, Kara, remembering the collision statement, had asked if Arcadia was a widow. Seas thought for a moment, but didn't remember her master ever taking a mate. That line of conversation had resulted in yet more gushing about Arcadia. Of course. Seas boomed. It would be a clever mind indeed that could hold our lady's attention. Now, entering their sixth factory off Progress Plaza, Kara found herself wearying of the victory tour. That's what it was, she realized, a show, proving Arcadia's path to power superior to that of any other Sith. She'd initially imagined the names of the great underground halls to be ironic, but apparently, the people bought into them. There were no correctors, no scarlet-clad straw bosses. Instead, about one worker in twenty wore a blue sash and a blaster, members of the Citizen Guard, responsible for peace and order. We have more volunteers than we need, actually. Seas said. Many take the added duty to help their own advancement. But there's rarely much to do. Certainly, the system seemed less oppressive, no one, anywhere, seemed to be working under any threat of pain. But something still seemed wrong. In the hydroponic gardens, where they raised silken fronds for thread, and here, in the textile mill, whose produce helped warm the citizens. Everyone seemed just a bit too devoted, somehow. Wait, Kara said, spotting a green-skinned male across the factory floor. That guy. Seas looked across the mill, worrying with activity. The Folline? That's the manager's station. He's the manager here. But I've seen him, Kara said. Back when I arrived. He was Arcadia's Baralix handler. The Herglick stared blankly at the mop-topped figure. That may well be. Barging forward, Seas got the manager's attention. You, citizen. Do you come fresh to this? Promoted this very work cycle. The Faline said, exhibiting a rumpled smile. He turned back to his control board, flashing frantically. Kara watched the new manager struggle. She thought his expression was halfway between pride and terror. 
Walking away, she quizzed her host. He was working the stables. Now he's here? Arcadia was, as ever, the answer. She always likes us to come at a project fresh. C said, rocking on mighty stumped feet. With new eyes. The rest of the hour passed in much the same way. Why did the mill turn out clothing in so many bright colors? To help Arcadia's citizens become noticeable, memorable individuals. Why had no one, to Caesar's memory, ever left the Arcadianate? No Sith Lord offered anything comparable to the life found here, under the frigid wasteland. Why had Arcadia been so slow to bring the rest of the galaxy under her protection? She knew that speedy conquest came at a price to the existing civilization. A meal had to be digested before eating again. But make no mistake. C said, seeing commotion up ahead. Arcadia will rule the galaxy, and we along with her. Kara looked far down the hollowed-out hallway to see Arcadia, dressed more lightly in a silvery tunic and cape, leading Beetle and Tan through the promissorium. Tan seemed excited to be touring Arcadia's academy, Beetle seemed to be rubbing his forehead. My time with you is done, I see. Seas said. Giant lips pursed, the herglic female looked down at Kara. If I may take the liberty, Kara Holt, you do not seem like a bad person. I do not understand why they say the Jedi hate the Sith. Kara looked up, tongue-tied. I don't know what to say to that. Well, maybe there are different kinds of Jedi, just as there are different kinds of Sith. Turning on a massive heel, Seas began to depart. But Kara placed a hand on the creature's mighty arm. Wait, Seas. I do have one more question. Certainly. How was it you knew Salegians would be coming here? Calamandretta seemed to have an open society, but Kara had seen no hint of any kind of mass media. Why, I was at the battle. Seas said. I was a tactical officer aboard New Crucible just yesterday. And now you're a tour guide? New eyes. Seas said, smiling broadly. But looking into the glowing yellow slits, Kara thought Seas's eyes seemed very old. The herglet trot away, perhaps a bit slower than before. Kara. 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 The Jedi found she had something attached to her leg. Hello, Tan. How was your, your tour? Tan bounced up and down, describing the sights that she'd seen in the promissorium with Arcadia, from the classrooms to the dining halls. Kara's attention, however, was on Beetle and his bleeding forehead. What happened to you? He tripped on his boat and fell down one of the escalators. Arcadia deadpanned. Kara looked to a moving staircase behind her. Every step's two meters long. How could you fall down one? Arcadia smiled primly. I wasn't there, but I am told that it was something to see. Beetle smiled weakly at Kara. If he's an ad for Rusher's services, Kara thought, they might as well fly back to the Daemonate now. Tan chattered on about the wonders of Kalamandretta's educational system, becoming almost a tiny version of the Herglet tour guide. As she spoke, doors opened to the left and right, discharging younglings of all species from their lessons. Kara wondered if their release had been timed to accompany Tan's message, to reinforce the healthy state of the local youth. If so, Arcadia's point was made. Kara scanned the small faces milling past, all on their way between classes. These weren't the grease-covered child laborers of Dark Nell, whatever they might build in the future, right now, they were building themselves. Her attention shifted to a godal couple, standing off to the side with a tiny child. Touching head cones, the main-faced parents saw their son to his classroom door. As the godal adults picked their way back through the crowded hall, Kara closed her eyes. Something about the scene both warmed and chilled her. Similar moments were happening all around. All akin, in a way, to Gubb's parting with Tan, days earlier, parents sending their children off to find better places in life. Was that universal? She'd seen identical sights in the Republic every time a Padawan entered the Jedi Order. She'd never had an experience like that. The Sith had robbed her of her family. And yet, these partings seemed temporary. 
Arcadia hadn't ripped these families apart. What had C said? Maybe there are different kinds of Sith. Walking in the stream of students just her height, Tan grew ever more effusive. And the thing she seemed most excited about was the range of subjects the students here learned, from calculus to genetics to stellar cartography. Your ward told me of the life she was bound for. Arcadia said, nodding to the odd youngling she passed. Tan and your other passengers were going to be chained to one subject for the rest of their lives. Preposterous. This was Damon's idea? She searched for Kara's gaze. Come, you can at least answer me that. It was a corporation, Kara said, looking away. Industrial heuristics. Arcadia nodded. One of Lord Bacter's holdings. The former. Lord. She corrected herself. She'd been apprised of events on Ghazari. My last information is he was hiding in a Cormian retirement colony, somewhere. Well, he should be safely out of the fray there. Kara wondered how Arcadia had heard, all the way out here. That Narsk, maybe. That made sense. Strolling back toward Patriot Hall, the main atrium, Arcadia described for Kara how Tan and the others would be educated in her realm. Students would work to become as versatile as they possibly could, so that, as adults, they could contribute in as many ways as her state might need. Other Sith Lords treated sentient beings as just another raw material, basic elements, unworkable and immutable. Miners taken captive in the territory of one became miners in the next. But what if the victor needed physicists? An empire's strategic needs changed with the mix of neighbors on its borders. How would it do for a state that suddenly needed nothing but fighter pilots to have only a token few? Before Kara could respond, Arcadia spied someone up ahead and stepped up her pace. Rusher and the Trelec stood in a loading zone near a massive magnetic gateway to the frigid outside world. Beside them, several workers loaded a mountain of containers and cylinders onto a trio of trundle cars. Arcadia swept toward them. Did my assistant find your supplies, Brigadier? Everything I could have asked for. Rusher said, studying a data pad. Should replenish all the stocks the refugees drew down. I'm surprised at the variety of food you have here. We don't live by algae alone, not with so many different pallets. What we don't grow here, we ship in. She looked at Beetle. It will probably take your crew longer to unload it than we took to grow it. We're pretty good with loading. Rusher said, passing his recruit the data pad. One of our specialties, in fact. Arcadia smiled politely. Looking down, she reached for Tan's hands. Go, girl, and tell your friends aboard diligence of the kind of life that awaits them here. Kara winced as Tan hugged the Sith Lord goodbye. Arcadia accepted the gesture, appearing to regard the expression as novel. I'll be across later, Kara told the Celestin, walking her to the ramp. I don't think Arcadia is done with me. She'll let us stay here, won't she? Tan asked, black eyes hopeful in the doorway. Please try to convince her, Kara. Kara's heart caught in her throat. Looking back, she saw Arcadia standing confidently as she chatted with Rusher and the Athorian aide. Whatever she wants to do, Tan. I'm pretty sure she's already decided, Kara said. Stay safe. Stepping back, she saw Beetle approaching the transport. Make sure she gets safely back to diligence. The recruit nodded. Master Jedi, do you think this could really be a home for us? Flustered, he corrected himself. I mean, for them? Not sure about a mercenary life, trooper? Kara patted his shoulder and smiled weakly. Well, I hope you make the right decision. You, too. Beetle said, needlessly saluting her. Stopping in the hatchway, he looked back. I'm sorry, I don't know why I said that. Shaking his head, he disappeared inside the trundle car. Kara turned to see Arcadia looking with obvious satisfaction at the work the Trelex team was doing. You have mastered this office, quickly, Warmalo. Arcadia said. She looked the Trelec in his narrow eyes. 
I should like to challenge you further. I appreciate a challenge. The aide said. Report to the foundry. You are the new director of metallurgical operations. The pasty-skinned figure rocked, seemingly unsure how to respond to the news. At last, Wormalo bowed his lumpy head. Thank you, my lord. Kara watched the newly promoted aide stalk off. Does he know anything about metallurgy? He has the same grounding I expect from all my people. Arcadia said. But he had been at the same assignment for nearly three months. I think he can do more. I expect him to. As the loaded trundle cars revved up behind her, the din reverberated throughout the atrium. And yet Rusher and Arcadia couldn't miss noticing it when Kara suddenly burst out laughing. <laughs> Rusher looked at her, puzzled. You take these spells often. I get it. The floor rumbling with the departure of the trundle cars through the magnetic seals, Kara knelt and clasped her hands. I get it. I understand what you're doing here. She looked again at the Trelec, shrinking into the distance. The Herglick. The Faleen. And now him. It was the common thread. She looked up at Arcadia. Your whole society. It looks orderly. But it runs on chaos. Arcadia stared down at her for a moment before her expression softened. Your perceptions are sharp, Jedi. She said. I knew that they would be. You've learned, in your day's journey, what I have spent a lifetime learning, how to forge an effective society under one person. Rusher looked at her with interest. I don't follow. Organizations decay from the moment they're created, Brigadier. Arcadia said. All Sith want to rule, and rule forever. But to rule forever, there must be constant revival. Seeing Kara stand, she gestured to the stars through the ceiling panels. You've seen much chaos at work in Sith space. I have harnessed chaos. Organized it. I have made a slave of change. Kara explained to Rusher what she had seen. It's like the way you run your crew. She expects people to be able to do any job, she said. Flexibility. Versatility. These are the traits I'm looking for. Arcadia said. I don't assume my subjects have only one kind of potential, only one destiny. I challenge them to find more in themselves. The Jedi responded with a canny smirk. But I bet Rusher doesn't take his best gunners out of the field the second they get good at what they're doing. Do you, Brigadier? Rusher straightened his collar, seemingly unsure of the tack he should take. No. No, that wouldn't make sense. He looked at Arcadia. Don't you have a competence problem? Don't you? Arcadia pointed in the direction Trooper Labon and the Trundle cars had gone. At least I'm guaranteed all my workers have the same starting knowledge about the things I care about. And those who knew life under regimes before mine have a great incentive to see that we all succeed. Kara studied Arcadia. The Sith woman's philosophy was less deranged than others she had heard in Sith space, but she was still Sith. There was always an angle. Kara just had to find it. Arcadia watched her working it out. You can say what you're thinking. I'm thinking all this moving everyone around keeps you safe, as much as anything, Kara said. Your more skilled underlings never become rivals, because they've always got something new to do. They're always having to scramble to get re-established. She looked directly at Arcadia. Your philosophy is an insurance policy. And reducing wasteful conflict is bad how? Arcadia rested her chin on the back of her hand. You've seen what it's like out there. Can you really say rivalry among Sith is good for the galaxy? Kara's grin faded. The woman was right. As proud as Kara was of her insight, it didn't change the fact that, from all she had seen thus far, the Arcadianate appeared to be a safe place for those who lived in it. If this was Arcadia's worst secret, it was hard to find an objection to it. But she wondered why the Sith Lord had wanted her to come to the realization on her own. I did. Arcadia said, catching the thought through the Force. 
because it's important to me that we understand each other and that you understand what I have to offer. Stepping to the middle of the atrium, she spread long, silver-clad arms. I'm offering sanctuary to all your students here on Sined. Kara stared. How do I know you won't put them to work making weapons? You don't, and I will. Arcadia said. I have my own borders to protect and wars to wage. But that will only be some of the time. With me, they have some hope of doing something else, besides. And in relative safety. She added. Rusher shook his head. I'm sorry, Lord Arcadia. He said. But your neighbors do things a lot differently. If you want the kids, and, hey, if you do, just ask, why don't you just take them? Catching Kara's angry glare, he added. Not that you should. Because I want Kara's goodwill. Arcadia said. The hospitality I am offering is genuine, and I need her to know that, before I can ask something in return. Here it comes, Kara thought. Agreeable demeanor or not, Arcadia was still Sith. The students weren't enough. What, do you want diligence, too? Kara could almost hear Rusher's teeth grinding at the mention. Nothing like that. Arcadia said, gesturing deferentially to the man. I'm sure Brigadier Rusher is talented, but specialists don't really fit into my scheme. Their thinking is too narrow. She smiled primly at Rusher. No offense. No defense. Rusher said, breathing easier. I'd be a goner the second you decided I'd serve you better as an accountant. Rubbing his gloved palms, he added. We are available for hire, though. Kara ignored him. Then what do you want? Why would you possibly want my goodwill? Arcadia didn't answer. Another aide had delivered a datapad that the Sith Lord was scanning with interest. Looking up, she said. I have something to attend to, but I will call for you both. Until then, I hope you'll remain here as my guests. Kara looked back to see several members of Arcadia's Citizen Guard stationed before the magnetic seal. Arcadia might offer hope, but she didn't take chances with her own. Chapter 20 Life was like a cannon, Beld Yulon had always said. You've got to clear the empty casings before you can fire again. As with most things, at least, up until he went Odeonite, Rusher's old mentor had been right. Depression had nearly claimed Rusher, aboard diligence after Ghazari. But in a strange way, the Jedi and her brood had been the distraction he needed to get his bearings again. The escape from Balura had woken him up. He still had a crew that needed his protection and guidance. But that shell had been fired. It was time to move on. Here, in just a few hours in Calamandretta, he'd gotten interested in starting over again. Arcadia's people had done amazing things with fabrication, feats that might make future artillery pieces lighter. Watching the Twi'lek supply master work, while he had still had that job, had also been instructive. Rusher saw three ways he might reorganize Diligence's cargo pods to speed weapon deployment. He didn't expect Arcadia would allow him to recruit here, but his visit would result in a better future for Rusher's brigade. Reaching that future meant clearing the barrel. The refugees had to go. And there, the casing was stuck. Entering Calamandretta, he'd realized why nothing larger than a fighter was allowed to enter the facility, the place was an icehouse for real. The roof panels in the atrium might be transparent steel, but the rafters and frame were solid ice. Not a place to light up engines, or even land near, given the shaking he'd felt when the trundle cars rolled out. Most of the city might be safely ensconced in the great tunnels, but its exit to the outside world had to be protected. Diligence could come no closer, the refugees would have to cross the ice sheet. But bringing 1700 students across in trundle cars would take days. The airtight cabs held only four passengers, with cargo following behind on sleighs. He didn't even want to think about trucking space suits for a thousand aliens of different sizes. A sticky problem, but one that Arcadia's people had been working with him in earnest to solve. 
Now the solution was nearly in hand. Making notations on a data pad, Rusher descended an escalator into a bluish grotto. The locals were big on their algae, he saw, colossal tubes filled with the bubbling stuff rose 30 meters around an interior plaza, serving as both light source and living art for Arcadianites dashing off to work. Blue goo in an ice cave. Well, it beat Damon and his statue, Rusher thought. But the coursing bubbles didn't seem to be calming anyone. Sined never slept. Everybody had something to do, someplace to go. Almost everyone. Hey! Called a voice from below. Rusher looked down. There sat Kara, elbow propped on one of her knees, at the foot of one of the massive foaming cylinders lighting reflection prospect. He had to look twice. That nervous energy was gone. Since meeting Kara, he'd only seen her in action. Even after he'd spirited her away from Balura, she'd stayed on the bridge, fidgeting and quizzing him about their destination. He'd finally retired, just to keep her from straining her injured leg. Jedi healing didn't seem to be a class everyone took. Kara simply slumped, drinking from a container like a beggar outside a cantina. A little early to start, isn't it? he asked. The sun just came up. For the fifth time today. She responded, opening the lid. It's water. Your loss. Rusher looked from side to side. The only other people not heading off somewhere were a couple of Arcadia citizen guard, watching Kara from a respectful distance across the hall. He thought he spied another up on the balcony, above. Kara snapped the lid shut. What's she got you doing? Rusher explained the work he was doing to bring his passengers into the city. They've got a big ice crawler that'll do the trick, but they need my help on a bushing we can marry to one of our cargo ramps, he said. That's the problem when we mounted the space liner atop the cargo pods. All our doors on the ground are for heavy equipment. It's not your only problem. Kara said, tucking the container in her vest pocket. I haven't decided they should go. What, the doors? The refugees. You sure that's water? Because you're not making sense, Rusher said. It's my ship and it's Arcadia's planet. Who are you, again? Kara straightened against the tube and shook her fists in the air. I knew she'd take you in. I'm surprised your drill didn't freeze to the floor. What are you talking about? Ever since you met, you've been orbiting her like a satellite. Rusher chuckled, despite himself. Well, her is a handsome woman, he said. Striking was more like it, but the kid seemed agitated enough. And she's created all this. You don't see anything to admire there. She's a Sith. Yeah, but she also knows stuff. A lot of people out here don't know their own history, much less anyone else's, he said. I like a woman who keeps up on current events, a thousand years ago. Kara stood, and as she did, her Arcadianite shadows across the plaza snapped to attention. She waved her hand, dismissively. They're always watching me. I'm in a box until she needs me, for whatever. Well, whatever she's up to, she doesn't sound like she's going to hurt you, he said, or she'd have done it by now. Terrific. <laughs> Rusher laughed. I don't know what you're expecting but this looks like a pretty good deal. We didn't have any idea how to get you back to the Republic, anyway, and a lot of routes just lead somewhere worse. Kara started walking away, but he went on. Tan seems to like it here. And not only do we get to leave, they're helping us. Kara spun, yelling up into his face. So you're just going to go somewhere else? Serve another Sith Lord? There aren't many other customers, Rusher said. He didn't know many of the neighboring Sith Lords, but Mandragal's practices had spread a long way. Someone would be willing to use an independent operator. You could do something else. Like what? He looked at the commuters, dashing to their assignments. I'm a little old to start tending to riding animals. Something real. Kara said, shoving aside his trench coat collar and grabbing at the medals on his chest. Look at you, Rusher. 
You're wearing insignia that you've just made up. You're not part of anything real. You don't fight for anyone. I'm wasting my life, is that it? Taking her arm, Rusher edged her out of the foot traffic and into the glow of the towering Alga Vial. Look, what exactly did you think would happen? That I'd carry you all across Damon's creation and more to get you someplace I've never been? This sector is my home, he said. This is my job. I'm not some scoundrel with a heart of gold that you can sweet-talk into joining your... Don't say it. Kara tried to force past. This conversation is over. Rusher blocked her path and grabbed her wrists. Look, you've got a lot of opinions, but not a lot of facts. You don't understand anything. Let me go. Hazel eyes blazed with hate. In a minute, once you understand what it is that I do, Rusher said. Yes, I'm a mercenary. Yes, I work for the Sith. But there's no one else to work for. That's not true, you could work for the people. Fine. You tell me how, Rusher said. You want me to be a part of something, but you don't know what. It's all good to set your own course when you're just one person, carrying around a shiny stick. But I'm a cannoneer. Those artillery pieces weigh tons. Some take sixty operators to set up, fire, and withdraw. How am I supposed to feed those people, to fuel that ship, while working for your you don't know what? On the grift? That's how you do it now. Yeah, with the permission of the Sith whose territory I'm in. How many places do you think I could land diligence if I were a renegade? Rusher shot a glance back toward the watchers and lowered his voice. They'd enslave every person in my crew, and they wouldn't care what happened to them. You've got a galaxy of people to worry about. I've got 560. And I'm not going to lose any more, he said. So before you go deciding what other people's responsibility to the galaxy is, maybe you'd better take a closer look. They might have responsibilities already. Kara stared angrily at him. And then he saw her eyes widen, just a millimeter, those black eyebrows beginning to arc. For the first time since meeting her, Rusher saw something new in that small, determined face. Doubt. He released her hands and let out a deep breath, surprised and a little ashamed by the intensity of his outburst. He kept forgetting, Kara Holt was just a kid, not much older than those refugees of hers, and the same age as many of his own recruits. He'd traded fire with her because she'd seemed to be able to handle any barrage. But this was her Ghazari hillside. Kara looked away, sullen. I don't even have my shiny stick. Rusher remembered. The lightsaber was back on diligence, where they'd been ordered to leave it. Well, you broke mine. One of Arcadia's minions stepped around the Alga column to address them. Kara Holt, you have been invited to meet Lord Arcadia in her museum. Museum? Sounds interesting, Rusher said. And you should await our lady outside, Brigadier, once you've finished your work with our engineers. Somberly, Kara began to follow the minion through the crowd. But before she left Rusher's sight, she turned. It's true. She said, looking down at the cerulean shadows on the floor. Arcadia hasn't asked for anything, yet. She's only given. And she looks like the best option we have. She looked up. But she's still Sith. And that means something. Rusher looked at her. I don't know what that means. It means keep your eyes open, Jero. For my kids, and yours. From the balcony of the level above, Both and I's watched as the humans parted. Narsk hadn't been able to keep track of the Jedi the entire time on Synod, Arcadia had given her surprising freedom of movement. It hadn't mattered. Kara had been easy to find, roaming the great ice halls listlessly. She seemed deflated, wholly contained. But while he knew where the Jedi was, Narsk still had no idea what Arcadia was trying to accomplish with her presence. He didn't care, despite a personal interest in seeing her suffer. But observing Kara was part of the instructions he had received in the desert, instructions he would carry out. Thinking back on that short, sunny respite, Narsk shivered. 
Why couldn't Arcadia have picked a planet like that for her citadel? After his work on Ballura, he'd expected Arcadia to bring him into her confidence about her plans. That hadn't happened, but the fact that he was still in Kalamandrena suggested that hope wasn't lost. Another assignment might be in the offing, and he knew what would more than likely prompt it. The bequest was finally happening. He'd received word of the upcoming event just an hour earlier, via his implant. Seven long pulses, transmitted by a system that remained a mystery to him. They meant that today would be a special day. They always were. How could they not be? When power consorted with power, the galaxy shook. Walking back from the chilly balcony railing, Narsk imagined the preparations being made in capitals across the sector. The conversations with advisors, the secret side deals already being considered. The bequest was on. And if his eyes could be trusted, Arcadia had just summoned a Jedi to her presence. What was she up to? Narsk bolted for the escalator. It was time to have a talk with the mercenary. Kara had rarely gotten around to visiting Coruscant's museums. It was always something for another day. She'd hardly imagined that her first museum since Jedi knighthood would be under an ice sheet in a Sith Lord's redoubt. Arcadia's aid had led Kara up several flights of stairs into a rotunda, open to the stars above through a small transparent steel aperture. Cyninian algae cascaded through fixtures around the room's circumference, giving the place a cool glow. A heptagonal pylon half a meter high sat at the room center, focal point of floor tiling leading to the seven equally spaced exits. A lot of empty space, she thought, watching her guide depart. More planetarium than museum. The only exhibits were on the walls, sitting in small elevated alcoves between the doors. She'd expected to see the usual Sith relics, as if there could be anything usual about sinister instruments of mayhem. Instead, many of the items seemed commonplace, although their vintage was clearly ancient. Here, according to the captions, was a translation device used by an aide to Chancellor Felorian during negotiations with the Duinuagwin. A diamond bit used by a nameless slave to mine crystals in the Great Hyperspace War. A whole recorder used to interview the philosopher Laconio, but not the famous recordings themselves. A fusion cutter used by a Sith trooper to board in Dar Spire. All were critical to history, and yet all seemed mundane, as anonymous as the people who used them. Looking up at the organic light fixtures, she realized the common element. These things were all tools. Arcadia shared something else with Damon besides a liking for sevens in interior design, there was no art in her realm. Everything was functional, even the display in the plaza where she'd left Rusher. The pretty tube simply routed Cynedian algae from the pumps to the final destination. Some of Kalamandretta's architecture was remarkable, but as with Damon, it served mainly to fade Arcadia rather than soothe the people. And they needed soothing. They were all so frantic. Kara thought back to the family of Godals she had seen parting in the hallways of the academy. She'd thought there was something missing from the scene at the time, but she didn't realize what it was, until now. Joy. The Arcadianites didn't suffer from the same kind of oppression that Damon's slave laborers did, but they lived under a cloud nonetheless. People didn't have to be threatened with physical danger to be afraid and Arcadia's system kept them fearful. Fearful of loss of status, should they underperform. Fearful of being shifted to occupations they didn't know anything about, should they perform too well. Arcadia kept them in perpetual motion. Perhaps they were happier than Darknell's hopeless residents, certainly, they weren't as bad off as the drones of the Diarchy. But in their own way, the people here suffered. Kara's eyes fixed on a single item, just over a meter long. It was another implement, but different from the rest. A branding tool carved from the bone of some monstrous creature, it had a metal tip worked carefully into hand-polished grooves. Carvings in its curved length depicted the story of the owner's family. It's beautiful, isn't it? Arcadia asked. Kara looked to see the Sith Lord behind her. She was in her war regalia again, just as she'd been when aboard her flagship. It's very nice work, Kara said. Even I can see that. Arcadia said, stepping past her to the display. 
the crafter who made it toiled thirty long years at creating such pieces. They were signs of status, prized by heads of households. She lifted the branding tool from its stand. This was from the end, near the apex of the woman's skills. The end? Trading vessels from one of your Republic corporations arrived on Audrin to launch a trade in prefabricated goods. They were able to replicate existing tools at a hundredth of her price. The artisan, who knew nothing else, threw herself into sea and drowned. Arcadia's hands clenched, snapping the branding tool in half. Beauty is meaningless against the wave. She threw the fragments to the floor. Kara looked at the broken tool, dumbfounded. Such a thing would never have been allowed here. Because the craftswoman would have had other skills to rely upon. The idea of spending a lifetime in a single pursuit was a recipe for stagnation, for obsolescence. But the cost is the masterpiece. Then it is worth paying. Kara knelt and picked up the pieces. There's more cost than that, she said, gently replacing the fragments on their stand your people. You keep them running. But you're going to run them to death. What about the Republic? Your society, even your beloved Senate, is driven by commerce. You create occupations, but you don't guarantee them. You allow competitors and new technologies to disrupt them without so much as a thought to those whose livelihoods are impacted. But we choose to face those challenges, Kara said. Do you? Arcadia walked to the pylon at the center of the room. With me, they know change is coming. But that change has meaning. It serves a cause. It happens to be mine. Kara stared, perplexed. The woman wasn't anything like she'd expected. Misguided as she was, Arcadia was logical. Noting her expression, Arcadia laughed. <laughs> Did you expect all Sith Lords to be murderous, knuckle-dragging villains? You can't run a galaxy that way. Then let the students go. I can't do that. Understand, Kara. If I seem reasonable, it's because I value reason. But I'm still Sith, and I am not going to release lives I control just to gain the trust of a Jedi. She walked behind the pylon and touched a hidden control. But I will offer them refuge, and I have something else that I think will be of even greater value to you. Around them, the living lighting dimmed, and above, the skylight went opaque. The sides of the heptagonal pylon slid down, revealing projectors that cast images of stars and nebulae around the darkened rotunda. Kara looked up, straining to find a point of reference. She couldn't. You came here to strike a blow against the Sith. And perhaps to help some of the people under our sway. But I sense that you also want something else. Something you haven't been able to get from anyone, on any of these worlds. Drowning in a sea of stars under Sith domination, Kara closed her eyes. There was something she wanted. An explanation. An explanation. Arcadia repeated. An explanation for all the wars, all the destruction you've seen. How brothers came to war. The strange ending to events on Ghazari. And how all this chaos rests within a larger order. Arcadia stood before dual projector lights, shadows falling before her. I need something from you, but for you to help me, you have to know something no one outside this space knows. You have to know why. Chapter 21 Kara sat, a student again in stellar cartography just as in the Jedi Academy. Only this was a lesson no Jedi Knight ever had, from a teacher none would suffer to live. And yet she was spellbound. The stars above had meaning now, painted in colors and outlined. There was Shiloh, where she'd arrived. There was the winding path to Darknell. And there was the refugees' flight path, leading through Belura to Sined. Symbols hovered in the air, marking Arcadia's best guesses at who controlled what. The Jedi rubbed her eyes, unbelieving. She wanted to memorize it all as quickly as possible. But there was so much. Far more systems were under Sith control than anyone in the Republic imagined. And from the snaking maze of territories and the jangle of colors and emblems, it was clear there were far more players, too. You know of the Sith Lord Chagra. 
Arcadia said. Kara nodded. Chagra had controlled Darknell before Damon. Chagra and Zelian were brother and sister, two of the seven children of Vilia Calamandra. Kara hadn't heard the latter name. But Zelian, she knew, was Damon and Odian's mother. Chagra was Odian and Damon's uncle? That was something the Sithologists of the Republic had never heard. The researchers she'd studied under weren't clear on who Odian and Damon's father was, just that he had been out of the picture for many years. But neither brother acted or looked much like the popular image of Chagra. His empire had been reasonably orderly. I think you're going to have to start at the beginning, Kara said. The Fountainhead Arcadia said, teeth glinting in the shimmering light. Is Vilia. My grandmother. Over the years, my grandmother acquired several dead husbands, and a sizable empire. Above, large blocks of space blinked into icy blue, one section after another. The Dowager, Kara whispered. Well, I hope you didn't think that was me. Arcadia said, smirking. But Bilia had a problem. Each of her marriages produced offspring. And those seven children, grown, each claimed the right to be her sole heir. Above, seven worlds dripped red. So she proposed a contest. The charge Mount Rika. Whichever child expanded her holdings, the most would have her whole legacy, when the time came. Kara stood up, mesmerized by the display. When, when was this? Thirty-four years ago. Before you, or I, or the so-called creator of the universe was born. So the challenge began. Above, the blue areas swelled, sprawling across sector borders and filling in gaps. Every world, Kara realized, was one of the many that lost its freedom, one of the planet's banner trees had fought to save. It worked. For a while. But Sith, don't play fair. When her bid began failing, Zelian, Odian and Damon's mother, declared war on Chagra. My father. Arcadia clasped her hands together and looked down at them. Kara looked at her, stunned. Chagra's daughter. That broke it. All of Vilia's children went to war against one another. My grandmother seemed strangely unwilling to referee. And our joint cause suffered. In the holographic display around them, the blue mass of space stopped growing and began to fragment, breaking into multicolored zones. For years, Sith conquests in this region stalled due to the infighting. Until only Chagra was left from his generation, and peace came. I know, Kara said. She had been born into that island of relative silence. No one had ever known why the internecine violence had stopped. Her parents were simply glad that it had, so they could stop fleeing. Did your father win Vilia's legacy? Arcadia stiffened. Yes. And no. She began pacing around the flickering pylon. He was sole heir. But Vilia yet lived, and so retained most of her holdings. All my father was guaranteed was the cooperation of his many nieces and nephews in restoring all that had been damaged. Ten years ago, Chagra was ready to face the Republic anew. Aquilaris, Kara said. Chagra sent Odian to conquer Aquilaris. My homeworld. She glared at Arcadia. Arcadia returned her gaze. You lost your family, I take it. Well, we are joined in sadness, for before many more worlds fell, Chagra died suddenly, eight years ago. And eight years ago. A second charge Matrika began, Kara whispered. Among the grandchildren? Among the grandchildren. Arcadia let the words sink in as, above, the star map showing took on a leprous aspect. The Chagra hegemony shattered into five shards. Then ten. Then more. Damon and Odian went to war first. They barely needed the excuse. On Balura, where my father had placed my troubled brother and sister for safekeeping, Kalishan took control and began to build a state around Quillen and Dromica. There are others. I can't even remember them all, sometimes. Kara's head spun. Wait a minute. You're telling me every Sith Lord who's warring out here is related. 
It was just too fantastic and something no one, not even Vanner, had ever heard. You're all cousins? No, not by any stretch. Not even all the human Sith lords trace back to Vilia. But it is a big family. There are also half-breeds, and some outsiders, like Kalishan, who try to figure in. It's all about impressing grandmother. So she'll remember them when she dies? She favors them now, too. Vilia doles out assets from her holdings occasionally as rewards. Flabbergasted, Kara sagged against the wall. Looking at the patchwork of color suspended in the air, it seemed too incredible. Who would believe this? You will. It's time. Pressing a control on the pylon, she watched the starfield disappear. The Sith Lord walked through the darkness toward Kara, stopping in a semicircle on the floor. Stay in the shadows. Watch and say nothing. If you're noticed, I'll have to kill you immediately. And your students. Chilled, Kara looked toward the pylon. In place of the floating star systems, a constellation of images flickered into being. Odeon, as large and hateful as life. Damon, in his gaudiest fineries. And there were others. Men. Women. More teenagers. Robed or in battle dress. Mostly human, but some strange faces. More cyborgs, like Odeon. A figure in a chair. An odd wraith-like entity in a hood. Kara's eyes jumped from one to the next. She didn't know where to look. And every one of them postured, trying to look as menacing, or regal, or wise, or aloof, as possible. Damon seemed completely disinterested, not even deigning to look at the others. Which was hard, given how many there were. Kara had seen seven markings on the floor, locations for standing. She assumed there were similar rooms elsewhere. But there were far more than seven images sharing the circle. It was like the Jedi Council. A council of hate. Greetings, my children. Came a soft voice from the center. Kara looked past Arcadia. There, hovering above the pylon, was the image of a white-haired woman in a gossamer yellow gown. The Dowager. Vilia. Human, and in her seventies, at least, wrinkled, but not worn. Kara watched as the woman caressed a strange alien flower, she appeared to be in a garden, somewhere. Clearly enjoying her retirement, Kara thought. Just letting the star systems roll in. I wish to offer you all my congratulations on the liquidation of Lord Bactra. Us all? Odeon smoldered. Yes, Odeon. The Quormian was an outsider. He was a friend to our family for many years, but he couldn't change what he was. She turned, as if seeing all the dozen-plus Sith Lords in virtual attendance at once. I felt the need for Bactra was past, and he gave us the opportunity to do something about it. Kara clasped her hand tightly over her mouth, muffling her gasp. Of course. Damon and Odeon had truly been fighting on Ghazari until they suddenly stabbed Bactra in the back. She just never imagined they'd done so on command. And least of all at the behest of someone who looked so kindly. Vilia swept her hand gracefully through the air. You have all done very well since we last spoke. And the time has come for the assignment of bequests. A murmur went up from the collected holographic Sith Lords. Half approving, half resentful. Bactra's territories have already fallen to those nearest, Daemon, Odeon, Lyoko, and Malachite. She said, gesturing to a couple of Sith Lords whom Kara hadn't seen before. That is as it should be. But his greatest assets are his corporate holdings, which call no single world home. She reached to the side, out of the projected image, to retrieve a small parchment. I now dispose of these. Industrial heuristics and all affiliated enterprises, I give to Damon. <laughs> a laugh went up from Arcadia's left. Kara could only see Damon's back from where she was kneeling, he was definitely paying attention now. Off to the right, Odeon was stiffening against the muffled laughter of some of his virtual cousins. The bequest doesn't change anything. 
Odeon said, his scarred face filling with rage. I occupy Bactra's capital. If the little snot wants these, these merchants, he can come and get them. The award has been made. Vilia said, turning toward the image of her massive grandson. The planet is yours, my Odeon, but you will give the executive staff time to relocate to a position behind Damon's borders. I'll send the corpses. That is enough. Vilia said. The room instantly quieted. For the first time, Kara saw the eyes in that kindly face clearly, bright and red. Suddenly self-conscious, she scooted farther back against the wall. Far be it from me to preach to you on philosophies, Odeon. You each have your own approach, and I respect that. I applaud that, in fact. But corporations are not to be destroyed lightly. They're a tool of the Republic. Odeon snarled. And the Republic is a tool of the corporations. Arcadia interjected. Vilia smiled, recognizing Kara's hostess for the first time. Very good, Arcadia. I know how you all were taught. You recognize power when you see it. The dowager looked away for a moment. But perhaps something from my own compliment will balance the accounts for you, Odeon. She said, lifting a data pad. Here. Two legions of Trandoshan slave warriors, from my forces. I award them to you. They'll arrive in your territory in three days, just as the industrial heuristics corporate staff leaves your space for daemons. Understood. Odeon bristled. Finally, ever so gently, the glistening head nodded. Kara placed her hand over her mouth to stifle her gasp. The destroyer of the universe, brought down by his grandmother. Listen, Bothan, unless you're looking to enlist, get away from me. Marching down the narrow hall behind Arcadia's guide, Narsk stepped faster to keep up with Russia. Mercenaries were so frustrating. Never willing to be diverted from the course they'd set for themselves, even when others had really set their courses. This is important, Narsk said, boots grinding on the crunchy floor as he tried to keep up. There is a pouch on your ship that belongs to me. So you keep saying. The Jedi stole your stealth suit. I believe she also brought along a walking tank from the Battle of Mizra. I expect it's hiding underneath her bunk. Narsk saddled up and grabbed the warrior's sleeve. I asked her about it back in the atrium when you arrived. She said a little girl had it, he said. Maybe the Celestine you brought over? Maybe. Rusher yanked his arm away. But I can't leave to go fetch anything. Lord Arcadius ordered me to wait here, same as you. You've got a comm link, surely. Rusher charged ahead after the guide. Look, Snark. Narsk. Whatever. I'm not going to annoy a Sith Lord by asking to make side trips. All the refugees will be coming across in the ice crawler later. If your gizmo exists, we'll send it back with Tan then. And then I'm out of here. That may be too late, Narsk said, entering the anteroom outside Arcadia's museum. No one was here, apart from two Wookiee citizen guards posted at either side of the golden portal. He checked the chrono as the guide parted. The bequest was on, right now. And the Jedi was witnessing it. She had to be. The guide who had escorted Kara from the grotto had taken her up the same hallway, a corridor with no other outlets. In a third of a century, no Jedi had been allowed to see a bequest taking place. The only possibility was that Arcadia intended to show off her catch, but the Jedi Knight would have to be executed immediately as all the other Sith Lords watched. That was decorum, or the Sith equivalent. What is Arcadia trying to prove? The Bothan's fur rippled, his ears perking up. Someone was coming up the entry hallway, another of Arcadia's aides pushing Quillen, still in the hover chair from the mercenary's ship. Of course he'd be invited, Narsk realized. The boy had every right to attend the bequest, even in his current state. But the teenager seemed oblivious to everything, his head tipped awkwardly onto his shoulder. Watching the great door open to allow Quillen's chair to pass, Narsk wished again for the stealth suit. All the answers were in that room, with Arcadia. But Quillen wouldn't be paying any attention. 
Where's a hole or a quarter when you need one? Inside the darkened rotunda, Kara looked from face to strange face as Vilia rattled off a list of Bactra's captive corporations, doling them out. Kara gritted her teeth. She couldn't keep track of the names. Guy next to Odeon looked like an evolutionary throwback. No hair care in his realm. Woman on Arcadia's right hid behind a crimson mask barely visible beneath an ornate cowl. And one figure kept fading in and out, as if underwater. Craning her neck to see better, Kara slipped suddenly against the icy wall. Putting force on her injured leg, she fought to keep from making a noise as her bottom hit the ground. Above, the pieces of the branding tool tumbled from their holder. Kara reached out with the force to catch them millimeters above the floor. What was that? Vilia asked. Nothing. Arcadia said, tossing her head back and shooting Kara an evil look. The Ice Queen straightened herself. If the Bactran affair is concluded, there is something more to take up. I have custody of the twins, Quillen and Dramica. Another sound of surprise, louder this time, went up from the circle. From Kara's right, one of Arcadia's minions walked Quillen's hover chair into the room. Arcadia brought the chair and its unresponsive passenger into the holocom's view, beside her. Is he well? Vilia asked, looking with concern. Is she well? They are apart, but I have them both. They are safe. That's good to hear. As the old woman spoke, Kara thought she could see Quillen perking up. There were too many images in the room for him to focus on, Kara couldn't keep track of them all, herself but he seemed to recognize his grandmother's voice. I claim their world and territories as mine. Arcadia said. To her left, Damon's eyebrow went up. And the corporate interests? They didn't have any. Vilia sighed. I see no objection to this. She said, glistening in the darkness of the room. Just rewards, fairly won. She paused. But the twins, themselves. What is to become of them? I think it would be best if they were cared for separately. Dramica remains on Belura, and I think she will thrive there, alone. But Quillen should have more attention. I was thinking. I was thinking that you might provide it. Vilia seemed surprised. After a moment, she smiled broadly. What a wonderful idea. Yes. That makes perfect sense. Have him delivered to me immediately. I will send coordinates of my current home on a secure channel. You have done well, Arcadia. Thank you, Grandmother. Kara looked from one to the other. She could see the resemblance now. Both in their clear, precise manner of speaking and in their appearance. They shared the same searching, intelligent eyes. Vilia turned again, as if admiring the flowers in her garden. And I thank you all. It's so nice to see you again. Following your progress, watching you grow like this, it helps me keep going. Hopefully there'll be an opportunity for another bequest, soon. The old woman nodded to her brood and vanished. And so did they. Kara gawked at Arcadia as the lights came back up. You're all a family, she said. You fight with one another, but she can make you stop. She shook her head, mystified. Why doesn't she make you stop? You can talk to one another like this, and you work together when she asks. Why don't you all work together all the time? This meeting was ten minutes long. The span of actual cooperation against Bactra probably wasn't much longer than that. But Vilia does hold leverage in all the resources from her own conquests and from her various marriages. Vilia sat upon an enormous pile of material wealth, military power, and corporate holdings. Passing them out like presents kept everyone in line, everyone playing the game. The strongest lords had every reason to see it through. No one wants to fail the charge map, Rika. No one wants to fail Grandmother. Arcadia looked down at her brother, who seemed to be totally detached from reality once more. I told you I needed something from you, Kara. Well, this is it. 
I want you to carry Quilland to my grandmother. Kara looked at the siblings, stunned. And when she receives you? Arcadia said, deadly serious. I want you to kill her. Chapter 22 Kill her? Kara couldn't believe her ears. She's your grandmother. Arcadia didn't blanch. Yes. And she's grandmother, biologically or through adoption, to every person you saw just a moment ago. And it is because of them, because of her madness, that these sectors churn with conflict. Kara shook her head. It didn't make sense. But for a couple of flashes, the woman in the holographic image had seemed nice. The Jedi looked at Quillen, sleeping in his chair. Vilia had seemed genuinely concerned about the boy. And the others, too, she seemed interested in advancing all her grandchildren's lives. What grandmother is concerned about is delaying the day a successor will arise. It's the reason she staged the first charge Matt Rika a generation ago. And now, this one. Vilia Calamandra had accumulated so much in her youth that she never could have protected it all, should even a couple of her many offspring rebel. And that seemed a certainty, Arcadia said, for jealousy and hatred ran freely among Vilia's children by her three late husbands. Without the contest, sooner or later, she would have been forced to take sides. And the side she really cares about is her own. If Vilia's children were just expanding her holdings by attacking the outsiders she suggested, like Bactra, I would have no argument. But she's been allowing, no, subtly encouraging us to attack one another. These little arbitration sessions are for show, just so she can throw some scraps of bloodied meat on the floor for us to fight over. Dizzied, Kara looked from one artifact on the wall to another. What Arcadia was saying squared with the history she knew, but it seemed so incredible and one part didn't make sense. There had been a winner to the first contest. Your father. Chagra. And my father died. That time of stability you remember, when Chagra lived as the sole heir. Vilia lived in constant fear of assassination from him. Did he give her any reason to worry? Did he feel as I did, do you mean? I don't know. I only know that he died. Poisoned. The weapon was a potent nerve toxin, so powerful it overcame all his abilities to heal himself through the force. I looked for his murderer for a year, but he had so many enemies. Golden eyes focused back on Kara. A convenient number of enemies. Kara grew animated. You think she had her son killed? Well, she certainly had her son kill. I'm not sure how far a jump it is in your world, but among the Sith. Shaking her head, Kara stepped from the wall and eyed the pylon. She hadn't seen any kind of communication system like it in Sith space. Without the Republic's relays, no one was around to maintain a network allowing so many so far apart to converse. Sensing her interest, Arcadia explained that it was yet another part of the family legacy provided by Vilia as a means of staying in touch with her grandchildren and only she could activate it. It's another way Vilia keeps control. I couldn't call on the others with it if I wanted to. My top technicians have been all over it. They can't figure it out. Your top technicians were probably cooks last week, Kara thought. Why do you want me involved in this, anyway? If you feel like this, why don't you do it? I can't go with Quillen. Grandmother's paranoid. She has dozens of secret retreats. This is the first time I've known where she was, and I guarantee, she won't be there next week. Vilia's bodyguards constantly scanned for familiar presences. I wouldn't be able to get off the ship, uninvited. I have second choices, but they are weak compared to you. And fail or succeed, a Jedi assassin means your hands are clean. Arcadia paused. Something like that. But this isn't just about me. It's about you, and the reasons you're here. You should want to do this. She looked to the skylight, now transparent. Synod's sun was passing above. You said Odeon struck your home. Aquilaris, was it? Kara nodded. A free settlement outside our space, if I recall. In the margins. 
Now, Chagra sent Odeon to conquer Aquilaris. Arcadia said, repeating Kara's words from earlier. That's true. At the time, his nephew still worked on his behalf. But Chagra was following orders, too. She stared Kara down. Dilia ordered the invasion of your homeworld. Kara stood her ground. Arcadia was working on her, to be sure, using logic and words to motivate her just as the twins minions had used the force. She wasn't going to have it. Making this personal isn't going to make me kill your grandmother, Kara said. She'd already forsworn her chance at revenge against Odeon weeks earlier, on Shalo. I think you sell yourself short. Arcadia said, stalking around the pylon like a Vorta beast. I've searched your thoughts, and I've seen your actions. Everything you've done. You're quite the guerrilla operative, for your own cause. She gestured towards sleeping Quillen. Weren't you ready to assassinate Damon, to attack the twins, just to ease the suffering of the common people? Damon's a warlord, Kara said. And killing one old woman won't solve anything. The rest of you, you're still Sith lords. And we'll still squabble. But it won't be a contest. It won't be a race. Kara looked to the napping teenager, then back up to the skylight. She had been looking for some way to make a real impact, something that would help all the people under Sith rule. But there were limits to what one person could do. Or maybe not. Vilia had shown otherwise. And there had been that moment, that flash of ire during the bequest. Kara had seen it. Vilia was Sith, and a Sith was quite capable of the things Arcadia said. But Arcadia was Sith, too, as was everyone at the bequest. What kind of chaos might a sudden change unleash? Kara had worried about a power vacuum in the Daemonate. What if killing Villa set loose something worse? The decision was easy. I'm not going to do it, Kara said. I don't know what would happen. But I'm a Jedi. I don't work for Sith, and I won't help you either. She gestured to the items on the walls. Find another tool. Arcadia shook, anger rising. Almost imperceptibly, the meter-long staff strapped to her back slipped through the air into her right hand. She touched the crystal at its center, and two brilliant shafts of crimson light extended from either end of the rod. You were my best option. She said, raising the double-bladed lightsaber before her unarmed guest. And you've just taken that away. Stepping back toward the door she'd entered through, Kara glanced toward the walls, looking for the tools that could be used as weapons. But as she did, the six other portals opened, revealing citizen guards, carrying hefty blasters. Her options were gone, too. Where's a torture wheel when you need one? Rusher leaned against the ice wall and tried to tune the boffin out. The fur face kept going on about wanting his silly stealth suit. Maybe Damon had just wanted to get a moment's peace. The more aggravating thing was the great door, tantalizingly shut just to his left. Arcadia's museum was in there, he'd been told. Rusher could only imagine what historical treasures might be inside. A Rayal museum? In Sith space? He knew Arcadia had only summoned him here to discuss the refugees. But still, he wished the door would open and that Arcadia would give him even a minute to look around. Suddenly the door did open. Lightsaber gleaming, Arcadia strode out, followed by a small parade of warriors. In the middle of the group marched Kara, barely visible past their armored frames. Her forearms were bound together behind her back in a single black cylinder, Rusher saw. Catching a furtive glance from Kara as the marchers passed, Rusher called after her. Hey, Wait. Arcadia interposed herself, allowing her sentries to pass with their prisoner. I want your passengers here now, Brigadier. Are they fabricating the bushing? Yes, but... Then report to the main atrium. The Sith Lord said. They'll bring the ice crawler in from the south garage bay when it's ready. Board it and bring me your refugees. And then we can leave? Only then. Arcadia said, sternly. 
I still don't need specialists in my organization. She spied the Bothan, lurking behind Rusher. Narsk, we'll be able to do business after all. Are you up for some more field work? Narsk nodded. Always, Lord Arcadia. Arcadia deactivated her dual lightsaber and gestured toward the open doorway. A human aide emerged, pushing Quillen in his hover chair. Taking a data pad from her assistant, Arcadia ran her fingers quickly across the device. Narsk, follow Quillen and Enbo here. I'll be along shortly to fill you in. Turning, she shoved the data pad at Rusher. What's this? Rusher's eyes were still on the guards, disappearing down the long hallway. These coordinates will take you out of my space. Use them. Maybe the Shigrasi remnant can use your services. Arcadia spun to follow her detachment. What, what will happen to Kara? Not looking back as she walked, Arcadia responded. She'll get the same treatment do any Jedi in cis space. Rusher gulped. Seeing the Bothan's attention fixed on the chair-bound teenager, he inhaled and headed down the hallway after the group. Kara was out of sight now, somewhere in that mass of mayhem. The kid had been a problem, but she didn't deserve the punishment of a Sith Lord. Few did. Listen, there's no need for you to go to the trouble, he said, searching for his best sales smile. I can take her off-world with me. Arcadia whirled angrily. And have her charging around demolishing things here, just like she did in the Daemonate? Thank you just the same, Brigadier. Her voice dripped venom. She'll be drained of her intelligence about the Republic and the other Sith Lords she's seen. Then I'll destroy her personally. Rusher's arms slumped. From behind him, the Bothan called out. Lord Arcadia. For me to serve you, I require the return of some property from the warship. Something the Jedi stole. Make it happen, Brigadier, I don't care how. Every bit of this was wrong, and Narsk knew it. He watched as Arcadia and her coterie disappeared down the long hall. The brigadier stood up ahead, gawking. The human didn't appear to know what to make of Arcadia's actions. Well, neither did he. The Jedi had been condemned to die, but she shouldn't still be alive in the first place. Narsk looked down at Quillen, being pushed past him by Arcadia's aide. There was no doubting what had happened in the museum. Kara Holt had seen a bequest, with all members of the great family present. She had to know about the charge Matt Rika. Narsk knew the rules, shrouded in mystery though they were, Kara should have been executed without delay in order to protect the family's greatest secret. That they are family at all. With their state so far-flung, the descendants of Vilia had been largely able to keep their familial connections private. The deactivation of the Republic's subspace communications relays had dried the interstellar ocean of knowledge, leaving many unconnected pools. Few knew the genealogy of their local Sith lords in any detail, save perhaps for the subjects of Odian and Daemon, whose leaders' kinship had been worked into their personal mythologies. To a large degree, the charged, as Narsk thought of them, had prospered from the secrecy. It had made coordinated stabs against outsiders like Bactra possible, it had also protected them against being seen as a common enemy by other Sith Lords. The Jedi's blood should be on the museum floor. And now, his implant was buzzing again. Narsk thought back on his codes. One long burst was call in. Seven short bursts signaled an impending bequest. What did alternating short and long pulses mean? Beware your employer. Narsk staggered, nearly slipping on the icy floor. His superior had directed him to serve Arcadia. Now Arcadia was a threat, as seen, or, more precisely, foreseen, by those with resources far greater than his. Whatever Arcadia had in mind likely meant trouble for his true employer, and now the icy Sith Lord expected him to be a part of it. It was, at once, a thrilling and terrifying place to be. Yes, he'd know her intentions firsthand. But what if he couldn't stop them? Even if he had access to the comm systems in Calamandretta, which he didn't, Arcadia might not give him the chance to get a warning out. What if he became trapped in her scheme, forced to be part of whatever it was with no way of getting out of it? Beware your employer. Are you coming, sir? 
The bald-headed aide looked at him, searchingly. Lead the way. Narsk fixed his eyes on the aide's boots as he walked. He had to have an exit strategy. This isn't right. Looking up, Narsk saw the mercenary leader up ahead, muttering and seemingly looking for anyone to talk to. This isn't right. Russia repeated. Narsk silently agreed. Then you need to do something, Brigadier. What? Rusher asked as the aide went past, pushing the hover chair. I can't risk everyone for one person. He looked to the end of the empty hallway. Even if she risked herself for all of us back on Balura. I don't have the right to put everyone else on the line. He looked down at Narsk and straightened, composing himself. Anyway, it's not my job. Narsk looked at the human. Another specialist, saying things he could have said himself. He chose his words carefully, walking just slowly enough to allow Arcadia's aid to edge out of earshot. I understand that, Brigadier. But I think whatever happened in that museum may have changed things. Your crew could be in danger if you follow Arcadia's orders. Maybe. But they'll definitely be in danger if I don't. Russia shook his head. I need more than that. He swore under his breath. It doesn't matter, anyway. You've seen those tractor beam emitters. We're not making orbit while they're there, and I doubt they'll let us just turn them off. Narsk nodded. The redundant stations were a kilometer apart and unconnected. Striking one, deactivating one, would do nothing. It is a problem, he said. But there might be a way. We're both in the same business. What's that? Demolitions. Walking beside Russia, Narsk quickly discussed ideas he'd had since first seeing diligence from the bridge of New Crucible. At first, the red-headed general listened reservedly. But as Narsk continued, he could see the color draining from the man's face. Are you ill, human? No, but you might be. These are some of the craziest ideas I've ever heard of. What do you know of ships and munitions, anyway? I worked for weeks in Damon's top testing center. Well, you must have spent them in the ventilation shaft. Russia said. He snorted. I won't have a ship left if I do what you ask. Narsk shrugged. You may not have one if you don't. And there's another part, he said, one that can't wait. It'll require someone on your crew, completely beyond Arcadia's suspicion. Russia looked at him for a moment, calculating. Yeah. Yeah, we've got that. You have a comm link? Russia produced one from his pocket and smiled. Modern encryption and everything. Yes, I cracked it on Balura, Narsk said, grabbing it. He worked the controls. Use this channel, and no other. Arcadia shouldn't be able to hear your transmissions to your ship. Seeing the aide approaching a fork in the hallway up ahead, Narsk shoved the comm link in Rusher's hand. I have to go. You need to decide now. Rusher shook his head. There's nothing to decide, Bothan. What you're talking about is crazy. And I can't do all this for no reason. Narsk understood. The mercenary worked just as he did. There was only one way. Fine, Narsk said. I want to hire you. Rusher did a double take and let out a belly laugh. You want to hire us? Is that so novel? Our brigade has only ever taken jobs from Sith Lords. And you would be now, Narsk said, in a sense. And let me tell you about the payment. Gub Tango's apartment had only felt like a coffin. Now Kara was actually in one, or its Sith equivalent. Arcadia wasn't one for wasting space on prisoners. While being marched deep in the icy depths of Kalamandretta, Kara had expected to see something like a traditional detention block. But Arcadia's facility looked more like a data processing center, with tall rows of stacked horizontal metal cabinets rising into the chilly air. On approaching, she'd realized the contents of the cabinets were alive, prisoners, being fed air and nutrients through tubes. Kara could see interrogator droids on floating platforms, mining data from the poor beings trapped in the boxes. It was a filing system for organics. Hefted by the guards into one of the chambers, Kara had wondered who else might be trapped in the pods around her. 
Surely, they couldn't all be people Arcadia had captured from her neighbor's territory. Was it a reconditioning area, too, for dissidents? Or, perhaps, a place to punish those who had failed in too many of their ever-changing jobs? Arcadia had never been clear about what happened to those who never measured up. With the breathing mask strapped over her mouth, Kara had been shut inside the case. But it had been dark inside only for a moment. Within seconds, the tiny confines had been lit from within by blinding strobes, and shrill, high-pitched sounds had replaced the silence. Either light or sound faded at irregular intervals, only to have the other increase in intensity. It was unpredictable, and meant to be that way. There was no meditation, no chance to reach out through the force for anyone or anything. Her only relative peace came in those moments when one of the droids came over the internal speakers, demanding answers about the Republic. Some of the questions she'd expected. What were its most recent frontiers? What is the state of Republic worship technology today? Others had surprised her. What is the biology of the species closest to the frontier? How much has the Republic invested in toxicology studies? She hadn't answered any of their questions, of course, earning more punishment for her ears. At least she could close her eyes, leaving her seeing nothing but the backlit blood vessels in her eyelids and plenty of regrets. She'd been wrong to consider Arcadia's hospitality for a second, just as she'd been wrong to think that Belura could have been any kind of a haven. In both cases, she'd said to herself that she really wanted the students to leave Sith space entirely. But, in truth, she would have accepted a passable alternative in Sith space for Tan and the refugees had one existed. Gub and all of the parents and guardians who placed their children with industrial heuristics and rushers brigade had hoped their children would go to a marginally safer place. She'd fallen into the trap of thinking a slight improvement was acceptable, just so she could get back to thwarting Sith lords. Blowing things up is easy, she had told Rusher earlier. Mercy is hard. She'd been hard on him, she realized, in part to keep pressure on herself, to keep her from settling for less for the students. As Sith-serving mercenaries went, he really wasn't that despicable. He definitely seemed to care about his crew. She envied him in that his job was finite. There were so many who needed help, her personal help, that she could barely conceive the scale of hers. There were 1,700 refugees aboard Diligence relying on her. But that wasn't a 17 millionth of the number who would remain in jeopardy. Was it right for her to focus her efforts on making things perfect for a select few when there was so much more to do? Yes. Kara only needed to recall the image of Luria, the little girl with her missing sister's headband. She, and so many of the others just like her, had suffered too long to merit only half measures. Yes, being the only Jedi Knight in the sector gave Kara other responsibilities. But those didn't absolve her of her duty to those who had put their faith in her. She was beholden. There was no such thing as a safer place in Sith space. One way or another, she had to get them the blazes out of here. The interrogators started in again, droning on about the number of Jedi and where they were stationed. Hearing their questions, Kara realized she was learning more about what Arcadia knew, or didn't know, than they were learning from her. The Jedi's great trump card, their reputation, lingered after their departure, but many beings she'd met in Sith space seemed to know nothing about the Jedi at all. Rusher had admitted that his knowledge came mostly from his history studies. Even some of the Sith Lords she'd encountered seemed to have little idea how to deal with Jedi. Arcadia had thought Kara could be bargained with. Odeon, in the Shalo affair, had thought Kara could be persuaded to see suicide as a rational choice. The twins seemed to have no knowledge whatsoever of what she was. Indeed, of all the Sith Lords and minions she'd encountered, only Narsk had seemed to immediately have a handle on what the Jedi were all about. You Jedi are supposed to be about fair play and decency. Kara opened her eyes. The Bothan was right, of course. But how did he know? Who was he? Chapter 23 Narsk stood patiently in the tiny round hangar. The place lacked one of Arcadia's lofty names, 
Embarkation Station 7 was one of a cluster of domes on the surface of Synod, connected to Patriot Hall and the rest of the city through a long series of underground corridors to the south. But the small structure was, in its own way, Arcadia's Black Fang, and the unique silver craft being prepared inside meant more to her efforts than all Damon's wild starship concoctions meant to him. And Narsk had simply been invited in. Or commanded to attend, rather. For this ship was for him, now. Shining before the renewed darkness outside the magnetic field, the shuttle was little more than a fighter with a longer crew cabin. A droid pilot sat in the cockpit, its torso fused to the frame of the ship. The passenger section appeared slightly more comfortable, wide enough for the new hover chair Arcadia's Tex had constructed to replace the shoddy brown one from Diligence. The floating throne sat, soft and resplendent in regal burgundy, at the edge of the gangway. The boy will be here soon. Narsk looked behind to see Arcadia in the doorway to the dome. No longer in her showy bequest finery, she had surrounded herself in a flowing turquoise shift. Gone were the fur accessories and the great headdress, now her silvery tresses hung before her in long braids. In the hours since leaving the anteroom, she'd gone from anger to complete ease. Amazing, given what she'd just ordered him to do. Your technicians have been showing me the vessel, Narsk said. I can see where Lord Quillen sits. Where will I be? Arcadia walked aft to the three cylindrical engines, each pointing backward. When she twisted a hidden control atop the central rocket, the exhaust port cycled open to reveal a hollow area inside, just large enough for a small human. Or a large bothan. Stepping to the back, Narsk peered inside. There was an oxygen mask and water supply, not a cubic centimeter of space had gone to waste, and yet Narsk could see a passenger riding inside without too much discomfort. Won't they realize the engine isn't lit? Arcadia cycled the cover shut and waved to a technician. Suddenly a furnace blast of flame and noise came from the false exhaust port, singeing Narsk's whiskers. As the din subsided, Narsk patted the ship's frame. Such a difference from what he'd seen in the Black Fang. Arcadia's people knew their design. We've calculated that the jump to the target's world will take seven hours. You'll have oxygen in the compartment for eight. That's not a lot of extra time, Narsk said. If you take extra time, you will already have failed. As I told you, the target is a Sith Lord, elderly, but not to be trifled with. She steadied the spy's face. You've studied the visuals. I'm guessing you have some sense of who Vilia is, Bothan. Narsk tried to appear indifferent. I hear things. Then you know I am entrusting you with a great deal. And you know my reputation, he said. It's why you hired me, to enter the diarchy. Even if the Jedi hadn't happened along, I would have given you the opportunity you needed. The Sith Lord stared. And if you're captured? Ask Damon what I reveal when I'm captured, Narsk said. I never say more than I need to say. Besides, he added, as far as anyone off this planet knows, my last employer was Odeon. Arcadia smiled. That could work for me. Narsk nodded. He hadn't known what had come of the bequest, but it was likely that Odeon now had a grievance against the Dowager. Nothing pleased him. Arcadia crossed the Paxno floor to the front of the shuttle, explaining how the ship would automatically carry Quillen and the hidden Narsk to Vilia's hideaway. She was describing the secret passcodes that would bring the vessel safely through her planetary defenses when Narsk noticed movement out on the tundra, beyond the magnetic field. What? Arcadia said, seeing Narsk's expression. Turning, she saw a space-suited figure ambling aimlessly on the ice. What in the... Seeing the Sith Lord reaching for her weapon, Narsk stepped forward. I think this is the delivery you called for. Stepping to the shimmering aperture, the Bothan waved to the newcomer. Spotting him, the figure waved back excitedly and loped across the wasteland toward their structure. It's the full Duros. Arcadia stared as Beetle Laboon approached in an environment suit clearly fitted for a Wookiee. The transparent helmet, barely secured, wobbled around his green head. His armored left arm hung limply at his side as the trooper stumbled across the slick surface. Looking to Arcadia for approval, Narsk stepped to the controls and allowed the young Duros to enter. 
Beetle lumbered into the dome, boots clapping against the deck plating. The Duros fumbled awkwardly with his free hand for a pouch slung over his right shoulder. Failing miserably, he began chattering an apology, or, at least, that's what Narsk imagined. The helmet had fogged completely over inside. Turn your speaker on or take your helmet off, Duros. With Narsk's help, Beetle unlatched the helmet, which clattered to the frozen floor. Thank you, sir. If you're Narsk, I have something for you. Narsk pulled the pouch over the recruit's shoulder. He unzipped it and peeked inside. After many days and several planets, the Mark VI was his again. Arcadia eyed its courier. Why did you walk here? Rusher could have sent you a cross on the back of one of the trundle cars. He did, ma'am. I fell off. They move for kilometers an hour. Really? The one that hit me felt like it was going faster. I think I broke my arm. Arcadia rolled her eyes. Pride of the mercenaries. She pointed to the exit. Your commander should arrive shortly with the refugees, Duros. Wait for him in Patriot Hall. Seeing Beetle shuffling in the doorway, she growled. The big room with the door leading outside. Beetle smiled meekly. Is your infirmary open? I'd like to have something for the pain, if I could. Arcadia nodded, gesturing for an aide to lead the recruit. Narsk watched the door close behind them. Hopeless, he said, shaking his head. Well, he'll be gone, soon. He paused. You're really going to let the mercenaries leave? They can leave. They just won't live. Those hyperspace coordinates I gave the brigadier will drop them into the Nacrical Singularity. Why not simply seize his ship? Why bother? He said they were down to just a couple of artillery pieces. And if I want a cannon carrier, my people can build a much better ship than that from scrap. She looked down at the pouch. Is that the great Narsk, Kahin Edge? Narsk pulled out the stealth suit and displayed it, trying to hide his dismay. The Jedi had put it through a lot of punishment. It indeed looked as if a child had been playing with it. He'd be lucky to buff out the smudges before he needed it. At least Arcadia seemed impressed with it as it was. She ran her hand inside the seam, marveling. How did you come by such a device? If I revealed all my sources and methods, you wouldn't have much of a need for me, would you? Narsk said. But it will get me close to this Vilia easily enough. She's still Sith. She'll sense you coming. One doesn't challenge Sith Lords as I do without learning how not to be sensed. Watching Narsk meticulously return the suit to its container, Arcadia turned back to the shuttle, where the workers were removing the hover chair after its fitting. His mission would be a simple one. When the vessel arrived on Vilia's world, Narsk would slip out unseen, shadowing Quillen. Once he confirmed that Quillen was in Vilia's presence, he would kill the old Sith Lord. Narsk looked around uneasily. You have a weapon for me? It's right here. Arcadia said, walking to the hover chair. Tipping it on its side, she opened a hidden panel to reveal five orbs of bluish gas. The pods were attached to a detonation device. A bomb? Arcadia chuckled. <sighs> Not up on everything, are you, agent? She gestured to the alga light fixtures, above. I meant it when I said we use all of the Cynidian alga. One of the organism's little-known byproducts happens to be an incredibly potent nerve gas. She jabbed her thumb at Narsk's pouch. I'd wear the oxygen mask underneath that thing, if I were you. Narsk's eyes widened. Your brother will be in the chair. Arcadia looked at the chair coldly. There are losses in war. Facing Narsk, she folded her arms. Had the Jedi gone in your stead, I might only have needed this as a backup. But whatever your talents, you are no Jedi. Thus, you are the backup. She passed him a small remote control. This triggers the gas. Narsk looked at the device and nodded. So Arcadia had tried to recruit the Jedi and failed. Arcadia was clearly her cousin Damon's equal when it came to scheming. When the trap activates and you've confirmed that she is dead, you will find the location of your payment inside the chair. 
Producing a small tablet from within the folds of her garment, Arcadia showed it to Narsk before tucking it above the central gas canister. Narsk smiled weakly and turned toward the exit. He would be expected to leave within the hour. Crossing the threshold, Narsk froze when Arcadia called after him. Bothan. If the suit allows you to do anything, why didn't you assassinate Damon? And why didn't the Jedi, when she had it? It sounds as though you would have had the opportunity. I can't speak for the Jedi, Narsk said, turning in the doorway. I'm not sure anyone can. She's clearly insane. And I won't speak of my orders from Odeon, except to say that, had I been ordered to kill Damon, Odeon would be an only child today. Seeing Arcadia studying him, he continued. I do owe Damon a debt for his treatment of me. But as much as I might like to punish him for that, I don't do things for the sport of it. That much was true, he thought, backing up. I'm sorry, but I need to visit your infirmary before the flight. Your algae don't agree with the Bothan system. Follow the useless Duros. Arcadia said, turning back to steady the vessel. I'll do just that. Whoever claimed ice was smooth had never been to Sined. The ice crawler's treads amplified every bump, sending vibrations through the cabin and along a path that terminated in Rusher's molars. The rumbling rhombus was enormous, easily half the size of diligence. Rusher looked back down into the cavernous cargo compartment. Arcadia staff had suspended several levels of seating on metal scaffolds toward the rear of the vehicle, more than enough room to accommodate all the refugees. The Sith Lord was going to get this done in one trip. We're here, mercenary. The shiny-eyed driver said. Rusher had seen the hairy-headed Nazar before. Weren't you driving the rumble car that brought us over, he asked. Promotion. Rusher looked through the viewport. The ice crawler loomed above Diligence's starboard arm, edging closer to its giant clawed base. His team had removed the jutting cannon barrels on one side to permit the crawler's approach. Turning back, Rusher leaned across the back railing to the driver's compartment and called down to the citizen guards, waiting by the enormous door some forty meters below. We're extending the bushing. We need you guys in the hole, ready as the door opens, in case there's any breach. Obediently, the space-suited figures set down their weapons and disappeared into the short tunnel. Seeing them appear on the cockpit's video display, Rusher lifted his comlink. We're here, Dackett. You know the drill. A different kind of rumbling rocked the ice crawler's frame as the corrugated door began to open. Seeing the long-faced driver release the controls, Rusher spoke again. Hey, I think they're going to need help down there. Not my job. And if you did your part, they shouldn't be having any trouble. The flinty-voiced driver looked idly up to the security monitor. Seeing commotion on the screen, he began to rise. Only to have his head snap backward. A clump of the Nazar's mane in each glove, Rusher yanked the driver's head back before slamming it forward against the console. An agonized groan came from the stunned creature's throat as the brigadier pulled him from his seat and shoved him over the railing, into the yawning cargo area behind the cockpit. Turning quickly back to the security monitor, Rusher deactivated the feed just before the unlucky driver's body hit the grating. Sorry, pal, he said, hearing blaster fire below. Not every promotion's a step up. Rusher looked down into the cargo area. The Nazar's body was only one of several now. Zeller and the armored troopers of Team Ripper were in the tunnel, blasting away. The Ice Crawler's Arcadianite crew was dead before the pressure equalized between the two vessels. Spying her superior officer above, Zeller yelled. Master Dackett sends his regards! And begging the Brigadier's pardon, he says you're crazy! He's not the only one. Already sliding down the ladder from the upper level, Rusher called out, Did our runner make his delivery? Yes, sir! Get the cutters in here to bring down this decking. Rusher scanned the cargo compartment. They'd need all the room they could get. We're going to have to do this in record time. Kara could feel her energy failing. The lights and sounds continued to hammer at her, but even without them, she felt like she'd reached the end. 
For weeks, she'd been fueled alternately by compassion and outrage. But now she was the lone quadractal, just like the one she'd seen as a child, struggling to stay afloat in the icy waves. She could barely move in the tight compartment, her awkward position was cutting off the circulation in her arms and legs, and she felt her muscles were going soft. If she didn't get out soon, she'd be no risk for escape at all. She should have struggled more against the jailers, she thought. Anything would be better than this. The screeching died down again, in advance of more questioning from the droid. Kara winced. It was all too much. How many days, how many weeks, would they keep her here? Was this the execution Arcadia mentioned? Just kill me already. But this time, the voice was different. An organic whisper. Hold fast. Kara opened her eyes into the blinding light. The Bothan. Long minutes passed, during which Kara wondered if it was all a joke, one more method of torturing her. The Bothan worked for Arcadia, after all. But finally, she felt movement, as the entire chamber around her slid outward. Cool air rushed in. Pawing at the oxygen mask, the Jedi forced herself to sit up. Lightheaded, she struggled to make sense of the whirling world outside. It was dimmer, and the space directly outside her metal vault was churning. Kara lanced out with her hand, grabbing at anything. She caught something. Hello, Narsk. The Bothan deactivated the Mark VI and removed his mask. Sorry. It took a while to figure out which drawer you were in. And I had some company to deal with. Floating beside Kara's prison on a hover lift, Nars pointed to the remains of the interrogator droids, smashed on the floor meters below. Evidently, droids can't see you coming in this suit, either. Not unless you've been on Gazari, Kara moaned, rolling out of the box and onto the Bothan's platform. She coughed. If you're here for revenge, I was already locked in a bin all day. Happy to hear it. Narsk quickly shut the door to her cabinet and lowered the hover lift. It makes letting you go now a little easier. Slumped against the railing, Kara glared suspiciously. Why do you want to help me? I don't. Narsk said, pulling the pouch from his back. Let's just say I represent someone who wouldn't appreciate Arcadia's plan. And to complete my mission, I'm going to need a diversion more than the mercenary alone can provide. The mercenary? Kara wavered. Rusher? The hoverlift touching down, Narsk unzipped the pouch and fished for an object inside. Successful, he handed it to Kara. Wait. This is my lightsaber. Observant. But this was on Rusher's ship, Kara said, staring at the weapon. She looked up. You've been there? No but it arrived with the person who returned my property. Narsk removed a writing instrument from the pouch before slinging it over his shoulder. I was lucky to get it to you at all. He hid the lightsaber in the arm of his spacesuit, but it got stuck between his elbow and the joint ring. He couldn't move his arm the whole time he was walking here. Kara gawked. Beetle? He sent Beetle? I told Rusher to send someone Arcadia would never think to frisk. I think it actually improved the trooper's balance. The spy opened the side gate to the hover lift. We've got to move. Scrambling after him, Kara found staying upright difficult. Fortunately, Narsk didn't want to go far, directing her to a sheltered alcove between stacks of prisoner cabinets. Arcadia was busy preparing for something big, he said, something that required her full attention. The assassination, Kara offered. The assassination is the first chapter. I've only had a short time to scout the city in the Mark VI, but I've already seen half a dozen war parties preparing to head to Arcadia's various borders, poised to act. Should her plot succeed, chaos will follow, all across this sector and more. Knowing it's coming, she likes her chances. And Arcadia had something else, the organophosphate distilled from the Cynedian algae. Chagras's blood, as it was called, evaporated instantly, killing at a rate that made the Salegian's atmospheres seem healthy by comparison. Narsk waved to the towers of cabinets on either side of them. From what I can see, this place isn't so much a prison as another testing center. 
When they're done asking questions, they see what their gas does to various species. And now, he said, that nerve toxin was being loaded into shells for delivery to Arcadia's warships moored across the tundra. No wonder she didn't need Rusher's brand of artillery, Kara thought. But Rusher's helping you? Helping us. You and your refugees. Why would he care what happens to the kids? To me? I don't know that he does. But he knows you have this. Grabbing her wrist, he pushed her sleeve back and scrawled several numbers on her arm with his static pen. These, these are hyperspace coordinates, Kara said. But it's only half of a location. Narsk slid her sleeve back down. He has the other half, half payment for what I've asked him to do. If your gunner general wants them, you two are going to have to reconnect. He has to give me my diversion, one way or another. Kara shook her head. He can find a way out of Arcadia's space, she said. He'd never come here for this. Possibly not. But these lead to a jumping-off point in uncontrolled space, the beginning of another lane. Leading to the Republic. Tossing the pen to the floor, Narsk started to turn away. Kara, dazzled by his revelations, grabbed at his arm. A route to the Republic? Rusher had never come across anything like that in all his travels. How did you get such a thing? Who are you? Narsk glared at her. I told you when we met. I'm not Sith. I just work for them. Evidently several at once. No. Not really. Just one. Stepping to a security monitor, he tuned to a scene of the tundra outside. The ice crawler was on its way back, right on schedule. We have ten minutes, at most. Head for the Patriot Hall, and I'd find a spacesuit. Anxiously, Kara looked back and forth at the metal prisons lining the aisle. I've got to free these people. You're wasting valuable time. Most are already dead. Even though the toxin went inert after a few minutes, Kara would have to open a lot of cabinets to find anyone alive, and anyone she found would be in worse shape than she was. Reminded of the toxin, Kara thought of the factories she'd toured, producing shell casings. The so-called Chagras' blood could recommence harm on the innocents neighboring Arcadia's realm. But there were so many factories, and so little time. Desperate, she dashed to the security monitor, looking for a map. You can't do everything, Jedi. Narsk said, watching her search. There's no time. People are counting on me. Which people? Look, I don't care what you do now. Free the prisoners. Charge the factories. Blow yourself up. It's the diversion I want in either way. He stepped from the alcove. But decide whether you want to die helping everybody or live helping somebody. Footsteps echoed in the halls, far away. Kara looked back at the stacks of cabinets in anguish. You landed here with a mission, Jedi. You want to do more? Do it on your own time. The Bothan pulled the mask over his snout and spoke, his voice muffled. If you want to survive out here, you focus on the job. Kara turned her attention from the monitor to the lightsaber, back in her hand at last. Focus. It was one thing she knew how to do. One of several, she thought, gripping it. Rounding the corner, Kara realized something with a start. Narsk had had the same employer all along, and there was only one person it could be. She called out. Narsk! If you're protecting Vilia, why are you letting a Jedi who knows about her live? The shrouded figure at the end of the aisle looked back at her for a moment. Because I wasn't ordered to kill you. Pressing a control, he disappeared. Chapter 24 Good luck to you, sir. Passing citizen guards as he strolled to the embarkation station turbolift, Narsk nodded casually and waved, feeling like an explorer leaving on a mission of discovery. That's what it was, for all they knew. With the mask removed, the Cirrusept system resembled the jumpsuits he'd seen Arcadia's test pilots wearing. They knew he wasn't one of them, but he was a specialist working for their cause. If they'd known how fast he'd just been running, they wouldn't have been smiling. 
Nars gasped for breath as the lift doors closed. It had taken too long to find the Jedi. He just trusted to the Mark VI and hoped for the best, bolting headlong across Calamandretta. He hadn't stayed long enough to learn anyone's reactions, but surely a phantasm had been seen that day. At least no one had raised an alarm. He didn't need that. Not yet, at least. The lift doors opened to reveal the hangar dome at the end of a long hallway. Nars could hear the shuttle's pre-flight preparations underway. Time was short. He stepped quickly, wondering if he had done the right thing. Freeing the Jedi had been a calculated risk. He'd only been ordered to watch her, and releasing her went a great deal beyond watching. But even before he'd heard Arcadia's plans for Vilia, he'd known he would need a diversion. He couldn't count on the cannoneer alone. Mercenaries could be bought off. Jedi couldn't. If Nars dealt in backup plans, the Sith Lord did so doubly. The Bothan remembered what he'd seen earlier, when Arcadia had slipped the data chip beneath the gas canister assembly in the hover chair. There was a second device, in addition to the receiver for his remote detonator, a timer. He'd seen enough in his work to recognize it immediately. Arcadia had planted a failsafe. If Nars didn't trigger the poison gas trap in Vilia's presence, it would go off anyway, at some period following the shuttle's touchdown at his destination. How long would he have? He didn't know. But it ruled out simply stealing away with Quillen and never triggering the bomb. Quillen. Where was he? Nars scanned the hangar floor for the hover chair. The boy was supposed to have been brought here by now for transport. If he wasn't, the whole scheme could unravel in a... What kept you? Narsk turned to see Arcadia, just inside the doorway, wearing her battle armor again. Her hair bound in a metal cap, the woman stood beside Quillen, the young man still huddled in the brown hover chair. To their right, Narsk saw the swanky new chair, innocent and ominous as he'd remembered. I had to run the suit through some diagnostics, Narsk said, bowing to Arcadia. The Jedi had not been taking care of it. Hmm. Arcadia looked Narsk up and down before returning her attention to her brother. Carefully, she used the force to levitate Quillen's body from the dingy, battle-scarred chair. The boy sagged in the air before gently coming to rest on the new, velvety model. I'm just saying goodbye. Arcadia said, shooting another annoyed glance at Narsk before returning to her private moment. She knelt beside Quillen, stroking his soft hand. I'm sorry, my brother. You never had a chance in life. Bowing her head, she spoke in low tones. But in death, you may avenge our father. Narsk steadied Quillen. There was no hint of comprehension in those eyes at all. Without Dramica at hand, he was truly nothing positive or negative, but he was still a living thing. Tragic, he thought. Her steely gaze returning, Arcadia pointed to the tail section of the shuttle, its secret compartment in the rear open to view. A technician zipped across the room, depositing a small stepladder for the Bothan's use. Arcadia looked down at Narsk. Well? Narsk stammered. I, I thought you might have more pressing business, right now. He tugged at his collar. It's all in hand. This is an important day. I'm not going to miss this moment. Very well, Narsk said, looking fearfully at the vessel. Walking toward it, he looked past the magnetic field up ahead to the surface of Sinead and long afternoon shadows again. Nothing was happening out there, or in all Calamandretta, so far as he could tell. There was nothing else to do. He ground his teeth and stepped on the ladder. Mercenaries. Looking inside the cramped compartment, he wondered whether anyone else had any respect for a job anymore. I paid for a diversion. Where's my diversion? This is Calamandretta Control. Protective field is open, Crawler 1. Welcome home. The magnetic barrier across the great doorway shimmered and vanished permitting the ice crawler access to the thatched atrium. The massive vehicle lumbered forward, its lofty nose just clearing the top of the entrance to Patriot Hall. Thanks, Cali Control. Its driver said over the communication system. It's been a fun ride. Won't be long now. No, it won't, Rusher thought, shutting off the transceiver. 
It was good that Arcadia had brought him into the process when it came to transferring the refugees, it had given him access to the command deck, and nobody in the ice city seemed to have thought it odd that he'd been the one speaking to them. Maybe it was the news of the Bothan's payment. When Narsk had offered a series of jump coordinates leading safely to the core worlds, Rusher had laughed out loud. But then the spy claimed the proof of his knowledge was aboard Diligence, of all places, in the alleged stealth suit. Soon Rusher had Dacket on the comlink describing the amazing piece of technology in Tan's possession, a product, according to the microtag inside, manufactured on Coruscant, four months earlier. Perhaps seeing Tan demonstrate the suit had made everyone sign on, a trip to the Republic would be the shore leave of a lifetime for some, and a chance for escape for others. A chance for a real refit, beyond their endless jerry-rigging. Or maybe it was because he was finally doing what Dacket had said, back in the solarium days earlier. You can't let him just see you going through the motions. You've got to do something. Pull the trigger. Rusher could see their greeters gathering on the depot floor, far below the ice crawler's overhanging cockpit. Arcadia's citizen guards were out in force, ready to receive the vehicle and its passengers. Judging from the weapon some of them carried, it didn't appear that they expected all the students to come willingly. Well, good for you, Rusher thought. Makes me feel better about what we're about to do. Clambering onto the ladder, he yelled down to his companions. Get set, brigade. We're about to make some history. The Hauk citizen guard at the intersection of the frozen passageways waved his blaster at the workers clamoring for his attention. I don't care how many of you saw this, this phantom. He yelled, brown jowls shaking. Don't you have jobs? I know I do. Kara slipped from one doorway to the next, thankful for the distraction. The interrogation facility hadn't been guarded like a prison, but evidently Narsk's departure from it had attracted attention all along his route. Personal stealth technology wasn't much help when forcing your way through a crowd of commuters. Still, Kara found herself wishing she had the hated suit now. Her muscles stinging, her head still ringing, she forced herself forward. The fact that Arcadia's workers didn't wear identical uniforms had given her a chance to move anonymously through the halls, but slowly. Too slowly. Ten minutes, the spy had said. She didn't even know why she was supposed to go to Patriot Hall, or what he meant by a diversion. How in blazes was she supposed to know when ten minutes were? Lockdown! Lockdown! A pair of beefy blue-sashed sentries dashed past her alcove. Hold everyone! There's been an incident at the impound. So that's what they called the place. I guess we're doing this, Kara said, stepping into the ice tunnel and igniting her lightsaber. <laughs> hey, guys, she yelled to the guards up ahead. I'm your incident. In the hangar, Arcadia raised her hand, preparing to close the compartment door behind Narsk. You have my encrypted channel programmed into your data pad. Contact me when you've succeeded. Before she completed the motion, <coughs> sirens reverberated through the dome. Narsk could hear them resonating all the way up the long hallway from the lift. Arcadia looked angrily to a speaker on the wall. What's going on? The Jedi has escaped the impound. A tinny voice responded. Narsk wriggled from his confines. The impound? Is that a prison? It's more of a morgue. Or it should have been, for her. She couldn't get out alone. Somebody let her out. Reflexively, Narsk drew his arms back inside the false engine. His eyes darted to Quillen and his hover chair, being walked toward the ramp for loading into the passenger compartment. I think you should attend to this problem, Lord Arcadia, Narsk said. I thank you for seeing us off, but matters are well in hand. Yes. That's because it's my plan. Storming toward the exit, Arcadia called one of her Wookiee citizen guards from his station by the wall. You there. She pointed to the tail section of the shuttle. Make sure the Bothan shuts that chamber tightly. We don't want him asphyxiating in space. Narsk's heart fell as the sash-wearing tower of hair took station behind the engines. 
Behind the glaring Wookiee, Arcadia was already gone. Narsk smiled weakly at the guard. Nice day for a flight, isn't it? The chubby depot manager pounded on the gate of the ice crawler. We don't have all day. When are you going to open up in there? Definitely not yet, Rusher thought, watching through the small viewport. Far behind the pasty-faced manager, he saw Arcadia and several of her minions crossing the atrium floor from north to south in a big hurry. Watching them vanish down one of the side ramps into the glacier, Rusher turned back to his team, waiting in place behind him inside the vehicle. Would have been nice to have seen that museum, he said, his hand raised. Drop the gate. Outside, the manager stumbled backward, nearly crushed by the falling drop gate. Shaking his fist, he bellowed. What do you think you're? The manager's jaw dropped. Instead of seeing the expected refugees inside the massive cargo hauler, he was staring down the long barrel of an ancient laser cannon, crewed by a team of determined-looking spacesuited cannoneers. We'd like to have you meet Bitsy, Rusher said, standing nonchalantly to the left. Looking at the wide-eyed citizen guards ahead of him, he lowered his hand. Rough day to be you, friends. Fire. The ground beneath Embarkation Station 7 shook, causing flecks of ice to flutter from the hemispheric ceiling. Lodged inside the shuttle hidey hole, Narsk looked wanly at the Wookiee guard. Don't you think you should go do something? The Wookiee snarled. Kicking away the stepladder, she grabbed Narsk's snout and shoved him painfully backward into the compartment. Narsk sputtered, coughing on his own whiskers. That's not what I meant, you idiot. Terrified workers stampeded through the carved ice halls leading to Reflection Prospect. Kara's initial assault had caught the sentries who had raised the alarm by surprise. But the hulking Hauptguard had thought nothing of the safety of his fellow citizens, firing his blaster as he charged through the crowd. The Hauk had actually shot both the hapless citizen guards in the back before Kara could strike them. Flipping her lightsaber to her left hand, she pulled one of the fallen sentry's weapons into her right hand with the force and returned fire. Kneeling, she targeted the sheer crystalline wall to the Hauk's right, knocking him from his feet with the ricochet. Several more combatants entered from side hallways, responding to the screeching siren. Holstering the blaster in her belt, Kara charged ahead, raking from side to side with her lightsaber. There wasn't any release in lashing out this time. Not like on Belura, with its crazed mesmerists. The citizen guards of Synod weren't Sith hopefuls, but instead people devoted to, or stuck within, Arcadia's military-industrial system. As another guard fell before her, Kara was glad she hadn't seen Seas in one of the blue sashes. It was always harder killing someone you knew. Seeing an opening in the opposition line, Kara leapt toward it. There, ahead, was the giant grotto with its balcony and escalator, surrounded by giant burbling pipes of cyanidian algae. But no one was reflecting in the cave plaza now. A dozen guards had taken station near the other exits, and several snipers were on the overlook, the balcony leading back to Patriot Hall. Alarmed at the numbers, Kara drew her blaster and took aim at the tube where she and Rusher had quarreled so many hours earlier. Let's see what you think of this, she yelled, firing. Nothing happened. Kara rolled, avoiding return fire. She'd hoped to inundate the grotto with the blue slop, only the byproduct was toxic, Narsk had said. But the towering cylinders were made of something tougher than transparent steel. Tossing aside the blaster, she went back into action with her lightsaber, deflecting fire as she tried to advance. But with the snipers firing from up above, Kara could only retreat to the doorway she'd entered through. What I'd give for a concussion grenade, she thought. The plaza was the only route she knew to Patriot Hall. Suddenly there was a break in the firing from the balcony. Kara thought she heard thunder now, reverberating faintly above the klaxons. Atop the upper floor, the snipers parted to allow a new arrival to approach. Lord Arcadia looked down from the ledge. The errant Jedi she said, seemingly undistracted by the noises far behind. You're surrounded. 
It's time to die. He'd thrown everything in. Rusher had Bitsy on the atrium floor now, tearing a new hole in the glaciated wall. After its first deadly shot, it had taken ten bearers and twenty seconds to get it out of the ice crawler and into action. Now Team Zaboka fanned out to the left and right, slamming their missile launchers to the surface and firing anchor bolts into the floor. Behind, Zeller and her Team Ripper crewmates were rolling out the brigade's last good Kelligdeed 5000, its crushing bulk crashing noisily over the drop gate. Deploying fast was easy when you didn't expect to get your weapons back. Rusher opened up again with Bitsy. No need for spotters in this battle. Every shot hit something. Arcadia's welcoming committee was long gone. And every shot sent seismic waves through Patriot Hall. Through all of Calamandretta, it seemed. On to stage two. Zaboka's high. Rusher yelled into his helmet comlink to troopers not ten meters from him. Quick fire, quick fire. With synchronized precision, six mortar launchers tilted and chuffed, firing at the transparisteel covering atop the atrium. The shell sonic splitters activated on contact, pulverizing the screen protecting Patriot Hall from Cyned's frigid temperatures. Instantly, the atrium's atmosphere ballooned outward, buffeting the metallic powder that had been the transparent roof and shearing it harmlessly outside. At once, automatic Durasteel doors shuttered the pathways into the city, protecting it from loss of heat and air. Dozens of Arcadia's hapless soldiers, exposed now to both laser fire and Cynedian ice, pounded on the barriers, clamoring to enter. Help them crack those doors, Rusher ordered, not so helpfully. Bitsy spoke again, slamming the western barrier with such force that it snapped right off its Durasteel gudgeon. The cavern ahead was open now, a gaping, smoke-filled maw leading into the underground city. Slapping the back of one of his troopers, the brigadier gestured for the team to pivot the weapon to the north. Kara had been taken south, earlier, and much farther west led to the Promissorium and Arcadia's own younglings. He'd never before led an assault on a fortress from inside the fortress. This would take finesse, as much as could be managed with heavy artillery. Still, they'd already seen some success. He looked up at the cloud of destruction that had been the ceiling and marveled. Clean shots, all. The massive ice timbers still mostly stood, holding nothing but framing a view of the new night, outside. Outside. Stage 3. He tapped his helmet again. Diligence, this is Rusher. Dacket, get moving. The Wookiee flinched. The ice sheet rumbled gently, causing loose items in the hangar to quiver. But Arcadia's appointed guardian simply growled, staring down the bothan stuffed into the tail of the shuttle. Oh, blast it. Fumbling in the cramped space, Narsk yanked the mask back down over his head and activated the Mark VI, vanishing. The female Wookiee stepped closer to the chamber, tilting her head left and right as she stared at the seeming nothingness. Until she came too close. Sorry, lady. Narsk's gloved hands shot out, grabbing a handful of hair on each side of the Wookiee's face. Yanking, he slammed the guard's forehead hard into the metal frame. Narsk shot forward, tumbling over the back of his dazed victim. Hitting the floor, he stumbled behind one of the landing gear, out of sight of the technicians. More thunder came from the south. Fearful of the visible effects of the snow falling from the shaking ceiling, Nars curled up underneath the fuselage and strained to find Quillen. The boy sat placidly at the bottom of the ramp, surrounded by three technicians who were considerably less calm. Join the club, Nars thought. She's not paying me enough for this. Kara pulled her lightsaber from one body only to embed it in another. Arcadia was letting her guards have their chance at her. Reflection Prospect had gone in a couple of minutes from a place of peace to a killing zone. She struggled to find somewhere to stand. New attackers replaced everyone that fell. And deflecting blaster shots into them wasn't effective, she'd discovered. 
The fancy sash wasn't the only thing Arcadia issued her citizen guards, the electromesh tunics under their clothes took the punch out of blaster fire. The Jedi leapt, winging another attacker. The accursed tunics were no match for her lightsaber, but they made it more difficult for her to withdraw it. She couldn't do this with body shots. This was messy enough work already. The floor shook. There was no mistaking it now, there were explosions coming from the north, in the direction of Patriot Hall. Shooting a look up to the upper floor, Karas saw that Arcadia was noticing it, too. That's enough. The Sith Lord said, directing her snipers back to the ledge. No blasters. Thermal detonators. A citizen guard looked up at her. But our people are down with her. And doing their job. Now do yours. From his perch on the track of the parked ice crawler, Rusher could see Diligence climbing into the thin Cynedian air toward Patriot Hall. Red lights glimmered on the great conical tower to the north, one of the two tractor beam emitters he'd seen on landing. That's it, Rusher whispered. Make them think you're coming for us. The warship had covered half the length of the ice sheet outside when the lights on the north tower suddenly went green. Diligence seemed to struggle against an unseen force, urging the transport and its attached cargo pod clusters toward the parking area, already littered with ships. The ship wobbled, straining to rise higher over the tractor beam emitter. Rusher tapped his space helmet to activate the comm link. That's it. Cut it loose. Diligence dipped and yawed, and suddenly the entire starboard cargo assembly separated from the ship, plummeting like a colossal bomb toward the emitter and Arcadia's parked fleet. Chapter 25 Sinead shook. Nars grabbed the landing gear and held on. He looked out through the magnetic field to the inferno beyond. The mercenary had signed on all right. With a vengeance. The northern tractor beam emitter was a memory. And even as the deadly blossom of exploding ordnance rose and expanded, it fell in on itself, creating another caldera in the ice where the landing field had been. As the surface ice beneath it distributed the kinetic energy, Embarkation Station 7 rode up and down as if on an uncoiling spring. Above, massive chunks of ice fell from the ceiling, narrowly missing the stumbling Wookiee. Around the quaking shuttle, technicians staggered toward the walls, away from Quillen in his deadly burgundy chair. Narsk leapt from behind the landing gear and lunged for the teenager. Half visible in the shower of ice, the Bothan forced his arm underneath the heedless boy's shoulder and heaved. Hang on, kid. This is for your own good. Farther south, through the tunnels, the explosion rocked Reflection Prospect, knocking Arcadia and her snipers to the ground. From beneath the balcony, Kara saw it, reverberating through Kalamandretta's glacial skeleton, the shockwave ripped the icy pillars suspending the second floor to pieces. She dived for the only shelter she could see, the threshold of the hallway she'd entered through, littered with bodies. At once, up ahead of her, the entire second floor of the grotto heaved and gave way, shaken by subsidiary blasts as it went down. Kara shielded her face against the rush of chilly debris. Those were the thermal detonators, she thought. But no thermal detonator could shake an entire city. Boy, that was pretty, Rusher said gleefully. I don't know! Dackett responded over the comm link. Noval is gonna take my other arm for this! Rusher had told the Bothan right, it had been an insane idea. All Diligence's armaments were deployed on the floor of Patriot Hall around him, not nearly enough weapons to consume all the munitions socked away in the ship's clawed, four-chambered cargo clusters. Neither Rusher's ground team nor the ship had any way to fire those. But Vichara Itelk had once been a ship to itself, before being welded to the cargo pods. Severing one of the two cargo compartments that served as Diligence's feet had been a simple matter of sealing the accesses and setting off the explosive bolts holding the hydraulic system in place. The engineer had, indeed, invented some new words on hearing Rusher's plan in the secure comlink exchange. But the plan had worked, making an astounding impact. You're beautiful, Bothan, whoever you are. 
Now diligence looked stunted, half its footing amputated. The ship would never land again in this condition. Losing lateral control, brig! Dackett called over the comlink. Hang on, Rusher said. Opening a pack on his belt, he looked at the homing sensor. Nothing. Dak, you got anything on our wanderers up there? Negative. The tags aren't strong enough to penetrate the ice. There goes that gambit, Rusher thought. Beetle had delivered more than just the stealth suit and the lightsaber. They'd welded a calm frequency tag just like the one all his troopers wore to the base of the Jedi's weapon. But neither Beetle nor the lightsaber were showing up on his register. We're going to have to do this the hard way. Let me make my call. Switching from the secure channel to the one he'd used to contact Calamandretta control, Rusher slid down off the ice crawler and placed his call. Lord Arcadia, this is your deliverer man, he said. Give me the Jedi, or I'm gonna crack your city open and let you all die. In the rapidly disintegrating hangar, Arcadia's technicians listened as the brigadier repeated his message. Or tried to listen, as the blasts kept coming from the south. The intruders in Patriot Hall were shooting again, doing their best impressions of the miners who had originally hollowed out Calamandretta's tunnels. Abruptly, a muscular human mechanic turned to see a surprising sight in the frigid haze, a bipedal snowman, pushing Quillen and his hover chair up the ramp to the shuttle. Hey! So much for this, Narsk thought, slapping a wrist control and deactivating the stealth suit. Suddenly appearing in the shower of ice crystals, Narsk yelled back through his mask to the mechanic. Saboteurs, he implored, pushing the chair higher. Hurry, we've got to complete the mission. I don't think we should do anything without asking. Narsk faced the mechanic, the suit and mask serving to make him look menacing and mysterious. Look around. Don't you know your job? He jabbed his gloved claw toward the shuttle. Now help me load him up. Befuddled, the mechanic dashed to the top of the ramp, pushing Quillen and his conveyance inside the hatch. Seeing the workers secure the passenger section, Nars dashed down the ramp, headed for the hidden compartment he tried so hard to escape from just moments earlier. The stepladder gone, Nars leapt, grabbing hold of the tail section and pulling himself up. Straining, he reoriented himself and backed his body, serpent-like, into the chamber. Reaching for the compartment's tube-like oxygen feed, he routed it under his mask. The vehicle shook around him, beginning to taxi toward the exit. The droid pilot had been given the go signal. Reaching for the control to cycle the compartment shut, Narsk saw chaos on the receding floor of Embarkation Station 7. The Wookiee guard and two of the techs were there, screaming at the seemingly paralyzed mechanic. After a second the man realized his mistake and began yelling at Narsk. Wait a minute. You've got the wrong hover chair. The mechanic dashed past the booby-trapped chair, still parked on the hangar floor, its rich color obscured by frost. Quick. Raise the magnetic field. Order the droid to stop the ship. Feeling the sluggish shuttle lift from the ground, Narsk found the remote control Arcadia had given him and pressed the button. The last thing he saw before his hidden compartment cycled shut was the burgundy chair spiraling into the air, riding a volcano of blue gas. And the bone-chilling screams were the last thing he heard, before the sound of the accelerating engines on either side of him claimed his hearing forever. Kara puffed, sprinting the long meters up the hallway. Arcadia's guide had led her this way earlier, on their way to the museum. It was the only path out of the grotto now, the collapse of the second level had ruined the route up to Patriot Hall. And while she'd seen Arcadia on the terrace before, she hadn't seen her fall. Kara was taking no chances. No more than she already had, anyway. Although the pumps no longer worked, the algae still lit the way, fluorescing in their tubes. Even back in the ruins of Reflection Prospect, the giant pipes had held, although several now tilted at dangerous angles. Arcadia's society really was formidable in its accomplishments. She represented a great threat to everyone around her, and the Jedi and the Republic didn't even know she existed. Kara had to change that, had to stop Arcadia. But she already had a job. She had to get the refugees out.
Reaching the anteroom, Kara dove toward the opulent museum door. Cracking it open, she found what she expected inside, Arcadia's museum, in all its vast circular majesty. Several of her prized artifacts had fallen to the floor, shaken by the tremors in the ice. Kara searched for exits. The stars shone through the skylight twenty meters above, far too high to reach, even jumping from the pylon at the room center. But there were six other entrances. One of them had to have. Arcadia. The Sith Lord stood in the doorway to the left, her ornamented staff in both hands, her face smudged with smoke, her once proud armor scratched and singed. I don't know what you've done or how you've done it. Arcadia said, activating the control, transforming her staff into a double-bladed lightsaber. But it stops here. Rusher swore. Minutes had passed, with no response. He'd held his fire on the city, but the city had nothing to say to him. Only Team Zaboka was still firing, Rusher had sent them and their more portable weapons out onto the tundra to target land vehicles approaching over what was left of the ice sheet. Certainly someone could hear him, he heard the panicked chatter on the comlink channel. But none of it seemed directed at him. If Arcadia was out there, she was probably busy. And if Kara was out there, that's where Arcadia was, too. Stop shooting. Stop shooting. Rusher looked to the north, where the tunnel leading into the glacier had collapsed between their fire and their impromptu bomb. A space-suited figure clambered awkwardly through a tight gap between the crushed gate and several ice boulders. Labun. Rusher dashed across the crunchy depot floor. Two of his troopers pulled chunks away, helping the recruit past. I gave the both and the lightsaber like you said, sir. Beetle said, breathlessly. The Jedi, trooper. Did you see her? No, sir. But the Bothan gentleman did go after her. Beetle said, pointing ahead of him. North. That's south. Rusher stalked the debris-strewn floor, trying to remember. The big grotto was directly south, at the juncture of passageways leading east, to Arcadia's museum, and farther south, down a series of escalators. The citizen guards had taken Kara that way, deeper into the bowels of the glacier. With the damage they'd done to the passageways, there was no reaching the grotto, much less anything leading down from there. No, if Narsk had reached Kara, the Jedi would have tried to go up. That meant either Patriot Hall, or up the long, climbing hallway to Arcadia's museum. Was there some exit at that end? More important, could they ever find it? There wasn't any time for picking through the rubble. If Arcadia had any other ships in the system, they'd be on their way by now. A call on the secure channel interrupted him. The other tractor beam's got us, Brigadier! Give him the other barrel, diligence, Rusher said, waving to his crew to stop firing. Looking south, he clicked the comm link again. You can't land, anyway, until you do. We'll assemble outside. You don't sound happy. No Jedi? No, Rusher said, and no route to the Republic. Let's use the coordinates the Sith Lady gave us. We've got them punched up and ready to go as soon as we recover everyone. I don't think we're going to be very popular here after this. As usual, the ship's master made sense. Rusher sighed. He tried. Kara parried one lightsaber stroke after another, backing toward yet another doorway in the circular room. All the exits were locked from the outside, including the one she'd entered through. Arcadia had her trapped. You're little more than a Padawan. Her opponent said, weapon whirling in her hands. You don't know what you're dealing with. You've never known. The ruby blade came down, streaking against the ice floor. Leaping, Kara bounded past the hollow projector pylon, which now provided the only cover in the room. You're not the first Sith I've faced, she said, fighting for time. You're just another petty dictator, like the rest. You're not special. Don't compare me with them. Mine is an enlightened regime. Kara laughed. Well, it's true then, what I've always heard. 
an enlightened Sith would kill her own grandmother. Ignoring the taunt, Arcadia raised her weapon high over her head and charged. Kara darted out of the way, causing the tip of the Sith Lord's lightsaber to spark off the pylon. I'm just taking what's mine. What should have been mine? Pressing a control on her weapon, Arcadia detached the ends from the meter-long staff, dropping the ornamented bar to the floor. One weapon had become two. Kara leapt, only to be repelled by Arcadia's gleaming defense. Incredibly, the woman seemed as coordinated with two lightsabers as with one, using the first to parry while preparing a counterstroke with the other. Forced back, Kara fell, stumbling over the raised tiles set in the icy floor. Pressing her advantage, Arcadia brought both lightsabers forcefully against Kara's green blade. Straining in the crackling battle of strength, Kara looked into her attacker's eyes. The calculating intelligence remained, but anger was taking hold. I was a fool to expect you to help. Arcadia said, mashing her lightsabers against Kara's. Too smart by half. But it's done. The assassin is on his way. Shimmering red light danced across her face. They're both gone. Eyes transfixed on Arcadia, Kara suddenly caught a feeling through the force. Both gone. You, you sent Quillen to die. Didn't you? Arcadia froze, and the world around her rumbled. The Sith Lord looked up to see a flash of light over the skylight. The stunted diligence screamed overhead, releasing something from beneath. Kara recognized it, the portside cargo cluster, fully a quarter of the ship's mass, spiraling toward the surface. Synod shook again, harder than before. The southern wall of the museum erupted, forced inward by the cataclysmic meeting of megatons of explosives and ice. Arcadia staggered with the impact. Kara kicked out, taking the Sith Lord's legs out from under her. Abruptly, the floor itself fractured, two-thirds of the ice jutting upward. Forced to the northern wall, Kara deactivated her lightsaber and clambered across the icy rubble, looking for an open passageway beyond the askew doors. Aftershocks and secondary explosions continued to shake the dome. Clouds of frost fell from above. And there, in the snowfall, she saw Arcadia, bruised but advancing. How could you? Kara yelled, reaching in vain for some handhold to climb the wall. You sent your brother to die, in a trap against your grandmother? How could you? Stepping over a crevasse in the floor, the Sith Lord waved her hands. Both lightsabers returned to her from the rubble. She ignited them. There can be only one Sith Lord. And no Jedi. Arcadia leapt. And above, the sky ripped away in a blinding flash. Kara struggled to open her ice-crusted eyes. The top third of the dome was gone. Arcadia's museum, shattered from above and below, was open to the stars and Synod's deadly cold. Hearing creaks as she tried to move, she couldn't tell whether they came from the collapsed pit around her or her own bones. Fumbling in the ice, she found a metal bar and jabbed it into the snowy wall, using it to pull herself up. A tool, from what had once been a museum of tools. Slamming the makeshift piton into the wall again, she scaled the frozen slabs, desperate to escape. Something was moving in the debris behind her. With a heave, Kara lunged onto the surface of Synod and inhaled. Frigid air, only barely laced with oxygen, stabbed at her lungs. Around her, she saw only devastation. Most of the buildings on the surface were gone, and Majestic Patriot Hall was now a leaning frame of pillars. The tractor beam emitters were gone. The field once strewn with ships heaved, tossing and refreezing. Hearing footsteps in the ice behind her, she tried to run, only to stumble and fall, choking at the cold. Diligence was gone. But she had seen it in the air, earlier. Was it escaping? Cheek against the ice, she decided to think that it was. It had been a good fight. She'd done her part. She closed her eyes. 
Chapter 26 The light of the medbay was warm and reassuring, everything one would expect from a classy space liner. Kara blinked at the room through her oxygen mask. Looks like she's thawing out. A familiar voice said. Stretching against the pillow, Kara watched a medical droid remove her mask. The silver model stepped aside to reveal Rusher, leaning inside the doorway. Overcoat gone, the redhead wore a black shirt beneath a worn rust-colored jacket. What happened? Kara croaked, voice raw from exposure. You went for a walk outside without your spacesuit. Rusher said, grinning. Kara struggled to sit up. No, I meant to the dome. I was fighting Arcadia, and then half of it vanished. Oh. Rusher said, stepping inside the room. Thank Bitsy for that. He explained that while he'd been waiting to be picked up by what was left of diligence, he'd spied a telltale knob alone on the ice out to the east. Catching the faintest trace of a signal from the tag on Kara's lightsaber, he'd sent his ship on a flyover to confirm it was the top of a deep and massive dome. Then the brigadier, along with Laboon and the Rippers, had heaved the massive weapon onto a cargo sled behind one of Arcadia's trundle cars. One final shot across the tundra had leveled the dome. You thought I was in there, and you shot it? You could have killed me. We're a precision crew. We shaved it like hair off a bantha. Pouring himself a cup of something medicinal, he recounted how he'd tricked his way into Kalamandretta with his remaining artillery pieces. He was fortunate that Arcadia had sent the ice crawler to get all the refugees in one trip, it had allowed him to put all of his munitions into action. We'd never deployed inside a building before, but we hoped if we got in there and shot enough stuff, they'd give you to us, or you'd scurry out somewhere. He drank. That's how it worked. How'd I get back to the ship? I arranged transportation. You carried me? Barely. You're heavier than you look. He smiled. All muscle, I know. Kara rolled her eyes. What about that bad leg of yours? Well, I had to keep my lurch ratio perfect this mission. And as has been brought to my attention, the walking stick was always just for show. I'm sorry, I broke your old one. Oh, I don't mind. I like the new one you brought me better. Rusher lifted something from a shelf, behind her. Kara recognized it with a start. Arcadia's lightsaber? Looking again, she realized it was the detached, ornamental middle. So that's what the stick was that got me out of the museum, she thought. But it's too small for a cane. But dandy for a swagger stick. Rusher said. Kara rubbed her eyes. The refugees? All aboard diligence, all safe. All twenty-two hundred of them. The Jedi's dark brow furrowed. But we had. One thousand seven hundred and seventeen. I can't believe I'm saying this, but we picked up some more riders on our way out. A bunch of laborers found environment suits and dashed across the ice to us, begging to be taken along. Apparently, they weren't as patriotic as Arcadia wanted them to be. You remember that Twi'lek, the supply clerk turned metallurgist? Evidently it wasn't much of a promotion. Rusher shared some of what they'd been told by the new arrivals, including details about Arcadia's chemical weapons program. He smirked. Sounds like we took part of that operation out during our little rampage. By accident, Kara said. You didn't even know it was there. I'm in artillery. Everything we hit, we hit on purpose, even if we don't know what it is. He patted the bulkhead. Anyway, there was plenty of room here on diligence for them, although we're kind of back to being Vicharei Telk. Only ugly. With the cargo pod clusters gone, the space liner was a space liner again, more or less. Might as well put it back to its service. He said. Kara shook her head. You tore apart your ship to save me? My engineer isn't very happy with me, but what else is new? Besides. He said, reaching for Kara's arm and pulling up her sleeve. You were carrying our destination. Kara looked at the numbers on her arm, scrawled there by the Bothan. She wondered what had happened to him. 
The last thing this part of the galaxy needed was him out there, working his mischief in his stealth suit. And yet, for some reason, he had helped her and helped Rusher. She wondered if Narsk knew the reason why, himself. A thought struck her suddenly. Your artillery pieces. You left them on Synad? Well, we couldn't very well bring them with us with no cargo pods. You know how it is with those things. Lightning fast to deploy, forever to get moved out. And we were a little busy. But they're your whole business. We're going to the Republic, Kara. Shopping is the official sport, from what I hear. I'm sure we can find a manufacturer willing to deal. He looked to the walls. And it'd be nice to get some new holos. The Republic. Remembering, Kara slapped her knee enthusiastically, only to wince in pain. I shouldn't have done that, she said. But I think you'll like to hear this. Quickly, she recounted some of what she learned from Arcadia about the Sith family and the charge Matrika. As she tried to recall every face, every name from the bequest, Rusher leapt in with details, filling in the blanks. He seemed to brighten as the pieces fell into place. That's astounding. He said. He'd known about some of the relationships, but not all, and while there were a lot more would-be Sith lords that weren't in the family, Kara's find had made many of the encounters he'd seen make sense. Get a recorder in here. I'll document everything, she said. You want to meet a real Republic Chancellor? I think you're about to get your chance. Kara warmed inside. The first time she'd sent others back to the Republic, they'd had to convey the sad news about what had happened to Vanertris and his band. This wasn't good news, but it was something direly needed in the Republic, light, shone into the darkness. Rusher scratched his beard. This does sound pretty valuable. You know, I've been itching to do a refit on the old tub. If this info's worth knowing, maybe they'll pay to give diligence for cargo clusters, instead of two. He watched her face. What? Don't they use the barter system there, too? Kara smirked. Don't make me go with you. Rusher laughed. There was more laughter in the halls, she heard. The ship, Moros after Gazari, had been full of glee since the news of their destination spread, he said. Tan might never sleep again. She barely slept before. The Jedi sighed. Mission accomplished, Gub. I'm pretty sure Beetle will be happier in the Republic, too. Actually, he wants to stick with us. A few of your kids, too, want to stay on as part of the new brigade when I come back. Don't blame me, I didn't recruit them. But with their folks still under heel out here, they'd rather stay here, doing something. I bet they won't feel that way after they've seen the Republic, Kara thought. Then again, maybe they might. 63,000, she mumbled. What's that? Who? Hmm? She looked up, blowing a strand of hair from her eyes. Oh. I was just adding up how many people I've sent back. Between Shiloh and what I've done since then, I've brought 63,000 refugees to the frontier. About. That's a lot of traffic. Rusher said. Especially when you're not really trying to lead some exodus, she said. It just happens. 63,000 down, billions to go. Nodding, Rusher took his new swagger stick and stood. I guess you've got your own lurch ratio to worry about. That's what I came up here to tell you. We've got a quick stop coming up in a few hours, Tramanos, I think. I'm sure there's someone unpleasant there to keep you busy. Kara watched the man head to the door. For someone she'd thought a tool of the Sith, he'd surprised her. But that was the thing about tools. They could be used for another purpose. A better one. Rusher, Kara called. When you get to the Republic, I'd stay there, if I were you. No, you wouldn't. He said, grinning. You're going to do what you came here to do, one system at a time. Kara laughed. Me and what army? You never know, kid. Maybe I'll cut you a rate. The garden stood on a grassy hilltop, overlooking a green sea that stretched beneath towering pink clouds. 
Nothing from the morning rain lingered beyond a cool breeze, rustling the fronds of the plants lining the walkway. Scaling the stone steps to the piazza, Narsk paused to sip from a fountain. Even the water here tasted sweet. For all the harshness of its masters, Sith space held enormous beauty. It was hard to believe this was only one of several such retreats, prepared and tended by the dowager's trusted orderlies. The place was alive with natural sounds. Nars could hear them now, through the prosthetics implanted in his ears earlier that day. Arcadia had secured the shuttle compartment against the dangers of space, but not the sound of the engines. Even activating the Mark VI hadn't done any good against the sonic bombardment, the receptors overloaded, burning out the suit forever. Just another of the trade-offs in his line of work, Nars thought his new ears would make him a more effective spy. His nose twitched. A multicolored butterfly perched on it before flitting dizzily to an exotic flower on the trellis. Ahead, a withered hand cupped the blossom. Welcome to my nursery. The gardener said to the insect. And you, as well, Master Kahane. At the top of the steps, Narsk knelt. Thank you, Vilia Kalamandra. He waited patiently as the snow-haired woman tended her garden. She always amazed him. Vilia Kalamandra, the evening star. Conqueror of Fagon and head of three houses. Bowed by time, but once tall and proud, what a warrior she must have been, Narsk thought. Hands that once held lightsabers were now mottled and wrinkled, well before their time, and yet, her golden eyes were still so alive. The Sith power did that, sometimes. The mind took a toll on the flesh. Narsk had expected her to depart as soon as she learned of Arcadia's plot in full. But Vilia had taken the news of her granddaughter's plot calmly, and without surprise. Her seers had expected something, hence the brief warning he had received via his implant. And if it had unsettled her in the least, she didn't show it. Here she was, in her simple amber gown, tending to nothing but her plants, and now her grandson. Brought here since Narsk's last trip up the hill, Quillen sat off to the side under a portable shade. No hover chair this time, the bearers had carried the chair themselves. Avian creatures soared over the ocean. Quillen grew animated, seeing past them to galaxies unknown. Head lolling against the chair back, he spoke syllables to the air. Yes, Quillen. Vilia said, sitting down at a bench beside the boy. She folded his hands. Grandmother understands. Narsk understood now, too. The teenager was the center of it all, everything that had happened since Gazari. While Narsk had been on the battlefield, seeing to it that Odian and Damon got her directive to attack Bactra, Vilia had grown concerned about someone else, Arcadia. Somehow, Vilia had learned of her granddaughter's interest in seizing not just the Diarchy's territory, that was to be expected, but also the twins themselves. Had Vilia learned of it through the Force? Or through other assets like himself? Narsk hadn't asked. But Arcadia's particular focus on the children had concerned Vilia enough that she'd assigned Narsk to look into it. His reputation had earned him a position key to Arcadia's plans on Balura. It was sheer coincidence that the Jedi had gone to Balura, too, it had certainly surprised him. But Vilia had known about it as soon as Diligence approached a populated world in the Diarchy. Vilia had been able to track Kara's location ever since her initial theft of the stealth suit because Vilia had been Narsk's source for it. Her technicians had obtained the Cirrusept system and modified it so that she could track Narsk and, he imagined, whatever other minions she had given them to. So Vilia had always known the Jedi would play a role in her future. She just hadn't known what it was. Kara Holt had, in fact, saved Vilia's life by refusing to play assassin for Arcadia. Once Narsk learned exactly what Arcadia had in mind, he took the opportunity to free her. Vilia always liked her debts paid. You are here with news. It should please you, Narsk said. Two of Vilia's other agents had used the moments of confusion in the Arcadianate to spirit Dramica away from Balura. The girl would be kept far from her twin brother in the future, they had all learned that was for the best, but also out of the hands of opportunists who might exploit them, as Kalishan had. And Arcadia, for that matter. There had been no communication from Arcadia. 
Another of Vilia's kin might have sent a mawkish message, playing the innocent and probing to see what the widow knew. Arcadia had remained silent to her grandmother. But she had spoken to Narsk when he messaged pretending to be in hiding on a neutral world. From her, he had learned his spur-of-the-moment plan had worked better than he'd had any right to expect. The damage done by diligence had caused the floor beneath the hangar to collapse shortly after Narsk's departure. All Arcadia had found in the icy rubble were fragments of the booby-trapped hover chair and the bodies of several of her technicians. Realizing they'd been killed by nerve gas and not the cataclysm, Arcadia had concluded that her aides had somehow loaded the wrong chair aboard the shuttle in the excitement, only to have the tanks in the correct chair ruptured during the bombardment. Last seen climbing into his hideaway, Narsk had been able to claim ignorance when he communicated with Arcadia. He was a victim, too, he'd said, arriving on Vilia's world with the wrong hover chair. She'd responded curtly to that before cutting off the exchange. He knew she had other worries. Other sources had reported major damage to Arcadia's capital and the recall of significant forces from the Diarchy. It would be some time before Arcadia could consolidate her hold over any new territory. Vilia liked her debts paid, but she seemed willing to let her granddaughter live with the embarrassment. One didn't want to be an outcast from this family. Chagra doted on the twins so. She said, patting Quillen's hand. It was so hard when he was taken away from them. Narsk looked to the ground. Rising, she looked searchingly at the Bothan. You have something to ask, I sense. You wonder if I had something to do with my son Chagras's death. As Arcadia claims. My lady, I had no. You would as well ask if Arcadia had anything to do with it. An ambitious daughter, fearful her father's legacy would go to younger more favored siblings. And an expert in nerve toxins, the very weapon that felled Chagra in his prime? You could construct a case against her as easily as you could against me, and it would be every bit as horrible. Vilia looked back from the hedge. So why would you want to? A family is defined by its shared illusions, as much as by its blood. Narsk shrugged. Gathering his courage, he straightened. I have only had reason to doubt myself, he said. I freed the Jedi. She won't leave Sith space, not if I know her. And now she knows about your family and the charge Matrika. She could take that information to your enemies. Including the Republic. Vilia waved off his concerns. There were no mass media to disseminate that information in Sith space, no authorities that would be believed. And the Republic had proven itself ineffective even when it had good, recent intelligence about the Sith. For the moment. Young Kara remains the only Jedi around. She could still be a danger to you and your family, Narsk said. I look on her as something else. She's just like you, Narsk. She's a learning experience. For all of them. One day, the Sith will again turn upon the Republic and we again will be facing the full roster of Jedi Knights. My grandchildren need to at least know how to deal with one. Narsk had performed a dual role for years, she said. By serving her grandchildren, he was at the same time creating challenges for them. As far as Vilio was concerned, Kara was just one more agent out there, testing her children's children. I am sorry, Dowager, the Bothan said, looking down. I know there are things that are beyond me. How does sowing discord strengthen your house? You don't have children, do you, Master Kahane? Wouldn't Narsk manage to shake his head? Well, I have had many, and they have had many. You expect them to fight with one another. I happen to expect them to fight well. She turned to the chair, where Quillen continued to stare vacantly at the sea. You always want them to succeed at whatever it is they set out to do. To strive. She said, stroking the boy's hair. And to thrive. She smiled gently at the boy. But when you see that some cannot, you pull them aside. This, this is a Sith philosophy? Vilia laughed. The Sith are ancient, Narsk, but there were grandmothers long before that. We have our own function. You could call it a philosophy, but it is part of being what we are. Seeing the woman return to her gardening, Nars bowed and turned to depart.
O, and Narsk. Caressing a thorny flower, Vilia looked back and smiled. If you do see Arcadia again, tell her I send my love. As always. About the author. Game designer John Jackson Miller is also the author of nine Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic graphic novels, as well as the Star Wars, Lost Tribe of the Sithy book series. His comics work includes writing for Iron Man, Mass Effect, Bart Simpson, and Indiana Jones. John Jackson Miller lives in Wisconsin with his wife, two children, and far too many comic books.